Recording this program is entirely fictional and made by a sole Canadian man. All characters and events in the show, including the host, even those that are based on real people, are entirely fictional. The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. America, the land of the free, home of the brave, and the stupid, and the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets, causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight, on the Season 3 premiere of Grand Theft Auto Biographies. Investment Adventures, Political Aspirations, and Cannibalism. Tonight, we will examine the life of a politician, a businessman, and a mass murderer who took America by storm in the late 90s and early 2000s. A savvy and yet incomprehensibly evil individual who left an impression on America's worst city like few others throughout its long and bloody history. We will see election tampering, failed assassinations, and multinational criminal conspiracies as we dig deep into the past of one of America's most iconic and psychotic entrepreneurs, Donald Love. This video is brought to you by my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. By supporting the channel for less than $2 American a month, you can get early access to videos, the ability to download episodes, and nearly 100 original music tracks, many of which are extended versions of the tracks that are on streaming services. A very special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Aussie, Diecastinator, Chuck K45, and Miles Garrett. All of you are amazing, and your support is something I truly can't express my gratitude for fully. Thank you so much. Today's episode is sponsored in part by my executive producers Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and Diecastinator. You can check out Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99 where they play games such as NHL and MLB, and story-based games like the Red Dead Redemption series, with plenty more story-based games to come soon. Mason Collins' podcast channel, We're About Everything, where they discuss, well, everything from zombie apocalypses to game remasters and more. Chuck K45's channel, who's working on setting up a channel all about buying farm equipment and fixing it up, and then starting a new farm from scratch, and Diecastinator's channel, where they examine, review, and discuss all things diecast, from the history of the hobby to rare models, and much more with new videos basically every day, in addition to buying and selling and trading the diecast cars. All links in the description, and a very big thank you to all of my patrons. Your support is literally helping me to keep the lights on, so from the bottom of my little black heart, thank you all so very much. Support the channel by showing my executive producers some love, or sign up yourself today. And now, back to the video. Good evening, America, and welcome to Season 3 of GTA Biographies. Tonight's subject is a man many of you may already be familiar with, thanks to his impact on the media landscape of this nation. A man who some 20-odd years ago vanished into a puff of corporate smoke, never to be heard from again. Mystery, a key theme that surrounded Mr. Love throughout most of his public career. That mystery extended to his origins as well, since, like many of the subjects we cover on this program, very little is known about the early life and times of the infamous media mogul. It is possible to speculate on how Love wound up where he did, but knowing the truth when dealing with a man plagued by rumors of cannibalism and mass murder is not always as easy as one might hope. We were able to confirm some facts regarding Donald's early life, the first being that he was once the business protege of Florida's own corrupt real estate magnate, Avery Carrington. In the late 1980s, Donald would frequently follow Carrington around as he performed business deals and pushed his rivals into bankruptcy, observing with great precision the methods of a ruthless American capitalist. At one point, Donald even sat in on one of Carrington's meetings with the infamous Florida kingpin, Tommy Versetti, before the Harwood Butcher became the most powerful man in the state. Tommy, this is Donald Love. Donald, this is Tommy Versetti, the latest gunslinger to come to these parts. Now, Donald, you just shut up and listen, and you might learn something. Now, nothing brings down real estate prices quicker than a good old-fashioned gang war. 
except maybe a disaster like a biblical plague or something, but that may be going too far in this case. You getting this down, you four-eyed prick? While we couldn't confirm for certain, we believe Donald was in his early to mid-20s by his 1986 meeting with Rossetti, which would place his birth year in the early to mid-1960s. Many believe that love was born in the worst place in America, Liberty City, though we could not obtain records from any of the city's hospitals for confirmation. Whatever the case, he would arrive on the East Coast in the 1990s to begin building his corporate empire. Liberty City in the late 90s. A city plagued by mob violence, political corruption, and hollow consumerism. A perfect place for the aspiring businessman to wreak havoc on the American electorate by sucking them dry of every penny they managed to scrape together. It was here that Donald Love made his name, in the city that had become famous for the worst reasons imaginable, a trend Mr. Love would only continue. By 1998, Donald would arrive in Liberty to begin establishing himself as a political player, an economic force to be reckoned with. It isn't clear where Donald's initial investments had been, but wherever they were, they'd allowed him to become a very wealthy man by the time he arrived in the city that he'd hoped to conquer. Donald had wealth, but what he really wanted was influence, and more importantly, power. He would establish his own media company in the city, Love Media, and slowly begin buying up assets, including radio stations and newspapers, to build up his portfolio and his reputation among Liberty's elite. Using his connections and his money, Donald would at some point make himself an ally of the Portland-based Leone crime family, under Don Salvatore Leone. Given Mr. Leone's own immense wealth and public cover as a mere businessman, it seems likely, and it is our speculation, that the two met through mutual high-income contacts, and found that their goals aligned quite neatly. When exactly this meeting took place is anyone's guess, but we believe it was sometime in 1998 following Mr. Leone's public spat with Mayor Roger C. Hole, which resulted in the mob boss fleeing his home in Portland to hide among the upper crust of Staunton Island. Salvatore would assign his up-and-coming soldier, Tony Cipriani, to first assassinate Roger Hole before working personally with Donald to ensure his victory in the subsequent mayoral election. Antonio, how wonderful to see you! What's going on? We're having a party, dear boy, a party. Yes, a morgue party. The first of the season! Whoa, 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 whoa. what the fuck are you talking about? A morgue party. We're gonna have quite a night tonight. But first, we need to go and pick up the guests. Come, before our guests get bored to death. No pun intended. Cause they're dead, you know. Our guest of honor is taking a little trip to the pathology labs. Let's not keep him waiting. Donald would begin campaigning aggressively across the city, using his already vast reach in the media to shout his name from the rooftops, ensuring everyone knew who would be the next mayor of Liberty City. He would even personally hire Tony Cipriani to drive campaign bans around the streets of Staunton Island, shouting obscenities about his rival candidate Miles O'Donovan and harassing O'Donovan campaigners. The L? Tony, how's the campaign? It's down to the wire and every last vote's gonna count. O'Donovan's campaigners are working those marginal seats hard. But we've got our own bandwagon, so get out there and spread the word! With his nearly overt ties to the Mafia, many alleged that Donald even had Tony kill campaigners on more than one occasion. And according to Love's most ardent detractors, these were the least of his crimes. There are some who contend that Donald Love was in fact a cannibal, and we here at Weasel tend to agree, seeing no shortage of crossover on the Venn diagram of cannibals and politicians. Whether or not he truly did dig on man meat remains unknown, but we are proud to say that we have no problem making baseless accusations that make our narrative more engaging. Antonio, que pasa amigo? You do know I'm Italian, don't you, Don? Not uh, Spanish? Of course. How silly of me. I just love all the romance languages. My god, this is good. It tastes just like chicken, but somehow more, uh, sentient. You want some? I already ate, thanks. Ugh, too bad. It's fantastic. I have some more delicacies about to be served. The liberals would have a field day, of course, but how little they know of life's real pleasures. Sophistication and democracy have always been such uneasy bedfellows. Listen, Don, we need to win this election, okay? We need to make sure that there's uh, no 
skeletons in the closet, if uh, you know what I mean? Right. What I mean is, how do we take care of this O'Donovan guy who is covering for um, standing in for the Ferrellis? The guy has a lot of people canvassing for him. All kinds of deluded people people, if you know what I mean. I think we need to have their faith in democracy shaken, if you understand me. What you mean is that I gotta go beat the crap out of them. <laughs> oh, your passion, Antonio, it's, it's magnificent. It's so, um, 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 Wagnerian, you know? Arrivederci, amigo. Humphreys, bring out the apple. The campaign would heat up to such an intensity, pun intended, that eventually Donald would hire Tony to burn down a warehouse containing voting machines controlled by the O'Donovan campaign. Antonio, good to see you. Now, I'm no Democrat, but even I draw the line at vote rigging. Did you know the Ferrellis own a silent share of a company making the new voting machines? That's bad, right? Well, we certainly can't trust them. No, it's best if they all have a major malfunction, if you catch my drift. Unfortunately for Love, though he'd been guaranteed the protection and cooperation of the Leone family, the same courtesy had been extended to his rival by the Ferrelli crime family out of Fort Staunton. And when Tony's efforts began to seriously encroach on a Ferrelli victory, Don Franco Ferrelli would personally make an attempt on the Don himself. How I hate publicity! But it's all part of the game, right? Right, so. The Ferrellis are gonna try and take me out, aren't they? Don't worry, I'm gonna be riding shotgun. Oh well, here goes everything. Having survived Franco's assassination attempt thanks to Tony, Donald would nonetheless remain paranoid and worried as election day got closer and closer. Despite earlier moral boundaries he claimed to be respecting, Don would even attempt outright election fraud by hiring Tony to steal uncounted ballots in a last-ditch, desperate effort to swing the election back in his favor. Bad news, Tony! What? The exit polls are neck and neck. Time for plan B. We steal some of the uncounted votes and we replace them with some of our own. What was that you said about vote rigging? Oh, shut up! Just days before the election, Don would learn of evidence supposedly linking him to the Leones that was on the verge of being leaked and unsurprisingly hired Tony Cipriani to dispose of whatever or whoever was threatening his victory. Tony, you've got to help me. O'Donovan's got evidence linking me to Salvatore. We're sunk. Calm down. Evidence goes missing every day. Not to mention judges, witnesses, jurors. I hope you see it that way. One of my men has been following the guy with the evidence. He'll meet you under the overpass in Newport. Despite Tony's efforts, the connections between Donald and the Leones would be too obvious to be ignored by the press, and any hope of victory would be completely lost when news media began reporting directly on the link between Tony Cipriani's actions and the aspiring mayor. Hey Don, took care of that mess for you. Everything should be cool now. Really? You got no more links to organized crime. You're whiter than white. You could be the Pope. <laughs> the Pope. Watch this. Although no links can be proved between Donald Love and Liberty City's organized crime, it seems his friendship with mobsters, including Tony Cipriani, have counted heavily against him in voters' eyes. The past few hours have seen his popularity plummet. He is deemed, it seems, unfit for office. Unfit? Because of you. Yeah, and it's all your fault. My fault? Oh, yeah. My fault. <laughs> I can't believe the sacrifices I've made for this town. And do you know what my weakness has been the entire time? Humility. <laughs> and now I'm ruined, bankrupt. Twenty million dollars in the hole. Gone. Bankrupt. Done. Arrivederci. Bankrupt!
Having plunged his entire $20 million fortune into advertising and otherwise funding his election campaign, Donald would find himself at rock bottom following his failed bid at becoming mayor. Now in the poorhouse, literally, Don would take up residence in Shoreside Vale at the Holy Reverend Joe's Flophouse in Pike Creek, living amongst the filth and cockroaches, but never giving up entirely, as he planned his Machiavellian return to power. Don would learn of his old business mentor, Avery Carrington, who is coming to Liberty City in order to begin redeveloping the Fort Staunton district with the Pantlantic Construction Company, which was in reality a front for the Colombian cartel. Don would plead with his old associate, Tony Cipriani, to help him execute his master plan. I know what you're thinking, Tony. How the mighty have fallen. But this is just a temporary blip. My man. Okay. Oh, don't be all touchy. I know I said some nasty things about this being your fault and all, but hubris is a nasty, nasty bedfellow. Almost as nasty as termites. And trust me, I've tried both recently. Wait. You and me are on our way back. I never went away. We're in this together, amigo. No, we're not. Please. Please, please, forget about it, buddy. It's all your fault? Pathetic. Ten percent. Ten percent of what? This? Oh, you're too kind. Not of this. Of something really big. Come, I'll tell you about it on the drive. I hope you have your car. Mine's in the, uh, uh, shop. Yeah. Though it's unclear if Carrington had a deal with the Ferrelli family that would benefit the two mutually, Tony, and by extension the Leones, would realize the potential of stealing Carrington's deal with Panlantic, apparently indifferent to any threat from the cartel, who at the time held very little power in liberty. This is gonna make me a fortune. Yes, sir, a fortune. Don and the Leones would then begin planning the most infamous terrorist attack in the history of Liberty City. Before executing the Fort Staunton Massacre, Donald would also, allegedly, commit another horrifying act. A reporter, the very same reporter who had previously run afoul of Tony Cipriani, Ned Burner, had witnessed Tony's killing of Avery Carrington, and was threatening to reveal the information if he wasn't paid off. Tony! At last! A reporter witnessed us killing Avery! He has photos! Oh God! I'm finished! Calm down, will you? Where is this reporter? Oh Tony, you're wonderful! Apparently, he's working on an undercover job at the church on Staunton Island. Get the photos and bury him! Being a man to never pay a ransom, Donald would instead hire Tony to retrieve the compromising photos, which unsurprisingly also resulted in an early retirement for Mr. Burner. You got some photos of me. Where are they? I don't know what you're talking about! After disposing of the meddlesome journalist, Tony would return to Donald at Francis International Airport, and according to our most gruesome reports, bring with him the corpses of both Ned Burner and Avery Carrington. The corpses were apparently loaded onto Donald's private plane, and exactly what became of them at that point is anyone's guess, but we think he ate them. I'm back! Back from the dead, Tony, risen in you like a phoenix from the ashes, like Lazarus. Yes, Lazarus love! Ah, I'm gonna be rich again! Panlantic are gonna pay me a fortune to see the deal through. We did it, Tony! Whatever. It's time for a little soiree with a very exclusive guest list. Come on. Not long after the disappearance of both Mr. Carrington and Mr. Burner, the Ferrelli-controlled district of Fort Staunton would be totally and completely obliterated by explosives planted in the city's subway system. In one horrifying act of violence, the Leone family would eliminate their biggest rivals, and Donald Love would receive a giant slice of land, newly primed for some major redevelopment. Look, man, this truck is loaded. Know what I'm saying? Drive cool. Yeah. It's all good. Sure, I'll put them on. Tony, we're one little job away from being fabulously rich. We've scoured plans of Fort Staunton. Its weakest points are along the old subway that runs underneath the area. Great, Don. All I gotta do is dodge a hundred wacko Italians. 
Just head along the Porter Tunnel and you'll find your way in just fine. With his Panlantic deal already underway, Donald would return to living his comfortable life of luxury, and even purchase a brand new mansion in Liberty's most exclusive neighborhood, Cedar Grove. Despite his overwhelming success at rising from the ashes, Love was not without his concerns, especially given his tendency to piss off his business partners due to his reluctance towards sharing profits. When the business end of the Colombian cartel came to collect on the lucrative deal Don had closed with their front company, Panlantic, Don would opt once again to hire the services of Tony Cipriani to help him fight and escape the cartel rather than pay them a single cent. No, that's no good! Um... Damn it! It's just so... Oh shit, if I just had something cold to cuddle up to, it'd be so easy. What's going on, D? Antonio! Oh, I'm just seeking spiritual enlightenment, if you must ask, but not today. Maybe tomorrow. Your message seemed kind of anxious. Anxious? <laughs> I'm, I'm meditating. Anxious. Moi. I'm at one with the universe. That's just impossible. Oh, shit, that's right. Um, there is a load of Colombians coming up here to potentially kill me if I don't keep my mouth shut and pay them all off. Oh, I guess that would explain all the, uh, Colombians hovering around outside. Oh, shit. Please, Antonio, you have to get me out of here. I don't want to... Please, I, I don't want to die. I don't... So much for, uh, being at one with the universe, huh? Oh, thank you, Tony. I'll make it... Oh, I'll make it worth your while. I promise. With Tony's help, Donald would flee Liberty City for the next three years, but instead of slowing down, this move would only accelerate his true rise to power. What Don was up to exactly between 1998 and 2001 is the source of much speculation, and it is our belief that he continued to expand his empire far beyond the reach of Liberty City, as one thing we know for certain is, his wealth only continued to grow. At some point, Love would develop a rivalry with fellow businessman Barry Harcross, who had alleged ties of his own to the Colombian cartel, and it is perhaps this very connection which was the source of the rivalry to begin with. Whatever Love's reasons for hating Harcross, by March of 2001 he would return to the city that had made him famous at the same time as his rival, and begin buying up assets like a spank addict in the red light district. In what may be the single fastest and most impressive series of acquisitions in the history of America at that point, Donald's media conglomerate, Love Media, would grow to include 900 radio stations, 300 TV stations, 4 networks, and 3 satellites by the autumn of 2001. Love would even purchase at least 10 U.S. Senators to solidify his power and reach as all-encompassing. You're listening to a Love Media station. Enjoy. It's time for a public service announcement from Donald Love. Hello, I'm Donald Love. Under my guidance, Love Media has emerged as the fastest growing U.S. run media conglomerate of the past five years. With newspapers, television, and radio stations across the U.S. and the free world, alongside a wide array of industrial and technology interests, we at Love Media ensure you get the truth behind the story every time. From films to dog food, from radio to pop music, you can be sure of independent, quality led broadcasting every time you tune in. That's why we're the fastest growing cable supplier and health insurance provider in the Northeast and why our new satellite in China is something all Americans can be proud of. Here at Love Media, we are proud of what we have done to help America and to help hard-working Americans relax. For investment opportunities or information about our new interactive television service, please go to www.lovemedia.tv. Just some of Love Media's properties by October of 2001 included Head Radio, Flashback FM, Double Clef FM, Chatterbox FM, the Liberty Tree newspaper, and even the Bitchin' Dog Food Company, among many, many others. 
Donald even sat down with Liberty Tree reporter William Metzik in September of 2001 to openly discuss his rapid return to the limelight. With the opening of his new website, a precursor to his entry into the world of internet television sometime in 2005, Donald Love took a few minutes from his busy schedule to talk to the Liberty Tree about what's in store for entertainment in Liberty City. Welcome to Liberty City. May I take this opportunity to tell you how pleased every citizen is to have you living in our city full-time? Thanks, and may I say thank you to Liberty City for making me feel so welcome. This is a great city, you know, which gets a lot of bad press. Not anymore. Well, of course not. I bought the press here, and that's what freedom is all about as a businessman. How are you finding life in Liberty City? Well, I hope it won't be overstating the case to say that I'm enjoying it quite a lot. It is my conjecture that Liberty City is not called Liberty City for nothing. Unlike other towns, a man can truly be free here, at least for a price. And freedom is an American principle I hold very dear. Now. History was never my strong suit, but it is my understanding that we defeated the Native Americans because they tried to tell us what to do. The same with the Nicaraguans. So I think all right-thinking Americans know why this is the land of the free, and especially that this is the case in Liberty City. And what does freedom mean to Donald Love? The same as to any man, to do what I want to do. You know, a progressive city authority and a wise and thoughtful private sector can work together to make a place great. I spoke at great length with several important government officials, including Mayor O'Donovan, aboard my private yacht in the Caribbean before I moved here, and I could see they were right-thinking gentlemen. Men who understood that you couldn't, uh, as they say, make a pudding without adding some sugar. They appreciate the special needs and concerns of the multi-billionaire investor, and promised me the economic climate in this town would be to my liking. At the same time, to me, Donald Love, the man, not Donald Love, the multi-billionaire who dragged himself up by his bootstraps, freedom means the ability to do what I want to do, and for you to do what you want to do, and not be told what is right or wrong by some interfering council or set of do-gooders. Diversity has always been your watchword as a businessman. Now you seem to be focusing on the media and selling off your older assets, including several of your most famous investments. Why is that? Yes, it certainly has. Diversity. And, I hope, ruthlessness. In the business environment, you must fight hard. Otherwise, you're not respecting your opponent, be he stockholder, lawyer, customer, or union man. I've considered it my duty to fight hard, not fair, and I think this is very important. But I also respect people, especially fellow billionaires, because I understand the sacrifices they made in a way you never could. But time and tide wait for no man, as they say, even someone of immense wealth and power. I tell you, I could buy you and 50 of you every hour for the rest of my life, but I could never buy one single hour of my life back. And sometimes, it's time to change. So, I have refocused the core interests of Love Media, and I'm now concerned primarily with the media and pet food industries. I believe they complement one another perfectly, although the wider Love Investment Group will retain some interest in plastic explosives and anti-personal landmines, because it is my conjecture that they are important and very lucrative industries. I'm hoping to make a significant pet food acquisition in the coming months, in the Liberty City area. So you see, what is good for Liberty City is good for Donald Love and ipso facto vice versa. And your new interactive TV service? Will be a remarkable thing for all concerned. Entertainment will never have looked so good, I can tell you that. People will never want to go out again once they get into this stuff. Families will stay together. I honestly believe they will enjoy each other's company so much more with a lovemedia.tv entertainment package. It isn't the cheapest television service though. Excellence never is. Can you put a price on excellence? I could, but I'm afraid it would be far outside your reach. And what plans for the future? I have many interests, but I never plan. It's a waste of energy. Take what you're given, and if you don't like it, take someone else's too. This is the American way, not planning. We are, thankfully, socialists. Donald Love, thank you so much. It has been a pleasure. Thank you, and I promise I will speak to your Pulitzer people on your behalf. You deserve it. Now living and operating out of the Love Media building in Staunton Island's Bedford Point District, Love would also develop a mysterious friendship with an old Oriental gentleman, whose identity and indeed significance remains entirely unknown. He would personally pay for the man to be flown to Liberty City by private jet to practice Tai Chi with him in his rooftop garden, but the mysterious foreigner would be arrested by the head of immigration at FIA, Ray Mathers, and held by the Liberty State authorities until they could transfer him to a prison upstate. In October of 2001, Donald would pay the cartel, now under new leadership, to break his friend out of prison during a routine transfer. 
while moving the Oriental gentleman along with the infamous terrorist 8-Ball and the recently jailed armed robber Claude, the prison convoy would be stopped on the Callahan Bridge by the Colombians, who were armed and very dangerous. Taking the Oriental gentleman and leaving the other two escaped convicts to their fates, the cartel would bomb the bridge to buy themselves time from the authorities, and subsequently cut the island of Portland off from the rest of the city for weeks. Instead of returning the Oriental gentleman as promised, however, the cartel would instead take him to their compound in Espatria, to ransom him for a larger payment from Donald, whom they knew was now a far richer man than he'd been just three years prior. To add insult to injury, Love's mansion in Cedar Grove would be seized by the cartel, but Donald would refuse to negotiate, and instead turn his attention to finding a lone wolf criminal he could trust to rescue his friend from the Colombians. While searching, Don would attend another of his infamous morgue parties and in the process be photographed by a journalist seeking to expose the mogul for his cannibalistic tendencies. Using his connections in the LSPD, Donald would hire corrupt detective Ray Machowski to find and destroy any evidence from his debaucherous private life, who in turn hired a mysterious man named Claude, the very same man who'd been inadvertently freed when his friend was kidnapped. I know a real important man in town, a soft touch with, uh, shall we say, exotic tastes and the money to indulge them. He's involved in a legal matter, and the prosecution has some rather embarrassing photos of him at a morgue party or something. The evidence is being driven across town. You are going to have to ram that car and collect each little bit of evidence as it falls out. When you've got it all, leave it in the car and torch it! We're both going to do pretty well out of this, kid. After destroying the evidence for Machowski and by extension Love, Ray would put Claude directly in contact with Donald, who'd been looking for the services of a man just like him. First of all, let me thank you for dealing with that personal matter. People will read something into anything these days. Experience has taught me that a man like you can be very loyal for the right price, but groups of men get greedy. A valued resource, an old oriental gentleman I know, has been kept hostage by some South Americans in Espatria. They're trying to extort additional funds from me, but I don't believe in renegotiation. A deal is a deal, so they'll not see a penny from me. Go and rescue my friend. Do whatever it takes. Claude would go on to save the old oriental gentleman from the Colombians and return him safely to the Love Media building, where he and Donald continued to practice Tai Chi together and presumably colluded on various mysterious dealings. Taking a page from his old mentor Avery Carrington and perhaps seeking to strike back at the Colombians while benefiting himself in the process, Love would next hire Claude to pose as a cartel member and assassinate the leader of the Staunton Island Yakuza, Wakagashira Kenji Kassen, with the goal of sparking a war between the two organizations and in the process buying up a ton of cheap land. Nothing drives down real estate prices like a good old-fashioned gang war, apart from an outbreak of plague, but that might be going too far in this case. I've noticed the Yakuza and the Colombians are far from friends. Let's capitalize on this business opportunity. I want you to kill the Yakuza Wakagashira, Kenji Kassen. Kenji is attending a meeting at the top of the multi-story car park in Newport. Get a cartel gang car and eliminate him. The Yakuza must blame the cartel for this declaration of war. Nearly satisfied that Claude could be trusted due to his individualistic streak, Don would next give Claude a final test to prove the Silent Reaper could be relied upon. He would send Claude on a wild goose chase to collect six mysterious packages being dropped from an airplane as it arrived at Francis International Airport. In these days of moral hypocrisy, certain valuable commodities can be hard to import. On its approach to the airport tonight, a light aircraft will pass over the bay. It will drop several packages into the water. Make sure you pick them up before anyone else does. When Claude loyally returns the packages as hope to Donald, he would deem the Reaper Man trustworthy of retrieving the real package, which had been aboard the plane all along. Thank you for retrieving those packages, but they were only a decoy. Sorry about that, but that's sometimes the way in business. My real objective was hidden on the plane all along. Unfortunately, the Port Authority seized the plane and were stripping it down until I intervened at great personal expense. Cross the bridge to Shoreside Vale and go to Francis International Airport. I've paid off the officials. My property will be waiting for you at the customs hangar in the aircraft fuselage. As instructed, Claude would travel to Francis International and attempt to collect the mysterious package, but instead be confronted with even more cartel members. 
Shooting his way through the Colombians, Claude would search the plane but find nothing, nearly giving up his search until locating a van left by the attackers with the branding Panlantic Construction Company. Putting two and two together, Claude would race to the Panlantic construction site at Fort Staunton just in time to find the cartel swarming the area, forcing him to once again shoot his way through all of the men to find his way to the service elevator. After killing all the cartel members on the ground, Claude would finally catch up to not just the thieves, but also his traitorous ex-girlfriend, Catalina. Hey, let's get this out of here. God knows what it is, but he seems to want it badly enough, so it must be worth something. Who the hell is you? Hey, take it easy, amigo. No es nada, no es nada. I left you pouring your heart out into that gutter. Hey, don't shoot, amigo. No, no, no problem. We are friends. Here, don't be such take a this. pussy. Hey, we got no choice, baby. You always got a choice, you dumb bastard. I'm sorry about the crazy bitch, man. They, they're all the same, please. Por favor. So... The whore got away. But you've done me a favor. You're not the only one that has a score to settle with the cartel. This worm killed my brother. I never killed no Yakuza. Liar! We all saw the cartel assassin. We are going to hunt down and kill all you Colombian dogs. I'll be operating on our friend here to extract information oh. and oh. a little pleasure. You, drop by later. I'm sure I'll require your services. Please, amigo! <laughs> Uh, don't leave me here with her, man. She's she's psycho, chico, man. Please, amigo. Hey, hey, amigo, amigo. Ah, ah. Though Catalina would escape, Claude would return the package to Donald at his Love Media headquarters building in Bedford Point, proving the loyalty that Love had seen in him for the right price. Donald's next, equally mysterious set of moves would be to move the package and his friend, the Oriental Gentleman, to a secure facility in Pike Creek to be authenticated once again hiring Claude to ensure both arrived safely at their destination. You are proving to be a safe investment, a rare thing in these days of falsehood. My oriental friend will need an escort while he takes my latest acquisition to be authenticated. I want you to follow him and make sure both he and my package get to Pike Creek unharmed. After escaping the wrath of dozens of attacking Colombians, the Oriental gentlemen along with the package would safely await their next move in Pike Creek, with Donald hiring Claude one final time to be certain that his plans weren't interrupted this late into the game. When SWAT teams and LCPD forces descend upon the Pike Creek facility, Donald would hire Claude to pose as a decoy, leaving the building in a secure car to lure the police away for the Oriental gentlemen's escape. A lesson in business, my friend. If you have a unique commodity, the world and his wife will try to wrestle it from your grasp, even if they have little understanding as to its true value. SWAT teams have cordoned off the area around my associate in the package. Get over there, pick up the van, and act as a decoy. Keep them busy, he should make good his escape. And this, dear viewer, is where, strangely enough, our story ends. You see, to this day, nobody truly knows what exactly Donald Love was working on or just what this mysterious package was, or better yet, how this oriental gentleman played into the entire equation. After Claude lured the police away from the Pike Creek facility, the oriental gentleman, the package, and Donald Love himself all simply vanished from public life forever. This left the ownership of nearly an entire city in question, but given the circumstances, it seems highly likely that Donald Love is still out there to this day. Rumors and conspiracy have surrounded these mysterious events since the first day the media discovered Love's disappearance. But despite our and many other news organizations' best efforts, it seems unlikely that we or anybody else will ever know the truth. If one had to summarize the character of Donald Love into one word, that word would be hedonism. Above all things, Donald valued his own enjoyment, and seemed to take great joy in constantly accumulating power, money, and prestige, with absolutely zero remorse or regard for consequences. As alleged by many, including our own news team here at Weasel, Love was a cannibal, who frequently attended morbid morgue parties where he presumably consumed the raw flesh of the innocent and the poor for his own sadistic enjoyment. Conjecture. Due to his incredibly mysterious background, beyond his connection to Avery Carrington, it's hard to say where Donald's sociopathic obsession with wealth accumulation stemmed from, 
though given his attitude, it seems likely that it was created, or at least emboldened, by a luxurious childhood and access to immense wealth from a young age. Though we must stress, this is unconfirmed. Whatever the case, Don was obsessed with winning, at any and all cost, and seemed to have no desire to form meaningful connections with any other human beings, with one possible exception, instead focusing all of his time and energy into defeating his adversaries in the political and business realms. Being an intensely immoral man, Donald also had no issue working with criminals throughout his life, from the smallest two-bit thugs to the biggest organized crime outfits in the state, but whoever he aligned himself with, he always believed in trusting as few people as possible, believing groups of men to always be dangerous. He was so indifferent to suffering and prepared to sacrifice others for his own gain that he planned and helped execute Liberty City's most infamous terrorist attack, the destruction of Fort Staunton, with zero hesitation or remorse. In fact, the idea is believed to have originated with him. Tony, Donald here. If the Panatlantic deal is to come to fruition, we're going to need to, um, how can I put this delicately? Clear a small section of land in Fort Staunton. Yeah, when you say we, you mean me, right? <laughs> Tony, you see right through me. Go and see 8-Ball. I'm sure he can provide us with the necessary hardware. Other than the old Oriental gentleman whose true relationship with Donald is entirely unclear, Don did not seem to have any true friends or associates, seemingly by choice, opting to remain independent at all times, and only relying on the greed of others to get work done, never on actual trust. He was a cold, calculated, and brutal man, who schemed and conspired to get what he wanted, and he wound up one of the most powerful people in the country. He also seemed to enjoy himself every step of the way, taking an almost childlike pleasure at times when working against his many enemies towards his own inevitable victory. In the end, we must ask ourselves, America, does what Donald achieves say more about him or about us? You decide. Though Donald Love never was, and likely never will be, charged formally with any crimes, it is our goal here at Weasel to always find the truth, even when obscured by so many layers of bureaucratic tape and obfuscation. Given his involvement with men like Tony Cipriani, Avery Carrington, Claude, and even the Colombian cartel, we believe there are no shortage of crimes that can be comfortably laid at the feet of Mr. Love, even if one ignores everything beyond his involvement in the Fort Staunton Massacre. Some of his alleged crimes, as far as we are concerned, are... Accessory to sabotage and murder when sitting in on Avery Carrington's deals with Tommy Versetti. Accessory conspiracy theft of a corpse, grave robbing, desecration, and murder when hiring Tony Cipriani to retrieve a corpse for his morgue party. Cannibalism when eating the corpse retrieved by Tony. Election tampering numerous times during the mayoral race of 1998. Accessory slander when campaigning against Miles O'Donovan. Accessory conspiracy murder when hiring Tony to kill O'Donovan campaigners. Accessory conspiracy murder and arson when hiring Tony to burn down a Ferrelli factory containing voting machines. Election tampering and accessory conspiracy murder when ordering Tony to steal uncounted ballots. Election tampering and accessory conspiracy murder when ordering Tony to retrieve evidence linking him to the Leone family. Illegal hostile takeover and accessory conspiracy murder when hiring Tony to assassinate Avery Carrington and taking his place in the redevelopment of Fort Staunton. Destroying evidence and accessory conspiracy murder when hiring Tony to kill Ned Burner. Cannibalism and desecration when ordering Tony to retrieve the bodies of Ned and Avery for his consumption. Accessory conspiracy murder and terrorism for planning and helping execute the destruction of Fort Staunton, resulting in the deaths of thousands. Accessory conspiracy murder when hiring Tony to help him escape a group of attacking Colombians and fleeing the city. Accessory conspiracy prison break and terrorism when hiring the cartel to break the old oriental gentleman out of police custody during transfer. Accessory conspiracy destruction of evidence when hiring Ray Machowski to deal with photos of him at a morgue party. Accessory conspiracy murder and harboring a fugitive when hiring Claude to rescue the old oriental gentleman from the cartel's compound in Espatria. Accessory conspiracy murder when hiring Claude to kill Kenji Kassan and start a gang war between the cartel and the Yakuza. Accessory conspiracy attempted theft of police property when hiring Claude to retrieve a mysterious impounded package, and accessory murder when Claude kills dozens of Colombians in order to collect it. Accessory conspiracy murder when hiring Claude to protect the Oriental Gentleman's convoy from an attack on route to Pike Creek. Interfering with police investigations and continuing to harbor a fugitive when hiring Claude to act as a decoy so that the Oriental Gentleman could escape. 
fleeing authorities when vanishing completely from Liberty City along with his friend and the package. We will likely never know what truly happened to the mysterious Oriental gentleman, the package that Donald wanted so desperately, or the man himself. To this day, new conspiracy theories are always being made surrounding Donald's whereabouts and intentions, as well as the contents of the package itself. We leave the question in your hands, America. Let us know down below where you think Donald Love wound up, what became of his friend or associate, and what was his importance, and most mysteriously of all, just what was in that damn briefcase. What makes a man sell his soul, America? And what if that man never had a soul to begin with? Tonight we were given a rare glimpse into the mind of America's elite, and saw the awful reflection awaiting us in that blackest of mirrors. Stay awake and stay vigilant, people. Danger lurks around every corner in this great nation, and you never know where it will strike next. America is a dangerous place, folks. You can never be certain if your boss truly intends to honor that deal he made for your vacation hours, or if he actually intends to have you transfer to a sweatshop in Cambodia at his nearest convenience. Stay indoors, people. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of America's favorite criminal expose, Grand Theft Autobiographies, with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching. America, the land of the free, home of the brave, and the stupid, and the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets, causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight, on Grand Theft Auto Biographies. Stolen valor, stolen dollars, and a whole lot of moonshine. Tonight, we ostensibly venture into the jungles of wartime Vietnam, only to emerge blissfully unaware that we never left the bogs of southern Florida. Addiction, seemingly to both alcohol and explosives, is the primary struggle for tonight's subject. A man who was rejected by the life he'd hoped for, and in return rejected the rest of civil society. A drunk, careless, and occasionally violent man, who always seemed ready to lend a helping hand to psychotic killers all across the country, Phil Cassidy. Our story tonight is unmistakably an American one. From alleged service in Vietnam and Nicaragua, to an upbringing surrounded by alcohol, violence, and suggestive taboos, to becoming the most emblematic type of capitalist to ever grace this fine nation, a gun salesman. Phil Cassidy was likely born in Vice City, Florida, sometime in the early to mid-1950s, though records on his date of birth could not be obtained during our investigations. Exactly where in the city he grew up isn't known for certain, though it seems highly likely that it was in the trailer park of Little Havana that his sister Louise Cassidy would remain in for most of her life. Wherever it was that the Cassidy siblings were raised, it was hardly with much sensitivity or care. From a young age, presumably, Phil would be beaten by his alcoholic father, most often, when Phil was caught ogling his sister, or one of what was likely many cousins who may have grown up in the very same trailer park. His father's anger would to some extent traumatize Phil, who constantly sought love and approval from the elder Cassidy, despite never receiving it. What became of Phil's parents, or for that matter, what his mother's role was in his or Louise's upbringing is unknown. What is known, though, is that by what was probably his early to mid-twenties, he would attempt to enlist in the army, and find purpose in his aimless existence up to that point. 
depending on one's perspective, what happened next could be considered a strike of uncharacteristic luck, or the final nail in the coffin of Phil's hope to stay on the straight and narrow. Possibly already an alcoholic, though it's unclear when exactly he picked up this habit that he borrowed from his father, Phil would be accepted into the army, but assigned to serve in the Catering Corps. Though exactly what his detail entailed isn't known, we here at Weasel are confident in making some educated guesses. We believe that Phil had at some point become a competent cook, further evidenced by his knack for brewing near-industrial-strength moonshine himself. Using his culinary skill, he became a cook for the army, possibly alongside another equally boisterous man who once claimed to have served with Phil in Nicaragua, Ray Machowski. If one takes Phil at his word, he may have also served, and we do literally mean serve, in Vietnam. He had at times claimed to know soldiers and veterans all across the Corps, and according to him, was responsible for dozens of wartime kills against communist enemies of America. In reality, it seems far more likely that Phil was only ever a cook for the real soldiers, and that his tendency to drunkenly boast about his wartime accomplishments was nothing more than an extension of his need to be accepted by his father. One can never truly know. It was hell up on that ridge. We had bogeys everywhere, and ammunition was running out real fast. I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't tell what was going to happen, so I said to myself, Phil, I said, because my name is Phil Cassidy. They don't award Purple Hearts to liberal pinkos. Do what your grandpappy did. Shoot everything that moves. I am proud to say I killed everyone there. I'm Jenny Mitchell with MeTV News. And now for, uh, and what is it? Now for a patriotism report. MeTV has learned of some shocking news that our government is failing to look after veterans properly. In a move that will shock millions, people sent off to die by this country are now being denied pensions and adequate training. Inevitably, some veterans are turning to drugs and crime or worse. We spoke to one prominent veteran, Phil Cassidy, who served with distinction in several wars, who said, quote, I love my country. I love her like a woman. I've made love to my country. I fought and killed innocent people for my country, and I'd do it again if they'd let me. But since I left, it's been hell. No one wants to hire a man with a dishonorable discharge from the catering corps. I've done some bad things. I know I have, but God damn it, it was fun, unquote. Then Cassidy fell over and began crying. I'm Jenny Mitchell, MeTV News. Whether or not Phil truly saw action in any capacity remains unknown, but one thing that cannot be denied is his obsession with another American pastime, guns. Introduced to them by his family or perhaps his army buddies, Cassidy would at some point develop not only an interest in firearms of all shapes and sizes, but also a particular skill in shooting ranges around the city. According to Phil, this skill was a product of his time in the army, but many, including our own investigative team here at Weasel, believe that it was acquired more naturally, and that it was his drunken foolhardiness, not his lack of skill, that kept him from serving the country the way he wanted to. By 1984, Phil, now dishonorably discharged from the army, would move into an apartment in Viceport, not too far from his sister, now married to one Marty Williams, and still living in the trailer park. Knowing little else besides booze and guns, he would quickly take to selling weapons like a, well, a redneck to selling weapons. Phil would become fairly well known among illegal gun runners operating in and around Vice City quickly. He would attract the attention of Mexican-American gang, the Cholos, who sought to control all arms trading in the region meaning Phil's operation had to go. Being a man who more often is too drunk to fight off dozens of armed thugs like some of the subjects we've examined here on this series, Phil would quite easily be muscled out of his Viceport apartment and forced to begin living at his warehouse nearby instead, even losing a payment owed to one of his new contacts after sashing it under the apartment's floorboards. This new contact would be corrupt Army Sergeant Jerry Martinez out of Fort Baxter, who would sell weapons to Phil, presumably on the cheap, in order for both to make a neat profit. When his payment is late due to the Cholos evicting Phil, Jerry would send a fresh recruit primed for indoctrination to collect the payment and unintentionally set Phil on a collision course with tragedy. You must be Vic. Jerry told me about you. Hey, I used to be in the service. Yeah, listen. He said you'd have some money for me. Sure, sure. Well, I ain't a bank. I don't have it on me, but I'll take you to it. 
I've been having trouble with them cholo boys. Some of them have What the hell is a cholo? Bunch of Mexican gangbangers, bad boys, trying to take over all the gun running in town. Look, where's the money, Phil? Yeah, well, funny thing, you see, it's like this. It's under the floorboards of my old place. But the cholo evicted me, and now I can't get to it. I'll get to it. He would see Vic again when Jerry Martinez ordered Phil to hand over a brand new Red Stinger sports car as a gift, which Martinez had Phil stash at his old apartment, now Victor's. Unbeknownst to Phil, Martinez had ulterior motives for giving the car to Vic, and not long after, Phil's new best friend would also be dishonorably discharged from service at Fort Baxter, when Vic's usefulness to Martinez is overruled by his own sense of self-preservation. Hey Vic, how you doing? Martinez wanted me to give you this. Don't worry, it's non traceable Don't worry! Man, I'm getting too deep into this shit. After being put back into the good graces of Martinez, thanks to Vic's help, Phil would quickly become good friends with his fellow servicemen. Again working on orders from Martinez, Vic would help Phil to regain control of the gun running in Viceport by taking the fight to his main enemies in the Cholos. Phil, where are you? Phil, it's me, Vic! Oh. Put your hands where I can see him, boy. You think you can come here and rob me? Probably try to rape me? <laughs> I know you're kind. Phil, it's me, Vic, your brother in arms. I'm gonna teach you a lesson. Lower your pants and prepare to cry. I'm gonna give you a shotgun suppository. Whoa! <laughs> Phil! It's me, oh, Vic. Oh my. Vic Vance. Vic! Why didn't you say so? Good to see you, brother. Come here. <clears throat> Let me squeeze a fart out of you. Oh, I'm sorry about Bruce, man. He was the best. Hey, I can still see the smile on his face when he shot that little gook. Bang. <coughs> Go to hell. Damn. Have you been drinking? What do you think? Listen, we gotta go. I got something to show you. Come on. Come on. Come on, now. Hold on. You're gonna drive? <laughs> Phil would drag Vic all across town, attempting to track down a group of cholos, and in the process give Victor his first glimpse at the extent of organized crime and vice. <laughs> oh, nothing. Felt for sure some cholo would be here. Those scumbags are always crossing the law. Let's not hang around here, Vic. Cops make me nervous. I hear you, man. Sometimes I skits out and kill a lot of them. Say, I know another place those damn cholos might be. When the two eventually caught the trail of a gang member leaving the hospital in Little Havana, they would give pursuit, and Phil would demonstrate to Vic just how deadly he could be. Cholo bastard! There he is! Cholo bastard! Though Phil had temporarily beaten back the Cholo menace, thinking he'd established himself as a runner not to be trifled with, Phil would quickly learn his enemy was not about to give up without a fight. Through unknown means, Phil would learn of an attack planned on his moonshine stash, and find himself too drunk or too distraught to try and prevent it. Now united with his fellow dishonorably discharged, Phil would receive a welcome helping hand. No booze left behind. <sighs> Phil! What's going on? You're a mess. I'm not drunk. I'm just resting my eyes. Okay. So, what's going on? My boom shines. Uh, about to get blown sky high by a bunch of angry scumbags. Hey, damn it. Mm. What? Yeah. Them cholos are gonna blow up my liquor. There's so much of it at the warehouse, one match, blow it all the way to Tennessee. Tennessee, here I come. <laughs> Phil, come on, let's deal with it. <laughs> the thing is, Vicky boy, my daddy was an angry man. He never ever told me I was special. In fact, he used to beat me, especially when he caught me staring at my cousin or my sister. You know what he said to me? 
He said I'd be better off dead. And how exactly is this helping? Uh, <clears throat> the tragedy of it is, I'm just like him. I am a drunk. <clears throat> I deserve to die. It should have been me instead of Zach on Hill 491, man. I'm coming home, Daddy! <laughs> yeah, Daddy, I'm coming home! You're pathetic. Thanks to Vic's quick action with a forklift, the two would manage to save most of his moonshine from the complete destruction of the warehouse. But a close call with defeat, and arguably death, wouldn't deter Cassidy from his dangerous obsession with the sinister concoction. I could have sworn I locked this place up. Phil, don't open the... Daddy! Scheming cholo bastard body trapped my place. Ain't no use running. When that boom shine blows, we're all gonna die. Get a grip! I'll get your damn liquor. I'll back the truck up to the door. You load her up. If Phil's near constant state of drunkenness wasn't enough, he would also partake in smoking marijuana with some regularity when hanging out with Jerry Martinez. Still technically working for Martinez, Phil would be obligated to once again accompany Victor in acquiring a shipment of guns being moved around the city that Jerry knew about thanks to his position as a sergeant. Hey, look who it is, Victor Vance. What's going on, amigo? You want some smoke? Fuck you, Martinez. Relax. You're so fucking histrionic. It's like hanging out with a bitch on her period. You want me to fuck you up? Whatever, baby. The thing is, you work for Phil. And Phil, Phil works for me, which makes you my bitch's bitch. Figure that out. <coughs> Man, this shit is heavy. So you had better play nice if you want to get paid, huh? Because if you don't get paid, then who's gonna look after your sick brother? Fuck you! <laughs> hey, change the record, baby! Fuck you! Fuck you! Fuck you! What did you expect me to do, huh? I didn't screw you over for fun. I was saving myself, and you would do the same, and don't pretend otherwise. I had a career! So what? You got kicked out of the army! Big deal. Hey, I told Phil about some guns I can sell if you can get them. Hmm? Hey, Phil, don't smoke too much of this shit, huh? It'll make you trip out. Get paranoid. Sure. Later, Jerry. Come on, Vic. This should silence any asshole following me. After getting back up to ensure that the job went smoothly, Phil, Vic, and his two hired guns would assault the military truck en route to its destination and steal the vehicle for themselves. It may not have been easy work, but it seemed the two army rejects had found a rhythm in their new criminal lifestyles, but nothing lasts forever. One night, while particularly drunk, Phil would accidentally spill to Martinez that he was having trust concerns following Vic's dismissal due to Jerry's deceit. Despite being told that the ramblings had been forgotten, Jerry would show up at Phil's warehouse not long after with one final job for him and Victor, to call them even for Phil's insubordination. Phil, baby, would I screw you over? Yeah, you would. Bullshit! I wouldn't! Not to you, not to a brother in arms. Come on, give me a hug. Ah, screw you over. Nah, you'd never screw anyone over, would you? Oh, look who it is. Saint Victor of Vance, the holier-than-thou killer. All these principles, you go around shooting people. <laughs> I do what I gotta do. Ooh. After I trusted an asshole. You enjoyed it, brother. Admit it, because you're a maniac, huh? I gave you a life. Go to hell, Martinez. Uh -huh. See, Phil, I saved Vic, and I can save you too. Huh? What does this scumbag want? He wants me to go over to some warehouse and see if his merchandise is all there. That's all. Hey, it's cool. Go with him, Vicky boy, if you don't trust me. But Phil, you owe me after what you said. You said that was forgotten. If you do this, I'll explain as we drive, Vic. It was time for me to get another drink. Phil and Vic would continue to do as instructed and walk straight into a trap engineered by Martinez. It seemed the two former army boys had finally worn out their usefulness. Who the hell are these guys? 
Hey, fellas, Martinez said... Yeah, Martinez said bye-bye. Hot damn! Play fair, fellas. What about the damn Geneva Convention? With no other options, Phil would begin to lay low, while the more proactive of the two went about evening the score with their former employer. He would even promise to Victor that he would remain sober, with his sobering brush with death reminding him of his own fragile mortality. I think we've both outgrown our usefulness to Martinez. Sure he wants us dead? Shit, an asshole, I'm gonna lay low for a while. I reckon you should too. Screw that! I ain't hiding from that piece of shit. Remember, discretion's the better part of valor. Good luck, soldier. Presumably returning to the gun-running trade and making new contacts to replace Jerry, Phil would continue operating at a vice port, while Victor ran around Vice City making a name for himself and consequently making powerful enemies. Phil would put Vic in contact with his brother-in-law, Marty Williams, who was always looking for new muscle to protect his business assets. Through Marty, Vic would meet Phil's sister Louise, and the two would develop a bond, which eventually saw Vic kill Marty outright and become Louise's partner in business and romance. When Victor is eventually joined by his troublemaker brother Lance, and the two end up stealing an enormous shipment of coke from Jerry Martinez, they would draw the ire of the powerful Mendez cartel, and eventually, Phil's services would once again be called upon. Having no shortage of reasons to help his old buddy, Phil would rush to the Vance brothers' aid, and help them to maintain control of their growing empire. Comrade! Come here! What are you doing here? I heard there's gonna be a party, so I brought fireworks! Where's Lance? I love that guy! Yeah! There he is! <laughs> Mr. Victor Vance, the punk who needs our help. What? You grown any cojones yet, lady boy? Yo, bro! <laughs> Come here, Vic. Ah, <laughs> uh, what's up, man? Your brother, man. <laughs> At least one of you has something out here, and a lot down here. Hey, huh? <laughs> so if you guys are ready, let's do this. Hey, Lance. Come here, man. Yo, bro, what's up? What the hell's going on? We're about to get hit by those Mendez guys. Thought we could use some of your buddies to crash the party. What? Help out! What, did I do wrong again? No, 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 man. For once, you did very right. Let's go deal with these pricks. Yeah! Let's pop! <laughs> Despite his best efforts to turn the tide of Victor and Lance's war against the Mendezes, eventually, a tragedy would befall the Cassidy clan that Phil could not possibly have planned for. Due to her connection with Victor, Louise would twice become a target of Vic's many enemies. Though her first kidnapping at the hands of Jerry Martinez had been thwarted thanks to Vic, the second time, she would not be so lucky. In the chaotic fighting between the Vance crime empire and the Mendez cartel, Louise Cassidy Williams would become yet another casualty, after being kidnapped by Mendez goons, and presumably tortured at the Mendez estate. Vic would attempt to reach her in time, but arrive just moments too late to save her. Uh, Louise! Uh, hey, Vic. You came for me. <laughs> no one ever really did much for me before. That's sweet of you. Hey, hey, come on. Let's, let's get you to a hospital. I don't think there's much point in that. Come on, Louise. We could have had something special. Yeah. No, we did have something special. Make sure Mary Jo takes care of my baby. <laughs> oh, Louise. Louise. <sighs> Phil would eventually learn the news and consequently break his promise to quit drinking returning to the bottle for some inkling of comfort. When Phil was eventually approached by Victor, who had already killed Armando Mendez, and now had his sights set on Diego and Martinez, he would jump at the chance to avenge his fallen sister. Phil, I don't know what to say. I'm going after Diego Mendez. I wouldn't ask for help if I didn't need it, but I need it. There's an attack copter up at the base. If I can get hold of it. You need a decoy. 
Then I got all the decoy you're gonna need. With drunken passion, Phil would help Victor to break into Fort Baxter to obtain a hunter attack helicopter, which Victor proceeded to use when confronting the pair's enemies downtown. I, 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 uh, I, I can't believe she's gone. Sorry, Vic. She was a good soldier. Uh, a, a good sister, I mean. Though Phil would be too inebriated to join the fighting himself, he would rest after a long year of twists and turns, satisfied that he'd done his part to make up for his many, many mistakes. You're not gonna do anything stupid, are you, man? We're breaking into a military base and I'm drunk. What could be more stupid? Don't worry about me. Don't worry about me. Louis! Following Victor's assault on the Mendez building and the death of both Diego and Martinez, Phil would move his operation into a junkyard in Little Haiti, a former site of Victor's empire, which was now being slowly dismantled. Phil would repurpose the lot into his own redneck compound and continue brewing his signature moonshine. At some point, he would even lose sight in one of his eyes, from his constant inhaling of the noxious fumes, but this hardly seemed to deter the man from his lethal habit. His gun-running operation having seen better days, Phil would begin collecting disability from the government at some point between 1984 and 1986. We believe, as he did, fraudulently. Though, given that we also do not know when Phil completely lost sight in his eye, this may have been the case initially, even if much later, it was most certainly not. Two years later, after the loss of his sister, Phil would still be living out of Little Haiti and selling heavy weapons to a discreet customer base, when he wasn't busy testing his own weapons down at a local gun range. Though perhaps unaware of the death of his old friend Victor earlier that year, he would be approached by a man present for Victor's murder, and ironically, the new contestant for replacing the Vance brothers as kings of the city's drug trade. When Tommy Versetti, former Leone thug known in Liberty State as the infamous Harwood Butcher, arrived in Vice in 1986 to set up shop for his employers, the Ferrelli family, he would instead opt to establish himself as the new King of Coke for Florida. In what was perhaps simply an attempt to increase his already rapidly rising notoriety, or just a move to make some quick cash, Versetti would approach Phil with the offer of a job, on recommendation from safecracker Cam Jones. Well, the best shooter in this town is a guy named Cassidy. Is that so? Yeah, a military guy, or thinks he is. I doubt he was ever in the army, but he certainly knows how to get a hold of guns. He'll be down at the shooting range. Not looking to work for someone more incompetent than himself, Phil would challenge Versetti to show him his own skills with a firearm, and be impressed enough to join his growing crew of miscreants and eccentrics. You Phil Cassidy? Why? I'm looking for a man who can handle a gun. In this setup, I'm not too convinced. Son, I can shoot a fly off your head at 80 feet. Oh, really? Yeah, I learned it in the Army. Fly shooting real popular in the Army? Glad I don't pay tax. You trying to be funny, kid? <laughs> the shoot! Being fully on board for the robbery, Phil would help Tommy to locate a driver for the job by recommending the neurotic but highly skilled Hillary King. And with King's joining, the crew would be ready to take on their final task. Things are starting to come together nicely here. The four men would travel together by taxi to El Banco Corrupto Grande in Little Havana, and after sending Hillary to find a hiding place and donning their own disguises, prepare to assault the building. Tommy and crew would burst onto the scene in dramatic fashion, and Phil would immediately take crowd control keeping the concerned customers level-headed while Tommy and Cam went to open the safe upstairs. This is a raid! <laughs> Nobody move! <laughs> Everybody up against that wall! Phil, hold down the fort. Wilco, roger that! Bye, Cam, the vault's upstairs. Despite his best efforts, Phil would be forced to kill one of the crowd when a panic button is pressed, and the group would be forced to work twice as fast, with VCPD SWAT teams on their way. I told you not to touch that alarm! Against all odds, three out of the four men, including Phil, would escape the scene unharmed, 
and much wealthier than just hours prior. They're crapping themselves! Corrupt bastards! Tommy! The vault's open! Okay, we got the SWAT retirement fund. Let's get out of here. Okay, you asked for it. You had your last chance. They're storming the place! Take cover! Death! Where's Hillary? I'll give him a better issue. Hey guys! Hey, get in! I got you covered! Following their successful robbery of El Banco Corrupto Grande, Phil would become endeared to Tommy, perhaps seeing something similar in him that he'd seen in Victor Vance two years prior. Whatever the case, Phil would invite Tommy to his compound to not only bond over their shared victory, but to continue expanding their business relationship. Phil! Run! Run! Never get a naked play too close to where the Phil Cassidy's moonshine still. Shit, Phil. Did uh, you drink that stuff? The hell, you don't have to drink it. Just a good whiff will set you off. Ah, we Listen, Phil, you said you could fix me up with some firepower. Sure thing. There's some Mexican gun runner. Been doing me for business of late. He does his weekly run about now. Hey. Ram his hardware off the back of his trucks before he goes to ground. And you'd be doing me a favor while you're at it. Then finish him up. With Tommy's help, Phil would re-establish his gun-running operation as the go-to for military-grade weapons all across the city. And it seemed for a time, Phil was back on top and ready to kick ass and take names once more. Unfortunately for Phil, the specter of his father's abuse in the form of his crippling alcohol addiction would return once more to haunt him this time, leave a very permanent scar. Hey, Phil. How's it going? Hey, Tommy! How you doing? This bit too long. I swear you should lay off that boom shine, man. It smells like paint stripper. It's making my eyes burn. Shh, 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 Tommy. Hey, come over here because there's something I want to show you. Something. Oof, God, should I be able to smell that from way over here? Don't like, you worry about the Phil, smell. Oof. You just watch this. Shitty, cheap, bad news or something. There's some more on the bench. Ta da! Oh, damn! <laughs> In a violent explosion, Phil would completely sever his left arm from the bone, and forever be known as One-Armed Phil. We attempted to film this interaction using our traditional actors, however, the stunt double we hired was incredibly incompetent, and subsequently blew off his right arm instead. Rest assured, in all our other investigations, there could be little doubt that Phil lost his left arm and not his right, so please, do not get confused. With help from his new friend, Tommy Versetti, who luckily happened to be present when Phil nearly killed himself, Phil would make a full recovery and even returned to both gun running and putting in time at the firing range, presumably learning to fire all weapons from the hip. Sometime between 1986 and 1998, Phil would finally decide that he'd had enough of Florida, and move to the dreary streets of the worst place in America, Liberty City. He would establish a legitimate gun shop in Staunton Island's Bedford Point, selling legal weapons to the average American housewife, whilst continuing to make illicit deals on the side. In fact, it seems entirely likely that even by this point, Phil's entire inventory, or at least large sections of it, came from his deals with groups like the Torrington-based Yakuza under Kazuki Kassan, and perhaps many others. He would even meet one of Liberty's most notorious residents at least once in 1998, Tony Cipriani, when receiving a shipment from the wise guy who'd formed an alliance of convenience with Kazuki's estranged wife, Toshiko. <laughs> You know, I do so much business at these docks, I should have set myself up here, not halfway down that goddamn island. Well, been a blast. By 2001, Phil would do just what he said he would, and move his entire gun-running operation to the docks in Rockford, at the former site of the Staunton Island Ferry Terminal. 
With seemingly increased success exporting his goods, Phil would comfortably settle into his niche as old age began to catch up with him, and likely believe his fighting days were far behind him. He would need to make one last stand it seemed, however, as that year he would be attacked by a group of Colombians during their push for further control over the city's various illegal operations, and on recommendation by his old war buddy, Ray Machowski, be forced to hire local gun for hire Claude to help him defend his entire base from subsequent attacks. Hey Jack, over here! An old army buddy of mine runs a business in Rockford. We saw action in Nicaragua back when the country knew what it was doing. Anyway, some cartel scum roughed him up yesterday. Said he'd be back for some of his stock today. He's gonna need backup, and in return, I'll give you a knockdown rates on any hardware you buy. I go myself, but the old sciatic is playing up. <laughs> so, uh, hmm. good luck. Great phone to head, but I thought there'd be more of you. Can't believe those yellow belly bastards left me without proper cover again. Well, three arms are better than one, so grab whatever you need. Those Colombians will be here any minute. After fighting off the Colombians, Phil would begin regularly supplying Claude with heavy artillery for a time, and may have therefore played a substantial role in the Reaper Man eventually dismantling the cartel's new leadership when he took revenge on their leader, who also happened to be his ex-girlfriend. Hey, if I teamed up with you, Nick Robert, maybe I'd still have my arm. If you need any firepower, just drop by and take what you need from the lockers. Leave the cash under the bench. Get out of here. I'll handle the cops. For Phil, the fighting was finally done. But one final challenge lay ahead of him, and one he is probably still tackling to this day. Franchising. Very little is known about the whereabouts of Mr. Cassidy today, or whether he's even still alive. But we do know that by 2003, Phil had expanded his legitimate gun-selling operation, at least as far as the Midwest's Carcer City, proving that with a little elbow grease and a whole lot of moonshine, anyone can make it in America, even if you only have one arm, or something like that. Phil Cassidy was a man plagued by numerous demons. Childhood abuse, horrible role models, alcoholism and poverty all characterized his early life, and most of his adulthood. Though Phil was never known to have adopted his father's tendency to abuse children, especially seeing as Cassidy was never known to have had children himself. Though Phil could be said to have been dealt a rough hand, he sought to make the most of the bad situations he often found himself in when possible, even if to him, that meant getting absolutely and completely shit-faced. This tendency to mask all pain with the stench of alcoholism, stemming almost certainly from his father, stayed with Phil for many decades, though it seems at least possible that following the loss of his arm in a freak moonshine accident, he sobered up, as he was not known for being a drunk whilst living in Liberty City. Phil was a loyal man who cared deeply for his friends and family, but whose own shortcomings as a failed soldier and an arguably hopeless drunk frequently interfered with his ability to be useful. When it came to helping himself, Phil could be said to be helpless, at least for many years but when it came to helping others, he would always step up to the occasion and do what needed to be done to help the people he cared about. In fact, as a byproduct of his frequent inebriation, Phil was often overly emotional and expressed his appreciation for his friends in drunken ramblings on more than one occasion. Despite these things, Phil was in turn loved by many, including his sister, though the two were never especially close, perhaps due to his own strange proclivities, but most importantly to a man like him, his many friends. Phil Cassidy was also a far smarter man than most have given him credit for, held back from his own ambitious goals due to heaps of psychological baggage. The man was nonetheless a savvy and incredibly effective entrepreneur. Having successfully sold his brand of heavy artillery for years on the black market, he remains one of the few people we will ever examine on this program to go from below-board criminal to legitimate American businessman. From Phil Cassidy's fully cocked gun shop to Cassidy's bargain firearms emporium in Carcer City, Phil established his brand and made his biggest passion his source of income for the majority of his life. Whether by blood or by sweat, or maybe a bit of both, one can never say that Phil Cassidy didn't work to get where he got. Despite all of this seeming praise in comparison to your average GTAB subject, we must also emphasize that Phil Cassidy, like all men with a criminal history long enough to wind up on this show, was a murderer, a lunatic, and possibly a war criminal. Though his own word is hard to take at face value concerning his actions in Vietnam or Nicaragua, it's clear that the man was responsible both directly and indirectly for the deaths of many dozens of people, even if one discounts his role as a noblesque salesman of death. 
At the end of the day, Phil Cassidy is an example of just how easy it is for this nation to morph an otherwise model citizen into a common criminal, prepared to defraud his government and sell guns to the people. What could be more American? While Phil Cassidy's criminal record remains technically blank, seeing as he was never apprehended for his crimes or formally charged as far as we were able to find, we here at Weasel nonetheless always strive to bring you the truth, with only a little bit of corporate spin. Thanks to our investigative team, we have managed to compile what we believe is a fairly comprehensive list of possible or alleged crimes that Mr. Cassidy could have been charged for, but likely never will be. Starting with, possible war crimes in Vietnam or Nicaragua, or both. Gun running in the early 1980s. Illegally brewing moonshine. Conspiracy accessory murder when putting Vic onto a group of cholos holding his apartment. Accessory to prostitution when giving Vic a sports car to pick up one of Martinez's girls. Conspiracy accessory murder when performing a drive-by on some cholos with Vic Vance. Illegally storing moonshine at a warehouse. Conspiracy accessory murder, accessory grand theft auto, and gun running when attacking an army truck for Jerry Martinez. Accessory murder when killing the attackers hired by Jerry Martinez. Numerous murders when defending Vic Vance's crime empire during an attack by the Mendez cartel. Conspiracy accessory murder, destruction of government property, and drunk driving when helping Victor to break into Fort Baxter and steal a hunter attack helicopter. Conspiracy to commit bank robbery while being recruited by Tommy Versetti, and later when recruiting Hillary King for the team. Armed robbery, conspiracy accessory murder, murder, and evading authorities when robbing El Banco Prepto Grande in Little Havana. Gun running and conspiracy accessory murder when hiring Tommy Versetti to take out one of his rivals and steal their weapons. Illegally brewing moonshine when accidentally blowing off his left arm. Gun running when receiving a stolen shipment of weapons from Tony Cipriani courtesy of Toshiko Kassan. Accessory murder and gun running when fighting off Colombians with Claude and selling him weapons. As we said, Phil was never actually charged with any crime. So as far as the law is concerned, these crimes will remain unpunished. It's hard to say if Mr. Cassidy will even respond to such accusations, saying as most of his customer base is likely either not at all shocked by these revelations, or enthusiastically on the man's side. Whatever the case, Phil Cassidy serves as a perfect tale of American exceptionalism, from abused alcoholic bank robber to successful and presumably respected veteran gun salesman. If ever there was a true American hero, well, it certainly wasn't Phil but try telling that to his many well-armed supporters. What leads a man down the road of illegal firearms dealing? Is it simply the abundance of death on every news station, billboard, and TV show you consume daily? Or is it perhaps simply the inevitable result of a good seed gone bad? We aren't here to say, my dear viewer, but one thing we can say with confidence is that America is a dangerous place. Stay indoors, people, but not before running out and purchasing a fully functional minigun from your nearest gun shop and mounting it to your roof to ensure your neighbors know you mean business. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching. America. The land of the free. Home of the brave. And the stupid. And the criminally insane. This is America! The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on Grand Theft Auto Biographies. Love, loyalty, and family. 
Tonight, for the first time on GTA Biographies, we will be breaking out of the tradition of covering just one notorious criminal, and instead follow the known histories of two different people whose criminal stories are inextricably linked. We will follow a pair of lovers who defied cultural expectations of their respective gang lives to find solace in each other's embrace, and their journey from the hard knock streets of gangland Los Santos to the tight vertical hills of San Fierro and the glowing light of Las Venturas, and back again. We will see friendships bloom, families tested, and a city brought to its knees in violence as we examine the lives of Kendall Johnson and Cesar Villalpando. The early lives of both Caesar and Kendall could be said to be similar in many ways. Born and raised in the gang territory of the Grove Street families for Kendall and the Varios Los Aztecas for Caesar, respectively, would force them both into a life of witnessing and sometimes even participating in crime. Despite having stronger ties to her own gang, Kendall would be far less involved in gang dealings growing up, as far as we are aware. Whilst Caesar, we believe, would join up with men like Jose from an early age and be more actively involved in the gang's less than legal activities. We must emphasize that for much of their early lives, little is known, with slightly more information existing on Kendall Johnson thanks to her infamous brother Carl, while Caesar's childhood remains shrouded in mystery. Kendall would grow up in Ganton on Grove Street, and as the sister to the Grove Street gang's leader, Sean Sweet Johnson, she would be no stranger to violence, or even death. Her family's connection with gang crime would lead to the death of her brother, Brian Johnson, according to some, due to the inaction on the part of Carl, but it remains unclear exactly how he played a role in his death. Whatever the case, Brian's death would put a hole in the Johnson family, and Kendall would be forced to watch her remaining brother's relationship fracture, ending in Carl leaving the city out of guilt to live in Liberty City. Meanwhile, Caesar's life, growing up presumably in El Corona and the heart of Azteca territory, is largely unknown. Some believe that Caesar was actively involved in gang activity long before meeting Kendall or Carl, and we here at Weasel tend to agree, though we must state once again, this is mostly conjecture. What we do know is that by the time Caesar was in his mid-twenties, presumably, in the early 1990s, he had become a competent, respected, and well-known racer in the lowrider circles around the city. Having a particular love for cars and modifying their hydraulics for elaborate and boisterous competitions, Caesar would find himself right at home in a city like Los Santos. Los Santos, 1992. A city unknowingly mere months away from chaotic riots that would nearly tear it apart. For now, though, things were calm enough for gangsters anyway. Unbeknownst to the gangsters of Grove Street and certainly El Corona, a conspiracy of police officers operating in the city's crash unit and members high up in the Grove's hierarchy would set in motion events that would forever change the lives of both Caesar and especially Kendall. Before all that, however, the two lovebirds would meet and begin dating at some unknown point, likely prior to 1992. It isn't known exactly when, but given that the two had presumably not yet met at the time of Carl Johnson's departure in 1987, it seems logical to assume their relationship began sometime in that five-year period. Whenever it was, their coupling would displease Kendall's older brother and head of the Grove Street family, Sweet, who viewed Kendall's dating outside of the neighborhood and especially with a rival gang member in a less than enthusiastic light. When Sweet refuses to cooperate with hard drug-pushing elements within his own gang and beyond, he would draw the ire of the corrupt officers in Crash, and eventually be targeted for assassination. When the hit is botched and the Johnson matriarch Beverly is killed instead of Sweet, Kendall would be beside herself with grief, attempting to rush in and save her mother, but being stopped by Sweet who wanted to keep the grisly scene from his little sister. Immediately, Sweet would phone their remaining sibling Carl, C.J. Johnson, and ask him to return home for the funeral. After five years living on the East Coast, it was time to go home for Carl Johnson, but the reuniting of the Johnson clan couldn't have come under worse circumstances. Happy to see her brother once again, but tired of dealing with Sweet's prejudice, Kendall would leave the funeral following an argument to spend time with Caesar and get away from the toxic environment which led to her mother's death. I miss you these five years, man. They're gonna be real happy to see you. Hey, what's up, y'all? Look who I found hanging around. Carl, hey! Good to see you. I came 
can't believe she gone, man. That's another funeral you ran away from, fool. Just like Brian's. Hey, she was my mama too. Not for the past five years she wasn't, nigga. And where the fuck you think you going? What? Get out my face. I'm going to see Caesar. The hell you are, girl. You ain't messing with them essays. You know we beefed it. They ain't nothing but a no, bunch of low lives. Women. What the fuck are you? At least I got Prince. Oh, and I guess that makes you an upstanding American. Carl, tell him. Carl, don't tell me shit, As long bitch. as he treat her right, disrespect you, and he dead. How the hell you gonna say that? Like it's any business of yours. Fuck you, sweet. Oh, shit. Asshole. Here we go again. This shit's real fucked up. Everything. I'm tired of you not listening to me, girl. And I'm tired of you acting like you own me. I can see who I want to see. It just ain't right you seeing some cello motherfucker. Oh, what? A no good, narrow minded, hypocrite gangbanger telling me what is right and what is wrong? Let me guess, sweet. Senseless killing right, but a boyfriend from the South Side wrong? Some things ain't just meant to happen. I mean, what if y'all have kids? Leroy Hernandez? That don't sound His good, girl. His name ain't Hernandez. Well, Leroy Lopez is. Leroy Lopez either, you racist fuck. That ain't how moms raised us. I ain't racist. I just know how they feel about you. And look at you. You dress like a hooker. Oh, and I guess you two would know what a hooker look like, huh? You say it like it's a bad thing. Shut, Shut up, Carl. Carl. I'm just trying to protect you. For what? So I can date one of your mindless friends? I don't think so. Don't say a word, Carl. Just follow your sister before you see another dead sibling. Then you know exactly what my problem is. She's meeting him at some cholo car club. Eventually, CJ would be given a formal introduction to Caesar when Sweet's distrust reached a boiling point. Overly protective of his little sister, and perhaps even more so following the death of their mother, Sweet would attempt to discourage Kendall from dating a rival gang member to the Grove Street families, but the younger CJ would be less intrusive on his sister's personal life, but would take the cue from Sweet to keep Kendall safe and follow her to a lowrider competition at Unity Station, where Caesar and the rest of his Varios Los Aztecas gangsters often hung out. Though initially distrustful like Sweet, it wouldn't take long for CJ to become fond of Caesar, and the two would even develop a close friendship over time. After their first introduction, the two would next see Carl Johnson when Caesar invited CJ to participate in the city's underground racing circuits, primarily lowrider races. Hey, CJ, you made it. What's the business? Hey, Carl. Hey, baby. Nice ride, man. That's no carucha. You sure you want to risk that, baby? Yeah, I'm sure. How much they talking about? It's our cash, your pink slip in the pot. Con San Jose. Then you pull up and race. The first pass the post wins. Con Chota sin Chota. Okay, for sure. I'm down. Hey, watch us, CJ. These boys don't like to lose, eh? Yeah, well, me either. Follow me to the race, dude. Already a natural street racer, Carl would take to the scene with ease and participate in several more races around Los Santos at Caesar's suggestion. Hey, who is this? What's up, homie? It's Caesar Villalpando, cabrón. Que onda? You seen Kendall? Yeah, she's around, pero mira, I was just hitting you up to say that you drive good. And you like cars, eh? So, uh... Yeah, I guess. We'll be going with this. Well, you wanna make something, a little money? Does the Pope shit in the woods? I don't know, but if you do want a little extra, there's plenty of money to be made racing. You talking illegal street racing? Hell yeah! No hoop these homes, just low riders. Nice ones. It gotta be nice if you don't get in, eh? Okay, I'm in. When and where? Drop by the spot in El Corona. I'll take you to the meet. Vouch for you. These guys, these guys can be very nervous with the new racers, eh? Check with Judy on that. While CJ ran around Los Santos attempting to repair a fractured Grove Street gang, Caesar and Kendall would keep mostly to themselves and out of the affairs of the Grove. Being a gangbanger himself, however, Caesar was still partial to hearing about the various goings-on in the city's darker corners. One such rumor that would reach Villalpando's ears would regard the conspiracy we alluded to earlier. When Caesar hears through the grapevine that Grove Street Lieutenant Melvin Harris, aka Big Smoke, was allied with the corrupt crash division of the LSPD, he would begin investigating and uncover some uncomfortable truths in the process. After catching Smoke in a meeting with his crash allies Frank Tenpenny and Eddie Pulaski, he would immediately phone CJ to warn him of the treachery afoot in his gang. Hey! Hey, CJ, it's Caesar, man. I'm kinda busy now, something big going down. Hey, see, I gotta see you, Holmes. Tell you something. 
Look, if it's about Kendall, don't worry. We cool, all right? No, Caesar, you gotta come and see something. Something important, eh? Well, it's gonna have to wait. This can't wait, Holmes. If I tell you you won't believe it, it's, I swear. Ah, uh, okay. I got about five, so it better be good. Where you at? I'm under the freeway, north side of Vernon Plus. So you dragged me way across town to see what? Just in time, I see. Take a good hard look over there. So, some ballers hanging around a dope spot. So what? Just watch, homie. What the fuck? Oh, no. Shit, Smoke, what you into? Shh, that's it. Look at that ride. That's the motherfucking green saber. Shit, Smoke. Crash making you sell us out? Moms! Sorry, Issy. I heard a rumor and poked around. I didn't believe it myself, but... Nah, nah, you did the right thing. I owe you, C's. I gotta go tell Sweet about... Oh, fuck! Sweet! Look, go get Kendall and take her to a safe place. What you thinking? It's Sweet. I think him and the homies is walking into a trap. Just go. GO! Knowing that the whole Johnson family was in danger, CJ would ask Caesar to take Kendall to somewhere safe outside of the city. And being a loyal friend and protective boyfriend, Caesar would oblige, driving Kendall outside of the city limits while Carl attempted to reach Sweet in time to warn him as well. Unfortunately, CJ would be too late to save Sweet from being arrested, and he himself would be bagged by Tenpenny and Pulaski and driven out to the countryside to continue serving as a tool for the corrupted officers. Caesar, it's me. Carl, you all right, Holmes? Your sister's been worried. I heard some shit went down. Yeah, Los Santos is dangerous right now. I'm out in the middle of, I don't know, what, Whetstone or whatever that is. I don't know Whetstone too well. I got some family out there, I think. But at least you ain't in jail, Holmes. Shit's fucked up with your brother, is it? You be careful and look after Kendall. Don't worry about me, man. You worry about the man who tries to fuck with my woman. I got some backup coming out to protect you. My cousin. Really intense, Holmes. Trust me. Meet them over at the diner in Dillymore in Red County. You won't miss them. Though Carl had managed to stay out of prison due to his usefulness to crash, Sweet would not be so lucky, and would end up in a prison upstate under strict supervision. Looking for a way to free their imprisoned brother and make some cash to stay afloat, Caesar would put CJ in contact with his cousin who lived in Red County at the time, Catalina. With the cat out of the bag regarding Big Smoke's loyalties, Caesar would bring Kendall with him to Angel Pine, where CJ was staying temporarily, just to be safe. Caesar, furious at having to abandon his gang and his city due to Smoke's betrayal, would initially desire to directly pursue Smoke himself, but a level-headed CJ and Kendall would convince him to lay low, while Carl attempted to find a solution to their problems, and to simply stay out of LS for the time being, while things settled down. This ain't over, man. I did this to take care of my woman. But now I'm gonna head straight back home, and I'm gonna cap me some fucking dope dealers! Hey, look. You going to the body over with that Big Willy bullshit, and you gonna get shredded. And I ain't losing you over no macho bullshit. Hey, relax, man. It's gonna get handled when it's time. We already know who the fucking bad guys are, man. Your stinking grocery for the smoke, and those chota pigs, Ted Benny and, and Pulaski. Smoke, he's a pusher, man. No, no, not Smoke. He might mess with Crash, but he don't mess with no yay. Come on, CJ, how you think he got that new house, huh? Just let that grow for life bullshit go and take a look around you. Word on the street is twice a week. Smoke sends a car out to San Fierro and the trunk comes back full of white. Shit! I gotta keep my eye on the highway to San Fierro. Maybe I'll see something. Just, just lay low and I'll be back. Caesar and Kendall would remain in Angel Pine for a time, but being restless out in the boonies and aching for some excitement, Caesar would go looking for new opportunities outside of Los Santos. Quick enough, he would stumble onto an illegal street racing circuit composed of mainly racers out of San Fierro, and begin racing against the likes of men such as Wootsie Moo and the infamous Reaper Man Claude, who many years later would be responsible for killing Caesar's cousin. Sensing another money-making opportunity for the cash-strapped Carl, Caesar would once again ask CJ to join him in the racing circuit, and subsequently set them on the path of the next chapter in their criminal histories. Hey, Holmes, I've been busy. Caesar, what's up? I can smell Nacho's oxide from a mile off. 
racing, my friend. Cars, not beautiful cars, but fast, man, fast. What are you talking about? Street racers from San Fierro. They meet out here to tear up the blacktop. No chota, no chota choppers. You want to make some money? Does the Pope shit in the woods? Why you keep asking me that, Holmes? I told you, I don't know. What the holiness does his business is his business. Just get a fast car and meet me in Kennel just south of Montgomery. See you, man. CJ would win the race, and after performing several more errands around Whetstone and Red County, participate in one more race against Catalina and Claude for Claude's car. Not willing to give up her lover's vehicle, however, Catalina would instead give CJ the deed to Claude's old garage in Doherty, as the two would no longer need it, intending to leave the state and embark on a near decade-long string of bank robberies. Having no other options, CJ would embrace the garage and move to San Fierro, inviting Caesar and Kendall to accompany him and maybe turn the place into a real successful business. Motherfucker! That mute asshole! That fucking snake without a tongue! Gave me this shithole instead of a pink slip! I must be the biggest fucking idiot in the whole fucking world. Holmes, take it easy. At least we're alive. Girl, friend, fellow traveler, relax, man. You're really killing my fucking vibe here. Well, I'm sorry I'm fucking up your vibe, old man, but I can't wait to get my hands on that mute and your bitch-ass cousin. My cousin? You're gonna diss my familia? My bad, man. I'm just pissed for all of us. I mean, look, we in a strange place, we got shit to our name, and for once, I try to make something work, this garage, and it ain't even a garage. Then make it into a garage. Oh, that's a great idea, sis. Won't you shut up? You know what, Carl? You are a fucking idiot. Your whole life you wanted something for nothing. Now you've got something, and you don't know what to do with it. We'll make it good enough. We'll help, right? We got your back, CJ. Come on, stop tripping, man. Both of you. Whoa, man, the energy here, it's fantastic. Oh. Yeah, uh, all right. But how am I find some good mechanics to work up in here, man? I know a few guys. Come with me, friend. They're good people, I swear it. Oh, man, I'm about to ride with this fool again. With Kendall's savvy business sense, Caesar's expertise with cars, and a couple of good workers in Zero, Dwayne, and Jethro, the Doherty Garage would slowly but surely be transformed into a legitimate business. On the surface, anyways. Whilst enlisting their new team and setting up in a new city, Caesar would also put Carl onto the couriers making runs between Los Santos and San Fierro on a weekly basis, giving CJ one more opportunity to put a squeeze on Big Smoke's operation even at a distance. Hey, Caesar, what up? I got the lowdown on Smokes, yay! Where it is every Monday and Friday, the cash leaves Los Santos for San Fierro. Then every Wednesday and Saturday, a courier takes the yay back to Big Smoke. Okay, I keep an eye out for them. See if I can't spoil their little party. All right, man. Though the task of making the garage turn a profit was one Kendall was more than up to, one thing she was not prepared for, at the very least not happy to deal with, was harassment from the construction workers operating in the site surrounding the garage. After being catcalled one too many times, she would complain to CJ and Caesar for something to be done, and though Caesar was prepared to stand up for his woman, Carl insisted the job be handled by him alone, and he would employ some particularly brutal methods in serving justice. Hey, homies! What up, Carl? What the fuck is going on? Do I look like a hooker to you? What? Don't Assholes keep saying shit to me. Who said this to you? Fucking structure workers up that hill. I'ma fuck them up. Nah, hold up. I got this. I need to go teach him a little respect, huh? That's right. Yeah. I've been thinking about getting me some new land anyway. After dealing with the construction workers in a truly horrific way, CJ and his team would get to work on their new business endeavor by relaxing and playing games of cards. Dissatisfied with the work being done, Kendall would push to get the team their first real job, and thanks to the ingenuity of their tech expert, Zero, said opportunity would be right around the metaphorical corner. Read them and weep, cabron! Oh, shit! <laughs> so this is it, huh? The great new business venture that's supposed to save all of our worthless lives? You wanna get in? Look, I thought this was supposed to be our foot on the ladder. I thought we were gonna make this place work. Hey, it might look like we playing cars, but we actually planning. 
Don't worry, sweet baby. We're about to go get our first project. At last, it works. What works? Oh, just a simple bit of electronic wizardry and intellectual bombast that hacks into the state-of-the-art satellite immobilization technology on board our target vehicle. <laughs> oh, me. I don't know what he just said, but it's on. Yes, it's on. Wait, what's on? With their first successful acquisition, the Doherty team would begin ramping up their efforts to find, steal, and chop up vehicles to sell for parts, or outright resell to customers less than willing to pay top dollar at their local dealership. Hey, Carl! There's two cars on the list, they say, and they're in the showroom across town. Let's go get them! <laughs> I always admire your direct approach, huh, Bray? During the drive, Caesar would reveal his and Kendall's newfound love for the city of San Fierro to CJ as they settled into their new roles running the garage. I like this place, you know? Where? San Fierro, man. My home will always be the Varios and El Corona. But this city, it has something gentle about it. Yeah, I know what you mean. Kendall seems to like it too, you know? Oh yeah, she's really getting her head into this business thing. That's good. She always been the brains of the family. She should get out together and we'll make something of herself. I think she's aiming to make something out of all of us, eh? <laughs> yeah, she the moms of the family now. Hey, who's this truth guy, Holmes? I don't think he's wrapped too tight. He just sees everything from a different perspective, that's all. At first, I thought he was just another acid casualty fruitcake. But some of the things he say, I don't know, man. It ain't all bullshit. <laughs> Hey, you gonna become an alien hunter, Holmes? <laughs> I'll take a rain check on that one. Caesar and CJ would steal two cars, a Sultan and an Elegy, from Otto's Autos in downtown San Fierro, racing the vehicles all the way back to the garage. Can I help you two, uh, gentlemen? Yeah, you can help us by going to help some other motherfucker. Y yeah, th that sounds like a good idea. All right, CJ, it's time to roll. Just follow the leader, you better keep up. Ah, uh, you a maniac, S.A. Time after time, Caesar or Carl would bring in a new stolen vehicle, and then Zero, Dwayne, and Jethro would work to strip it or repaint it for sale. And soon enough, the garage was actually bringing in plenty of traffic. Pun intended. Caesar and CJ would even get so bold as to stake out the San Fierro docks and flat out illegally operate a transport crane to take vehicles off a stationary cargo ship. Yeah, I got it. It's in the manifold. Shit, I just changed that seal. Must have got a crimp in it. Damn. Hey, C's, your boy is here. He ain't my boy. Hey. We're almost living a normal life, huh? This is far from Grove Street, right? Yeah, I know, but I just can't get it out the back of my mind. Moms, sweet, smoke, I just can't let that go. I know. So what we gonna do about sweet? See, it's a shitty situation, but I gotta let it play out a little longer, okay? Okay, but be careful. We ain't trying to lose you again. That's right, sis. Good looking out. Hey, Carl! I got a rap to you, Holmes. I know a guy who knows a guy who handles freight containers down on the docks. He saw one of the containers was loading up cars, and one was a match for a car on a customer's wish list. So he marked the container with a spray can, but it might be too late. The ship's loading and it moves out tomorrow. Okay, let's go peep it out, see what we can see. No strangers to gunfights, CJ and Caesar would at least on that occasion be forced to fight for their meals, taking on the dock security forces in order to escape with their next paycheck. Okay, CJ! This is the one! Good work, Holmes! Hey! What the fuck do you think you're doing? The sheer criminal hubris of the Doherty team seemed nearly limitless at the height of their operation in San Fierro, with Carl and Caesar both becoming bold enough to openly pursue target vehicles in broad daylight, with little concern for being apprehended by the local authorities. 
The scale of car culture in San Fierro also made the city and its residents near perfect targets for their particular enterprise, and some car nuts would even be brave enough to flat out toy with the likes of Caesar and CJ, knowing that chop shops and car thieves are a dime a dozen in a city like San Fierro. Hey man, where you been? I tricked one of the cars on a shopping list. But the crazy bitch, she drives like the devil. I've been following her for hours, but she stops for nothing. You'd have to ram her off the road in order to get a chance to get her car, and you know a wrecked car is no good to us. I swear she's playing with me. Dude, calm down. If she playing with you, then she probably won't get one time involved until it turn ugly. We gotta find a way to stop her or slow her down. Too bad we can't involve the police. Cause then we could pop a crazy bitch tires and bang a crazy bitch ass in jail for being a danger to my sanity! You know what? I think I got an idea. But despite the garage's success, both CJ and Caesar had other reasons for living in the city by the bay, with Kendall less than interested in the two's macho revenge plan. While Kendall continued to keep the garage running smoothly, her boyfriend and her brother would work with some of CJ's other allies to begin taking down the man who exiled them from their home in the first place. Caesar would track a vehicle driven by members of the Balas, the Grove's main rivals in LS, and muscle to the LS side of Big Smoke's operation. Sensing an opportunity to gather intel on the organization, Caesar would phone CJ to meet him near Blueberry in Red County. CJ! You got it? Hey, my cousin just called me. He gave me a tip about a Balas car going to San Fierro to score yay. Shit! We gotta find out who's supplying those cats. Read your mind, Holmes. I picked them up at the Mulholland intersection, and I'm trailing them now. Okay, I'm coming to meet you. Better make it fast, Holmes. These boys are hanging around. The two would follow the vehicle all the way to Angel Pine and observe the shady dealings that were keeping Big Smoke a comfortable and powerful drug lord. There it is, Holmes! Rod! You sure head! This business is bigger than any gang, is it? Rod! Little bitch! This guy take himself real serious. That's T-Bone Mendez. What now? Is that it? Hey, who's the gringo? I don't like the look of that guy. This more than a few thugs push a product. It's a serious organization. How many of these clowns are there? Ah, I know a pimp when I see one. They being clever about this. It ain't no exchange of nothing incriminating. That was some heavy shit. We better split up and get out of here. I'll meet you back at the garage, eh? Coolio, we got what we came for anyway. With a newfound conception of just how Smoke was running the show, Caesar and CJ would return to San Fierro and begin brainstorming on their next potential move. Luckily for them, an old friend of theirs from their countryside racing days, Wootsy Moo of the Mountain Cloud Boys, better known as Woozy, had a similar interest in dismantling his own rivals in the Vietnamese Da Nang Boys, presenting an opportunity for both groups to help each other. Carl would assist Woozy in dealing with his Vietnamese problem, and subsequently agree to work with him and Caesar in digging up information on the San Fierro end of Big Smoke's cocaine empire. <laughs> That's crazy, man. What are you looking at exactly? Hey, God, bro. hey man, you get the flicks developed. What's up, Woozy? Hey, Carl. I was just explaining to your brother-in-law that we were friends. Oh, yeah? Well, look, Woozy, I need to get some info from you, man. What exactly do you boys want to know? Who are these putas, Holmes? Why don't you go take a look? These guys? Yeah. They're the loco syndicate. They're pretty big time, I think. Don't have any dealings with them. We don't touch blow. Now this guy runs things. I don't know his name. 
This guy is T-Bone Mendez. He's the muscle. And who's that guy? That's Jizzy B. He's the biggest pimp in town. He helps set up the deals. You know, uh, concierge of sorts. Hey, did he my way in? How I get to him? Oh, Jizzy? Jizzy runs the Pleasure Domes Club in that old fortress under the Gamp Bridge. Hey, good looking out, Woozy. No problem. Don't be a stranger. All right. Carl would spend time working for Jizzy to earn his trust and meet the other two main members of the Loco Syndicate operating out of San Fierro, San Fierro Reefa leader T-Bone Mendez and mysterious benefactor Mike Torino. When the time to eliminate Jizzy in order to steal his phone and intercept a meeting between the Syndicate and the Balas arrived, CJ would panic, having misplaced his sidearm and forgotten to make a DIY silencer. Thankfully, his well-armed and resourceful friend would be more than prepared for such an eventuality. After killing Jizzy, the two would learn of the meeting taking place at Pier 69, and call upon Woozy's Mountain Cloud boys to assist in crashing the party. CJ would meet Caesar on a rooftop opposite the pier, and prepare for one of their most intense battles so far. Hey man, nice job getting that phone message. What's up with Jizzy? Dead. So what's the plan? T-Bone security got here real early. They got men on the roofs watching over the pier. Hey, okay. Yeah, yeah, I see you. That was Woozy's boys. They're in place. Look down by the side entrance. Shit, they heading up to the roof. Shit! Me now we're gonna have to take out T-Bones men on the rooftop before this whole gig blows wide open. Thankfully, CJ, being a natural with almost any vehicle or weapon, would make short work of the San Fierro Reefa attacking Woozy's men on the rooftops. But an incoming Mike Torino would spot the bodies and send their plan into a tizzy. Man, my bussin' was tight! Here comes T-Bone! And here's that snake rider. Look at that fool, hanging out with the ballers like they was lifelong pals. Something ain't right. Where's Torino? Chopper inbound! That's gotta be Torino. Shit, he'll see the bodies on the rooftops. It's too late, man. He's tripping out, Holmes. Smoke grenades? So much for a surprise. Come on, we gotta take these fools right now. Together, Caesar and Carl would shoot their way through the balas and reach T-Bone Mendez, finishing him off together before CJ turned his attention to his traitorous friend, Ryder. Mendez, I see you, Rifa, motherfucker! Hey, Ryder, sherm head asshole. Where you think you going? C can't stop me. He's in it for those boats. Don't worry about it, I got this. Reluctantly, CJ would murder his former friend turned drug pusher and find himself temporarily beside himself with grief, despite their victory. With work still to be done, Caesar would give Carl a much needed morale boost as they prepared for their final move against what remained of the Syndicate. Carl, you're a fucking hero down in that list. I just spoke to my cousin. Not with my people, I ain't. Shit's still fucked up. Man, I got homies I used to run with that turn they back on me over this. Yeah, well, what are you gonna do, huh? Fucking Ryder, man. That was my homie. And I killed him. Fucking midget deserved it, eh? Little asshole tried to bang your sister, you know that? No, for real? Shit, maybe you right then, man, but... Cheer the fuck up! You're going soft on me, man. You did something good, eh? Yes, you did. But this isn't over yet. What you mean? Well, your former friends have a factory. And the way I see it, if you take that out, you will have put them out of business for good. Carl would indeed manage to take down the Syndicate's warehouse with more help from Woozy, while Caesar and Kendall continued to run the Doherty Garage in relative peace. Life for Caesar and Kendall would remain relatively stable, for a time anyway. 
running the garage and presumably living somewhere in the city together, though we were not able to locate an address for the two during their stay in the Bayside City, possibly indicating that they lived together at the garage itself. Whatever the case, being related to Carl Johnson meant life wouldn't stay boring for long. After leaving San Fierro to pursue a lead on the supposedly dead Loco Syndicate boss, Mike Torino, CJ would find himself embroiled in a government conspiracy, and be forced to string along Caesar at the request of the very much alive Mike Torino. I need you to commandeer a truck. A rival agency with a confused social agenda. They got things that we need. Now this is a two-man job. You'll need a friend. Use your sister's boyfriend, but don't tell him a thing. Remember, I'll be watching you. Having no other choice if he wanted to stay alive and rescue his brother, CJ would do as instructed, and bring Caesar along for the dangerous job of hijacking a semi-truck at top speed on the San Fierro freeway. We need to jack a truck on the freeway! It's headed to San Fierro! What's the plan? I'm gonna pull alongside, and you gonna hop aboard! Oh shit, you didn't mention that on the phone! It'll be a walk in the park. Tell Kendall I love her. There's a rig up ahead. Just a little closer, Holmes. Thankfully, having clearly done his research on CJ and his associates, Caesar would be the right man for the job, and successfully managed to jump aboard the tanker as Carl drove alongside it, tossing the driver out and bringing it in for storage to their Doherty garage. Exactly what became of the tanker, or what it was even needed for, remains unclear, but given that mysterious G-Man Mike Torino was involved, it seems likely that at some point, another G-Man arrived discreetly at the garage to take it off Caesar and Kendall's hands, but we will never know. After working for Torino for some time, Carl would run into Woozy whilst living in Las Venturas, and eventually become partner in a casino venture that the Triads had going in the city. Knowing his sister already had the head for business, he would at some point invite Kendall to help Woozy and him manage talent at the Triad Casino. The Four Dragons on the fabulous Ventura's Strip. Don't hate the little man because he's packing a six shooter. Oh, next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know how much balls it takes to stand down here and sing a song like that? It takes guts. I'm, I'm sorry. We're just looking for something with a little more uh, mass appeal. What could have more mass appeal than a song like Small but Perfectly Formed? Women want me. Men want to be like me. Assholes. Oh. <laughs> Gotta be right. kidding me, right? Damn. This casino game is hard work. I thought it was just a case of opening the doors and letting suckers give you their money. If only. You know what? I'm getting bored here. I'm trying to do business, not audition midgets. People of reduced stature, you mean? Yeah, yeah, I said that. All I know is when are we gonna get some real talent in here? I heard that. However, by this point, the power and influence that Carl had acquired with his stake in the Triad Casino, successful garage, and even position as manager to rapper Mad Dog, would allow for CJ, Caesar, and Kendall to return to their corrupted home in Los Santos. With the goal of finally setting things right, and dethroning Big Smoke from his position as crack cocaine king of the city. What Caesar and Kendall couldn't have known, however, was that their other main enemy and corrupted crash officers Frank Tenpenny and Eddie Pulaski, who held Big Smoke's leash, had been effectively exonerated of all their crimes, when the time came for their widely publicized trial, and all thanks to the efforts of CJ. Now all living out of Mad Dog's mansion in the Vinewood Hills, Caesar, Kendall, Carl, and a recently released from prison suite, as well as CJ's other oddball associates, would watch with bated breath as the verdict came down from on high and an entire city collectively roared in anger. Hey, be quiet, be quiet. Come on, you bunch of wankers. This is unbearable. Shut up. Officers Eddie Pulaski and Frank Tenpenny, both hardworking members of a community policing unit, have been charged with racketeering, corruption, narcotics, and sexual assault. They brought it on themselves. That bastard cost me my farm. And he hogged the bond. Fellow officer Ralph Pendleberry, who had threatened to turn state's evidence, and who was then found shot dead in a supposedly unrelated gang incident. I say 20 years. Airport. Try five years. Cops trial, always get off easy. Yeah, I heard that. Lost evidence, retracted witness statements, and now the disappearance of fellow officer Jimmy Hernandez and officer Pulaski himself, believed to be on the run. Oh wait, 
They're exiting the courtroom now. That bastard Pulaski will probably just turn up listen, dead listen. just like the rest of them. In light of the them. lack of evidence against my client, the district attorney's office has seen fit to drop all charges what? against this innocent man. That's bullshit. You see? You can't trust the system, man. This surprise decision is wholly unprecedented. Oh man, ain't no justice. It's just I know. Us. I've been arrested yeah, numerous times for totally natural behavior. Los Santos will burn tonight. Ain't nobody gonna be riding in my hood. I don't know about that, Holmes. Look, the whole city is going up. Oh, People are fucking go. pissed off about <laughs> this. People don't know what they want. We all being you. You see, man, it's always the same, friend. Power systems corrupt everyone. Look, I said we go secure the hood. We ain't getting shit together so some idiot can burn it down. With the city in complete chaos, CJ and Sweet would return to the Grove while Caesar returned to his Varios Los Azteca brothers in El Corona, and Kendall presumably stayed in the safety of the Mad Dog Mansion, though it's possible she accompanied Caesar on his respective crusade. After cleaning out the Grove of the Balas, Caesar would ask Carl for help in cleaning up El Corona, and naturally, he would oblige, no longer at odds with the Aztecas and instead staunch allies. Yeah, so get the place locked down. No one's gonna ruin the hood. You hear me? No! I see. What up? We almost got the hood under control, man. CJ, this is some serious shit, man. Hey, man, I know, man. I went through a lot of shit for this family since you've been gone, so I know. What? For yourself? Not for the family. Don't get shit confused, nigga. Man, when you gonna give me a break? When you stop acting like you the man. You keep yapping on what you done did, let me tell you what I done did. When Kendall needed shoes, I went out and got the money. When mom's needed operation, I robbed people for the bread. Why you off in Liberty City thinking about your own shit? For five years, come on, man. Now you do something you wanna fucking pray? Nigga, please. That ain't fair, man. Carl! Man, I need your help. Man, I'm kinda busy right now with family shit. I helped you guys, hombre. It's time you help me and my homies. My hood screwed up too. We got this shitty neighborhood on lockdown now. All right, what you need? It's time to get my old gang back together. Push out those yay slanging punks, eh? I know, but I got a lot going on right here in my own hood, man. And I made my brother a promise. All your brother wants you to do is pay back your debt, CJ. All right, I hear you. I got your back. Come on, let's roll. Orale, the Vario's coming back. Carl would accompany Caesar to the heart of the rioting in Azteca territory, meeting up with veteran gangsters Sonny, Hazer, and Gal to help Caesar clear a path to his old home on the far side of El Corona. Amidst the chaos of a rioting city, Caesar would confide in Carl his plan to ask Kendall to marry him, and though not concerned about CJ's approval, he would ask Carl to talk to the much more hardline suite for him. Presumably, Carl would do just that, but before such pleasantries could take place, they would have to fight to regain control of the former Azteca territory. Shit's real serious, man. Look at the streets, eh? Yeah, we better watch ourselves, man. We don't want to get caught on the ballers trip while this shit's going down. Man, Ten Penny Can brought the central to on? his knees. Hey, while we're here, I, uh, I have a question to ask you. Yeah, what? Well, it's, uh, it's personal. Come on, man. We brothers, you and me. You can ask me anything. Okay, here goes. I want to ask Kendall the question. What's the problem? Call her, dude. Here, use my phone. No, Holmes, the question. What? Oh, shit, you mean pop the question? Well, I'm okay with that. You know, I appreciate you asking my permission and shit, but... Nah, I know you're cool, Holmes, but it's sweet, man. He's the problem. Can you talk to him? Sure thing, Caesar. I'll talk to him. Thanks, CJ. That means a lot to me, Holmes. The fight wouldn't be an easy one, however, as the East Side Vagos had taken significant amounts of territory both before and after the riots, similarly to how the Balas had muscled in on Grove territory following Carl's exile. With an excessive amount of firepower, the gangbangers would battle their way through the alleys and side streets, slowly gaining ground, but not without cost. Those Vagos, man, I'm gonna cut those cacos. Raspalo hasta el hueso. Hey, carnales, what's cracking, Holmes? Cesar. And you must be CJ. Cesar says you cool, so we cool, Holmes. Okay, check it out. We're gonna have to work our way through this neighborhood to get to my house. If we stick together, those Vagos pendejos won't stand a chance. Watch each other's backs, amigos. Hasta la muerte! Hasta, Hasta la, la muerte! muerte! That was the easy bit, eh? Now we're going Hi. to the Viper's Nest. This is where it gets tough. Luckily, we have a little surprise up our sleeves. Eh, Sonny? That's a rocket launcher, man. We'll bring the National Guard down on us. Look around you, CJ. The whole city is a war zone. Come on, I want to take my house back. 
Though Hazer would be hit during the fighting, Caesar and the Aztecas would manage to reach his home thanks to CJ's help, and the gang could finally re-establish their control over the area, one broken home at a time. Let's fucking finish this! I'm with you, man. Let's take these pumps. Find a new home, assholes! Vagos on this hood! Burn them! What's up? All right, that's the last of them. How is Hazer? We need to get him to a hospital. Hey, I'll take it. CJ, you done more than enough, Holmes. You should get back to the Grove. All right, S.A. I'll see you after all this is settled down. Thanks, CJ. Good luck, my friend. CJ would have one more battle to fight, however, and along with his brother Sweet, track down and kill both Big Smoke and Frank Tenpenny. Although, technically, Frank's death was entirely his own doing when he crashed his out-of-control fire truck off of the Ganton Bridge, right into the center of Grove Street. <coughs> Don't. Don't do it, man. He's gone. I just want to be sure it's over, man. That's all. It's cool. Don't need to put a bullet in him. He killed himself in a traffic accident. No one to blame. Let's roll. I mean, far out, man. You know, I mean, you beat the system. I tried for 30 years to cross over, but you managed it, man. I mean, man, you're an icon, man. Oh, thanks, man. I'm just glad it's finally over. What's up with Smoke? You know what's up with Smoke. He always saw things look different than us. Smoke? Smoke was always on his own, always out for self. That is the surest path to hell, man. Well, that are 15 microdots and an ounce of mescaline. Let's go get something to eat. Sounds good to me. With Smoke and Tenpenny dead and their business assets secure, Caesar and Kendall would return to managing both the Doherty Garage on Caesar's part and presumably the Four Dragons Casino on Kendall's part. Though exactly what became of Caesar, Kendall, or Carl Johnson remains unclear, it seems safe to assume that following the chaotic year that was 1992, they settled into one of their many new businesses for a more relaxed life as the ones now calling the respective shots. Hey, now that everything is cool, we gotta stay on top of our game. Keep everything in check, but subtle. We got problems in Venturas, problems in San Fierro, shit's never ending. For sure. I mean, the family's back on their feet, but we gotta keep shit tight. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people has got their eyes on it. Whoa, 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 whoa. I come in peace with Mr. Dog here, who has an announcement. My, I mean, our first gold record! Yes! 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 You know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, they heard about I it. I decided to get breast implants. Oh, shit, 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 What's next? We should hit the casinos, roll some dice with Woozy. Nah, we gotta take care of shit here first. We going on tour, fam! Has anyone got a tissue? My nose is, <laughs> yeah. it won't stop running. Is that, anybody? Yeah, I have. Over there. Uh, I'll pass. Carl, where are you off to now? Finna hit the block. See what's happening. Kendall Johnson and Caesar Vialpando were in many ways a perfect match for each other. Caesar being a passionate and loyal man who always stood up for his friends, and Kendall being a driven and motivated go-getter, both being held back by their gang upbringings and both bringing out the best in each other, with little tension or drama between them. What exactly their personal or home lives were like remains unclear, but based on known interactions it seems likely that the two always remained singularly devoted to one another romantically. As only a brief window of their lives is known to us, we can only speculate on the lives these two might have lived following their ascension to business owners and talent managers. We do believe that they eventually married, though when, under what circumstances, and whether or not the relationship held indefinitely is not known. Caesar Vialpando was a man whose loyalty could never be questioned, as he never even hesitated to drop everything and help the people he cared about when the chips were down, and often unprompted. Caesar was heavily protective of Kendall despite her strong sense of independence, which only likely further endeared her towards him. He was also, like Kendall's brother, at times a complete and utter maniac, capable of murder, espionage, and acts of elaborate thievery when it suited him or his family. Like most gangsters in America, including Carl, Caesar always had a justification for his violent or illegal actions, and would continue seeking less than above board work even when well established with his own money either because it was all he knew, or because it was what he truly enjoyed doing. Despite being entirely uninvolved in gang activity herself,
Kendall did not seem to object all that heavily to the more murderous tendencies of either her brother or her boyfriend. Though, to be fair, it isn't known exactly how aware she even was of just how many people the two had collectively killed or robbed. If she was aware, she certainly didn't care enough to avoid working with the likes of Woozy at the Four Dragons Casino, who himself was involved in numerous violent incidents across multiple cities, including a massive casino heist that Carl had helped him to execute. Kendall, in this regard, seemed to care only about family and nothing else, either being completely indifferent to the methods Caesar and CJ used to move them up in the world, or blissfully unaware, though the former seems more likely. In fact, given that Kendall was actively involved in the operation of the Doherty Garage, which was itself an illegal chop shop, it seems almost undeniable that Kendall had no problem with scamming or robbing those she could, as long as it helped her or her family, and simply chose to keep her hands as clean as possible when it came to the more direct action necessary to keep their businesses in operation. Caesar, on the other hand, was explicit in his involvement in gang activity, and while he isn't the one who single-handedly turned the state of San Andreas on its head, he did play a significant role in the story of the much more well-known Carl Johnson. In fact, it could be said that Caesar's role in Carl's journey to becoming one of the most influential entrepreneurs to ever come out of Ganton was instrumental. Had Caesar not been ambitious enough to investigate the rumors regarding Big Smoke's betrayal, it is possible CJ and Sweet themselves would have been assassinated. Not to mention Caesar's role in helping CJ to dismantle the Loco Syndicate and operate his own chop shop garage. While neither Kendall or Caesar could hold a candle to the criminal record of Carl Johnson, the two of them nonetheless would have a substantial number of crimes that could be attributed to them mostly due to their association to the aforementioned CJ. Though Caesar's sheet is obviously far more extensive than the much more hands-off Kendall, both were responsible either directly or indirectly for plenty of crime around the state of San Andreas in the magical year of 1992 and possibly beyond. As usual on this program, these individuals were never charged with these crimes. However, we here at Weasel wish to give you, dear viewer, an idea of just how extensive the records could be had the authorities responsible for apprehending such people been competent instead of corrupt. With that being said, let's look at what crimes we believe the pair could have been charged with for their actions in 1992 alone, starting with Kendall, who as of now very easily holds the record for shortest crime sheet on GTA biographies to date. Accessory to an illegal lowrider competition when first introducing Caesar to CJ. Accessory to illegal street racing when racing with Caesar in the Los Santos circuits. Conspiracy accessory to Grand Theft Auto when helping the Doherty Garage to plan their thefts. Conspiracy accessory murder when encouraging Carl to dish out justice to the catcalling construction workers. And as for Caesar Villalpando, his criminal record is much more substantial, starting with Participating in an illegal lowrider competition where he first meets Carl Johnson. Illegal street racing when racing CJ in the Los Santos circuit. Illegal street racing when racing CJ in the countryside circuit. Conspiracy accessory murder when filling CJ in on the details of Smoke's couriers moving product into San Fierro. Conspiracy accessory murder when providing CJ with a silenced pistol to murder Jizzy B and his guards. Conspiracy accessory murder and murder when helping CJ to ambush a loco syndicate meeting at Pier 69. Conspiracy accessory murder when planning the final details of the assault on the syndicate with CJ. Accessory Grand Theft Auto when helping CJ to steal a Uranus. Accessory Grand Theft Auto, Grand Theft Auto, Reckless Driving, Reckless Endangerment, and Evading Authorities when stealing a Sultan and Elegy from Autos Autos in downtown San Fierro. Grand Theft Auto and Accessory Murder when stealing a Jester from the docks in San Fierro. Reckless Driving, Reckless Endangerment, Accessory Grand Theft Auto and Attempted Grand Theft Auto when trying and failing to steal a Stratum for the garage and helping CJ to steal it instead. Grand Theft Auto, Murder, Reckless Driving, and Accessory to Reckless Driving when hijacking a truck for Mike Torino. Conspiracy Accessory Murder, Murder, and Purchasing Military Grade Weapons when fighting off the Los Santos Vagos to reclaim territory for the Varios Los Aztecas with CJ. When all is said and done, Caesar and Kendall are hardly the most deadly or violent of the people we have so far examined on this show, but nonetheless represent another demographic of this country's vast criminal underground. Vio Pondo especially may have given Carl Johnson a run for his money in terms of his own ambition as a gangster, if circumstances hadn't forced him into the path he inevitably walked. What became of either once again remains unclear, but with the respective histories in mind, it seems unlikely that either hung up their criminal lives entirely, but instead graduated to the more sophisticated life of being criminal entrepreneurs.
It seems that even for the criminally minded, love can still conquer all. While many of the people we examine on this program struggle to find steady or healthy relationships due to their often exceedingly violent lifestyles, sometimes even the most ruthless criminals can find true love where they least expect it. America is a dangerous place, people. And even if this uncharacteristic story of romance and mod garages seemed wholesome, one mustn't forget the trail of bodies left in the wake of such people, and the many lives they inevitably destroy. Stay indoors, people. You never know if you'll bear witness to the next Bonnie and Clyde as you're shopping for your low-fat Twinkies at the Super Save. I'll see you next time for another exciting edition of Grand Theft Auto Biographies. With me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching. America, the land of the free, home of the brave, and the stupid, and the criminally insane. Do we tighten it some more now or just wait for it to turn black and fall off? The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on Grand Theft Auto Biographies. Materialism, Addiction, and Sadism. Tonight, we will follow the life of a criminal bride caught up in the affairs of her many affairs. We will see a near stereotypically perfect example of a modern Libertonian woman whose ambitions for living a comfortable, pampered existence would come into constant conflict with her fleeting attention span for love. I love you, Tony Cipriati! A proud and occasionally eager participant in crime herself, Tonight's subject is a woman who you most certainly do not want to end up on the wrong side of, if only for her most powerful criminal connections. We will see thievery, marital assassinations, and ambiguous love affairs, as we document the known criminal history of Liberty City's own Maria Latore. Maria Latore was born presumably in Liberty City in the late 1960s or early 1970s, though exact dates could not be obtained in our investigations. In fact, whilst we believe that Maria is a Liberty City local, we do not know this for a certainty. However, based on her very thick Libertonian accent, it seems at the very least fair to assume she spent a significant amount of her childhood in the worst city in America. No information exists on Maria's childhood or the identity of her parents, though it is assumed by this program that they were first or second generation Italian immigrants, or at least trace their ancestry directly back to the old country. Being an Italian-American woman in Liberty City, Maria would be no stranger to mob violence, and, we speculate, spent a majority of her youth and young adulthood surrounded by the all-too-common machismo of the American Cosa Nostra. It isn't clear exactly when, but at some point, Maria would also become acquainted with a high-ranking Yakuza member, Asuka Kassan, though the exact nature of their early relationship remains unclear, with some speculating that theirs was more than a friendship, and may have even been romantic or sexual in nature, though once again, this isn't confirmed. Eventually, though, Maria would find herself fed up with life and liberty for any number of reasons we can only guess at. Sometime prior to 1992, Maria would move to Las Venturas and begin looking for legitimate work as a server at one of the Strip's many fabulous casinos. Unfortunately for Maria, due to her heritage, bad luck, or just bad habits, she would once again find herself surrounded by Liberty City mobsters, seeking to turn the jewel of the desert into yet another criminal asset. By 92, she would find work as a waitress at Caligula's Palace, a mob-owned casino that was being run as a joint venture between the three Liberty City families. Quick enough, Maria would be introduced to the infamous boss of the Leone family, Don Salvatore Leone, who was at the time we believe in his early to mid-50s, while Maria was in her early to mid-20s. Intrigued by Salvatore's money, power, or both, but evidently little else, the two would start dating, while Maria worked the casino, and Salvatore attempted to turn his joint venture into a sole proprietorship. Well, well, well. What do we got here? Here's your sandwich. Who's this pretty thing? I don't usually do this kind of shit, you know. <laughs> I like this girl. What's your name, kid? Maria. 
And the service is not included. Hey, the woman, you fat fuck! You heard the bird. Come on. <laughs> Are you kidding me? See you later, guys. Maria would continue seeing Salvatore during his brief stay in Venturas, but remain relatively distant from Salvatore's various business dealings, which saw him employ the likes of such notorious criminals as Carl C.J. Johnson. Though never formally introduced, Maria would meet Carl at least once, when Salvatore hired him to perform a hit on Franco Ferrelli at the St. Mark's Bistro in Liberty City. Just feel the weight of the weapon, sweetheart. <laughs> I can feel the weight of someone's weapon. Hey! You don't want to blame on that front. Can I fucking go now, or fucking what? Ooh, you fucking twat! Right in the fucking happy sack! Perhaps you'll be cured of your little anti-social condition, mate. Carl, it's my man. Mr. Leon? Looks like this piece of shit was right. You did a real number on those Ferrelli losers. Now it's time the Ferrellis found out what it means to screw with Salvatore Leon. How would you like to hit the St. Mark's Bistro? A hit in Liberty City? Cool. But I'ma need some backup. Take who you want! Well, I usually use these two. Hey, hey, remember all those jobs we did together? Huh? Huh? You and me, Carl, remember? Huh? You know, you used to call me Killer Ken. Ken the Killer? Killer? Ice Cold Ken. That's me. And him too, I guess. Though Maria may have grown to enjoy life in Venturas, her new man's business venture would end in one of the most elaborate and well-documented casino robberies in the history of San Andreas, wherein Salvatore was for once the victim and not the perpetrator. With Caligula's near bust, Leone would see fit to move back to Liberty City and return to managing his empire from home, inviting Maria to accompany him, and at some point even proposing marriage to the young waitress. It isn't known when or where Maria and Salvatore married, but our investigative team speculates that it may have taken place in Las Venturas mere days or less before their departure for the East Coast. Given the city's reputation for shotgun marriages, and the always fleeting nature of Maria and Salvatore's relationship, we find it unlikely that a large, elaborate ceremony was held. But one must also remember that both Leone and Latore were Italian-American, and therefore may have partaken in such festivities simply out of tradition. Though the marriage would obviously take place, it would be against the wishes of Maria's father, whose identity remains unknown. All that is known is that he strongly disapproved of her being with Salvatore, whom he referred to as a fat slob. Whatever the case, we know that for certain, by 1998, the two had been married for some time, several years at least, leading us to believe that whether in Venturas or Liberty, their vows had been given in 92. Marriage can be a tricky course to navigate, and for a woman such as Maria Latore, the life of a happily married housewife would not be one she either aspired to, or even desired, it seemed. After a presumably very short honeymoon period for the couple both literally and figuratively, they would seem to quite quickly devolve into angry bickering, occasionally physical scuffles, and frequent infidelity from both parties. Clearly only with Salvatore for his wealth and influence, Maria would show almost no true affection for the elder Leone boss, and by 1998 was not only living on her own in the St. Mark's apartment, but was consistently sleeping with other men, a fact that even her husband was well aware of. Though himself prone to infidelity, or at the very least, frequent visits to strip clubs, Salvatore would take Maria's lack of loyalty personally, but never have the heart to outright cut her off, and continue to support her lavish, materialist lifestyle by providing her with the aforementioned apartment and plenty of money to waste on frivolous things. In addition, Maria at some point in her life would develop an addiction to speed, among other drugs, and begin buying it regularly from dealers at great expense to herself, even to the point of winding up in debt to one dealer, to the tune of possibly $100,000. Despite Salvatore's attempts to keep Maria from leaving outright, the two's inarguably toxic relationship would be enough to make Maria at least consider selling Leone family secrets to journalists such as Ned Burner of the Liberty Tree, though as far as we could tell, she never followed through with these threats, mostly due to a disagreement regarding payment, which she'd intended to use to pay back her speed dealer. From archived emails that our investigative team was able to retrieve, Maria wrote, Hey, I got your email from this guy, I know, but that's not important. So listen, I heard you wanted some information on the workings of organized crime in this town, and were prepared to pay for it. Well, what I'm saying to you is that I am seriously connected in that world, and could have you killed in about five minutes. But if you offer the right price, then I'll tell you everything, 
and I mean everything you need to know about the Leone crime family, about the Ferrellis, and the other guys. And trust me, I know the truth, but I need money, and not a hundred bucks or something dumb like that, so uh, how much can you pay? I need the money, and obviously I mean cash, I'm not a bank, but I owe someone money who is also not a bank. In fact, he's a speed dealer, and not a nice one. Get back to me, and maybe we can do some business. Trust me, you'll not regret it. Hey, Mad Maria, good to hear from you. What did you have in mind? Of course I'll pay for information, but I need evidence. I'll have to be able to run a real story. That's how the press works. We only make it up when the people we are talking about won't have us killed. If you can get me real evidence, I'll pay big, 10,000 at least. Do we have a deal? Get back to me. I can be trusted. Yours, Ned Burner. And finally, Maria responded with, Ned, 10 grand? What do you think I am? A coke whore? Is that it? I mean, really. I spend 10 grand on lunch. Often. I hardly do coke ever, aside from at breakfast, so that ain't the problem. I told you, I owe my speed dealer a lot of money. 10 grand ain't enough. No, let's make it 100. Okay, so this is it. Are you listening? You'll be glad you spent all that money on this. Salvatore Leone ain't all the man he's cracked up to be. I heard from someone very close to him who was not a liar or a coke whore, thanks very much, that sometimes he can't even get it up after he takes those blue pills. And also, that his right-hand man, Vincenzo Chili, is not loyal to him, or doesn't respect him. What about that? That's a story in itself. Plus, the Leones are planning to take over the whole town. So come on, Ned, give me the money, or I'll get mad. But you didn't hear it from me. As far as we are aware, this interaction ended with Maria's demanding of $100,000 from Burner, who was unwilling to meet such extravagant demand. However, given that Maria seemed completely forthcoming with her information, it seems fair to assume the only reason she didn't get Salvatore and his organization in more trouble was due to her own incompetence, and not a lack of trying or motivation. When Salvatore's soldier, Tony Cipriani, returns to Liberty City in 1998, following several years in hiding, she would almost immediately become interested in him, and much to her own delight, get plenty of opportunities to see him, when Salvatore orders Tony to wash over her while she went about her various errands. Is this one of your new doggies, Sal? Mr. Leone. Tony, come esta. I'm glad you showed up. I want you to do something for me. You're late, typical man. I want to go shopping and you're driving. So help me, I'm going to have some fun today, even if it kills you. I just need to finish getting ready. Eh, screw it, I'm gorgeous. Come on, Tony. However, a woman like Maria Latore rarely allowed for life to be boring, and despite Tony expecting to chauffeur to several shops for hours of mundane shopping, that would not be how his day would play out. Instead, Maria would attempt to shoplift from the Portland View branch of the Signora Grande Italian Boutique. Wait here, sexy, I won't be long. What? I just wanted to see what it looked like in the daylight. I'll Take your goddamn there. hands off me. When chased out of the establishment by the owner, Tony and Maria would be forced to flee the police before Maria demanded that she be brought to another store on the edge of Chinatown, fleeing the store yet again when caught by the owner, who was more than prepared to dish out his own justice. Keep the engine running. Come on, Maria, no more stealing. Oh, hush, Tony, baby. That was all a misunderstanding back there. I'm telling you, I don't have anything hidden up there. Get the hell off of me. Thief! Maria and Tony would be forced to flee the scene of the crime, and it's possible that Tony even killed the clerk who threatened them, but this is unconfirmed. After his first encounter with Salvatore's wife, he would perhaps gain a deeper appreciation for just how their marriage had reached the rock bottom it was clearly at. Tony, honey, I had a great time today. Maybe you can drop by later and we can have some more. See you later, handsome. Unfortunately for Tony, to Maria, fun meant meeting her speed dealer in Chinatown for another night of being wasted. It would thus prove a wise decision on Salvatore's part, or in retrospect, quite the opposite, as Maria would discover her dealer had plans that went far beyond just scoring a bit of sugar. Stop it! One of Salvatore's dogs is bringing me right over! Oh, he's a charmer! 
Maybe too thin, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, listen, I want a party, but the cupboard is bare. You got some sugar? Pure cane, huh? Great. Ciao. Come on, Tony. I got places I need to be. Upon arriving at the meet, Maria would be greeted not by a friendly bag of mind-altering substances, but instead, a group of Sindaco thugs, who would promptly bag and tag the vulnerable woman, attempting to kidnap her for presumably an enormous ransom to Salvatore. Thankfully for Maria, her new bodyguard and Tony Cipriani would be on the case, and with relative ease managed to stop the escaping vehicle and kill all the Sindaco soldiers trying to make away with her. I ain't going anywhere with you. Who the hell do you think you are? Try. So, uh, you want to come up for a uh, coffee or something? I'll pass. You sure? Well, call me. But despite the obvious dangers to her life of partying, hard drugs, and associating with violent criminals, none of it would be enough to deter Maria from making bad decision after bad decision. One such decision would be shortly after her kidnapping, when she decided to put herself up as a prize in a motorcycle race around Chinatown and Callahan Point, possibly all in an elaborate attempt to gain Tony's affection, which unsurprisingly, falls flat. Dear Tony, I've put myself up as the first prize in a street race. If Salvatore finds out about this, we're both going to be in big trouble. So you better come and save my ass. Then maybe it'll belong to you. Forever yours, Maria. Tony would win the race and plead with Maria to return to her apartment safely, but the rebellious and free-spirited woman would choose instead to leave with another contestant in the race, Elsie Biker, Cedric Wayne, father and gay. Come on, Maria, let's go. Well, finally, <laughs> Mr. Tough Guy makes this That's move. Bullshit, yo. Look, Maria, you're Salvatore's girl. I'm my own girl. You're such a goddamn square. Come on, Wayne, let's party. Unsurprisingly, Maria's fling with Wayne wouldn't last long at all. The two would party together, taking hard drugs and apparently having wild sex, until Maria confessed her love for Tony to Wayne, eventually winding up back at her apartment, weeping in dramatic fashion to try and win Tony's affection. <laughs> ah, what have you taken now? Nothing. What was it this time, huh? Smack, downers, lewds, uh, a little too much trumpet, not enough diazepam, a little too much sideways, not Shut enough up. up. Tony! Who did this to you? No one. Who was it? This guy I'm seeing, Wayne. Oh, some guy you're seeing. You're my boss's girl. Shh, come on, Tony. Don't be so square. Besides, he gets me this great speed, you know? A girl needs a lift. Plus, it makes you really wild and bad. Shut up! Why'd he do this to you, this dead prick, Wayne? I told him I was in love with somebody else. I told him about me and you, Tony, and then he hit there me. There is no you and me. <laughs> Christ, you're killing me. Where is this Wayne? He deals at a bar down in Chinatown. I love you, Tony Cipriani. However, Tony was a loyal and dedicated man to Salvatore's organization, and as a result would consistently reject Maria's advances and only act to keep her safe as per his boss's orders. When it becomes apparent that Wayne would be an issue if left unchecked, Tony would eliminate him the only way he knew how, permanently. Despite confessing her love to Tony and making it clear she desired him, Tony wouldn't even budge after eliminating Wayne for her, and as a result, or perhaps simply out of habit, Maria would return to taking all manner of hard drugs, and once again require the aid of her husband's favorite soldier. Oh, hey baby! Oh, I thought you'd never make it! What is wrong with you? <laughs> Nothing, baby, it's all good. Get up, you crazy bitch! What have you taken now? Taken now? Nothing much, you know, a couple of, a couple of greens, a couple of heavy reds. Oh, and these great pills I'm getting from Holland now, pure as hell. I feel great. No, I don't. I need a zap and I'll be fine. They're here somewhere. What's a zap? A zap? You don't know what a zap is? Ah, Tony, you are so Come on, make sense. I need 
need a zap, Tony. I'm gonna die. I felt like this before. I've OD'd. Get me a zap, Tony. I left him at the diner at Callahan Point. Well, don't just sit there, eh? Come on. Knowing he had little choice but to help the hapless junkie, Tony would drag Maria around town, attempting to locate her stash of zap, only to end up in the wrong place at the wrong time, or rather, multiple times. Why have you brought me here? My stuff is in here. This is where Wayne used to hang out. The I remember. Like goddess, I got some zap stashed in Hepburn Heights. Hey, it's that bitch Maria, and that's the fuck who killed, killed Wayne. Metal is the while dodging vengeful bikers, Maria and Tony would drive all across Portland, checking her stash in Hepburn Heights, only to wind up back at Maria's apartment, and eventually, Salvatore's mansion. Upon finally coming down off her high, or coming to her senses regarding the cash-strapped Tony, Maria would finally end her attempts to seduce him, and even try to frame the situation as her rejecting him, despite all evidence to the contrary. What kind of driver are you? That took ages! I could have od On the map! I'm gonna need a new wardrobe, a little nip and tuck to work. Honey, have you got some money? Uh, not really. Well, what the hell have you been coming on to me for? I'm Salvatore's girl. He's loaded. Don't you ever hit on me again. Seemingly no longer interested in Tony, Maria would return to life with Salvatore, which consisted of mostly fighting, both physical and verbal, and little else. Already upset enough having to deal with union problems at the Portland docks, Salvatore would have a particularly nasty fight with Maria shortly after her attempted affair with Tony. Shut up, you ungrateful bitch! I'll knock you into next week if I hear another word from you! Oh, that's right, big dick. What are you gonna do, hit me? Why, I oughta... That's the only time you touch me these days! Why the fuck would I want to touch you? I don't like you's goods. You revolt me. Me? Revolt you? What? Yeah, revolt! Oh, please. You know what? My daddy was right when he said you were nothing but a fat yeah, small. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hi, Tony. I want my money, old man. Get out of here, you tramp. Hey, Anthony, you're an angel of mercy. Women, what are you gonna do about them, huh? Luckily, I can trust someone in my life. You, Tony. You're very important to me. Did I ever tell you that? You can't even get it up, you old bastard. Not for you! I don't like using public toilets, you slut! Very important. So listen, it's you and me now. We're in charge. We got those fools on the run. How would you know? You're more interested in hanging out with men. And you're only happy when you got your drawers around your ankles and your back against the wall. Christ, I met rabbits who like to fuck less than you. So listen, fuck this is you, important. you, Salvatore Leone. You no dick bullying, wife beating piece of a Fuck me! Dick. Fuck you! In fact, everyone has! Anyway, I got a shipment of you know what coming in. This is gonna put us, you and me, on the map big time. Everything should run smooth. I just need someone, someone I trust, to take care of things for me. All right, Tony? I'll talk to you later. And another thing, I never met a girl with hydraulic underwear. It amazes me. Christ, why did I marry her? I was looking for a tramp, I married a slut. I must have really pissed someone off in my past life. I'll tell you that much. However, as would become fairly commonplace, even a fight of this magnitude would mean practically nothing to the two, who had become entirely used to each other's abuse. Mere days after their spat, Maria and Sal would be seemingly right back to normal, clubbing together despite Maria's continued distaste for her elderly husband. Hey, Sal. Tony, what do you think of the new car? She's a beauty, huh? Fully loaded, top of the line. What's that smell? Oh, yeah, midlife crisis. Shut up. Tony, listen, I got a shitload of money that needs to be picked up from my warehouse down at Callahan Point. I don't trust anyone else to do this. Are you girls gonna talk all day, or are we driving? God damn it, woman. Did I tell you you could speak? By 2001, Maria would move back into Salvatore's mansion on the edge of the St. Mark's district, though their marriage would hardly improve. Despite now being the effective kings of crime in Portland since the destruction of Fort Staunton in 98, the Leones, Salvatore included, would begin to rest on their laurels, and an already easily bored Maria would begin to get restless. 
With their marriage still in the dumps, Maria would take an almost immediate liking to one of Salvatore's new soldiers, who had begun making a name for himself working for the likes of Luigi Guttarelli and Salvatore's son, Joey. The New Blood, a silent criminal handyman by the name of Claude, would arrive in Liberty in 2001 following a less than mutual breakup with his ex-girlfriend Catalina, which landed him in a paddy wagon en route to an upstate Liberty prison. Having proved himself to Salvatore's men, Claude would be given an opportunity to do the same to Salvatore, and the Don's first task for him would be to accompany Maria on one of her many adventures around the city. I need to talk business, so you're going to look after my girl for the evening. Hey, Maria! Move your butt! Dumb bird does this every time. And here she is, the one and only Queen of Sheba. What were you doing up there? Whatever it was, I bet it cost me money. Well, you don't think I hang around here for the conversation, do you? Get in the car and keep your big mouth shut. Take the limo, but bring it back in one piece, you hear me? And watch her. She can be trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure your new lapdog has everything covered. And isn't he big and strong? Hey, Fido, let's go visit Chico and get some party treats. He's at the rail station at the Chinatown waterfront, I think. Being a loyal man who always followed orders without question, Claude would silently chauffeur Maria to her dealer Chico along the waterfront, while Maria prepared to get her metaphorical freak on. If more people would join the military, this would be Mira, a it's my favorite lady. You're looking for some fun? A little... Mm -hmm. Hey Chico, nah, just the usual. Here's the party, hey, maybe you should check out the warehouse party at the East End of Atlanta Keys. Mm. Thanks, Chico. See you around. Gracias, and enjoy. I want to After learning of a party taking place in Atlantic Keys, Maria would task Claude with driving her there. But unfortunately for both of them, the party would be broken up by LCPD SWAT teams on a tip from an anonymous source. Thanks to Claude's expert driving, Maria had managed to escape the party unscathed and thoroughly impressed. You know, I enjoyed myself for the first time in a long while. And you, you know, you treated me really good with respect and everything. Well, I better go. <laughs> I'll see you around, I hope. While Claude didn't know it at the time, it was following this encounter that she would develop feelings for the silent Reaper Man, feelings that would ultimately lead to her husband's untimely demise. During another of their infamous fights, presumably, Maria would confess her love for Claude to Salvatore, or at the very least lie about them being in a relationship together, despite never interacting outside of his work for her husband. Enraged and unwilling to stand for a betrayal within his organization, Salvatore would plan to have Claude assassinated, inviting him to his mansion after his successful destruction of a Colombian drug lab to celebrate after one last job. It's my favorite cleaner! I'm proud of you, my boy. You kicked the shit out of those grease balls. I just got one little job for you before we can all celebrate. There's a car around the block from Luigi's club. The inside is covered in brains. We gotta help some guy make up his mind and it proved a little uh, messy. Take it to the crusher before the cops find it. Claude, none the wiser to Maria's idiocy, would proceed towards the target vehicle in the red light district, but luckily receive a page from her just in time to save his life. Meeting her at the docks in Callahan Point, Maria would reveal her mistake, and tell Claude his only hope to survive now would be to flee with her and her friend Asuka Kassen of the Torrington-based Yakuza to Staunton Island. Listen, Salvatore thinks that we're going behind his back, so he was offering you to the cartel in order to make a deal. I couldn't let him do that. I mean, the worst thing is, it's all my fault because I told him we were an item. Don't ask me why. I don't know. Look, you're a marked man on the Mafia turf, and I've got to get out of here, too. I've seen too much killing, too much blood. I... This is a friend of mine, okay? She's an old friend. It's, it's so good. She's someone we can trust. Come on, enough of the speeches. We better get out of here before we get more hysterical Italians wanting less friendly reunions. Being a man who went wherever the wind carried him, Claude would not object and would accompany Maria and Asuka to Asuka's condo in Newport, where the women would take a moment to rest while Claude hit the streets to do what he did best. Asuka and I are gonna have to talk. Uh, why don't you go cruise around? You'll need a place to lie low. There's a warehouse at the edge of Belleville that should suit your needs. Come back here to my condo when you're ready, and you and me can have a little chat. Now living together in Asuka's condo, Maria and her old friend would catch up on old times, having not seen each other for presumably many years, while Asuka worked with Claude to ensure his ties to the Leones were severed for good. We have certain issues to clear up before we continue any form of relationship, business or otherwise. Let's lay our cards on the table. I am Yakuza, and I know you worked for Salvatore Leone's family. I can give you work with our organization. 
But first, you must prove to me that your ties with the Mafia are truly broken. Salvatore Leone will be leaving Luigi's in about three hours' time. Make sure he doesn't reach his club alive. Meanwhile, Maria and I will catch up on old times. Oh, Asuka, you've got a massager. That's not a massager. Around this time, Maria, now a widow, would spend most of her time with Asuka and fretting over Claude, whom she viewed as her new boyfriend, even though he'd never spoken a word to her or shown even the slightest bit of interest in her romantically. In fact, Maria would worry so much about what Claude thought of her that she would call up the Chatterbox radio program hosted by Laszlo Jones in 2001, following Salvatore's assassination. After insulting her gracious host a number of times, as is nearly tradition for all programs Laszlo has ever been on, Maria would ask him how to know if a guy is interested, to which Jones responded with his typical sarcasm. All right, let's go over to here to line 79. Hello, you're on Chatterbox. Hello, uh, is that Laszlo? Uh, yes. <sighs> oh, well, I'm on the radio. How, how exciting. Oh, thank you, Laszlo. Um, is this on the radio? I mean, am, am I actually on the radio right the second? Uh, uh, yes, you are. Uh, I'm sure it's very exciting for you, but uh, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> oh, man, I mean, what, what, what else is there? I could go on all day, but well, you know how it is, don't you, Laszlo? <laughs> Uh, not really. I mean, what's your name? What'd you call about? Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. I, I'm Maria, you know, Maria, like Mamma Mia, only, only different, you know, but, you know, men, M-E-N. <laughs> oh, it's a dirty word, only there's only three letters. Uh, you, you know what I mean? I mean, your broadcasters are all the same, aren't you? I mean, I heard about you. You're always out on boys' nights. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What, what are you talking about? I, I, I'm married. Uh, one of those convenience jobs to protect you, I bet. I know what you're all like. You know more about men than I know about leopard skin furniture. So, less of that clever stuff and give me some advice. I mean, come on, I got real problems. You see, okay, I had this boyfriend. And at first, he was real kind to me. He was a real gentleman. A little bit older and everything, but you know, he treated me really good. And then it all went wrong. And so, you know, I found someone else. And he seems real nice, but, you know, he don't talk too much. So, I really can't tell if he likes me. And, well, I guess what I want to know is... How do you tell if a guy is serious? I mean, you know, he treats me good, but he don't seem real interested in me. You know, he's always working and hanging out with the guys. Um, say, you don't think he's like you, do you? What do you mean, like me? Well, what are you insinuating? Th that he's on the radio? Well, probably not. When not calling into radio shows, Maria would be, we believe, engaging in various acts of BDSM with Asuka, though this remains entirely speculative. However, given the two's reported history and alleged conversations between them, it seems likely that at the very least, their relationship was not entirely platonic. It's my handsome handyman. Maria's all tied up at the moment, but I'll tell her you call. It's time you met our man inside the LPD. Here's a payment for the last little job he did for us. He is understandably cautious. Get to the payphone in Torrington as quick as you can, and await his instructions. Maria would even accompany Asuka in apparently all or some of her Yakuza dealings at the time, following Asuka as she attempted to win a gang war with the Colombians and avenge the death of her brother Kenji, whom neither woman knew was actually killed by Claude. In a rare, overt demonstration of her sadistic streak, Maria would even accompany Asuka to the Panlanta construction site, where the Yakuza leader was torturing cartel leader Miguel, which Maria happily participated in. Do we tighten it some more now, or just wait for it to turn black and fall off? Give it a quick prod. Oh, what is that gooey yellow stuff? Oh, hey, babe! My handyman. I, I was bored, so I came over to keep Asuka company. She's got the makings of a natural, this girl. She's managed to extract this little gem from our guest. <coughs> There's a plane coming into Francis International in two hours' time. It is full of Catalina's poison. You can avoid airport security by getting a boat out to the runway light buoys and shooting the plane down on its approach. Collect the cargo from the debris and stash it. Oh, you be careful now, okay, baby? Now try the chili oil. In fact, Maria seemed not only to enjoy torturing Miguel, but to be a natural, according to Asuka, at interrogation. However, despite any chutzpah she might have had, it wouldn't be enough to match the considerably crazier Catalina, when she arrived along with presumably dozens of cartel soldiers to assault the construction site. 
Though exactly how the encounter played out remains debated, it would end with Asuka Kassen dead, along with Miguel, and Maria kidnapped to be used as bait in Catalina's ultimate goal of eliminating the handsome handyman once and for all. Nobody quite knows why, given Claude's apparent indifference to Maria, but for whatever reason, he would actually arrive to pay Catalina's ransom at the cartel-controlled mansion in Cedar Grove. Bueno, pa que es idiot? One of these scarface idiots. Did you turn up to rescue Maria or to get me back? Well, I got news for you. Shooting you will be a pleasure, but dating you was only business. You are muy pequeñito, amigo. Throw over the cash and you can have this overused puta back. You have been a busy boy, but you haven't learned. I'm not to be trusted. Kill the idiot! Apparently never learning his lesson when it came to his ex-girlfriend, Claude would naively assume the exchange to be in good faith, and subsequently be left to die while Catalina fled to her escape chopper, with Maria still in tow. For some reason. However, despite getting the drop on Claude again, this time Catalina would not be able to run fast enough to escape the wrath of her ex-boyfriend. Claude would pursue her chopper all the way to Cochrane Dam, and eventually kill her and all of her cartel guards, rescuing Maria, and finally finding closure on the betrayal which consumed him for so long. Residents in Cedar Grove have been coming to terms with the emotional aftermath of a full-blown war that hit the area yesterday. Local resident Clive Denver described to police a single gunman that he saw fleeing the scene with a dark-haired woman. Oh, you know, we're gonna have such fun, because, you, know, you know, I love you. I, I, I really do, because you're such a big, strong man, and that's just what I mean. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh, you know, I forget, but you know what it's like, don't you? The sound of explosions shook nearby homes as people ran for cover. Several citizens were injured in the panic as gunfire was exchanged between ground forces and a helicopter circling the dam. Yeah, we got a good view from down here in the gardens. When the copter finally got taken out, better than the fireworks on the 4th of July. With the death toll already over 20, police are still finding bodies. There have been no official denials concerning rumors that the dead were members of the Colombian cartel and still no leads as to the cause of the massacre. Can you believe it? This one cost me $50. What became of Maria Latore remains a matter of great contention among criminal historians in Liberty City. Many contend that following the chaotic Battle of Cochrane Dam, Claude murdered Maria along with everyone else present, possibly to keep her from connecting him to the crime, or possibly simply out of annoyance. However, there are also a great many historical sources who claim that there is no real evidence that Maria was killed that night, also citing the lack of any corpses matching her description being found in the lengthy investigation which followed unlike the many dozens of Colombian bodies who were found. We will never truly know what became of her, but whatever the case, following her involvement with Claude, she would vanish from the criminal and historical record, with no further information existing on her post-2001. We may never know the truth. Maria Latore was an incredibly materialistic and shallow person, the majority of the time. Motivated by lust, wealth, and heavy drugs, she rarely acted in ways which did not directly suit her own interests, which were often self-destructive in nature. From a young age, Maria seemed to view herself as a trophy to be won by the various men who vied for her attention, and also seemed to be explicitly attracted to those who would forego this interest. While it isn't known if her upbringing was one of wealth and status, Maria was quite used to getting what she wanted, especially when it came to men making those she could not obtain with ease all the more alluring, such as Tony Cipriani or Claude. While seemingly emotionally and sexually motivated by the chase, at the end of the day, Maria was no fool, 
and knew the value of money. Attaching herself to the likes of Salvatore Leone and his immense resources, whilst continuing to sleep with whomever she pleased. The best of both worlds. Maria may have also been bisexual, as many believe that she had relations with the likes of Asuka Kassem, and possibly other women, though this is not confirmed with any certainty. Married to Salvatore for approximately nine years, Maria seemed more than willing to employ violence through her mafia connections, if it served to benefit her. Vaguely threatening the likes of Liberty Tree reporter Ned Burner, or effectively setting Cedric Fotheringay up to be killed, showing zero remorse. She also had a sadistic streak, participating happily in the graphic torture and interrogation of Miguel, without showing the slightest bit of hesitation, and setting her own husband up for assassination by her new boyfriend, without shedding a single tear. In addition, Maria was also apparently a kleptomaniac, and arguably a junkie, who stole on a regular basis, simply for the thrill of it having no shortage of resources available to her to pay for whatever her heart desired, yet somehow winding up nearly $100,000 in debt to her speed dealer. Some might describe Maria as ditzy, though they would not be entirely incorrect, it would be a mistake to assume she was all body and no brains. Maria seemed to always know exactly what her actions would result in, and seemed to almost revel in watching others deal with the scenarios she was responsible for creating. At the end of the day, though, when Maria Latore is compared to most subjects we have examined on this program, she might as well be an angel. Not directly responsible for murdering or even ordering the death of anyone, but instead responsible for making egregious but ultimately human mistakes that led to the deaths of many people around her, even if she didn't intend for it. However, we speculate that the main thing which kept Maria from being a truly repugnant criminal herself was ambition, and not a lack of ability or tolerance for violence. Far happier to kick her feet up, pop several different pills, and drift away into a blissful nirvana, Maria was never interested in taking names the way men like Salvatore, Claude, or Tony were, and instead vicariously lived through their actions, observing with sadistic glee. Though heavily associated with the Leone crime family and later the Yakuza, Maria Latore herself has a substantially shorter rap sheet than most subjects we have examined here on GTA Biographies. While Maria was never arrested to our knowledge, even if she had been, it's likely her connections would have meant a short stay in a city jail before returning to her luxurious lifestyle. That being said, we here at Weasel will always try to bring you the facts as we see them, and though not able to stand shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder crime wise to the likes of Claude, or even her late husband, we believe there were plenty of charges that could have been attributed to Maria herself, starting with Stealing from the Portland View branch of the Signora Grande Italian Boutique Stealing from a shop in Chinatown and possibly being present for Tony's murder of the store clerk Accessory murder when requiring Tony's assistance to escape her kidnappers Accessory to an illegal street race when putting herself up as a prize in a bike race around Callahan Point. Conspiracy accessory murder when informing Tony of Cedric Fotheringay's whereabouts, who is subsequently killed. Purchasing illegal drugs and accessory murder when requiring Tony's assistance during a particularly bad trip, resulting in the deaths of many bikers. Purchasing illegal drugs and evading authorities when a rave she attends is crashed by LCPD SWAT teams. Accessory attempted murder when unintentionally getting a hit placed on Claude by her husband. Conspiracy accessory murder when knowing about Asuka and Claude's plan to murder Salvatore Leone. And the torture and interrogation of former cartel leader, Miguel. As you can see, Maria Latore, while far from the worst of the worst on GTAB, was hardly an angel, responsible for the deaths of many, and prone to stealing out of habit. Maria's criminal surroundings would either bleed into her own personality, or simply mesh well with her existing narcissism, and her desires to have things her way at all times. Perhaps in another life, under slightly different circumstances, or perhaps if she had simply not married Salvatore Leone, she may have been your average, ordinary Libertonian woman, seeking thrills and stimulation in the worst city in America. When you're surrounded by as many crazy, psychotic, and violent individuals as Maria was, you would hardly be surprised when you find yourself joining them, because you certainly can't beat them. What is it that creates people capable of brushing off such destructive acts of violence without a second thought? Is it cities like Liberty and Las Venturas, dens of vice and criminality so alluring that even the most wholesome among us might be tempted by their malicious appeal? Or perhaps it is simply certain people who inevitably gravitate towards a life of rebellion and carefree corruption. We may never know for sure, but one thing that I know is that America is a dangerous place. 
Stay indoors, people. You never know if that middle-aged white woman ahead of you in line complaining to the manager is secretly the wife of a mobster prepared to cut off all of your precious toes. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching. Thank you to all of my patrons for making this series possible. And a special thank you to my very first executive producer patron, XX Anti Tricks Never Sorry 17. Myself and the Weasel News Network couldn't be more thankful for your contributions. America. The land of the free. Home of the brave. And the stupid. And the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets, causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight, on Grand Theft Auto Biography. Justice, Paranoia, and Cocaine. Tonight we will examine the fascinating life of a man who went from a two-bit criminal lawyer to a washed-up criminal record producer, and the hazardous detours he took along the way. A supposedly educated man who made a name and a living representing some of America's most notorious and psychotic killers. I Shut up, Ken! We will follow his journey from humble origins in the Sunshine State to rock bottom in the middle of the desert, all the way to his unlikely recovery working for the famous rapper Mad Dog. We will see laws broken, drugs taken, and assassinations escaped as we document the criminal history of Vice City's own Ken Rosenberg. Ken Rosenberg was born in 1953 in presumably Vice City, Florida, although this remains unconfirmed by medical records. Ken's childhood is a mystery, as are the identities of his parents, but if we assume he was indeed born in Vice City, perhaps at the Ocean View Hospital just down the road from his office, then we can also assume that Ken's parents had been locals themselves. Whether or not this was indeed the case, we know that Ken would develop an interest in practicing law from, we imagine, a young age. According to our investigations, Ken did indeed attend law school, and therefore passed his state's bar exam, receiving his license sometime in his early 20s. However, it is widely suspected within his own industry that Ken cheated on his exams, through unknown means, but we must remember this is merely conjecture. Sometime before age 25, Ken would gather the resources necessary to establish his own law practice in Washington Beach Vice City, K. Rosenberg & Company, running it out of the Hotel Harrison on Washington Street. Exactly what Ken's practice was like in the early days remains unknown, however given his latter clientele, it's possible that Ken received funds and or other assistance from less than reputable sources when first opening up shop, but this is merely our own speculation. What we do know is that by 1978, Ken had begun to represent, or at least cultivate a relationship with, the likes of the Liberty City-based Ferrelli crime family, who had spread their criminal tendrils as far and wide across America as they could manage. Ken, being an opportunistic man with no objections to actually breaking the law when it suited his own interests, would eagerly develop a business relationship with the Ferrelli family, presumably representing any and all of their interests in the city when possible, even if back then said interests were fairly minimal compared to their Liberty City operation. Ken would represent the likes of Giorgio Ferrelli primarily, who is thought to have been the man in charge of Ferrelli operations in the city until his cousin and boss of the family, Sonny, became interested in expansion many years later. By 1984, K. Rosenberg and company would be booming business-wise, representing the likes of many criminals from all walks of life, and acquitting them of their most heinous breaches of the civil contract. His firm would even bag a client in the Vice News Network who employed Rosenberg's team for official legal advice, in exchange for free publicity on the radio. Street rage descended on Vice City today as some drivers succumbed to the desire to ram and chase each other at high speed. Witnesses in downtown reported that some drivers were even seen to be discharging firearms at one another. Our legal team, Rosenberg and Company, urged citizens to quote the Second Amendment should they face charges. VNN, thinking for you so you don't have to. <laughs>
By 1986, Rosenberg would finally get his big break when the boss of the Ferrelli family, Sonny Ferrelli, heard about the release of the infamous Harwood Butcher, aka Tommy Versetti. Having been responsible for the failed assassination plot which had given Versetti his nickname, Sonny would move to have Tommy relocated to Vice City and help build the family's territory and influence in Florida, while also conveniently keeping him far away from Sonny. In order for Versetti to begin establishing a presence for the family, with Giorgio presumably running non-drug related businesses for them already, such as loan sharking operations, he would need a product to sell. And given that it was the 1980s, there was only one product the ravenous citizens of Vice City were hungry for. Cocaine. Turning to their resident legal contact in the city, Sonny would task Rosenberg with setting up a deal to give Bersetti the jumpstart he was going to need, after 15 years inside. Knowing all the city's key criminal players, and having prepared for just such an opportunity for the last eight years, Ken would quickly begin looking for potential sellers, and his first stop would be retired Colonel Juan Garcia Cortez. If there was anybody in the city who knew where to buy what Ken needed, it was him. Ken would presumably explain what the Frelli family wanted, and Cortez would happily and easily oblige, either putting Ken in direct contact with, or acting as a middleman to, the Vance crime empire, consisting of two brothers, Victor and Lance. The Vances had proven themselves capable drug runners in the city in 1984, when pushing the far more violent and powerful Mendez cartel out of the business, although Victor had desires to retire from the drug trade entirely. Finally given a chance to sell the 20 kilo shipment they've been sitting on since dissolving most of their criminal businesses in vice, Victor, the brains of the operation, would wearily agree to selling, and coordinate with Cortez to set up an appropriate location for both parties to meet. Hey, hey guys, it's uh, Ken Rosenberg here. Hey, 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 great, hey. Well, uh, I'm gonna drive you guys to the meet, okay? Now, I've talked to the suppliers, and they are very uh, keen to start a business relationship. So, uh, if all goes well, we should uh, be doing very nice to ourselves, which is, you know, good. Okay, so, they're brothers, okay? One operates the, uh, the business, and the other one does the flying. Okay, that's them and the chopper. All right, here's the deal. They want a straight exchange on open ground. All right? Okay, stay tight, let's go. Got it? 100% pure grade A Colombian, my friend. Let me see it. The greens? 10s and 20s. Used. I think we have a deal, my friend. <laughs> oh, shit! Come on, get out of here! Try! Ken would drive Versetti along with Ferrelli Associates Harry and Lee to the docks in Viceport for the meet, a straight open ground exchange. Unfortunately for everyone involved, the deal would be ambushed, resulting in the death of Harry, Lee, and Victor Vance, with Lance, Tommy, and Ken escaping by the skin of their teeth. I poked my head out of the gutter for one freaking second and fate shoveled shit in my face. Go get some sleep. What are you gonna do? I'll drop by your office tomorrow and we can start sorting this mess out. With the Ferrelli's money and coke both gone, Ken would be paralyzed with fear about what his bosses might do knowing the deal he set up went sour. With Versetti's assurance that he would help Ken to clean up the mess, he would retire to his office in Hotel Harrison and stay up all night trying to calm down with excessive amounts of caffeine. Go get some sleep, he says. <laughs> I have been sitting in this chair all night with the lights off drinking coffee. This is a disaster. We are so screwed, man. These gorillas, listen to me, are gonna come down here and rip my head off. It's re ridiculous. I did not go to law school for this. Okay, now what the hell are we gonna do? Shut up, sit down, relax. I'll tell you what we're gonna do. You're gonna find out who took our cocaine 
and then I'm gonna kill them. That's a good idea. That's a great idea. Let me think, let me think, let me think. Oh, there's this retired colonel, Colonel Juan Garcia Cortez. He's the one that helped me set up this deal well away from Vice City's established thugs, okay? Now listen, he's holding his party out in the bay on his expensive yacht and all of Vice City's big players are gonna be there, okay? I have an invite, of course I have an invite, but there's no way that I'm going out there sticking my head out the door, no I way, not I told you, happen. shut up, I'll go myself. Oh, whoa, 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 hey, I like 1978 too, but you know, this isn't gonna be a beer and strippers do. I mean, no offense, but I think that you might turn heads on the runway for the wrong reason. What's wrong with the way I'm dressed? Okay, look, here, stop by Raphael's, tell him I sent you. He'll make you look respectable. Okay, go, come on. Paranoid and scared stiff of mob repercussions, Tommy would attempt to assuage Ken's fears by doing the dirty work for him. Being an active Vice City socialite and a man who made his career knowing the who's who of the city's underworld, Ken would have an invitation to one of Juan Cortez's elaborate parties aboard his yacht docked in Ocean Beach. But given the circumstances, Ken would be too afraid to attend, and Tommy would go in his stead to investigate. Ken would remain at his practice and attempt to keep his composure, looking for leads all the while maintaining his regular day job of criminal lawyer. When Tommy returned from Juan Cortez's party, he wouldn't bring particularly helpful news, informing Ken that a street lead would be necessary to track down the thieves, if they were going to make any progress anytime soon. Ah, well I hope you're having a good time, because I'm going out of my mind with worry here. What did you find out? That there are more criminals in this town than in prison. We need a lead from the streets. Okay, let me think, let me think, let me think. Ah, I got it! Okay, there's this slimy, some music industry slime ball. Goes by the name of Kent Paul. Anyway, he's got his nose so far up most of Vice City's ass that if anybody knows the whereabouts of 20 keys of coke, it's this guy, all right? He's always at the Malibu. I'll go pay him a visit. Take it easy now. Ken would send Tommy to meet with well-known cokehead and manager of the band Love Fist, Kent Paul at the Vice City Malibu Club, and luckily for both of them, Paul would actually manage to give them their first substantial lead in a chef who was rumored to moonlight as an assassin, Leo Teal. Tommy would interrogate Teal, and in the process meet the brother of the dealer killed alongside Harry and Lee, Lance Vance. No closer to actually knowing anything about who robbed them, Ken's paranoia would only get worse when the Ferellis began applying further pressure on the overstressed lawman. Furious that their money had not yet been found, Sonny would demand that Ken do the family another favor in the meantime, or else. When Sonny's cousin, also presumably based in Florida, Giorgio, was facing a five-year prison sentence on fraud charges, Ken would be tasked with making sure the jury had a change of heart. Unfortunately for Ken, his skills as a lawyer, while good, were not perfect, and his attempt to persuade the jury of Giorgio's innocence would fail miserably, which meant that it was time for Tommy to take a crack at it his way. Oh, 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 for God's sake, it's you! Oh, jeez! I'm gonna need new pants! Hey, those psychos from up north, they've been on the horn, and they're coming down here soon! Now where is the goddamn money?! Relax, relax. We're not at that part oh, yet. Oh, I thought that you were taking care of this! I really did! And now those guidos say we gotta do them a favor! You mean I gotta do them a favor? Oh, oh of course that's what I mean. Do I look like I can intimidate a jury? I couldn't intimidate a child, and believe me, I've tried. Now look, it's either that or Ferelli's cousin Giorgio gets five years for fraud. You gotta take these guys out! I understand. Help the jury change their minds. Don't worry about no, it. No, 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 no! I tried that! The jury case didn't go so well. So make them change their minds. While Versity attempted to follow the trail on the streets, Ken would continue using the resources at his disposal to give them as much leverage as possible. He would meet with local real estate mogul Avery Carrington and recruit his help in locating their missing money and drugs, provided that Tommy helped him first. Hey, Avery, goes without saying, Tommy, Tommy, any progress? No, 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 tell me later, tell me later. Tommy, this is Avery Carrington. I believe you met at the party? Not in person. Howdy. Avery here has a proposition. <clears throat> Haven't we got other things on our mind? I'm trying to keep the wolves from the door. So could you please cut me some slack? I'm stretched like a wire, and even if I'm dead by the end of the week, I'd like to think that I didn't die poor. Now just okay? calm down, both of you. Son, you help me, and any greaseballs giving you a hard time, I'll see to it they take a long dirt nap. Okay, what could I do for you? This delivery company's got its depot on some prime land. They won't sell. They're hanging on like a big old prairie rat. So we gotta go in there and smoke that vermin out. Head on down there and stir up a hornet's nest. 
The security will have their hands full, and then you can sneak in and put them out of business. And you could drop by Raphael's for a change of clothes. You might be there a while, but yeah, go for it. Should be a riot. If the balls drop like they should. Stop by my office sometime. Tommy would somewhat reluctantly oblige Avery and instigate a riot at the Spand Express lot near Avery's building site, and later, flat out destroy an under construction office development in western Washington Beach. Meanwhile, Ken would wait with bated breath as Tommy made slow but steady progress on locating the party responsible for ambushing their deal, and in the process, also be forced to constantly bail Tommy out of jails across the city whenever he ended up on the wrong side of the local authorities. In our investigations, we managed to obtain an alleged conversation recorded at the Washington Beach Precinct of the Vice City Police Department between Mr. Rosenberg and a VCPD officer, whom we are told was fired shortly after the encounter. Vice City Police Department, Washington Beach Precinct. Officer Lundusky speaking. Tommy Versetti is an innocent man! Ah, uh, you must be Mr. Versetti's lawyer then. Listen, pal, don't even bother me with this nonsense today. I just watched this psycho chainsaw man to death in the middle of the street, and I ain't in the mood. Officer, you really think my client was capable of that? A fucking course I do. I saw him do it. I see why they called him the Harwood Butcher. Tommy Versetti walks right here, or we sue for defamation. Oh, you gotta be shitting me. Defamation? Everybody's heard about him down here at HQ. We got eyewitnesses nailing him in Vice Point. My client wasn't even in town today, and you know it! You're getting on my last nerve, pal. You really think all these people are wrong about him looking like the suspect? Of course he looks like the suspect! That don't make him guilty! You look like an idiot! That doesn't mean you are one! Idiot? You four-eyed, snot-nosed swindler! Mercedes walks right now, or there's gonna be hell to pay. Well, considering I'm getting promoted to sergeant tomorrow, I'm not too scared of you. You're just a lawyer. Now, if your killer boss here was making the threats, maybe I'd be scared. Tommy Versetti is a kind man, a generous man, a civic-minded man, but he does not appreciate being called a killer officer. Oh, he doesn't, does he? Well, I'll be sure to write that down in a memo entitled Pot Meets Kettle. Come on, officer! Tommy Versetti wasn't even in Vice City on the day in question. Oh, this fucking guy. You really think I'm gonna buy that? I got five different people identifying him entering the building with a gun and a chainsaw, and according to them, he both shot and chainsawed at least half a dozen people, including- Tommy Versetti doesn't even own a gun! How could he do that? How could he? Now let him go. Doesn't own a gun? What kind of gangster doesn't own a gun? Not the kind of gangster who mutilates somebody in broad daylight, I tell you that. You know, and I know, Tommy Versetti never did that. Maybe you know it, but I know this guy is guilty as the day he was born. And I swear if I was a sergeant, I would have had him transferred upstate already. Versetti walks or you can kiss your promotion goodbye, pal. Oh, now you're threatening me. I'm not gonna budge on this, buddy. I got eyewitnesses, I got videotapes from the Malibu across the street, videotapes from another hotel, I got evidence that he was there coming out of my ass. Well, sure he was there, but that hardly means he did it. Ah, oh, so we're making progress now. You're saying he was there. I see. It's really interesting how that works. Versetti walks right now. Bail or I sue? Go right ahead. My boss doesn't get back for another 20 minutes, and I punch out in 10. I won't have to deal with it until I'm sergeant. And by then, knowing the truth, I'll be able to shut this whole thing down. You wouldn't know the truth if you found it banging your wife. Now shut up and release my client. And your wife's not that great. What? You fucking... You, you think I don't know what I saw? Don't you dare talk about Belinda like that. Oh, really? Because you saw it. It must have happened. Ho, ho, ho. What a load of crap, and you know it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now you're starting to get it. I saw it. It happened. Just like that. No crap to be found here. Come on, officer, officer. Come on, what are you, drinking on the job? Never. I'm clean as a whistle, friend. Get Sergeant Polanski down here. That fat chump owes me a favor. Like I said, he won't be back for another 20 minutes, so you shit out of luck, and so is your murderer friend. My client is a very important man, and he won't respond kindly to these revolting accusations. Like I give a shit. I got all the evidence I need to lock his ass up for life. All your evidence is circumstantial bullshit and you know it. Circumstantial? Was it circumstantial when you became a two-bit criminal lawyer? We're trying to prepare a legal case, officer. Not sling accusations around like a pre picked dodo. I'll show you a dildo. My wife's got plenty to spare. I ain't releasing this psycho. I've never seen witnesses so shaken up before. In my opinion, you're wasting your time. You think your opinion is important here? We are talking about a man's freedom. What about the other guy's freedom to live with his head still attached to his torso? Don't make me get irritated with you, officer. You cannot substantiate your claims in any way, any way, shape, or form. Versetti walks. Walks? 
I got him on multiple counts of murder, breaking and entering, disturbing the peace, evading authorities. These charges, they ain't worth the paper they're written on, and you know it. Well, these charges are exactly why your client ain't making bail while I'm on duty. You have no grounds for refusing bail right now. Sure I do, he's a goddamn maniac. My client is innocent. Your client wears Hawaiian shirts. You think that is gonna stand up in court? That? No. I doubt they would be as judgmental as I am, unfortunately. Come on, he's an innocent man, officer! We'll just see how innocent he is when the jury deliberates, pal. If I have to make a claim against the police department for this outrage, I will. Yeah, we'll screw you too. Lindusky, you're fired. For said he's going free. I clear your shit, get out. Uh, but, but, sir, I... Take that awful self-portrait with you. Eventually, though, Tommy would indeed manage to track down the thieves thanks to Ken connecting him with Juan Cortez, and with help from Lance Vance, the two would storm the mansion of coke kingpin Ricardo Diaz, avenge Lance's brother, and take the Diaz crime empire for themselves. Or at least, for Tommy. Though their money had indeed been found, Ken would now find himself in a precarious situation. Still needing to keep in contact with the Ferrelli bosses up north, Ken would be responsible for apparently reassuring Sonny that Tommy's new operation was indeed a Ferrelli asset, and not what it appeared to be, his. Now both a Ferrelli lawyer and a Versetti gang lawyer, Ken would throw his weight behind Tommy primarily, who was now seeking to expand far beyond his original goals and take over Vice City himself. Oh, we gotta redecorate this place! We gotta make it look older! I can't stand this look! Tommy, what do you say? What do you say we put a bar in the- You're my lawyer, Rosenberg, not my interior decorator. Got it? Listen to me. The time to take over this town is now. It's all out there waiting for us. We need to start seizing territory. Let Vice City know we're the new players in town. You know what I'm saying? What you need is a legitimate front, Tommy. Real estate. It's never done me no harm. We need to start using some muscle. Or we can kiss all that hard work goodbye. Local business know Diaz is dead, and they're refusing to pay protection. Oh, we could try bribery. Bribery? Screw bribery. I'll show you how to make them scared. I'll be back here in five minutes. Perhaps due to his still stressful situation as a potential fall guy between the two very deadly organizations, Ken would around this time either develop or exacerbate a dangerous cocaine addiction. When Versetti purchases the Vice City Malibu Club as one of his many new business assets, Versetti would task Ken with setting up the office for his next big move, a bank robbery in Little Havana. Though he likely started doing coke to distract himself from his many potentially life-threatening predicaments, Ken would quickly become even more high-strung, but simultaneously eager to help in the robbery, something Versetti would disregard time and time again. Tommy! Hey, Tommy, look at this. This is great. I've got us this mini bar installed. We got a whole bar downstairs, Ken. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Well, I got the chalkboard you asked for. Ah! That's the benefit of a law school education, the ability to follow instructions. No, it is safe. Oh, all right, well, let me think. Safe, safe, safe. I got it. This guy will blow you away. Ah, nah, that schmuck, he's on the inside. Where inside? In a police headquarters cell awaiting transfer. I think he's about to get paroled. After pointing Versetti towards expert safe cracker Cam Jones, whom Versetti breaks out of prison, Ken would barely skip a beat at asking to fill one of the remaining roles needed for the heist, fueled by excessive amounts of cocaine pumping through his veins. But unfortunately, or more likely fortunately for Ken, Versetti would be wise enough to keep Ken in charge of what he knew best, the money, recruiting additional help through Cam Jones' knowledge of the city's best marksman, in supposed veteran and all-around lovable nutcase, Phil Cassidy. We need a stick-up man, you know one? Hey, Tommy! 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 This stuff keeps you sharp, man! Woo! I could be your stick-up man! Stick him up! Stick him up! You ain't a stick-up man, you're an idiot! Now get yourself a drink and shut up! Hey, get out of my way! Yeah, yeah, yeah! Ow, ow, ow! Relax! Cam, what do you think? Well, the best shooter in this town is a guy named Cassidy. Is that so? Yeah, a military guy, or thinks he is. I doubt he was ever in the army, but he certainly knows how to get a hold of guns. He'll be down at the shooting range. After finding and recruiting Phil, he would next connect the team with the best driver he knew in Hillary King, though once again a delusional and very, very high Ken would try to convince Versetti to let him be the driver instead, but once again he would be ignored by the likes of Phil, Cam, and Tommy. When the time came to finally get the show on the road, Tommy and his team would meet one last time to go over the details of the plan. 
Perhaps feeling useless since his role in the Versetti crime empire became less important with Tommy's legitimate fronts, and continuously refused in his desires to actively participate in crime alongside Tommy, Ken would remind the group of his importance, and get a rare acknowledgement from Tommy for his contributions as the Money Man. As you can see, gentlemen, this is going to be the easiest buck we ever made. <laughs> Tommy, seriously, you gotta consider going into law. <sighs> what the hell are you smoking, man? This ain't no simple plan. Well, who needs a simple plan anyway? Take communism. Now that was a simple plan. Didn't do Russia any favors, huh? Calm down, all right? With a team like this, it's gonna be no problem. We got Cam on safe. Phil, you and me will handle security. And Hillary will drive the get I don't... Uh, <laughs> aren't you forgetting somebody? Somebody who helped you to no end in this town? Somebody Ken! Like... Ken, that's right. Ken here, he washes the money for us. And he keeps the drinks on ice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand what I'm supposed to be doing here. Look, it's easy. Haven't you ever seen a movie? We walk into the bank. We wave the gun around and leave very rich men. Tommy would continue buying up assets around Vice City to grow the Versetti gang, and Ken would continue bailing Tommy out of prison whenever necessary, or otherwise representing the organization. However, despite not being actively involved in the fighting, perhaps against his own wishes, Ken would continue to be a vital asset himself to Tommy, who seemed to, at the time, genuinely respect Rosenberg's contributions, as a lawyer and a crook, even if he was often hard on him. When the Ferrelli family see fit to finally pay a visit to the Versetti gang and tax its many businesses for their cut of the profits, Ken would be forced to deliver the bad news of an attack on the print works, which was only the calm before the storm for the war between Tommy and Sonny. Hey, hello, Tommy, Tommy. We got a situation over at Printworks. You better go and check it out. I don't know, some kind of mess or other. Things are messed up. I gotta go. Though Tommy would manage to both catch and kill all of the Ferrelli's tax collectors, for Ken this would only mean bigger problems. He would receive a call from Sonny himself, apparently threatening to kill Rosenberg's entire family for his apparent betrayal, which Ken likely tried to downplay. Tommy, 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 I had Sonny on the phone, okay? Are you with me? I don't know about you, but there's something about a man threatening to murder my family which really scares the crap out of me. What are you gonna do? Ken, take it easy. I am calm. Calm as a man can be when he's fearing for his life. Stay off the idiot fuel and look after yourself. No one's gonna take us out. I'll see you later. I am calm. Don't I sound calm? Must be impending death that is doing this to my voice. Completely calm and prepared for this inevitability, Tommy would keep his cool and get ready for a visit from Sonny personally, with plans to cheat his old boss and send him packing with a briefcase of counterfeit money made of his very own print works. Ken, however, already high-strung enough before his coke addiction, would continue to freak out, expecting Ferrelli Hitman to get him at any moment. What's going on? Tommy! Oh, good, good, good. Listen, listen, uh, listen. I like fish. I love fish. I love them as pets in bowls. Or his food on a plate, but as much as I love them, I don't want to sleep with them, okay? But right now, your Italian brothers are coming from up there to fit me with some cement shoes, and I- Shut up, Ken! Sit down! Lance, what the hell's going on? It's your friends up north, Tommy. They ain't too happy you kept their man. They're coming down to see the business today. They took longer than I thought. Guys, we gotta make this final. We gotta leave no doubt that this is my operation. Mine! Ken, you get the first one to counterfeit cash and put 20 mil in briefcases. Lance, you get the guys together. Tommy! Why? No big hugs for your old buddy. I've had 15 years out of the loop. I'm a bit rusty on family <laughs> etiquette. Oh, he's angry, huh, Tommy? Didn't I say your temper would get you into trouble, huh? There's three mil in the cases. How many was it? Ten? No, eleven men. That's how you get to be called the Howard Butcher. <laughs> you sent me to kill one man. One man! They hey, knew Tommy, I was coming, Sonny. Tommy! Watch your tone. Anyone would think you blame me for that unfortunate set of circumstances. Just take the money. Get the damn cash. You know, Tommy, I did what I could for you. I pulled strings, called in favors. I was your friend, Tommy. I hoped you'd see sense, see what's good for business. I trusted you, Tommy, and you disappointed me. 
But at least someone in your chicken shit organization knows how to do business. Isn't that right, Lance? Sorry, Tommy. This is Vice City. This is business. <laughs> you sold us out. No. I sold you out, Tommy. I sold you out! The real cash is upstairs in the safe. So, Tommy, what was the big plan? You think I'd just take the fake cash, save face, and run away with my tail between my legs? No. I just wanted to piss you off before I kill you. Depending on one's familiarity with the infamous Harwood Butcher, it may not come as a surprise to know that in the ensuing battle between Tommy and Sonny's organizations, it would be the Versetti Gang who remained standing, with Tommy personally gunning down both the traitorous Lance Vance and Sonny Ferrelli, and fully establishing himself as the new king of Vice City. Having hidden during the fighting, a trembling Ken would emerge when the coast seemed clear, to find his friend and boss the last man standing, and at least for a time it seemed like Ken Rosenberg could breathe a well-deserved sigh of relief. Tommy? Oh my god, Tommy, what, what happened? What does it look like? It looks like you ruined your suit, and Tommy, that was a beautiful suit. Tommy, what on earth happened? I had a disagreement with a business associate. You know how it is. Tommy, I have a disagreement. I send them an angry letter. Maybe I pee in their mailbox. I don't start World War III. You know, maybe you should speak to my shrink. That stupid prick, Lance. Tommy, I never liked that guy, okay? He's neurotic, he's insecure, he's self-centered. The guy's an asshole. I'm glad you took him out. I don't think we're gonna be getting any more heat from up north either. Cause there ain't no up north anymore. It's all down south now. Wait, does that mean what I think it means? Tommy, baby! What do you think it means? That we're in charge. I mean, I mean that you're in charge. Oh, Tommy! You know, Ken, I think this could be the beginning of a beautiful business relationship. After all, you're a conniving, backstabbing, two-bit thief, and I'm a convicted psychotic killer and drug dealer. <laughs> I know. Ain't it just beautiful? Following Tommy Versetti's ascension to the kingpin of crime, Ken would continue to work for him in Vice City for several years, but Ken's habits would slowly dissolve the two's friendship over the course of the late 80s and early 90s. Presumably spending most of his time at the Malibu getting absolutely plastered, and slowly slipping in his duties as a lawyer and a friend. At some point between 1986 and 1992, Ken's addiction would be so bad that he would be disbarred from practicing law completely, and he would finally hit what he presumed to be rock bottom. With what little willpower Ken still possessed, he would by 92 check himself into a rehab center in Fort Carson, San Andreas to try and kick his destructive habit, and though he would initially succeed, his relationship with Tommy would be too far gone to salvage. But Ken would quickly realize not only was his reputation in the dirt, but being disbarred he was no longer a useful asset to the Versetti crime empire, or really anyone as far as he could tell. Determined to still try, he would attempt to reach Tommy from a payphone in Fort Carson. But fed up with Ken's antics, Versetti would refuse to even take Ken's call, let alone reconcile with the man. However, Ken, having spent many years deeply connected to several organized crime outfits across the country, would get one last chance to be useful, when a deal between the three Liberty City families selects him to be a moderating party. Looking to expand into the deserts of Bone County, and more specifically the fabulous Las Venturas, the families would pool together resources to open a casino themselves, Caligula's Palace, on the famous Ventura's Strip, and Ken's job would be to ostensibly keep them all honest to each other, but in reality, to catch a bullet from the first family who sought to change the power dynamic. Having been selected personally by the Leone Don Salvatore, Ken would be under particularly intense pressure to deliver exactly what Leone wanted, which was his entire investment returned as soon as possible, or else. Barely able to enjoy his newfound power for even a few moments, Ken would quickly be brought back down to earth, and realize the situation he was truly in, which seemed oddly, and terrifyingly, familiar. Right back to fearing for his life on a daily basis, and now friends with effectively nobody but a talking parrot named Tony, Ken would cower in his Caligula's office, awaiting what he believed to be his inevitable assassination. As if his misery could not be further compounded, around this time he would receive a visit from an old acquaintance he'd dealt with in Vice City. The only problem was, that acquaintance was Kent Paul. 
Kent Polk, here to see Rosie. Hey boss, there's somebody here to see you. Oh, go away. I have a migraine. Oh, hey, Rosie, son, it's me, Paolo. Oh, God. My despair is complete. Okay, let him in. Rosie, how are you, me old son? I pray that one day I can escape my perpetual torment and retire in peace and comfort a million miles away from anyone I've ever fucking known, and instead, I get this? Come on, it's me, Kent Poe. Well, hello, Paul. What a pleasant surprise. Who the hell are these guys? These are my boys, Maka and Cole. Sir. You are any speckled doves, boss? I'm peeking on one right now. Top of the range, yeah. man. Well, it's fitting as I sit here up to my neck in a river of shit with every mafia gorilla from Liberty City to Los Santos pissing in my face that you, Kent Paul, should witness it. What's the matter, son? Too numerous, oppressively insurmountable, and depressingly fucking typical, even to mention. It's all right, bruv. Paolo can help. Give us some space, would you, son? I'll give you a tinkle later. All right, for sure. Not you, Mecca. Oh, you twat. Unbelievable. Luckily for Ken, Paul had brought with him one of the most dangerous criminals in the state, Carl C.J. Johnson, after beating C.J. in the desert thanks to their mutual contact in the hippie drug dealer, The Truth. When Ken becomes increasingly worried that a hit attempt by the Ferellis on the recently traumatized Sendako underboss Johnny would succeed, Carl would try to keep him calm by providing his services and helping to keep the situation from getting any worse. Ironically though, unbeknownst to Ken, it had been Carl who traumatized Johnny in the first place, as he worked with the San Fierro Triads to try and rob the very casino Ken was running. Oi Rosie, liven yourself up, Carl's here. <sighs> Hello. What's happening? Hey, there's some top fanny down at that pool, Pabsy. Eh? Oh, leave it out, Dimlo. What's wrong with you? Well, are you gonna tell him or shall I? I'm really screwed. Crack on, Rosie. Spit it out. I threw it all away. Okay, I had the power, the money, the ladies, but I couldn't lay off the blow. So I went into rehab, and everything went to shit, but so what? So when I came out, I started representing the Liberty City mob again, and that's how I ended up here. But no one family would trust another family to run the casino, so I was put forth as a neutral party. So now I spend my days waiting for one family to cap me and blame the other one. My only friend is a bird named Tony. I never fucked anyone over in my life who didn't have it coming to him. Shit, let me think about this. You're gonna have to break it down for me real quick. Okay, okay. The Sendakos are on the warpath, okay? I mean, something terrible like has happened to Johnny. I mean, he's in a shock-induced coma at the hospital across town. Now, the Ferellis, they will take this opportunity to rub him out. Now, if any hit between the families succeeds on my turf, I will get the axe, bullet, machete, Okay, whatever. okay, relax. I'ma shoot over to the hospital and move the body or something. There you go, my love. Things ain't so bad, are they? <sighs> Bada bang! Carl would manage to find and safely deliver Johnny to the Sendako Abattoir on the edge of town, and with his first victory in what seemed like years, Ken would immediately slip back into his addictive habits, with a little help from his friends. <laughs> oh, baby, I'm back! I am back! Let's get this show on the road! The good doctor has revived the patient. Thank you, Sweet thank as my you, son, thank sweet. You. So everything's straight now? No! Absolutely not! I'm still screwed! Absolutely screwed, but at least now I'm in the right frame of mind! <laughs> what the fuck are we gonna do? Any minute now, some mafia bullet is going to splatter my brains all over the wall! My wall! My beautiful wall. Ooh, you missed a bit. I love that. Forget about it. Oh, that's a great idea, Tony, but you know what? It ain't gonna work, okay? Not this time. No way, no way. Look, man, relax. Get a grip. Yeah, you're right. I need to get a grip. Take control. Yes, grab the bull by the horn. And show everybody who's boss. I'm the boss. I am the boss. All right, then. All right. Let's tear this down. That's what up. I'm saying. <laughs> so where we going? Details! Details! Let's just get there! Rack em up, Macca. What's the matter with ya? 
Oscillating frequently between supremely confident and cripplingly scared, Cam would get a much-needed morale boost from CJ, who seemed to be taking a liking to the disgraced Florida lawyer and accompany him to his meeting with Johnny Sindaco. Okay, boss man, where to? We're gonna pay the Sindacos a visit and see how Johnny is. Win him over with some <laughs> kind words during his convalescence. Well, yeah, sure. I can take you by there. Okay, great. We need a car. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> I gotta get out of this game. Shit, my nose is pissing like a racehorse. That is really good stuff. Drive faster, would you please? Come on, come on, come on. What are you, an old lady? So you trying to get out? Yes, God, yes. I want to do something safe and legal and boring with people that like me and have a wife and some kids and get divorced and fight for weekend access like everybody else. Listen, I'll see what I can do. Thanks, I'm just so tired of all this life and death bullshit. <laughs> Ah, oh, shit, shit's all down my damn shirt and everything. Uh, it's my best shirt, too. Didn't this shirt look good on me? However, when Ken begs Carl to proceed further inside with him to calm his nerves, a reluctant CJ would unintentionally trigger a heart attack in the wheelchair-bound Sendako underboss, and an intense firefight would subsequently break out. What's going on? Did you forget something? No, look, you go on in, I'm gonna wait. Uh... Look, you gotta come with me this once. If I pull this off, I can carry on. I know I can, but please, you gotta come with me. I, I, I'm gonna squirt my ass all over the floor. Just this once, please. Please, please. Okay, please. okay, chill. <laughs> Shit, this can't look good. Listen, everything gonna be okay. Just remember, you the boss. I'm the boss? I'm the boss. I'm the boss! I'm the boss! I am the boss! Hey boys, tell your boss that Ken Rosenberg is here to see him. Ken who? K K Ken Rosenberg. <gasps> Ken Rosenberg, the guy that runs this town! So, uh, how's Johnny? Yeah, he's doing much better. Huh. Yeah, he ate something this morning. Oh! Huh. Mm -hmm. Hey, Ken! Oh. Ah, oh, Christ, this fucking thing. <laughs> Ken, como esta? Yeah, how you doing? Pretty good. And you? Ah, I still got a little bit of the night terrors, uh, <laughs> touch of diarrhea, but I'll get through it. Huh, diarrhea. Cool. And yeah. uh, who's this? How you doing, Johnny? It's fucking him. It's him. Oh, oh my head. Oh, God. It's him. It oh, my heart. My heart. Uh, uh. Damn, that nigga fucked up. But with CJ's help, Ken would manage to survive the encounter, just barely, following Carl as he gunned down numerous Sindaco soldiers to escape the abattoir. Shit, we gotta get the fuck out of here. We need some wheels. Get me back to Caligula's. You calm down and follow my lead. Holy fuck, man. We work well as a team together, huh, CJ? You and me tearing this town up? Nobody can stop us. Nobody in the world. Johnny's a done deep, and so is his gang. Too fucking right they are, dumb pussies. Oh, fuck, I'm screwed. I'm fucking screwed. What the fuck am I gonna do? Shit, shit, shit! You just gotta hang in there. Play it dumb. I'll figure out a way to get you out of this. Just drop me at the airport. Nah, man. They gotta think you did. I think of something. I promise. Get in there and be cool, like you've just been out for a relaxing drive or something. Calm. Yeah, calm. I'm calm. Real fucking calm. I'm calm, Mr. Calm, Mr. Calm. That's me, Mr. Calm. Ken would saunter back into Caligula's, attempting to keep his cool, and not reveal his participation in the death of Johnny Sindaco, but with the arrival of Salvatore Leone and Las Venturas, he would soon learn he had much bigger worries to concern himself with. Hello? Carl, it's me, Ken. Show the Leone family has speed. made yes, their move. Salvatore's here. Now, he's taking over Caligula's! We're screwed. It's war for control of Venturas, man. War! War! There's word of some triad visit or something that should keep them busy. I'm calling from the bathroom. I gotta go. I really gotta go. Though still completely unaware of the true extent to which Carl was screwing over the families he was working for, Ken would maintain his cover, and try to keep his mouth shut for as long as possible so as not to upset the easily perturbed Don Salvatore. Vouching for Carl's considerable skills as a gunman, Ken would introduce CJ to Mr. Leone at his Caligula's office, and unknowingly give Carl the perfect chance to conduct subterfuge for his planned heist by gaining Salvatore's trust. And who's this asshole? The name's Carl Johnson, sir. Before working with Mr. Rosenberg here, I had the pleasure of doing business with your son, Joey, back in Liberty City. 
You know my Joey? I like that. So, kid, what can I do for you? Well, Ken, if vouch for me, I'm a straight killer. Oh, but one man fucking army. A, a real dependable. Total fucking maniac, too. You know the Ferrellis are sending over a crew to hit me. Their flight gets in soon. Traveling is a string quartet. <laughs> I was gonna send some of the boys over as a little welcoming committee. But uh, maybe you can take care of it. Thank you, sir. I guarantee you, you won't regret this. Uh, maybe I should go away. Ah! That, that, you stay where you are, Rosenberg. I don't want you getting yourself lost. But Ken, always the fervent paranoiac, would continue to stir in his own fears of being capped by Salvatore, or one of the other two Liberty families breathing down his back. Starting to feel like he could trust Carl as a friend, Ken would appeal to CJ's good nature, and beg him to do whatever it is he was going to do, fast. Hello? You've hung us up to dry, I know it. Rosenberg? Yeah, soon to be wearing concrete shoes in a shallow grave in the desert, Rosenberg? I'm surprised you remember! Look, I ain't forgot y'all, man, just hang in there. Easy for you to say, this Salvatore guy might whack me at any moment! Thoroughly satisfied with CJ's performance as a hitman, Don Salvatore would hire Carl to perform an assassination on Marco Ferrelli at the St. Mark's Bistro in Liberty City, and on Salvatore's orders, dispose of Ken along with Paul and Macker in the process. Carl! It's my man! Mr. Leon? Looks like this piece of shit was right. You did a real number on those Ferrelli losers. Now it's time the Ferrellis found out what it means to screw with Salvatore Leon. How would you like to hit the St. Mark's Bistro? A hit in Liberty City? Cool. But I'ma need some backup. Take who you want! Well, I usually use these two. Hey, hey, remember all those jobs we did together? Huh? Huh? You and me, Carl, remember? Huh? You know, you used to call me Killer Ken. Ken the Killer? Killer? Ice Cold Ken. That's me. And him too, I guess. Thankfully, Carl was not interested in killing any of his new allies, and instead only interested in robbing Caligula's with his triad friends running the Four Dragons Casino up the road. Alright, you guys better get out of Los Venturas fast. I'll be in touch. What about your backup, man? Will you be alright without us? Of course he will, you fucking moron! Come on! Shortly afterwards, Carl, along with his triad allies, would successfully rob Caligula's palace, but not before Carl ensured that Ken would be safe from Salvatore's wrath by lying to him and reporting Ken, Paul, and Macker all deceased. Hello? Hey, Carl, my boy. Mr. Leone. Everybody's talking about the job you did on that same Mark's Bistro. Thank you, Mr. Leone. And you, uh, you took care of those three loose ends? Yeah, those poor saps ran into a little trouble along the way. You won't be hearing from Mr. Rosenberg again. Good boy, good boy. Now listen, you're gonna have to keep a low profile or people will start to make connections. So let's keep our distance for a while, huh? I'll call you. Thank you, Mr. Leone. Though Salvatore would inevitably discover CJ's role in the robbery, he would apparently never question Carl's killing of his three loose ends, knowing that CJ had played the double agent supremely well when actually carrying out all of Leone's other orders, such as the assassination of Marco Ferrelli. As a result, Ken would finally be free of the threat of death for the first time in months, and be able to relax in parts unknown until a new opportunity came ringing, by way of his new friend, Carl Johnson. Hey Ken, how you doing? Who is this? It's Carl. Carl Johnson. Hey, Carl! Great! Guys, it's Carl! Great! I'm fucking great! Fucking amazing! I got a need for an accountant and a sound engineer, and I thought of you and Paul. Fucking amazing! Paul's great with figures, and I'd make a fucking amazing producer! This is... This is fucking great! It's amazing! Yeah, yeah, whatever you say, man, but look, see you soon. Fucking amazing! Finally seeing a turn of fortune, Ken would become the accountant for Los Santos rapper Mad Dog, alongside Kent Paul and CJ producing and managing the artist, respectively. Not long after getting his career back in order, Mad Dog would sell his first gold record, thanks to help from his new team, including Ken. It seemed as though Rosenberg had finally managed to find a place for himself again, without having to constantly fear for his life. Whoa, 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 whoa. I come in peace with Mr. Dog here, who has an announcement. My, I mean, our first gold record! Yes, you know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, they heard about I it. I decided to get breast implants. Oh, so <laughs> yeah, fucking local, bro. is it? Joke on. Anyway, what's next? We should hit the casinos, roll some dice with Woozy. Nah, we gotta take care of shit here first. We going on tour, fam! Has anyone got a tissue? My nose is... <laughs> yeah. It won't stop running. Is that, Anybody? 
Yeah, I have over there. Uh, I'll pass. Carl, where are you off to now? Finna hit the block. See what's happening. Little to no information exists on Ken's life or career post-1992. Perhaps due to a desire to avoid the limelight in all respects, and avoid broadcasting his survival to the likes of the Leones back in Liberty City. We, however, couldn't care less about outing him. If you're out there, Ken, don't worry, I'm sure they're over it by now. Probably. Ken Rosenberg was a high-strung, frequently paranoid drug addict with a knack for getting himself into deadly situations. From a young age, Rosenberg seemed to aspire to criminal law in the most literal sense, actively attempting to cultivate a relationship with the Ferelli family and mingling with the likes of Colonel Juan Cortez, Kent Paul, and many other less-than-legitimate businessmen with full knowledge of his client's violent or otherwise illegal proclivities. Ken was never worried about the moral cost of representing murderous thugs or psychotic killers, and even happily made some of them his closest friends, either out of a genuine attachment to them, or a desire to remain on their good sides and avoid their considerable wraths. Rosenberg was an intelligent man, having at the very least the knowledge and skills necessary to become a lawyer, even if he did cheat on his exams, and using his keen sense of opportunism to exploit the situations he found himself in when possible. Even if his law degree was built on a lie, Ken was inarguably a very effective defense lawyer in his heyday, managing to get Tommy Versetti off on bail numerous times when the evidence against him seemed beyond damning. He was also an expert at networking, and had little issue earning the respect of his fellow criminals with his silver tongue. However, when fearing for his life, Ken could become a dysfunctional mess, and clearly didn't deal with stress very effectively, turning to drugs as a crutch at the slightest hint of disruption to his otherwise smooth day-to-day. Ken also clearly had some ambitions to be more than just a lawyer working for criminals, as evidenced by his incessant attempts to be included on the El Banco Corrupto Grande heist, and his reminiscence while fighting alongside, or rather behind, Carl Johnson. Whether Ken actually had it in him to squeeze the trigger on an enemy remains to be seen, but he at least paid lip service to wanting a more active role in the criminal organizations he often represented, even if when given the chance to fight, he would usually choose to flee. Ken was in many ways everything wrong with the American criminal justice system, using every trick in the book to clear his clients of any guilt for their many, many substantial crimes, and with full knowledge that those clients were in fact guilty as all hell. Ken's primary concern seemed to be himself, and he showed little interest in developing long-lasting and time-testable friendships, romantically or platonically. Despite being plenty capable of socializing for business purposes, Ken seemed to have a great deal of anxiety outside of his business dealings, and especially following his disbarment from practicing law. It's possible Ken was always like this, though it seems fair to assume that following his disbarment, the loss of his old life in Vice City, and a friend like Tommy Rossetti, and nearly being killed on numerous occasions, he would only become more fearful of his fellow man, and less willing to engage in social activities without the aid of his real best friend, Cocaine. What all of this says about the man remains up to you, my dear viewer. It's arguable that Ken is among the worst of the worst here on GTA Biographies, not for his direct role in murderous affairs, but for the number of people who he deprived of a truly just verdict, when saving his criminal buddies time after time. However, it could also be said that Ken is arguably one of the least violent individuals we've ever examined on this program, as he himself isn't technically responsible for many crimes at all, and may therefore be one of the least offensive criminals we've examined. Perhaps it all depends on one's perspective. Was Ken Rosenberg a conniving, backstabbing two-bit thief? or a man misunderstood, just trying to make it any way he could in America. You decide. Ken Rosenberg is an interesting case when examining his potential criminal record, due to his role as a man of the law himself. Technically speaking, Ken Rosenberg was never charged with or even overtly suspected of anything other than representing very dangerous men, even if his role as a money launderer and mob defense lawyer occasionally bled into active participation. With this in mind, we have attempted to compile a list of what we believe may have been some of Rosenberg's crimes, but we must emphasize that if it were possible to hold him accountable for any of it, there would most certainly be far more than we will be able to cover here tonight. That being said, let's look at what we think he could have been charged with if our justice system weren't so horribly skewed in favor of corrupted men like him, starting with possibly cheating on his state's bar exam, conspiracy accessory drug dealing, drug dealing, and fleeing the scene of a crime when setting up a cocaine deal that is ambushed by the DS crime organization, accessory intimidation of a jury, and destruction of private property when putting Tommy Rossetti onto the Giorgio Ferrelli case. 
accessory murder, and conspiracy accessory prison break when putting Tommy onto safecracker Cam Jones. Conspiracy accessory murder and armed robbery when having knowledge of the plan to rob El Banco Crepto Grande in Little Havana. Accessory murder when present for Tommy Versetti's slaughtering of the Ferrelli crime family. Conspiracy accessory counterfeiting and money laundering when working for the Versetti gang in Vice City. Accessory murder and conspiracy Grand Theft Auto when hiring Carl Johnson to save Johnny Sindaco, with Carl killing several Ferrelli family goons in the process and stealing an ambulance. Accessory murder when witnessing Carl's slaughtering of the Sindacos at their abattoir in order to escape. And accessory murder when vouching for Carl's services as a gunman to Salvatore Leone, who hires Carl to kill several hitmen. As we said before, if Ken was to be held accountable for the actions of his occasionally dishonest profession, then it seems likely this list would be ten times longer, given the many times he bailed men like Tommy Rossetti out of prison, or otherwise lessened the sentences of violent, dangerous criminals. However, if there's one thing that Ken Rosenberg could hold over practically every subject we have, or perhaps ever will examine here on this program, it's that he ultimately was able to get away with everything by using the law to his advantage, instead of constantly falling victim to it. Ken Rosenberg was many things, a coward, a thief, and a con man, but he was also in many ways a truly American success story. Sort of. What makes a man take the criminal and criminal law so seriously? Is it simply too difficult to make it in this great nation these days without turning to a life of crime to make ends meet? Or are some people simply destined to wind up on the wrong side of the law in either a jumpsuit or a business suit? One thing that cannot be forgotten is that America is a dangerous place, and true justice can be a fleeting, illusory ideal. Stay indoors, people. You never know if your defense lawyer is secretly representing mobsters who would sell your organs for profit if given the chance. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching. America. The land of the free. Home of the brave. And the stupid. And the criminally insane. But my friends call me Woosie. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets, causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight, on Grand Theft Auto Biographies. Gambling, racing, and robbing. Tonight, we will be examining an infamous Chinese-American businessman, a miraculously talented driver, and a natural gang leader, all rolled into one eccentric and occasionally violent package. We will follow the criminal exploits of one man determined to do right by his people, while making a neat and considerable profit, and his journey from the second fiddle triad in San Fierro to casino owner on the fabulous Ventura Strip. We will see unlikely friendships form, rival gangs defeated, and a Mafia Casino robbed, as we document the known criminal history of San Piero's own Wootsie Moo, aka Woozy. Effectively nothing is known for a certainty about Wootsie Moo's early life, but some assumptions regarding his early years can be made based on what little information we were able to obtain. It isn't entirely clear if Woozy was born in the United States or China, but given his accent, it seems at least likely that he spent the majority, if not all of his youth, in America, possibly in the bayside city of San Piero San Andreas, where he would eventually set up shop alongside several other triad groups in the state. Who Woozy's parents were, his motivations for joining or forming a San Fierro triad, or his reasons for taking to organized crime, however, all remain unknown, with his first and last known interactions with the law taking place in the magical year of 1992. It seemed that by 92, Woozy was in his early 30s or late 20s, which would place his birth date sometime in the early to late 1960s, but as is so often typical on this program, no official birth records could be obtained from any hospitals in the whole of San Andreas, leaving the question of his birth nation ambiguous. 
Despite all the things that Woozy would go on to do, he was amazingly completely blind. Presumably since birth, though it's possible he gradually lost use of his vision or had some type of accident which induced his blindness. Whatever the case, he rarely spoke about his condition, which he seemed both ashamed of and proud of simultaneously. Blind or not though, Woozy was gifted with what his triad dubbed natural good fortune, which allowed him to do many things that one might otherwise assume were practically impossible for a blind man, such as playing cards, or more often, racing cars. At some point in his life, Woozy would develop a love for that great American machine, the automobile, and quickly become interested in San Piero's underground racing scene. He would participate in presumably dozens of races over the years, in and around San Piero, Red County, and possibly Whetstone, alongside many of the city's most talented street drivers, including famous contractor Claude and his girlfriend at the time, Catalina. By the early 90s, Uzi would not only be a skilled street racer, but the official boss of his own triad organization in San Piero, the Mountain Cloud Boys, albeit subservient to the Red Gecko Tong Triad, headed by Ron Fa Lee. Yeah. Woozy's official title within the triad would be Dai Dai Lo, or Big Big Brother according to our in-house translation team, which signified his position as second in command of all affiliated triad groups under only the more experienced Chinese-born Ran Fa Li. As boss of the Mountain Cloud Boys, Woozy would oversee the establishment of, and maintenance of, an off-track betting shop in San Piero's Chinatown district, as well as coordinate all other criminal enterprises that the triads had their hands in across the state. Sometime in 1992, Woozy would meet notorious gangbanger Carl C.J. Johnson, while racing against Johnson's future brother-in-law, Cesar Vialpando, in the Red County racing circuits. Cautious, but always eager to make new allies, especially talented ones, Woozy would introduce himself directly to Carl and wish him good luck in the race, but given his reluctance to disclose his blindness, he would at least initially come off as an eccentric and possibly dangerous man, whose lack of predictability put C.J. and Caesar on edge. Where is this guy? Hey, I've been waiting forever, man. Where the hell you been? Sorry, Holmes. I had no idea when the race would be. Right. You just happened to show up five minutes after everybody else, huh? When the gasoline runs through your vein like the burning passion, you know when it's time to race. I think you're getting high on that country air, man. Hey, CJ, look. You haven't been to one of our meets before. Where are you from, friend? I'm from Grove Street Family. Los Santos, what's happening? Relax, this isn't a parade, pal. But you know, we gotta be careful. Wootsie Moo. But my friends call me Wootsie. How are you doing? CJ, Carl Johnson. Listen, out here we like to race for cash or pink slips. Race of choice. Get your car started, we're about to go. Good luck, Carl Johnson. There's something real strange about that dude. Be careful, CJ. Show. Sure. Eventually, however, the three would become good friends, especially Woozy and Carl after two separate races across the uneven hills of Red County. Seeing great potential in making an ally of the clearly very skilled CJ, Woozy would present Carl with his official business card for contacting him in San Fierro, and leave Carl with the idea of meeting up again in the future to work together in their shared criminal exploits. Yeah. You drive with style, Carl Johnson. And I never mind losing to a guy who's willing to push himself right to the edge. As for me, I'm a man who honors his bet. Well, you learn pretty fast with the police on your ass. Listen, it's best if we clear the hell out of here as soon as possible, because for some reason the local police don't appreciate our noble sport. Yeah, thanks for the advice. Okay, I gotta go. Uh, you know what? If you ever find yourself in San Fierro, give me a call. Maybe you can do a little business together. Hey, I might just do that. I guess that's our wake-up call. Nice meeting you. Though Woozy wouldn't know it at the time, he would be cultivating one of, if not the most, profitable relationship with the state's up-and-coming gangster entrepreneur in Carl Johnson. 
While operating his triad out of the San Fierro betting shop in Chinatown, he would eventually catch word, likely from Caesar via Pondo, of CJ's arrival in the city, and their plans to set up a chop shop in Doherty, as well as slowly work to infiltrate and destroy a drug dealing syndicate that Carl had personal gripes with, the Loco Syndicate. Using the triad's vast knowledge of organized crime in San Fierro, Woozy and his right-hand man Guppy would visit CJ's Doherty garage to begin helping him with the syndicate, starting with the most important part of any good plan, gathering information. <laughs> it's That's this crazy, is man. <laughs> what are you looking at exactly? Hey, God, hey, man, you get them flicks developed? Sup, Woozy? Hey, Carl. I was just explaining to your brother-in-law that we were friends. Oh, yeah? Well, look, Woozy, I need to get some info from you, man. What exactly do you boys want to know? Who are these putas, Holmes? Why don't you go take a look? These guys? Yeah. They're the Loco Syndicate. They're pretty big time, I think. Don't have any dealings with them. We don't touch blow. Now, this guy runs things. I don't know his name. This guy is T-Bone Mendez. He's the muscle. And who's that guy? That's Jizzy B. He's the biggest pimp in town. He helps set up the deals. You know, uh, concierge of sorts. Hey, did he my way in? how I get to him? Oh, Jizzy? Jizzy runs the Pleasure Domes Club in that old fortress under the Gamp Bridge. Hey, good looking out, Woozy. No problem. Don't be a stranger. All right. Using their information, CJ would introduce his services to Jizzy B and slowly begin to earn his trust in order to properly screw him over when the time was right. In the meantime, CJ would also take the opportunity to make good on his obligations to help Woozy after helping him with the Loco Syndicate, by working with his triad, the Mountain Cloud Boys, to maintain control of their vast criminal empire. Hey, what's up? Hey, Carl, it's Woozy. Hey, if you got some time, I'd like for you to come over so we can talk about something. Yeah, for sure. Where you at? I own a little betting shop in Chinatown. Just come around and uh, introduce yourself. My people will be expecting a visit. It's a plan, man. Later. Come, Come on, on, you can do it! You Come can on, do it! Kick ass, baby. We're close, Puckeye! Easy, man, I'm here to see Woozy. Oh, uh, upstairs! Stupid ass motherfucker. Come on, Come Birdstone! On, Birdstone. Come, ah. on. Go. 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 Come on, go! 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 Come on, you can do it! I'm Johnson, I'm here to see Woozy. I Birdstone, work with him. Yes, right this way. Uh, you know of the boss's curse? Curse? Nah. He's blind. Blind? But we was just racing cars last week. Yes, I know. He's blessed with unbelievable good fortune. And the triad that would do anything for him? We call him our lucky mole. I. I keep that in mind. Good. Woozy! Hello, Carl. Hey, what's happening, Woozy? You know, how you doing? Straight to the facts. I can't use your help unless I'm open with you about who I am and what I do. Let me reintroduce myself. I am the boss of the Mountain Cloud Boys. Nice to meet you. Likewise. Why don't you sit down? As Dai Dai Lo of the Triad, it is my responsibility to see that disputes are settled without uh, damaging important business. Where I come in at? We shall see. I'm about to drop in on a local Triad that failed to show face at the last Tong meeting. Come with me, and you'll see how we Triad settle things without recourse to unnecessary violence. All right, I'll ride with you. Being a loyal friend for the most part, CJ would happily assist Woozy in his triad any way he could. Needing to check up on a group of Bloodfeather triads who missed out on one of the last Tong meetings, a gathering of Chinese organizations both legitimate and illegitimate for cooperative benefit, the two would set out to get answers, but with the recent arrival of Vietnamese gangs attempting to muscle in on triad businesses, Woozy would be notably nervous. The Bloodfeather triad have a storehouse around the block. We shall see what excuses they have to offer. Okay, so what's all this talk of business? Some small-time Vietnamese gangs have been making trouble lately. We're not sure why they're gaining any courage now, but I'm nervous about the situation. 
How do I fit in all of this? You're an outsider. This is a place. Come on, it's this way. Upon arriving at the Bloodfeather warehouse, Woozy and Carl would initially be greeted with a panicked crowd, fleeing the scene. Although with Woozy's impaired vision, he wouldn't immediately notice the trouble, even if he sensed something was wrong. Ah, we're here. This way. Strange, this gate is usually locked. Stick close. Oh, man. Woozy, what's got you so spooked? Oh, oh, sorry. Didn't see you lying down there. He's dead. They all are. The blood feathers wiped out? Die, die low. Uh, forgive me. I was too scared to fight, so I hid. Enough. What happened here? The Vietnamese surprised us. Cut us all down. Shit! Here they come again! Having already wiped out the entire Bloodfeather triad, the Vietnamese gang, the Da Nang Boys, would ambush Woozy and CJ in the alley, and attempt to cut down the Mountain Cloud Boys boss, but with Carl backing him up, the two would manage to safely escape the attack, to regroup at the betting shop. We got more company! Now more precisely aware of the threat gangs like the Da Nang Boys posed to the triad's control of Asian organized crime, Woozy would meet with the Shoot Fu, or most senior triad member in San Fierro and head of the Red Gecko Tong directly above the Mountain Cloud Boys, Ron Fa Li. With CJ's assistance, now a guarantee thanks to the mutual aid between he and Woozy, Ron Fa Li would employ Carl to retrieve a vitally important package from Easter Bay Airport. Though exactly what this package contained or how it helped to serve the Tong leader or Woozy remains unclear. Hey, Boozy, my man. What's going down? Hey, CJ. Let me introduce you to Shuk Fu, Ram Fa Li. He heads the Red Gecko Tong on the West Coast. How you doing? Yeah. Mm. Ah Ah Kong has sent word from Kowloon. A Vietnamese crime family, the Da Nang Boys, are preparing to move to the United States. This may explain the cowardly attack on the Blood Feather Triad. There may be some trouble ahead. The Shifu would like a package retrieved. A courier has left it in a drop at the airport. It is most important to the matter at hand. Oh, I can do that. <laughs> he is Triad? A mountain boy? No, a personal friend of mine. And less likely to draw the attention of the Danang boys. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for your support. Ron Fa Li would lounge around Woozy's apartment above the betting shop, playing video games and generally seeming unfazed by the very real threat that Danang boys were to both him and the rest of the San Fierro triads. When Woozy expresses a desire to be proactive in their moves against the Danang, Ron Fa Li would insist that he'd been followed to the Mountain Cloud Boys base of operations, and that any attempt to leave would result in an inevitable assassination attempt. Thankfully, Carl's natural criminal problem-solving skills would kick in, and he would suggest a classic strategy to keep the Red Gecko Tongue leader safe while he carried the heat far away. As honored as I am to share my home with you, we should lure these lizards out into the baking sun. <laughs> We were followed here. The Da Nang boys are watching this apartment. As soon as we leave, they will attempt an assassination. Hey, what's the big deal? Won't you cruise on out of here, lead them to a place quiet, and cap they flat asses? No offense. None taken. <laughs> we find you funny. Tch, look, long as they think Mr. Farley here is in the back, they'll follow me wherever. After a while, you can come out safely. Simple. <laughs> Amazing. Your success will be rewarded, Mr. Johnson. More than happy to use Carl's skills as a driver and a seemingly neutral party to the Asian organized crime outfits in the city due to his being black, Ron Fali would remain inside the betting shop, while CJ left the building in a rancher to lure the Da Nang Boy assassins all the way to the countryside. Hey. 
Johnson, it's Guppy, are you okay? Yeah, it's nothing. They took the bait like morons. Mr. Ramfai Lee, get out all right? Yes, Woozy is taking him to safety. Thank you. Cool. I'll see you later, man. In between serious work for the Mountain Cloud Boys on Woozy's part, or managing his garage on CJ's part, the two would find time to genuinely bond, playing video games together at Woozy's apartment, and becoming friends through their mutual respect for each other. During one such casual hangout, Woozy would pry Carl to see if he would be capable of helping with the next move against the Danang Boys, but for once, CJ would be out of his depth, pun intended, at least, initially. I need something taken care of. What? Hey man, quit trying to distract me. How are you in the water? What you mean? Can I swim? Yeah. Can you swim well? No, I can't. Shit! Man, damn! How you do that? <laughs> However, being a determined man and general jack of all trades, especially criminal ones, Carl would take the opportunity to train himself in the water, despite his own fears of swimming, going back to his days as a kid swimming by the Santa Maria Pier. Hold on, you trying to tell me you can't swim? Seriously, when I'm in the deep water, it, it panics me. Plus, I'm terrified of eels and squid and seaweed and- Okay, dude, see, I know you're just trying to make excuses now. Look, CJ, I need someone from outside the triad who I can trust. Alright, so let me get this straight. You want me to swim around in dirty dock water, dodging little brown jelly beans and Vietnamese gangsters to put a bug on a boat in the harbor? You're so negative. Listen, man. When I was a kid, swimming off the Santa Maria, I once got a condom stuck to my face. <laughs> Horror like that stays with you for life. Believe that. <laughs> I have a confession to make. I, um... I'm blind. No shit! Yeah. Although I've trained my other senses to a point where you wouldn't notice my handicap, in the water, they'd be quite useless. All right, Woozy, relax. Don't beat yourself up about it. Look, I'll do it. Uh, one last thing. You do know that I'm black, right? And not Chinese. I'm blind, Carl, not stupid. Summoning all of his courage, CJ would somewhat reluctantly agree to help Woozy in planting a bug on the Danan Boys' own ship docked in San Fierro Bay. While the job itself may have been difficult for even the most well-trained divers, Carl would somehow manage to pull it off with minimal resistance, remaining unseen as he snuck aboard the tanker to give the Mountain Cloud Boys an opportunity to finally get ahead of their rivals. Now able to listen to Danan conversations to gleam a possible advantage, Woozy and the Mountain Cloud Boys would instead learn, perhaps unsurprisingly, that the Vietnamese gangsters were arriving in San Fierro with a substantial cargo of refugees, something it seemed both Woozy and CJ both strongly objected to. Having already helped the Triad substantially up to that point, Carl wouldn't hesitate to volunteer in helping Woozy's men to finish the fight, and keep the Danang boys from making their move into America permanent. Woozy, my man! CJ, you caught me on my way out. Business? This is the big one. This is the one that is going to seal my place in the Red Gecko Tong. But something's come up, and I gotta sort things out myself. Excuse me. Little Lion, what's the news? Damn! Why today, of all days? Okay, shit. Uh, take Guppy and go check it out. Trouble? The Danang boys are arriving today on a container ship. Little Lion's gone to check it out. I really gotta go, too. Hey, man, look. Don't even trip. I'm a handless for you, all right? Thanks, my friend. Your help and friendship has been invaluable to me. Thanks, man. What are other guys? Oh... They're getting a helicopter to do a couple of flybys of the ship. Look, if everything goes well, I'll call you in a week or so and invite you to my new spot. Woozy himself wouldn't accompany Carl, Little Lion, or the other triads to the freighter, but thanks to CJ's unique skill set, it would hardly matter, as he pushed his way through Danan gangsters to reach the freighter's hull and rescue the refugees. 
Carl would even kill the Danang Boys' leader, known only as the Snakehead, and effectively halt the gang's plans to move to America, at least temporarily, and subsequently help Woozy solidify his position in the Red Gecko Tom. Please! The Snakehead tricked us! We're prisoners! Please help us escape! The Snakehead is up on the bridge! With the Danang boys eliminated, at least for now, Woozy would be prepared to make his next big move, literally, by relocating his triad center of power to the fabulous city of Las Venturas to open a triad-controlled casino, the Four Dragons, on the famous Ventura Strip. Before the move, however, Woozy would follow through on his promise to help Carl dismantle the Loco Syndicate. He would send triad reinforcements to CJ and Caesar when ambushing the Syndicate at Pier 69, and later help Carl to track down the last remaining figurehead, mysterious G-Man Mike Torino, as he supposedly attempted to flee the city. It's Woozy. I've got some information for you. Hey, Woozy, what's the business? My man found that van you were looking for by the helipad downtown. And Torino? Yep, he's there. Apparently he's about to take some merchandise and cut out a helicopter. They've already started loading boxes. Something about Torino don't add up. Holla back if you hear something. Although Woozy's information on Torino would technically be accurate, neither would know at the time that CJ only eliminated a stand-in, as Carl would go on to work for Torino when the truth of his affiliations was revealed. Before learning of Torino's survival, though, CJ and Woozy would work together one final time in San Fierro to coordinate an attack on the Loco Syndicate's drug factory on the south side of town, using Woozy's knowledge of the criminal operations in the area. You're going soft on me, man! You did something good, eh? Yes, you did. But this isn't over yet. What you mean? Well, your former friends have a factory. And the way I see it, if you take that out, you will have put them out of business for good. Yeah. CJ. Who is this? I work for Woozy. He told me to call you. Alright, what's up? I'm rigging a car with explosives so you can take out the crack factory. Drop around the garage downtown. Cool. I'll be at you in a minute. With all of their Bayside City loose ends wrapping up neatly, Woozy, Ron Lee, and a significant portion of the Mountain Cloud boys would migrate to Las Venturas and begin setting up their casino. But Woozy would have one other party in mind that he wanted to bring in on the casino venture, who had been an invaluable asset to the triad and their San Fierro operation. That party was, of course, Carl Johnson himself. Hello? Carl, it's Woozy. Hey, Woozy, man. What you been up to? Come along and see for yourself. I got a little business proposition for you. Come over and see the setup, my friend. Okay, for sure. I like that. Like it? You're gonna love it! It's the Four Dragons Casino in Las Venturas. I'll see you soon, yeah? Yeah, okay. But running a casino is never easy, and especially when that casino faces immense pressure from established organized crime outfits in the game who rarely take to new competition with a smile and a handshake. While attempting to set up the Four Dragons and perform all the necessary preparations for the grand opening, Woozy would quickly learn just how difficult it was going to be to run their business with the Mafia-run Caligula's Palace up the road, looking to squeeze any new players for every penny they had. With equipment being destroyed, his employees being harassed, and just general chaos while getting things ready, Carl's arrival in Venturas couldn't have come at a better time for Woozy, who would reveal exactly what his offer to CJ entailed, should he be interested. Idiot! Do you realize how much those machines cost? We're supposed to be opening it. What the fuck was that? Hello? Hello? <clears throat> what the fuck is wrong with you people? Boss, CJ's here. Carl, glad you can make it. So, this what you've been doing? Yeah, it's been a complete nightmare. You want a stomach ulcer? Try opening a triad casino in a mafia-run town. The mob trying to squeeze you? Yeah, the corporations are moving in and everybody's feeling the squeeze. I've had slot machines busted up, workmen being scared off. So who behind this? Huh? Well, there are these three mob families operating here and each of them has a stake in Caligula's casino. And some whacked out lawyers running it for them. It could be any one of them. Or all of them. Can't you just give them a little something? No. 
In addition to the usual authorities that need bribing, each one would want a slice. And I'm not about to hand over all our profits to some wise guy Italians. Our profit? That's right, you heard me. I want to offer you a share in our casino. In exchange for some help setting it up. How's that sound, partner? Sound like we got a deal then. Boss! The boys found some thugs trying to smash one of the deliveries. We caught one of them. Get rid of him. Hey, wait. Hold up. Hold up. Come here. Whoever's behind this, we need to let them know that they're dealing with full-fledged psychos. <laughs> Time to the front of the car, then you sweat it out a little, and I'll be out there in a little while. See if we can make this guy squeal. That's my car. Using his knack for intimidation, CJ would have the thief tied to the hood of a car, which he proceeded to drive dangerously around town until the man gave up his associations. CJ would learn that the party responsible for attempting to jack their shipments was the Sindaco family, and quickly returned to the Four Dragons to tell Woozy what he'd learned. Knowing that directly competing with the three powerful Mafia families who already had an established presence in the city would be next to impossible, CJ, the aspiring criminal mastermind, would devise a plan to counteract the mob's hostile action by hitting them where it hurt the most, their wallets. <laughs> the glorious sound of a hole-in-one. Great shot, boss. Thanks. Not bad, Woozy. So, the Sindaco family was behind the attempts to sabotage our venture. I wonder why it's only them and not the others. Probably ain't just them. Rule of the streets, don't snitch. What we need is to hit the Mafia Casino. Yeah, go jack the place. Hey, hitting a casino isn't like gangbanging. It's a whole different league. Yeah, you right. It'll take some planning, but I'm down. She always wanted to pull a heist. What the? Ah, bad luck. Listen, you're gonna need a crew and some special equipment. Yeah, it'll take some explosives. Always gotta blow up shit to pull a heist. You know what? There's an open cast mine southwest of the city limits. They must have explosives. I'll go peep it out. After pitching his idea of a casino heist to Woozy, CJ would begin to concoct his master plan beginning with obtaining explosives for, at the time, unspecified purposes, knowing that at some point something was going to need to blow up. Woozy would continue to oversee the day-to-day -day operations of the Four Dragons as the heist began to take shape, purchasing machines, hiring staff, and dealing with continued Mafia incursions, biding his time for the perfect revenge. One such incursion that would require immediate attention would be when the existence of counterfeit casino chips becomes apparent. Knowing the Sindaco family owned a plastics factory across town, Woozy would immediately be suspicious of them producing the fake chips, but an always proactive Carl would once again volunteer to handle the situation himself. Hit me! Are you sure, man? Yeah, I'm going for a five-card hand. Come on. Okay. Here. I'm a stick. What you got? How would I know? You tell me. Not good, man. You got, a uh, 47. Damn. You're bad luck for me, you know? When I play the other guys, I always win. Boss, take a look at these two chips. One's a fake. That's amazing. You didn't even touch him. No, I just took a guess. Why else would he come in with two chips and sound so worried? You take a look. Oh, yeah, the dragon on this got the sunglasses and a white stick. Insolent bastards! I'll make sure the cashiers are extra vigilant. It's obvious where these chips are coming from. The Sindaco family owns a plastics factory across town. I'm gonna blow it to shit! Man, look, don't trip. I got you on this. After successfully destroying the Sindaco factory, Carl would coincidentally stumble onto the perfect opportunity to conduct sabotage when an unlikely contact connects him with the former mob lawyer running Caligula's for the three Liberty City families, Ken Rosenberg. Hey, Woolsey, I think I found a way to scope Caligula's casino without causing too much suspicion. We can talk later. 
Before their plans could be realized, however, there remained the official matter of making Woozy, Ron Vali, and CJ partners in the casino on paper. Mr. Ron Vali. <clears throat> Gentlemen, can I have your marks, please? Gentlemen, or shall I say partners? Mm. Oh, I drank to that. With their partnership finally official, Woozy and Carl would begin planning one of the most elaborate and notorious casino robberies the state had ever seen. Luckily for Woozy, among Carl's many, many skill sets, would be a natural talent for organizing just such a job. Perhaps having been raised on one too many bank robbery movies, CJ would insist on their meeting taking place in a secluded maintenance closet, despite the casino boss literally being one of the planners. Woozy? Oh, Carl. You could at least turn the lights on. Oh, I thought I had. But this window here must let some light in. Yeah, this perfect right here. This what we gonna plan a high set. Anyone else coming? Nah. Couldn't we have done this in my office? You gotta have a secret place to plan shit like this. That's just how it's done. Okay, okay. I see where you're coming from. So, what do we do? I guess we gotta make a plan. Speaking of plans, do you have the layout to Caligula's Casino? Shit. Nah. I guess I gotta go get one. Meeting adjourned? Meeting adjourned. Leaving Woozy in the dark literally, but not metaphorically, CJ would obtain blueprints of the casino from the Las Venturas planning department, using his unique methods. With plan in hand, Carl would deliver them to Woozy and begin to pour over the details meticulously, to determine the most effective approach for pulling off such an ambitious heist. Thankfully, Woozy would be able to draw not on just Carl's skills, but on Carl's allies as well, specifically tech expert Zero, who had worked with Carl at his Doherty garage. Zero would send the casino team a card reader capable of bypassing any security system reliant on the, at the time, state-of-the-art technology. All they needed now was a card to clone. Now I know you're blind, man, but you gotta see this. Very clever. So what's the prognosis? Is this just gonna be extremely difficult, or next to impossible? Hear me out on this, homie. Alright, the cash room is on the bottom level. There's a bunch of rooms and a tunnel under the whole building with access to the casino floors at either end of the complex, all right? Now, security consists of CCTV, a key code access, and in places, a swipe card. Hey, are you pointing again? Oh, my bad. Have it. Ah, don't worry. It's good practice for when we finally get a crew in on yeah, this. Yeah, I know. Hey, boss, this arrived for CCTV. Hey, 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 hey! Damn, man! Now we've seen the plan. Well, then we've got our first recruit. Come on in and shut the door. All right, cool. This is the security card reader that Zero sent over. Now all we need to do is get one of those cards. Luckily, there's always one guaranteed weak link in any security setup. The human heart. What happened next is the matter of some debate, as there are contradicting reports from the time which make it difficult to determine what really happened. According to some, Carl Johnson would court a Caligula's croupier, Millie Perkins, and seduce her in order to obtain her access card. However, there are also those who claim that in actuality, CJ murdered Perkins to expedite the process of breaking into Caligula's, with an alleged conversation between Carl and Woozy containing a half-hearted confession to this despicable act. Hello? What is the holdup with that security pass, CJ? Man, it had been a slight setback. Well, what kind of setback? Well, more of an unfortunate accident. It's Millie. She dead. What the fuck? How? When? Well, we was hanging out and shit got fucked up. That's all I'm saying, man. Well, her pass will probably be in her house. You gotta break in and get it. Shit, you right. Hey, I'ma call you when I get to call. Whether Millie Perkins was murdered for her card, or was simply deceived long enough for Carl to steal it, is anyone's guess. But what is known for certain is that CJ did obtain the card necessary for the team to continue with their established plan, by apparently any means necessary.
Unsurprisingly, CJ's efforts to keep the heist plan a secret by meeting in a maintenance closet wouldn't work for very long, and eventually, half the staff at Four Dragons would wander into his and Woozy's meetings as their team continued to expand. While Carl headed out to plant explosive charges at Sherman Dam in order to cut the power to Caligula's during the heist, Woozy would hang back and attempt to explain the plan to their growing and increasingly pedestrian team of janitors, nerds, and triad gangsters. Seem impossible to keep a secret around here. I would have thought the size of the room would keep the numbers down. Hey, speak up! We can't hear you back here! I appreciate your input! But please, fuck off! What'd he say? <laughs> he said fuck off. Come on, let's get out of here. Hey, what are you still doing here? I live here. Oh, okay, you can stay. Great. Hey, where's the coffee and donuts? Okay, look, I'm gonna go shut off the city's power source. Wolves, look after these fools for me. Okay, now... The important thing to remember with a plan like this is that nothing can go wrong. The team's next objective would be to find a way into the casino itself, without arousing suspicion. And once again, Carl would be on top of things with a plan to steal several police motorcycles, and eventually, an armored truck, in order to pose as money men making a deposit during the heist. Still allowing Carl to take the lead on the heist planning, Woozy would continue to hang back allowing his men such as Guppy to do the dirty work with Carl while he held down the fort and kept things business as usual at the Four Dragons. All right, here's the plan. It's all about the art of deception. While I get as much heat on me as possible, y'all get away with the green. Question, how does the Mafia normally move cash out of Caligula's? Bingo. Stripes of Mr. Zero here. Hey, good job, you little <laughs> ass Ow. kisser. Ow. So, we gonna steal ourselves an armored car and respray it so it looks like one of the regular trucks. What about the police escorts? Whenever they move cash around, they use police motorcycles as outriders. Exactly what I was thinking. Come on, come with me, and we gonna go get some cop wheels. One thing Woozy would do directly for the plan would be to obtain Caligula's casino uniforms for the team to facilitate their nonchalant entrance, although exactly how Woozy went about doing this is unknown. With the charges planted, uniforms and keycard obtained, and several LVPD motorcycles to escort the armored van, all they needed now was the van itself. Though Woozy proposed simply stealing one during its regular collection rounds, Carl would insist that getting the crew involved in a street theft of that magnitude would only incur unnecessary casualties, and the real solution would instead come by way of their tech expert, Zero. Okay, we got the bikes and Woozy taking care of the uniforms. Now we just gotta get an armored van and respray it with the Caligula's Casino logo. Why don't we steal one while it's on its rounds? That way we can make some money, too. Nah, I don't want to get the crew caught up in some street-level jack and it could get up. Um, I... I have an idea. Um, have you ever seen those helicopters they use to lift heavy loads? Yeah, they call them sky cranes. We could lift the whole truck and take them to someplace safe. Then we need to steal a sky crane. Unfortunately, I'm not a pilot. Well, uh, me neither. Hey, don't look at me. Or me. Shit. I fly it then. We could respray it at the airstrip. Yeah, Carl. It'll be just like fighting Berkeley, only bigger. Yeah, thanks for that. After stealing a sky crane to steal an armored car, the Four Dragons heist team would have everything they needed to stage their robbery. Woozy, Carl, Guppy, Zero, and the unnamed janitor of the Four Dragons, who apparently lived inside the building's maintenance closet, would suit up for one of the biggest heists in San Andreas history. We all good? Yeah, we're good. Alright, see you at the back door. Let's roll. Though of little practical help on the job itself, Woozy would nonetheless participate directly in the heist itself, attempting to maintain the guise of complete control while delegating directions to Guppy. Posing as a Caligula's staff member, CJ would effortlessly slip past security and proceed to the building's basement to let Woozy and his men inside where the real fun could begin. Well done, Carl. Now it's time for us to do our part. Try to stay close. Okay, team. I've gone over the layout to this place so I know it back to front. Everybody follow me. 
The Davius Bastards have changed the layout. Don't worry, I'll take the lead, boss. Good idea. Everybody, follow him. Upon arriving at the actual vault, Woozy would set the explosive charges while Guppy watched for incoming Mafia soldiers, and Carl went upstairs to ensure the backup generators remained off, after Zero leaked their plan to his arch-rival, Berkeley. Not far now, keep alert. Hey, I was just about to say that. Sorry, boss. Not far now, everybody. Touch Stay alert! Oh yeah, stay alert! The team would blast their way inside the vault, grab as much cash as their hands could carry, and return to their armored van and escort bikes, for an easy exit as Carl kept the casino's security squarely focused on him. Okay, we'll set the charges while you watch the door. Okay, boss. Hey, I'm on it. Hurry it up, gentlemen. They know something's wrong. Someone else is in the system. Hey, what's the problem? Somebody's trying to bring the emergency generators back up. Okay, I'll head back up to the generator room and shut them down for good. Everybody take cover! Oh, shit. Where do I go? Where do I go? Fire in the hall! Okay, people, load up the cash. I've unloaded the police bikes. Everybody in. You two, change into your police uniforms. Carl would eventually manage to escape security and flee the scene in, of all things, a police maverick, meeting back up with Woozy and the rest of the team at Carl's Verdon Meadows airfield, east of the city. Although not as smooth a ride as it could have been thanks to Zero's ego, the team would nonetheless come away from the job as very rich men, and as an added bonus, the robbery would effectively kill the interests of both the Leone and Ferelli crime families, who soon after pulled out of Caligula's entirely, with the operation presumably remaining exclusively under Sindaco control. Zero, will you hide? I didn't mean to tell Berkeley. It just kinda came out, is all. We are watching, you idiot! Hey, CJ, calm down! You better take me home, CJ. After successfully running two out of the three Mafia families out of Ventura's, Woozy and his triads would comfortably remain in control of the now exponentially profitable Four Dragons Casino. Woozy would continue to oversee all the minute details of the casino itself, selecting talent, vetting his workers, dotting every I and crossing every T keep the business, business as usual. Woozy would also allow Carl Johnson's sister, Kendall, to assist as a talent manager as things finally seemed to settle down, at least temporarily, for the busy triad boss. Don't hate the little man cause he's packing the six shooter! Oh, next! Thank you. Thank you! Thank you! Do you know how much balls it takes to stand down here and sing a song like that? It takes guts. I'm, I'm sorry, we're just looking for something with a little more uh, mass appeal. What could have more mass appeal than a song like Small but Perfectly Formed? Women want me. Men want to be like me. Asshole. Oh. <laughs> you gotta be right. kidding me, right? Damn. This casino game is hard work. I thought it was just a case of opening the doors and letting suckers give you their money. If only. You know what? I'm getting bored here. I'm trying to do business, not audition midgets. People of reduced stature, you mean? Yeah, yeah, I said that. All I know is when are we going to get some real talent in here? I heard that. Woozy would assist Carl one final time in 92 that we are aware of when he provided a team of triads, including the ever-effective Guppy, to storm the former Mad Dog Mansion, now controlled by the infamous drug dealer Big Papa, in order to return it to the disgraced rapper. Woozy would continue to presumably see both Carl and his sister Kendall for many years, but like the Johnson siblings, little to nothing is known about Woozy's life beyond the year that made him and his own famous among criminal circles the world over. Wootsie Moo was an intelligent, charismatic, and unnaturally lucky Asian-American gangster who was naturally talented in the art of organized crime management. Woozy adhered quite strictly to the values and rules of his associated triad and always respected the chain of command, showing nothing but appreciation and respect for the likes of Ron Fali. He was also himself a highly respected man who commanded loyalty from his subordinates through rational and calculated action rather than force or a rush to violence. That being said, Woozy was not without a temper, as he would occasionally display bouts of frustrated rage when provoked, though he rarely acted in violence himself unless absolutely necessary. Woozy was a loyal friend and, for a criminal, an overall trustworthy person, to those he considered friend and ally. He never hesitated to return a favor or pay back a debt he owed in spades. He intentionally kept his triads business limited to what he believed to be less harmful vices, such as gambling, 
while refusing to involve his organization in the cocaine trade or human trafficking, as was so often common in cities like San Vero. However, Woozy was not above allowing at least some collateral damage in his business dealings, even occasionally civilians, so long as he could write off the tragedies as necessary evils, such as the alleged murder of Millie Perkins, though it's worth noting that this remains unconfirmed. Being blind, Woozy would to some extent constantly seek to prove himself as capable as any seeing man to both his triad and his personal friends. He seemed to be both embarrassed and proud of his own condition due to his reliance on others for certain daily tasks, while also displaying strangely adept skills in activities that might otherwise seem inaccessible to a blind man, such as his ability to play video games quite well. This natural talent, or luck, whatever one might call it, would be exaggerated by Woozy's subordinates, though it isn't clear if this was done by their own accord or on orders from Woozy himself to maintain his ego. However, we believe the former to be more likely. Although Woozy had a close friendship with Carl Johnson, beyond CJ, not much is known about Woozy's personal life. If he ever married, who his other friends might have been, or how he came to be the man he was before meeting Carl are all a matter of debate. As far as we can tell, Woozy does not appear to have been married or romantically involved with anyone in 92, though it's entirely possible that the often private man kept such matters just that, private. All of this being said, Woozy was at the end of the day a gangster, and complicit in the deaths of many people, even if the majority of those people were other criminals caught up in the game. He was also responsible for operating both a betting shop and a casino, whose entire purpose was to deprive people of their money in games almost certain to significantly benefit the house, aka him. His organization, while uninvolved in human trafficking or cocaine distribution, was nonetheless responsible for numerous illegal operations in and around the state of San Andreas. He was certainly no angel, but as far as criminals go, he was hardly the dirtiest of the bunch. As the boss of a crime family, Woozy has no shortage of potential charges that could have been levied against him, although as is all too common for subjects of this program, he was never apprehended for his numerous crimes. Whether or not he ever saw jail time in the United States or elsewhere, however, remains irrelevant to our investigative team, who will always seek to showcase just how many crimes go unpunished in this great nation. It is also worth noting before examining the numbers we have on Wootsie Moo that these numbers only reflect his actions in 1992, and do not account for his likely many crimes before and since. With that out of the way, let's look at the crimes we believe Wootsie was responsible for during his time in association with Carl Johnson, starting with Illegal street racing when racing Carl Johnson and Claude in the Red County Circuit Accessory murder, murder, and reckless endangerment when checking on the Bloodfeather Triad and fighting the Da Nang Boys Conspiracy accessory murder, accessory illegal surveillance, and accessory trespassing on private property when hiring CJ to sneak aboard the Denang freighter and plant a bug. Conspiracy accessory murder when hiring CJ to attack the Denang freighter with Little Lion. Conspiracy accessory murder when helping Carl to find and kill Mike Torino, even though it turns out to be a body double. Conspiracy accessory murder, accessory terrorism, and accessory destruction of private property when making CJ aware of the Loco Syndicate factory and helping to plan its destruction. Accessory torture slash interrogation when allowing Carl Johnson to tie Johnny Sindaco to the hood of his car and drive him around town to get him talking. Conspiracy accessory murder, accessory trespassing on private property, accessory conspiracy to commit terrorism, and accessory theft when sending Carl to steal dynamite from Hunter Quarry. Conspiracy accessory murder and conspiracy accessory terrorism when planning the destruction of the Sindaco's plastics factory with CJ. Conspiracy accessory murder, conspiracy trespassing on government property, accessory arson, and accessory destruction of government property when planning to steal the casino blueprints from the city planning department with Carl. Alleged accessory murder and conspiracy accessory theft when planning the manipulation and possible murder of Millie Perkins with Carl. Conspiracy to commit terrorism and conspiracy accessory murder when planning the infiltration of Sherman Dam by Carl in order to plant explosives on the generators. Conspiracy accessory murder and accessory grand theft auto when planning the theft of several police bikes for their heist. Conspiracy accessory murder, accessory grand theft arrow, and accessory grand theft auto when planning the theft of a sky crane and armored van with CJ. Armed robbery, murder, and conspiracy accessory murder when breaking into Caligula's palace, robbing the vault, and escaping with a substantial take and conspiracy accessory murder when providing Carl Johnson with reinforcements to take back Mad Dog's mansion from Big Papa. 
It should not come as a surprise to know that Woozy's rap sheet for his actions in 92 alone would have been more than enough to land him in prison for several lifetime sentences, if he'd been prosecuted to the full extent of the law. However, once again we must remind you that as gang boss, it is a certainty that Woozy was responsible for far more crime than we were able to report here tonight. For men such as Woozy, there seemed to exist a vague criminal code of do's and don'ts. However, any meaningful collateral from his actions didn't seem substantial enough in his eyes to warrant a re-examination of his own violent lifestyle. We can only guess at the extent of Woozy and his triad's true criminal history. What makes somebody abandon the civil societal structure of these glorious United States for a life of crime, exploitation, and obscene profits? Is it greed, or perhaps that ever-present motivator which seems to underline so many of the world's most feared criminals? Ego. America is a dangerous place, folks. You can never be sure if that blind guy wandering your local supermarket is actually a highly skilled martial artist gangster prepared to kick you in the neck for the slightest offense. Stay indoors, people. Lock your windows and mark your pastor's phone number as spam just to be safe. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching. America. The land of the free. Home of the brave and the stupid, and the criminally insane. Yeah! The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on Grand Theft Auto Biographies. Fame music, and a whole lot of posturing. Tonight we will look at the life of a one-hit wonder whose one hit wasn't even his own creation. We will follow the criminal exploits of a man who claimed to come from the streets and constantly sought to validate that image by any means necessary. An aspiring hip-hop artist and petty crook who deceived the entire West Coast into believing he possessed enough talent to land himself on the Vinewood Walk of Fame. We will see cold-blooded murders, terrible house parties, and a career built on one of the music industry's biggest lies, as we examine wannabe gangster Jeffrey Cross, aka OG Loke. Jeffrey Cross was born in Los Santos, San Andreas, likely sometime in the early 1970s or late 1960s, given that he appeared to be about the same age or slightly younger than his friend Carl C.J. Johnson, born in 1968. Jeffrey grew up on the Grove Street cul-de-sac directly across the street from the Johnson family home, where C.J., Sweet, Brian, and Kendall all lived with their mother Beverly. Who Jeffrey's parents were, or how involved they were in his life, remains unclear, but it seems fair to assume they were fairly uninvolved with his early life, as Jeffrey seemed to look up to the Johnson clan from a young age, perhaps even viewing Sweet or CJ as a pseudo-big brother. Despite this bond, Jeffrey would struggle to properly fit in with his friends, especially the Johnsons, who ran the infamous Grove Street family set with Sweet as the leader and CJ his top lieutenant. Jeffrey, on the other hand, would never earn enough street cred or respect to be given an opportunity to join the GSF proper, constantly turned down by the Grove's leadership and encouraged to pursue a life outside of the criminal ones they had chosen. But for Jeffrey, being considered a gangster or street hard would be his one and only pursuit, and he would eventually find what he believed to be his springboard for gaining that respect and the recognition he so desperately craved, gangster rap. At some point, possibly in his youth, but at least by the time he was in his early 20s, Jeffrey would begin billing himself as a gangster rapper and spend many dozens of hours trying to write rhymes or freestyle for his friends around the Grove. He would adopt the stage name OG Loke and begin introducing himself as such on the regular. The reception to his musical aspirations, however, were less than enthusiastic, and he would receive next to no encouragement from any of the Johnson brothers or other well-known GSF members like Melvin Harris, aka Big Smoke. Despite being told consistently to give up his rap dreams, OG Loke would instead come up with a plan to increase his credibility among the gangsters he hung around with, get arrested. 
In early 1992, he would go out of his way to receive jail time by doing anything he could get charged for, accruing parking fines and joyriding around police officers, among other petty crimes. His plan would work, unsurprisingly, and Jeffrey would be given a very brief stint in the city jail at the LSPD headquarters downtown. Whilst inside, Loke would spend his time working out in order to build up his gangsta physique, but it isn't clear if this is at all true, or simply more posturing, given that he appeared to look the same both before and after going away. But life in American jails is never easy, and for a man such as Jeffrey Cross, it would end up being a particularly traumatic experience. At some point during his very short stay, Jeffrey would apparently be assaulted by fellow inmate and Eastside Vagos gangster Freddy, in a situation all too common in prisons all across this nation. This event would likely severely traumatize him, and after being released weeks later, just after Freddy, he would immediately seek revenge. Hey, did that fool go? Look at this fool, man. Perk Trey Mikey banging. Think he hard. <laughs> <Got him. laughs> oh, I tell you. I know that fool can't be serious. Hey, what's happening with you, Jeffrey? Hey, man, it's OG Loke, homie. OG Loke! Ah, uh, uh, my bad. How was it though, homie? Man, what you think? How was it? Hey, chill out, dude. So what you want to do now? Man, I got to kill some Chola motherfucker. He was dissing me, man. Hey, Jeff, I thought you was going to, uh, college. <laughs> <laughs> man, fuck you. Motherfucker done stole my rhymes. He's in East Flores. Hey, give me a strap. Man, won't you stalls out with that shit to get in the car, fool? Picked up by his Grove Street buddies, OG Loke would be on the warpath, and ask them to take him to Freddy's house in East Los Santos, before his shift started at his new job, given to him by his parole officer, Fast Food Janitor. My parole officer lined me up with a job. Motherfucker always trying to keep a player down. You got that right. Still, ain't so bad. I'ma be a hygiene technician. Coming up in the world, huh? Just a stepping stone to greatness. Though Sweet and Big Smoke would be far too keen on Jeffrey's antics to lend a hand, Carl would be strangely willing to help Loke track Freddy down, and even take him out, perhaps out of a sense of loyalty to a fellow Grove Street gangster, even if he was all talk. Man, this is the spot. Ain't this Vagos hood? Man, I don't give a shit. I'm gangster. <laughs> Come on, let's leave Loke to deal with Casanova. Hey, I'll stick with Jeff. I mean, Loke. Okay, cool. I'll see you guys back on the set. Freddy, I've come for you, you motherfucker! Hey, Lope, hold up! Jeffrey, you got the wrong idea, man. That was just a prison thing. I, I got plenty of muchachas on the outside. I don't need your scrawny ass. Man, ignore him. See, I don't know what he talking about. Hey, yo, give me back my rhymes, you thief. I'm gangster. You dropped the soap, sugar. I don't know nothing about any rhymes. Hey, hey, motherfucker's making a run for it. Hey, Lo, get back here, nigga, you crazy. Hey, you back off me, CJ. I gotta protect my rent. Loke and CJ would chase Freddy all across town, with Loke attempting to shoot him off of his motorcycle, but eventually, they would catch up with him at a basketball court in East LS, and a shootout would ensue. Thanks to CJ's considerably more impressive skills with a firearm, both he and Loke would survive the encounter, with Freddy meeting his end along with the fellow gangsters. With Freddy's death, Loke would acknowledge his assault to CJ for the only known time, and ask him to keep his mouth shut, knowing that now the only other man who knew was among the dearly departed. Don't you say a damn thing, CJ! <laughs> Wish you lonely low? Hey, I like a nice mustache myself. I keep it real, I like you fake-ass motherfuckers. Come on, gangster, let's get back to the grove. Nah, I can't. I gotta go and sign in for this damn job. Whatever you want. You wanna ride anyway? Sure thing, let's roll. After murdering Freddy, CJ would drive Loke to the Verona Beach Burger Shot for his first shift, and Carl would agree to continue helping Jeffrey out of his hood obligations. Though Carl would keep his promise of helping Loke in his journey to become a successful rap star, he would, quite wisely, avoid becoming any closer to Jeffrey as a friend, and continuously refuse requests to spend any quality time with him, if only to avoid his god-awful rapping. Thanks for the ride, CJ! Don't be a stranger, fool! Yeah, for sure. I'll see you around. Like a quarter pound! Later! In between shifts, on the street, and even on the job, Loke would practice his rapping and presumably begin the process of recording his album, though exactly where he was paying for studio time remains unclear. Dreaming of the day he made it big, 
Loke would begin envisioning his next publicity stunt in a debut album party, but his ideas would at least initially be far too ambitious and illegal to bring to fruition. Luckily for Loke, his old friend CJ would be, strangely enough, more than willing to do just about anything to help him out, including stealing a sound system that he hoped to use for his debut. Looking real technical, gangster. <laughs> you ain't run off again yet? No, gangster. I'm here for good. Yeah? Well, fuck this gig, man. I'm putting together a listening party for my album. But first, I need a sound system. Hey, I'm damn. As long as I don't have to go to the port. What you talking about, fool? Guaranteed I start playing, everybody will come through. Being real OG, I really ain't into rap no more. I'm more into that hardcore gangster shit. Well, that's me, homie. That's me, OG Loke, baby. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I only like them if they rhyme real well. You know, well, anyway, what you want me to steal? That's what I'm talking about. Love for your homies. Now check it. I caught me a real fly sound system, cruising through the drive through I think they headed down to the beach for a beach party. Now check this out. I roll with you, and on the way, I can get a couple of free stabs. It's OG Loke in the place. You don't want to stop me with a gun in your face. Yeah, 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 OG, yeah, man. Let's OG. shut the fuck up. Maybe I need to do this on my own. I believe in you. Gangster for life, homie. For life. Yeah, for life, homie. But a loud, bombastic premiere would never be enough to launch his career if his music didn't sell. And despite constant practice, Loke would see little to no improvement in his actual rapping. With practically everyone around him telling him he wasn't good enough, eventually, even he would begin to doubt his abilities, and he would quickly realize he needed a new approach. Perhaps not smart enough to attend college as his friends suggested, and perhaps not talented enough to make it on his own in the rap world, Loke would be sneaky and devious enough to devise a plan just crazy enough to work thanks to the jack-of-all-criminal-trades, Carl Johnson. <laughs> hey, 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 it's OG Loke, homie, and I'ma kick a little something like this. Hey, yo, when I come through, open the place, you don't want me to come with a gun in your face. I spit it hotter than anybody in the yo, world could do. That it's shit like I sucks. Damn. Damn, my shit was whack. Hey, what's happening, Lope? Hey, Carl. What up, man? Hey, dude. You ever thought about getting a writer to help you out with this shit? Yeah, I did. But who, homie? Who? Shit. I ain't in the rap game. You know, that ain't my thing. But, um, we have to think about something. Man. How about if I get somebody to write something for me, only they didn't know about it? What? <laughs> I think I just might have found a ghostwriter. I become the reciter, all nighter, all writer. <laughs> Mad Dog's rhyme book from his home in the hills. Mad Dog's rhyme book? Man, you said you helped, Carl. Come on, man. I'm hot like fire, all nighter, hey, all writer. Hey, when I kick it, I'll I do it, anything, I homie. I swear that. Okay? For some reason, CJ would actually agree to steal Mad Dog's rhyme book from his Vinewood mansion, sneaking onto the premises and possibly murdering several of Mad Dog's guards along the way, all to retrieve a flimsy notebook that would jumpstart the wannabe rapper's career. Carl would return the book to Loke, and immediately he would begin turning the already successful star's unreleased works into his debut masterpiece, with Dog none the wiser, at least at first. Hey Loke, I got what you wanted. Holmes, you ice cold, dude! Hey, I'll catch you later. Peace, homie! With Mad Dog's rhyme book in hand, OG Loke would finally have his chance to enter the rap game and would start recording his new songs for his first album, presumably trashing anything he had already written in favor of Mad Dog's superior lyrics. Around this time, he would also receive a fairly meaningless promotion from hygiene technician to appliance technician at his job, but cleaning fryers would not be the step up that Loke was looking for. Knowing that he needed a stronger foot in the door than just good lyrics, Loke would contact Mad Dog's manager, Alan Crawford, and attempt to convince him to partner up. Crawford, however, would be none too fond of Loke, and would not only refuse to work with Jeffrey, but threaten to blacklist him from working with just about anybody else in the music business, effectively putting a halt to the career he'd barely started. Hey, what up, Loke? CJ, 
What's up, homie? Hey, my shit's so tight right now, it's about to bust. So you happy now, homie? Happy? Man, hell no. I can't take this shit much longer. Man, I'm an artist. I'd rather be inside. Man, I can't get it there for nothing. Motherfuckers always want to keep a nigga down. And that CPO, Mad Dog's manager, is putting on me real heavy, man. He covered my style for real. Heavy? Man, he five foot three. But that fool's strong. Man, we gotta take him out. He done blackballed me, man. I can't get in the game no way. I told you, I'm an artist, a communicator, and nobody can even hear my message. He going around telling everybody I'm whack. Well, he obviously ain't heard your new shit. That shit is outrageous. That's what I'm talking about, man. Down with a frown, on the tail, a sad clown. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what you want me to do? I want you to take that motherfucker out. Kill him? Well, I ain't mean, Dale. Listen, he gonna be attending some awards ceremony, and that's the only time he leaves dog side. But Carl, once again, and for unexplained reasons, would be all too ready to help Loke even with this problem, in the only way Loke seemed to think would work, eliminating Crawford entirely. CJ would steal the car meant to pick up Crawford and his wife at a premiere, and instead escort the two to the bottom of the ocean by driving their car off of a pier in Santa Maria Beach, bailing out just in time to send Crawford and his innocent wife on their final vacation. <laughs> With Crawford dead and Mad Dog still unaware of his stolen rhymes, Loke would finally have the opportunity to finish his album and his plans for a loud and very annoying debut party. Feeling put down by the man, Loke would also quit his job at Burger Shot at this time, knowing that if he was to return to jail for violating parole, his massive album party could be a perfect send-off for the next chapter in his developing rap mythos. Hey, fuck you, man! And I don't care what you heard, I ain't nobody's ass technician, bitch! Hey, hey, what's up, Lo? Technician ain't gangster. That's what's up. I heard that. Listen, Carl, if I'm going back to a cell, I want to have a big party first. This may be my last chance to get hurt. Okay, so what's the plan? Well, I'm going to slide back over to Grove Street and get those sounds boom and fantastic. All right, so what you want me to do? I want you to get ready for the party and get some girls, man. Okay. Just some real fly girls, yeah. you know what I'm saying? The ones in the bikinis and uh -huh. shit, in the videos. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I told you, brother, I'm the chronicle of our struggles. The voice of the families, like Moses, only keeping it real. You said it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He would invite CJ to attend the Grove Street-based bash, but Carl would attempt to avoid it, only agreeing to come when Lope revealed his mic had broken. Unfortunately for CJ and all the partygoers, the mic would eventually be fixed, and OG Loke would take the stage for one of the most embarrassing and inauthentic debuts of any rapper at the time. Yeah, 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 it's your man OG Loke in the house, baby, and I'm gonna cover it down for all my real gangster niggas, all my gangster bitches. Speaking about gangster, look at my man CJ right there. CJ, what up, nigga, what up? I thought the motherfucking mic was broke. Yeah, yeah. What's up, homie? What's up, Rod? See all the homies in the back, man, away from this whack music. Man, I'm serious. Despite the party being interrupted by gang fighting and his friends hating the music, Loke's new lyrics would apparently be enough of a change to attract some listeners. And by some music industry miracle, he would begin to slowly gain fame after releasing his first album straight from the streets that year with Blast and Fools Records, with the album being produced by local producer giant Jimmy Silverman. Over the next several months, developments on Grove Street would accelerate Lopes' rise through the rap game exponentially, and he would slowly start to see real profits. After the Grove is taken over by the rivals, the Balas, when one of the Grove's lieutenants, Big Smoke, sells the gang leadership out, Loke would be brought under Smoke's wing, and used for his own purposes to benefit them both. With Smoke's investments, Loke would be able to promote his album on public radio and elsewhere, receiving enough attention from various media outlets to warrant an interview just weeks after CJ's exile from Los Santos, which was also Big Smoke's doing. Big Smoke would begin serving as Loke's manager and go out of his way to get the rapper attention, to facilitate his real scheme money laundering. Pushing his cocaine money through Loke's accounts to clean his dirty money, Smoke would build himself up as an up-and-coming philanthropist, when in reality, he was becoming the state's biggest drug lord. 
Meanwhile, Lork would also ascend in his respective field, and even nab an interview on West Coast Talk Radio's new show, Entertaining America, to promote his album, hosted by the eccentric Laszlo Jones. The most boring show with a brand new host, Entertaining America with Laszlo. Welcome to Entertaining America. This is Laszlo. <laughs> I gotta say it, pardon me, but uh, don't call it a comeback. I- I've been here for years, <laughs> just unemployed. But I am back, running the media. God, I love this West Coast vibe. Everybody here is so laid back and <laughs> lazy. I'm here with a man who gets paid to talk for a living. <laughs> That's incredible. What a concept. Um, he's called a rapper. Oglock, how are you? Oglock! It's OG Loke, OG Loke. You hear me, player? Yes, of course. I hear you. You're only a few feet away, man. Listen, I'm a big fan. I I love rap. I I think. I mean, singing songs about yourself. <laughs> That's awesome. H- how you living? Straight. Really? Are you really straight? What? You gonna question me? Dude, it's cool. If somebody passes it to me, I don't ask questions. It's probably not laced anyway. So, who out there wants to talk to OG Loke? Caller, you're on Entertaining America. I love the way you rap about the Louisiana Purchase. Straight! You know the French sold us Louisiana so we would have a place to show our tits. My point exactly. Yeah! We need more naked liberty. Exactly. Look, I'm no rapper, even though I dress like one, but I think I could really get into, you know, getting hammered, singing about setting things on fire, shooting up funerals, ba da ba 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 you know, striking poses, smoking a lid. Exactly. You see, the Constitution was written on reefer by dudes with wooden teeth. You see, my clothing company, Low Down, home of the G, says this. I love reefer. It's the rules if you're a rapper. Wow, those sound like some great rules. You know, you get a lot of flack in the media these days. In a recent press conference, your manager came to your defense. A lot of people say gangster rap is misogynistic posturing by fake-ass idiots who spend more time in drama school than they ever did pimping or hustling dope. Well, I assure you, OG Loke is the real thing. He's hated women all his life. He's sold drugs to school children. He's murdered innocent people just for kicks. But he rhymes like an angel. And I assure you, it's all in a good cause. So either way, you can feel good about yourself listening to this music. Well, that was very informative. Big Smoke is doing a lot for the community or, or to it. He sounds like a great guy. So I want to get in on this rap thing. Do I have to break dance, you know, do the windmill? Hey, can you body pop? Come on, Laszlo. You know OG ain't no playboy. I ain't down with that shit. It ain't gangster. I walk the walk. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Fresh. Yo, I'm, I'm down. <laughs> I'm into walking too, but I was thinking maybe we could have a break off, you know? I could spin on my back. You being funny? I'm trying to be. Watch it, fool. I warn you. I got the streets. I got a rep. Me and my man Smoke, we took over. I've been gangbanging since I was three. Ice cold killer. <laughs> Excuse me, gangbanging? <laughs> I never understood that. I mean, other guys in the room while you're... Ugh. I'm ice cold, bitch. Don't make me dump on you, G. I'm the streets, man. I am gangster. I'm taking rap in a whole new direction. From now, it's about making words rhyme. And I'm going toe-to-toe with you in a minute. Why do you rappers get so worked up? You're rich. You've won. Stop shooting at each other. You know, and you keep saying, home from the streets. Well, you know what, dude? Everyone has a street in front of their house. That doesn't make you cool. Oh, we got a comedian, huh? You got scraps, huh, bitch? You down? You mark-ass bitch, punk, trick, buster, fool? Look, I don't, I don't know what you said, but uh, hey, this ought to calm you down. I brought you some malt liquor. You's a buster, fool. Lucky I don't hang you out the window or turn you out, because I'm also a pimp. Including dudes, I'll pimp anything, you hear me? Oh, dude, I hear you loud and clear, man. You will pimp anything. Listen, how many hot women need a man? Because, I mean, it's kind of been a dream of mine to sleep with housewives. Are you dissing my hoes, bitch? Uh, No, 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 dude. Uh, Your hoes are bitches. Your hoes are bitches. You a buster. What are you? I'm a buster. I'm a buster. Whatever that is. Dude, dude, put, put the gun away. Don't diss my strap. I love your strap. You're a great guy. Look... I'm, I'm just coming down off the 80s. But please, don't shoot me, homie. Relax, fool. No one's getting dumped on. I'm a warrior poet. I tell a cautionary tale about life on the streets, you know? <laughs> Only too well. <laughs> that was OG Loke. Hey, man, it's been a real pleasure. Straight. Yeah. Good luck with the music. Hope you can make a killing. All good things must come to an end, however, and for Loke's rap career, that end would seemingly be right around the corner. 
While he was living the dream and enjoying his luxurious new lifestyle, his old friend CJ, whom he'd betrayed by aligning with Big Smoke, would be busy making moves across the state, and eventually, his path would once again intersect with the phony artist. While filming a music video in the country, a recently recovered Mad Dog would finally realize that it had been Loke who stole his rhymes months prior, and along with his new manager, who was ironically the man to steal the rhymes to begin with, he would confront Loke with intentions to ruin the career he'd built on a mountain of lies. You fucking phonies! Sean, bitch! Give me my rhyme book! Give me back my chain! Give me back my hose! He busting out! Come on, dog, let's get it! Still unaware that CJ had helped Loke steal the rhymes in the first place, Mad Dog and Carl would chase Loke across Los Santos, changing vehicles several times, and eventually winding up at Blastin' Fool's Records, with nowhere left to run. You phony! Ah! Ah, man, you can't prove nothing! Hey, Jeffrey, you a bust, straight bitch. You stabbed me and my brother in the back. Man, I'm an artist. We all make mistakes. Ain't that right, Alki? You ain't no artist. You's a buster. You's a fake. Man, I was gonna give you credit on the next album. Man, here, royalties? Take that. I got Look, more bitch, too. I should smack dog shit out your ass. <laughs> Just don't Break hit your me. face yeah, right here, motherfucker. you fucking phony! <laughs> Mr. Dog, Jimmy Silverman, Blasting Fool's Records. Hold up, I'm the manager. You want to talk? Talk to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> Pleasure, gentlemen. Let's Let talk, all right? I'll bust your ass. I need hits. I mean hits. Now, what about this guy? This, uh, phony. I've got a good mind to sue his ass into next year. Make it off me, you drunk. Hey, Lo, go get us some lunch. You get lunch. Excuse me, gangster. I don't think so. Man, get out of here. Don't, don't be pushing me. Don't be pushing me. With his career in shambles, his reputation likely destroyed, and his job abandoned, in all likelihood, OG Loke returned to prison following the events of 1992, having violated his parole months earlier by quitting his gig as a plant's technician. However, if Loke did return to jail, he would eventually be released yet again and return to his career as a rapper even without Mad Dog's rhymes to prop up his terrible writing. It can only be assumed that Loke would spend many years honing his craft, as he would eventually release his second album, Original, and garner enough newfound fame to land himself a spot on the legendary Vinewood Walk of Fame. How in the world this happened is something that even our most dedicated GTAB investigators could not figure out, with our most likely theory being a shift into a parallel universe, where the wannabe gangster actually possessed talent. Any other possibilities seem beyond our comprehensions. In fact, dear viewer, I myself even overheard talk of Loke still buzzing around the Los Santos celebrity scene as late as 2021. He apparently contacted the Celebrity Solutions Agency I ran with Franklin Clinton, F. Clinton and partner, though our receptionist never heard back from him, if it was even him to begin with. Whatever the case, for better or worse, OG Loke's name is quite literally etched into Los Santos history forever, even if most of us would like to imagine otherwise. Jeffrey O.G. Loke Cross was a dishonest, opportunistic, and incredibly fake person, whose only goal in life seemed to be attaining recognition that he felt he was owed. Wanting to be a gangster like his friends, Jeffrey built up a large part of his adult persona around posturing and fake or exaggerated confidence, spurred on by living in the shadows of such legendary hood figures as CJ, Sweet, and Big Smoke. It was at least hinted at by his friends that Jeffrey was actually more intelligent than his peers, and he was constantly encouraged to make use of this intelligence by attending college, instead of wasting his life dedicated to mindless gangbanging, but no amount of discouragement would deter him from his goal of being a gangsta. Though not nearly as violent as his fellow real-life gangster friends, Jeffrey, having grown up constantly being exposed to gang violence, would have no objections to using said violence for his own gain, as long as he himself didn't have to get his hands dirty. He seemed to want all the reputation and respect that came with being a feared and well-known gangster without wanting to put in any of the actual work needed to reach this status. He would instead use the help of his friend CJ and later Big Smoke to steal, murder, and lie his way to the top of the heap in San Andreas circa 1992, never seeming to regret any of the many despicable actions he either organized or endorsed in his climb to stardom. Jeffrey seemed completely unfazed by violence or crime, in fact, ready to kill Alan Crawford and his wife, although it's unknown if Cross was even aware of his wife being killed as well, at the drop of a hat, or hiring Carl to steal for him on several occasions, even if it meant some people had to die along the way. He never asked questions. 
He was also seemingly completely disloyal to anyone who was no longer useful to him, happily partnering with Big Smoke even after it's revealed that Smoke deliberately played a role in CJ's exile, Sweet's imprisonment, and the death of the Grove itself. He was also an exceptionally bad musician. Having presumably little to no involvement in the creation of his beats, and absolutely no involvement in even writing the album that would bring him the vast majority of his fame. Despite this, Jeffrey was clearly very driven, and pursued his goals with an ambitious, cutthroat mentality, content to use whomever he needed as a stepping stone to greatness. At the end of the day, when examined next to the likes of criminals like Carl Johnson or even Big Smoke, OG Loke is far more tame, having never killed anyone himself, and only committed petty crimes to land himself in prison. However, his lack of loyalty, outrageously disproportionate ego, and general lack of credibility as a rapper, a gangster, or a friend somehow make him arguably less likable than even his most murderous peers. As we already briefly alluded to, OG Loke himself isn't responsible for many crimes, at least not directly. All of his charges prior to 1992 were for petty infractions, barely even worth mentioning on a show featuring men who have bombed entire neighborhoods. However, his association to the infamous Carl Johnson and the many things he tasked Carl with doing during his rise to fame make him plenty guilty of more than just joyriding or parking fines. With that said, let's look at how many crimes he could have been connected to thanks to the all-American gangster in Carl Johnson, starting with Excessive parking fines and joyriding in 1992. Conspiracy accessory murder and reckless endangerment when chasing Freddy all across town with CJ, who kills him and several Vagos. Conspiracy accessory theft and conspiracy accessory Grand Theft Auto when asking Carl to steal a sound van for him. Conspiracy accessory murder, theft, and trespassing on private property when asking Carl to sneak into Mad Dog's mansion and steal his rhyme book. Conspiracy accessory murder and Grand Theft Auto when asking Carl to murder Alan Crawford for him violating his parole when quitting his job at Burger Shot, and alleged accessory money laundering when working with Big Smoke. As you can see, the only real reason that Jeffrey has a rap sheet longer than two entries is his connection to the powerhouse of destruction that was Carl C.J. Johnson. If Carl had simply refused to help Loke, it's possible the wannabe gangster would have actually given up on his failing rap dreams and attended college, or tried to make something of his life that was respectable. But unfortunately, a gang connection can be a very sacred thing sacred enough for an otherwise savvy and effective criminal entrepreneur such as CJ to bend over backwards just to be considered still loyal. An irony that would be Jeffrey's eventual undoing. Or was it? What makes a man so desperate for acceptance that he's willing to have innocent people killed along the way? Is it the dangerous allure of the gangster lifestyle glorified by our media in violent games and movies? Or is it the malevolent and ever-influential gaggle of who's who up in Vinewood, poisoning our minds with the hope of one day being one of them? Who can really say? All I can say is America is a dangerous place, folks, even if that danger sometimes takes the form of music so bad that your ears start to bleed. Stay indoors, people. You never know if that freestyler on the boardwalk is actually planning to assault you for your pocket change to pay for the studio fees. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching. America. The land of the free. Home of the brave and the stupid and the criminally insane years zero the united states has seen its fair share of gangbangers mobsters and psychotics who have roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos destruction and corruption tonight on grand theft auto biography Conspiracy, marijuana farms, and polar bears? Polar bears! Tonight we will attempt to examine the life of a man whose name we don't even know. A man who spent his life supposedly dedicated to two very simple values, peace and love. An aging hippie born in the post-World War II boom and reborn during the summer of love as a full-blooded American stereotype. 
We will follow his exploits, primarily in 1992, during his association with the infamous Carl Johnson, and his efforts to convert CJ to his conspiratorial worldview. We will see a bloody harvest, secret government projects, and wild peyote trips as we document the known criminal history of a man simply known as The Truth. Given that his real name is not even known, examining Truth's actual early life is quite difficult. However, some details have surfaced over the years that allow us to piece together some basic facts about his life before 92. He was likely born sometime in the 1930s or 40s, given that he appeared to be in his late 50s or early 60s by 92. And as a result, Truth would be part of the great American hippie generation, seeing his teen or young adult years during or around the Summer of Love. Being a walking stereotype, Truth would be of course quite fond of recreational drugs like LSD, mescaline, and a whole hell of a lot of Mary Jane. In 1967, Truth would purchase another hallmark of the American hippie, a camper van painted in psychedelic colors and converted to run on cooking oil instead of regular gasoline. He would likely use said camper, dubbed the Mothership, to travel across America, or at the very least the state of San Andreas smoking with his friends, attending concerts, and even the occasional love-in, being particularly familiar with the city of San Fierro, known for such progressive events. While we cannot confirm with any degree of certainty, we strongly suspect Truth himself was either born in or grew up around San Fierro, as his accent seemed to suggest that he was at least a San Andreas native. In 1989, Truth would attend the Fierro love-in, likely in the Queens District, where he would become first acquainted with skilled mechanics Duane and Jethro, who would had their business in Vice City bought up by the mob just three years prior. He would also at some unknown point meet electronics expert Zero, real name unknown, and even the British band The Gurning Chimps, and their manager Kent Paul, likely making all of these connections through his sale of marijuana. It isn't clear when Truth began cultivating his own marijuana to sell, but he seems to have been selling it to his friends on the side for many decades, and may have even been a regional supplier to gangs selling the product in the neighborhoods, though this remains unconfirmed speculation. He would, however, at some point purchase a farm in Flint County's Leafy Hollow to begin cultivating an entire crop of his favorite plant for both his own consumption and, presumably, widespread distribution. By the early 1990s, Truth would be running his farm in relative peace, but be unfortunate enough to cross paths with the crash division of the LSPD, specifically Frank Tenpenny. It isn't clear if Tenpenny was blackmailing Truth in order to facilitate his cooperation, or if Truth was simply happy to sell to whomever was paying. But whatever the case, he would become Tenpenny's weed supplier, and as a result, unknowingly put himself on the path to notoriety and bad karma. By the magical year of 1992, Truth would be an aged hippie still dealing pot to all potential buyers, including Officer Tenpenny. When Tenpenny's actual conspiracy to peddle drugs and maintain his own power in the Los Santos police force comes under scrutiny by the district attorney, he would hire Truth to grow several tons of marijuana. With intentions to have the plants planted on the DA in order to discredit his allegations of corruption and crash, Tenpenny would draw his real ace in the hole, Grove Street gangster Carl Johnson. Blackmailing Carl into cooperation, Tenpenny would advise Truth to contact CJ, who would then be responsible for paying him for the enormous shipment of weed he was preparing. Yeah. Carl. Who is this? You know me. This is the truth. No, I don't. Perfection. They said you were a moron. Who? Okay, you can drop the act now, kid. You the police? No, we have a mutual friend and business partner. We do? Who? Yes. Have you killed any cops lately? Oh man, Tenpenny. I should've known. That asshole. So I've got a room at a motel in Angel Pine. Make sure nobody follows you. Carl wouldn't know it at the time, but he and Truth would slowly become allies and even friends. But in the meantime, they were both simply tools to the ever-corrupt Officer Tenpenny. Given that Tenpenny wanted Carl to actually pay for the weed that Truth was making, and not simply provide it as a favor, it seems unlikely that Truth was being blackmailed by the crash officer. In fact, it seems fair to assume that not even Tenpenny knew Truth's real name, or much about him beyond his services as a weed supplier, which he likely learned through his many years working the Los Santos drug scene. Whatever the case, Carl would be forced to meet with Truth at a motel in Angel Pine, where Tenpenny would reveal his plans to beat the system once again. Hello? Hello, somebody in there? In here. <sighs> Tenpenny. 
Check this shit out. What do we have here? Yo, Carl. What up, kid? Hey, what's happening? Oh, uh, is this undercover training? Oh, no, you must be off duty. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Hush up, man. Mr. Truth here is going to be supplying you with some of the finest... We and you are going to deliver it for us. Hey, man, you losing it. You hallucinating this shit. What? Oh. Yo, True, come here, man. Welcome, friend. Sup? Carl here is gonna be paying you your money. <sighs> what you talking about? Now, Carl, I got a real do-gooder fucking with me, and I want you to take this evil green poison and drop it on it. <laughs> it's gonna ruin that asshole's career. Oh, bullshit. Dudes, you want mushrooms? You lose? How about some DMT? No, not for me, man. I got a jet. Oh, shit. I'm fucked up. Yo, Carl, pay the man. Whoa, man. I never thought I'd see that. A Fed out smoking me, huh? What are you, dude? FBI? DEA? Nah, I'm more like a private investigator. Friend, you give off a positive energy. How about some Vietnamese opium? Nah, I don't get down with that. But how do I know I can trust you then? What, I'm working for you now? I'm a man of peace. But some squares across that ridge are not respecting my peace. I mean survivalist maniacs, right-wingers, fascists. They have a harvester and I need one. Get it, then you can pay me. Namaste, Carl. The fuck that mean? Later, freak. But Truth, if he or not, was a businessman, and like any businessman, sought to cut down on his manual labor, even if it meant a few rednecks had to be sacrificed in the process. He would have Carl steal a combine harvester from a group of survivalists in Flint County, and though he wouldn't directly tell CJ to do so, he would apparently not be bothered when Carl used the harvester to harvest his way through the hillbillies in order to safely deliver it to his farm. Man, you brought peace back to my valley. Thank you, friend. I'll call you when the whoop to do is ready. Just make sure you get that cash. Now possessing the machinery necessary to quickly harvest several tons of marijuana, Truth would get to doing what he did best, growing the evil green poison himself. Using his already vast reserves of seeds, Truth would cultivate a massive crop, far larger than what was even needed by Tenpenny, over several weeks. While Carl ran around the countryside robbing banks and betting shops, Truth would quietly and peacefully attend his crop, and eventually, it would be ready for harvesting. What's happening? Hey, Carl, dude. Now I got the little mama you're after. But be careful, man. People are listening to us. I got a little green village up in the hills. Come and get it. Whoa, man, I don't know you, I don't know you. Prank caller, prank caller! With money in hand, Carl would return to Truth's farm in Leafy Hollow to pay for Tenpenny's weed, expecting his job to be done at that point. At least until the next time Tenpenny decided to mess with him. However, perhaps not too surprisingly, Tenpenny would apparently have no intention of letting Truth off scot-free, and send LSPD forces to arrest him, presumably thinking Carl would already be long gone with the marijuana. However, Carl, none too fond of Tenpenny either, would gladly stay to help Truth both destroy the evidence of his crimes and prevent more cops from arriving before they could make their escape. Peace. I've got everything you need, Lone Traveler. It's in the mothership. Back there. Thanks, man. Look, here go your paper. Ah, the karmic circle closes. All is as it should be. Back to the egg. Oh. Damn, man, there must be two tons of that stuff back there. What the fuck's that noise? Hey, that sound like a chopper. Oh, man. Narcs, you fucking rat. Dude, don't put that on me. You don't want to deal with Ten Penny. What's all this? Calm, brother. Panic paves the way to bad karma. Man. We gotta torch those fields. I only hope Kaya can forgive us.
Having recently won himself a garage through illegal street racing circuits around the countryside, Carl would drive with Truth in the mothership, where the two would get their first opportunity to get to know each other. What you pull over for? You better drive. I haven't driven in 15 years. You was doing all right? Yeah, then the fear hit me. Now I'm rolling a number to calm the waves. Shit, I better call Caesar. Hey, Caesar, no time to talk, man. I'm on my way to San Fierro, okay? I'll meet you and Kendall at that garage I wanted the races. I'll let y'all later. Truth would attempt to open Carl's eyes to his, well, truth about government conspiracies, mind reading technologies, and aliens from other planets. But at least at first, Carl would be more confused than anything. The two would crawl their way across the countryside in Truth's ancient van, and CJ would question just how he got around if he was so averse to driving himself. What's with all aluminum for you, man? Protection from mind control, dude. Mind control? Induction of images, sound or emotion using microwave radiation. Do you know how many government satellites are watching any citizen at any moment? No. 23. Do you know how many religious relics are kept at the Pentagon? No, I don't. 23. You see a pattern emerging here, man? Man, I'm seeing patterns all over the place. Get that smoke out my face. Jesus, we screwed. When'd you get this? 1967. How you get around if you don't drive? I have an astral goat called Herbie. She's faster than most, but getting old. Yeah, whatever, man. You talking shit. Eventually, the two would arrive on the outskirts of San Fierro, a place Carl had never been and Truth would begin to reminisce on his many adventures in the Bayside City over the years. Hey, this thing go any faster? Man, we got three tons of grass on board. The engine block is held together with a macrame hammock and it's running on 15-year-old cooking oil. Shit, can you shoot? Shoot, I'm a hippie. The only thing I've shot is acid. I heard about this dude snorting it once. Thought his nose was a kangaroo and the moon was a dog, woo! There she is, brother. San Fierro, the city of psychedelic wonders. Man, I can't believe I ain't been here before. There ain't a better place to escape the man, man. Okay, Mr. San Fierro, where's the spot at? It's in Doherty, on the east side of Fierro, between Garcia and Easter Basin. Perhaps feeling particularly nostalgic, or perhaps simply out of habit, Truth would even begin smoking in the van, already filled with tons of marijuana, much to Carl's annoyance. Hey, you want to hit on this? A little temple cherries and a cocktail with some Nepalese munga munga. Put that thing out, man. I can't see. Hey, mellow out, brother. It's good shit. Put it out, motherfucker. I'm warning you. Whoa, chill the fuck out. Firstly, you are a real buzz killer, amigo. And secondly, I never made love to my mother. She wouldn't. And thirdly, we're in this together, so be cool. Sorry, man. I just don't drive when I'm fading. Finally arriving at the garage in Doherty, Truth would settle in temporarily with the Johnson siblings, Carl and Kendall, as well as Kendall's boyfriend, Cesar Vialpando, intending to pay Carl back for helping him to avoid Tenpenny's double cross. This is the place. Whoa, Jesus, dude. Looks like you've been fed a bummer. But unfortunately for Carl, the garage he'd been given would be run down and in serious need of renovations, not to mention staff, if CJ was ever going to turn it into a profitable chop shop. Luckily, Truth would be more than willing to help Carl, now indebted to him for his help escaping the LSPD. And even more conveniently, Truth would know just the right people to help Carl transform the garage into a veritable business, albeit a legitimate business. Motherfucker! That mute asshole! That fucking snake without a tongue! Gave me this shithole instead of a pink slip? I must be the biggest fucking idiot in the whole fucking world. Holmes, take it easy. At least we're alive. Carl, friend, fellow traveler, relax, man. You're really killing my fucking vibe here. Well, I'm sorry I'm fucking up your vibe, old man, but I can't wait to get my hands on that mute and your bitch-ass cousin. My cousin? You're gonna diss my familia? My bad, man. I'm just pissed for all of us. I mean, look, we in a strange place. We got shit to our name. And for once, I try to make something work, this garage, and it ain't even a garage. Then make it into a garage. Oh, that's a great idea, sis. Won't you shut up? You know what, Carl? You are a fucking idiot. Your whole life you wanted something for nothing. Now you've got something and you don't know what to do with it. We'll make it good enough. We'll help, right? We got your back, CJ. Come on, stop tripping, man. Both of you. Whoa, man, the energy here is fantastic. Oh. Yeah, uh, all right. 
But how am I find some good mechanics to work up in here, man? I know a few guys. Come with me, friend. They're good people, I swear it. Oh, man, I'm about to ride with this fool again. Truth would gladly help Carl to recruit people to work in his garage, and in the process give him a brief tour of the city, while he regaled CJ of his many outlandish and often unbelievable stories, in which he was almost always high as a kite. Come on, man. There's these two guys I know. Used to work on marine engines. Till the mob bought their business over in Vice. Now they try and make ends meet by taking any old job. They're a little bit dull by their habit. But the smoke don't get in the way of their skills with an engine. We'll pick up Jethro first. Last I heard, he was working at a garage over in East Basin. Hey, man, how you meet these dudes anyway? I met them at the 89th Year Love-In, apparently. Apparently? You know how it is, man. A field of tents, crazy-ass music. A quart of mescaline vodka, polar bears. Polar bears? Yeah, go figure. But they were funny guys, man. Great sense of humor. Truth's first recruit would be mechanic Jethro down in Easter Basin in the middle of Vietnamese gang territory, which Carl would become all too familiar with in the months to come. This here's Vietnamese gang territory. Da Nang boys, shining razors, butterfly children. Watch yourself, dude. These cats are real serious. Using his near-infinite karmic credit with fellow stoners thanks to his status as a dealer, Truth would easily convince Jethro to join Carl's ragtag chop shop crew. Hey, Jethro! Hop in, man. I've landed you a real job. Hey there, Truth, dude! Oh, man. Do, do I owe you? Because I swear I paid for that weed, dude. No, man, we're good. I think. Jethro, Carl. Carl, Jethro. What's up, man? Can we swing by the hospital? It's over in Santa Flora District, west of here. Yeah. You sick? No. The government is. But that's a long story. So, you know, like, what's the deal, dudes? I'm opening the garage in Doherty by the waste ground. You know, car mods, low riders, all that shit. You down? Some polar bears shit in the woods. No, but they've been known to shit in the liquor tent, if I remember it right. Yeah, that was like, so far gone, man. Before finding their next recruit, however, Truth would ask Carl to take him to the San Fierro Medical Center, where CJ would get his first real glimpse at the extent to which Truth lived up to his name. What we here for anyway? Nothing. Oh, don't look. Cover your faces. Think about a yellow rubber duck. You tripping again. Shh. Okay. I've seen enough. Let's go see if we can find Wayne. He's working a hot dog van at the tram terminal in Kings. Come on, dude, what's all that about? You don't want to know. Why? Do you know what a subdermal neurophone is? A what? Exactly. Sometimes it's best to stay in the dark, kid. Carl would begin to become intensely curious as to what Truth knew that he didn't, even beginning to see wisdom in his otherwise paranoid ramblings. With his own conspiratorial itch scratched, at least temporarily, Truth would next bring CJ to meet another mechanic, Dwayne, who'd taken to running a hot dog van in Kings. Dude, Dwayne, man, how's the hot dog business? It's totally shit. Why? What's happening? Uh, my friend Carl here is opening a chop shop. Jethro's in. How about you? Uh, yeah, cool, man. Uh, I've got, like, some shit to take care of first, though. So, uh, you tell me where you guys are gonna be at, and I'll meet you dudes there. The garage is on the waste grounds and door. I'll see y'all later. Okay, next stop, cop station downtown. What? You want your mom? Why? If I told you, the likelihood is you'd get a probe up your ass within a month. Like, listen to the man, dude. He's real serious about that shit. Wow. Uh, okay. But you're starting to freak me out with all that spaceship, man. But once again, Truth would request a short detour, this time to the San Piero Police Department, to once again watch out for what can only be presumed to be lizard people working for the U.S. government, or something like that. Whatever it was that Truth was looking for, he would apparently find it yet again, but be no more willing to fully reveal the truth to Carl should he not be prepared to hear it. Okay, you know the drill. Don't look interested in anything. Picture a pink golf ball in your mind. Okay, we're good to go. Where to next, spacehead? There's an electronics guy I've had dealings with. Goes by the name of Zero. He could fix a supercomputer with a paperclip. He's got his own shop, but he's always ready to help fellow travelers along the path. Let's go introduce you to him. Look, what's going on, True? Who was him do? Don't go there. Listen to Jethro. Now, what if I told you we never went to the moon? 
JFK lives in Scotland with Janis Joplin. And the only reason we've been in a Cold War for the last 45 years was because snake-headed aliens run the oil business. I think you popped another micro dot. Good. Keep it that way. Last, but arguably not least, despite what the name implies, Truth's next recruit for Carl's cause would be tech expert Zero, who ran an RC shop in Garcia. It remains unclear how Truth and Zero originally met, as unlike most of his contacts, Zero does not appear to have been, by our own judgments, an avid marijuana smoker, though it is possible he simply hit it better than most. Leave me alone, Berkeley. This is stalking. Oh, hey, Truth. Get in. I'll fill you in as we drive. Home, James. Carl, Zero. Zero, Carl. Sup? Carl here is opening a garage around the corner. I told him you're the man to speak to when it comes to electronics. <laughs> Actually, I'm the only man to speak to. <laughs> Grade A tip-top genius, that's me. You should drop by the shop sometime. See some of my shit, bro. I'll do that. And with that, Carl would have an actual team ready to help transform the garage from abandoned vehicle storage to the most successful illegal chop shop in the city. And all thanks to the aid of one very helpful hippie. Okay, we here. After helping Carl to set up his garage, Truth would disappear to parts unknown on his non-stop mission of doing something very important, we think. He would apparently keep an eye on Carl from a distance as he continued to climb his way up the criminal ladder, meeting more and more dangerous contacts including mysterious G-Man Mike Torino, who, similarly to Tenpenny, would effectively blackmail CJ into performing whatever dirty work he needed done. Being a man whose entire identity was constructed around opposition to men such as Torino, whom he believed was far shadier than even he would admit, Truth would become extra paranoid when learning of Carl's association to him. He would use Carl's naivete to his advantage, and recruit his old friend for one of the most outrageous heists the government has never acknowledged. Hail fellow, well met. Namaste. Peace, Carl, my brother. Hey, Truth, where you at? Just checking that you were no longer on government business. Where is he? How the fuck would I know, man? He like the devil. Hey, man, you okay? Everything is transient. Uh, whoa, man. Uh, I'm passing through life same as every man. Okay. Do you have any idea what you're doing for Torino? Nah, I seem to be on the need-to-know basis. Oh, no, man. Two lies don't cancel each other out. You know that. We pay them to lie to us. Is that what our founding fathers wanted? No more, friend. No more. We're not alone. Get off me, man. What's going on? Everything is going on. Don't you get it? There's a place, not even on the map. A train is about to leave. It can explain better than I ever can. Boy, this is going to blow your fucking mind. We got work to do. You better drive. I'll explain. The elegance does not even touch it. With no prep, barely any explanation, and absolutely no assistance, Truth would drop Carl off on the boundaries of Area 69, a top-secret government facility not marked on any map, and CJ would plan his infiltration. Had it been any other man at any other time, or even perhaps a group of internet lunatics keen on getting inside, it would have been an absolute impossibility. But for a man like Carl Johnson, it was just another Tuesday. Carl would somehow manage to enter the facility, either by stealth or by force, and work his way through the halls to find the first piece of the truth that Truth spoke of so very often, a military-grade jetpack. Code red! Code red! Intruder has penetrated the project. All military personnel to the launch bay immediately. He would burst out of the facility and escape without being gunned down by some wild improbability, and deliver the jetpack to Truth atop a mesa in the middle of the desert. To this day, the government has refused to acknowledge the theft, the existence of the project, or the substantial losses incurred in attempting to keep it from being stolen. As far as they're concerned, none of it ever happened. But we here at GTA Biographies strongly object. Carl, dude, man! Hey, here you go. You better stash it somewhere fast. Far out, have a nice trip, dude! Hey, wait a m Ah, was it too much to ask to get a lift in the town? Truth would return to CJ's airfield and begin tinkering with the multi-million or possibly multi-billion dollar space toy and find quite quickly that flying it was far more difficult than Carl made it look. With his hands on such a rare piece of technology, one might think the truth would be finished, 
But far from it, he would have one more job for CJ, which once again involved top secret government conspiracies and a very mysterious vial of green goo. Damn, where is this fool? Whoa, shit! Hey, man, look out! Oh. Oh. Uh. The new age begins here! Say what? Not all fantastic things are lies, Carl. Today we'll know everything! Oh, I can hardly wait. I hear knowledge is truly sacred in this part of the world. Man, I've tried, but I can't fight for shit. You better do it. Land on the train, kill the guards, get in and steal stuff. Oh, yeah? What stuff? I don't know yet. Oh, <laughs> you don't know yet. I was starting to think you was a lunatic. What you mean you don't know yet? You'll be stealing the answer. Look, fly the jetpack, land on the train, and steal whatever they least want us to get. Shh. Listen. They're coming. We better go. Peace on Earth, dude. Barely breaking a sweat, CJ would don the jetpack and fly over the suburbs of Las Venturas to catch a military train transporting the mysterious substance. He would shoot his way through the soldiers, likely catching them all off guard with the new equipment, and swiping the vial for examination by truth. Not even sure if what he'd retrieved was what he'd been looking for, Carl would return the goo to truth, and he would be more than thrilled at its recovery, despite refusing to identify what exactly it was, if he even knew to begin with. You got it, man? I got something. Let me see. Ooh, everything is different now. What is it? Everything. They will call this Year Zero. I'll be in touch. Wait! What is... Yeah, see you around. Truth would once again vanish to either stash, experiment on, or perhaps sell the new shiny government toys Carl helped him to acquire. What he did with the green goo remains unclear, but it appears he abandoned the jetpack after realizing he himself could not fly it, leaving it in the possession of the much more capable Carl Johnson. The green goo itself was never seen again, and explanations regarding what it was, what purpose it served, or why Truth wanted it, continue to be woven to this day, ironically enough by stoners across the state carrying on Truth's legacy. But Truth would be seen by at least CJ and company a few more times that year, before he truly disappeared from the record. Sometime after receiving the green goo from CJ, Truth would meet with the British band the Gurning Chimps in Las Venturas, and take them on one of his journeys deep into the desert of Bone County, for a peyote trip which would go, predictably, quite wrong. Waking up in a Japanese bathhouse in Los Santos, Truth would find himself unable to recall what happened to the band, or how he even wound up where he was. Knowing he would never make it back to the desert in time, and likely still coming down off of his intense high, Truth would ask CJ to locate them for him, as he attempted to find his karmic center, and probably his pants. Hello? Who am I speaking to? It's CJ. Hey, Truth, is that you? Might be. Might be a government algorithm trying to pick your brain, so don't admit anything. Whatever, man. What's up? I need a favor, Carl. Thought I could cash in some karma chips. Your credit good? I took some fellow travelers deep into the desert on a peyote safari a few nights back. We faced the inner light and communed with a lizard king. Sound fun. How'd it go? That's the problem. I don't know. I'm in Los Santos. I woke up at a Japanese bathhouse about an hour ago. I have no idea how I got here or where the others are. They're probably fun. I don't think so. They were Brits, a band, and their managers. They have no experience about the desert. Okay. Where'd you make camp? I can go have a look. I took them up Arco del Oeste. Fantastic sunsets. Best start looking for them up there. Carl would gladly help out and eventually even form a relationship of his own with Gurning Chimps manager Kent Paul and the lead singer Macker, as well as Paul's old friend Ken Rosenberg. CJ would rob a mafia casino, save Paul Macker and Ken's lives, and eventually return to Los Santos to retake the mansion of rapper Mad Dog from Los Santos Vagos dealer Big Papa. Now back home, CJ would at some point invite Truth to either live with or at least hang out with him at his new mansion in the Vinewood Hills, and Truth would personally sit in on the trial of Frank Tenpenny, hoping his time had finally come along with the rest of Carl's crew. Hey, be quiet, be quiet! Come on, you bunch of wankers! This is unbearable! Shut up! Any Pulaski and Frank Tenpenny, 
both hardworking members of a community policing unit, have been charged with racketeering, corruption, narcotics, and sexual assault. They brought it on themselves. That bastard cost me my farm. And he hogged the bar. Fellow officer Ralph Pendlebury, who had threatened to turn state's evidence, and who was then found shot dead in a supposedly unrelated gang incident. I say 20 years. Airport. Try five years. Trial, Cops always get off easy. Yeah, I heard that. Lost evidence, retracted witness statements, and now the disappearance of fellow officer Jimmy Hernandez and officer Pulaski himself, believed to be on the run. Oh wait, they're exiting the courtroom now. That bastard Pulaski will probably turn up listen, dead listen. just like the rest of them. In light of the lack of evidence against my client, the district attorney's office has seen fit to drop all charges what? against this innocent man. That's bullshit. You see? You can't trust the system, man. This surprise decision is wholly unprecedented. Oh man, ain't no justice. It's just I know. I've been arrested numerous times for totally natural behavior. While Santos will burn tonight. Ain't nobody gonna be riding in my hood. I don't know about that, Holmes. Look, the whole city is going up. People are fucking pissed off about this. People don't know what they want. We all being you. You see, man, it's always the same, friend. Power systems corrupt everyone. Look, I said we go secure the hood. We ain't get shit together so some idiot can burn it down. Although Tenpenny wouldn't be convicted that day, in the subsequent riots and chaos, CJ would retake much of his old territory from the Balos gang and once again carve out space for he and his own to live in, in the city he called home. Now good friends, Truth would continue to accompany Carl as he settled into his new life as a powerful and highly successful gangster businessman. Truth would even witness the death of Frank Tenpenny himself at CJ's hands, although technically, Frank's death was entirely his own doing, but it was nonetheless quite satisfying for Truth. Don't do it, man. He's gone. I just want to be sure it's over, man. That's all. It's cool. No need to put a bullet in him. He killed himself in a traffic accident. No one to blame. Let's roll. Hey, far out, man. You know, I mean, you beat the system. I tried for 30 years to cross over, but you managed it, man. I mean, man, you're an icon, man. Oh, uh, thanks, man. I'm just glad it's finally over. What's up with Smoke? You know what's up with Smoke. He always saw things a little different than us. Smoke? Smoke was always on his own, always out for self. That is the surest path to hell, man. Well... That are 15 microdots and an ounce of mescaline. Let's go get something to eat. Sounds good to me. See you around, officer. What became of Truth afterwards is anyone's guess. Given that he seemed to be in his early 60s 30 years ago, it's entirely possible, if not likely, that he has since passed on. But no one has seen or heard from him since, which is probably exactly the way he likes it. The Truth was, as we've mentioned, the near-perfect stereotype of the American hippie. He preached peace and love, sold and smoked marijuana, traveled the country in a psychedelic van, and sought to expose the government for massive conspiracies, for which he had no real proof. Until he did. Truth was an exceptionally peaceful man in almost all circumstances, but where the government was concerned, he could be an absolute maniac, even if he himself did not partake in the violence he commissioned. He was a man of many mysteries, which is most elegantly demonstrated by the fact that nobody seemed to know his actual name. As we said, he was a very avid pot smoker, among other recreational drugs, and as a result was very laid back, preferring to keep his cool and remain calm at all times, lest his karmic balance be thrown out of whack. He almost never got truly angry, even when cornered by the police and on the verge of losing everything, and always found a way to turn otherwise intense situations into relaxing journeys through one's inner mind. He was known to trip on just about every drug known to man, and it's possible he sold a lot more than just pot, which may point to connections in the criminal world far beyond Carl Johnson or even Frank Tenpenny. He also had a green thumb, capable of growing, maintaining, and harvesting high-quality marijuana crops entirely on his own, albeit with the help of modern equipment like combine harvesters. 
He was almost entirely independent in this regard, making his own way through life without relying on his many friends and allies, but also never failing to call in a favor for the many, many people who felt they owed him for his services as the San Andreas Weed Fairy. Truth was both a very simple and incredibly complicated man. A man whose inner thoughts seemed far too complicated to untangle for our investigative team here at GTA Biographies. He believed things that seemed too difficult to wrap one's mind around without dismissing him as a complete lunatic, and yet he seemed to be validated on at least two occasions when discovering top-secret government projects, which turned out to be just as real as he'd predicted. At the end of the day, Truth was mostly harmless, as long as you weren't in the CIA, FBI, or any other three-letter government agency, which is to say, not really all that harmless at all. Had he the physical capabilities, it seems likely the truth would have caused even more damage than he did with just his accomplice in Carl Johnson. But, as history stands, his peace and love, lazy hippie attitude would always win out over his righteous desire to stick it to the man with anything more than words. Unlike most people we examine here on GTA Biographies, Truth has absolutely no history of direct participation in violent crime. However, as an avid pot smoker and seller in the United States during the War on Drugs, Truth would have had plenty of crimes beyond violence for which he was responsible, starting with drug dealing and cultivating marijuana in his early life. Drug dealing, conspiracy accessory murder, and conspiracy accessory theft or Grand Theft Auto when selling weed to Carl for Tenpenny, and then hiring Carl to retrieve a combine harvester from fascist survivalists. Drug dealing, drug distribution, cultivating marijuana, conspiracy accessory murder, and evading authorities when selling three tons of marijuana to Carl and then witnessing Carl destroy a police helicopter in order to escape. Conspiracy accessory murder, conspiracy accessory trespassing on government property, and conspiracy accessory theft of government property when tasking Carl with infiltrating Area 69 to steal a jetpack. And conspiracy accessory murder and conspiracy accessory theft of government property when tasking Carl with stealing a vial of green goo off a military train. As you can see, his record would still be quite substantial for his association to Carl Johnson, but had Truth never been given the deus ex machina that CJ was, it seems entirely likely that he would have no direct connections to violence. Truth's willingness to have dozens slaughtered in the name of simply confirming his paranoid delusions, even if correct, goes to show that underneath his peaceful, calm, old man exterior was the head of an anti-government fanatic, who is plenty capable of the violence he so often denounced. What caused the hippies to be so paranoid about the government's secret plans? Was it the LSD? Maybe the pot? Or was it the overwhelming evidence of government foul play? It isn't for us here at GTA Biographies to say. One thing I always say quite confidently is that America is a dangerous place, folks. Stay indoors, people. You never know if your pot dealer is secretly planning to recruit you for an infiltration of a top secret government facility in the middle of the night. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of Grand Theft Auto Biographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching. Jolly old England, the land of tea. Home of the Queen. <coughs> I mean, America, the land of the free, home of the brave, and the stupid, and the criminally insane. Gotcha! The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets, causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight, on Grand Theft Auto Biography. rejection, and connections. Tonight we will take a look at a man who was anything but American, who, despite his name, would end up making quite an impact on the land of the free after crossing the pond. An ambitious and talented producer, manager, and general socialite, who took every opportunity he was given to move up in the game without getting his hands too dirty directly. We will see drunken Scottish rock and rollers, chicken choking northerners, and gold certified records as we examine the life of an Englishman far removed from his natural habitat, Kent Paul.
Paul was born in 1965 in the city that he would eventually take as part of his own name, Kent, England. He apparently grew up in the Medway Towns district, though the area wouldn't actually take that name until 1998. Who his parents were remains a mystery, though it is known that he had at least one sister and apparently a close relationship with his mother, perhaps abnormally so, as his psychiatrist would imply many years later. At age 14, he would walk in on his sister having sex with a local fireman named Martin, and at least the way Paul tells it, the incident would be an intentional intrusion. Just one year later, in 1980, at age 15, Paul would apparently be attacked by a Mark Cosgrove for staring at his mother while she was taking a bath. Though according to our research, this was most certainly not the cricket player Mark Cosgrove, as he wasn't even born until 1984. That same year, he would lose his virginity right around the time he began to hit puberty describing his pubescent transformation as an eruption of acne. At age 16, Paul would be arrested for the first time when caught vandalizing Mark Cosgrove's car after supposedly stealing his first girlfriend, May. And in Paul's own words, from then on he would be a hard-hearted bastard and never allow the loss of a girlfriend to get him down. He would spend much of his youth pining for women and usually failing to seduce them, attending parties and becoming addicted to all manner of drugs though exactly when Paul picked up his destructive habits remains a point of contention. He was also, at least according to him, prone to getting into fights at a young age, claiming once to have beaten up a blind man in Dungeness High Street in Kent for staring at his girlfriend's chest. Being a cocky, go-getting egomaniac, Paul would constantly seek new avenues to inflate his sense of self-worth, and at some point become interested in the music business, interested enough to begin pursuing a career as a manager or producer. It isn't known when or how Paul acquired the skills needed to actually succeed in the industry, but his eventual track record, pun intended, with bands, would prove he was indeed talented enough to get the job done. It's possible Paul learned how to produce and manage bands while in England, or in America, as by 1982, at age 17, he would move to Vice City, Florida, and begin making his name known across the pond. Kent Paul. Paul from Kent. An Englishman in New York. Well, in Vice City to be precise, but certainly a fish out of water. Right, anyway, these Yanks, right, what a bunch of pillocks. Stuff you learn on the Midway Estates, mate, you can make a killing out here. I do all sorts, I run the music business, I'm also a face in the underworld, so don't miss. But seriously, love... Vice City, 1982. A city already steeped in neon evangelism, advertising some of the most intoxicating indulgences this side of the planet. A perfect place for a lad from the Medway towns, apparently. Over the next four years, Paul would mingle with, harass, and bloviate to the masses of Vice City's nightlife scene. He would spend a great deal of his time at the Malibu Club in Vice Point, drinking, hitting on women, and being rejected, and occasionally getting himself into trouble, which seemed to follow him wherever he went. Sometime between 1982 and 1986, Paul would meet and have a falling out with Big Mitch Baker and his biker gang, make contacts in the Vice City SWAT department, and secure the rights to executive produce for the Scottish band Love Fist, though it's possible he went uncredited for this role. In addition to SWAT, bikers, and bisexual Scottish rock and rollers, Paul would also become well acquainted with drug dealers big and small across the city, through unknown means. His own addictions to cocaine, alcohol, and likely many other drugs leading him to bigger and bigger players. Though Paul himself wouldn't become directly involved with Vice City's criminal underworld until later, he would gain a reputation for being the man to speak to when it came to snow in sunny Florida. Also between 1982 and 1986, Paul would apparently be arrested and tried for an unknown crime, where he would first meet criminal lawyer Ken Rosenberg. Rosenberg would manage to get Paul acquitted of his charges, though any further details on the event could not be obtained by our investigators. By 1986, at age 21, Paul, now known exclusively around Vice City as Kent Paul, would be on top of the world, so to speak. More accurately, he would be so frequently inebriated that he felt on top of the world, or at least on top of Vice City. Being a rare Brit living in the Sunshine State, he would also be quite easy to spot by either his distinctive accent or appalling haircut. He would become so connected to various Vice City socialites that he would even receive a personal invite to one of Juan Cortez's famous yacht parties, where he would brush shoulders with the likes of Congressman Alex Shrub, Candy Sucks, and many others. That same year, through his underworld connections, he would hear about a botched drug deal between the Vance crime family and the Ferrelli family of Liberty City, and not long after, receive a visit from the very angry representative for the Ferrellis and Vice, Tommy Versetti. Where'd you pop up from? I've been looking for a bird like you for ages, mate. You know what I am? Looking for some English guy. Kent Paul. 
Kent Paul, mate. Yeah, I'm the governor, Andy. I'll sort things out. You know what I mean? I'll treat you. Whatever you want, I'll get you, girl. Don't you worry about a thing, mate. Get lost, honey. Oi, 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 oi. You Kent Paul? I'm a friend of Rosenberg's. Rosenberg? Rosenberg. Oh, that bonkers ambulance chaser. That guy could defend an innocent man all the way to death row. <laughs> Get another drink, bruv. What is a comedian? Listen to me. I'm missing 20 keys and a lot of cash. Trust, mate. It's a mugs game. What do you know about it? Oi, oi, well, what I was coming to was, there's some chef come trumpet shifter who deals that kitchen of Hotel and Ocean Drive. He's been looking real pleased with himself lately. You could go and check him out. I will. And I'll be seeing you around. Yeah, that's right. Go and walk away, you mug. I knock you spark out. Give me a drink. And where's that slut? He would tip Versetti off to a potential lead in Chef Leo Teal, who Paul knew was rumored to moonlight as an assassin. Though his information wouldn't directly lead Tommy to his targets, it would inadvertently help him to meet the Cubans of Little Havana under Umberto Rabina and a mysterious contact who'd been employing Mr. Teal, known only as Mr. Black. Paul would continue to lounge around the Malibu, while Tommy Versetti slowly worked his way up the criminal ladder, to become the big dog in town. Though still outside of Versetti's inner circle, he would remain connected and knowledgeable of Tommy's organization, including his alliance to Lance Vance, and his work for the then kingpin of the city's drug trade, Ricardo Diaz. When Paul hears about Lance Vance attacking Diaz and being subsequently kidnapped and interrogated, he would reach out to Tommy personally despite their rather rocky introduction, and try to win himself some credibility points by saving Tommy's new right-hand man. All right, me old China. Paul, I might have a little result for you, but I need to speak to you in person. I'm enjoying a little R&R at the Club Malibu. I reckon you're going to owe me a favor or two after this, sunshine. I'll see you later. All right, Mush. I'm going to save your Vera, mate. What the hell are you talking about? You know that wanker Diaz, the Bugelmeister? He's got your boy Lance. Word is, you might try to jump. You didn't jump high enough, if you know what I mean. Where did he take him? Ah! ah! Oh, I right, right, plain right. English. Keep your party on. You're going to cross town the junkyard. <laughs> Bloody hell, you nutter! Though Tommy wouldn't be particularly grateful for Paul's tip to save Lance, it would inadvertently lead to the downfall of Ricardo Diaz at Tommy's hands. As the city fell under the veil of new criminal management, Paul would remain at the bottom of the totem pole, still unappreciated for his role, however minor, in taking Diaz down. Around this time, however, he would begin working with, or return to producing for, the band Love Fist, who at the time were working on their Steel Heart Stone Cold Prostate Tour across America. Paul would record with the band at a studio in downtown Vice City, but eventually the group would need a rock and roll pick me up, and Paul would know just the man to call. Tommy, son, have I got a surprise for you? I'm down at recording studios with some major artists. Why don't you pass a visit? You know it makes sense, don't ya? See you later. Oh, hey! Yes! Brilliant, bloody brilliant! Hey, Tommy! Glad you could make it. Hey, you ever met Love Fist before? No, I haven't, but I've always loved your music. Let me introduce you to the band. This is Per Percy, Dick, and Willie's in the car's here, and that was Jez in the booth earlier. And guys, I want you to meet a good friend of mine. This is Tommy. We go way back. Hey, pal. And, uh, what was your name again? <laughs> Leave it out, Jez, you remember. Lovefest. Don't be Did playing you? them games with me, Jesus. mate. I'm too crafty for that sunshine. English. Good See, one in America. The, the thing is, Tom, mental. the boys totally need some help. They ain't too connected here. They don't have the old hands, totally your father. We need some drugs, pal! Gonna get on the old <laughs> love yeah, fest, yeah, nice beauty, you know? Yeah! Well, this is Vice City, man. What's the problem? Love juice, man. We need love juice, man, Dan. Love juice? Aye, two parts boom shine, one part trumpet, five fizz bombs, and a litre of petrol. Can you help us out, pal? Oh, we really mean a lot you to the boys. You can do that for the boys, right? 
Tommy would indeed manage to retrieve the band's eccentric drug cocktail, and Paul would thus be able to keep them in high enough spirits to continue recording. Though their mojos would return, problems for the band and by extension Paul would be far from over. Being a group of outlandish foreign rockers, Love Fist would attract a great deal of attention wherever they went, and especially in Vice City. Paul and the band would learn of an obsessed fan who claimed to have had their life ruined by Love Fist, and who was now planning to try and kill the band as revenge. Prepared for just about every aspect of the rock and roll lifestyle except for assassination attempts, Paul and three quarters of the band, minus bassist Willie, would once again approach Tommy to help save them from their impending curtain call. Tommy, man, am I glad to see you. What's going on? Bad vibes, Tommy. I am need joking again. It is heavy stuff, man. Heavy gang. This cat, we hardly know him, but he knows us. Like this cat, knows all about us. Knows that Willie likes his ladies' underwear, eh? What it Percy likes to do. Shut up, you fool. Just get hey. jazz bomb yeah. sheep. It's a love rocket thing, can. Wait, <laughs> shut yeah, up. Yeah, a love rocket <laughs> thing, right? But listen to this cat. The, the guy wants Love Fist dead. Dead, Tommy. Love Fist, gone. You know what they say, the good die young, but Tommy, you've got to save Love We've Fist. We've got a signing in two hours, and I think... Yeah, and, and the boys think the stalker's going to try some monkey business there. Tommy Versetti, being, well, Tommy Versetti, would quite easily manage to kill the would-be assassin, or at least he would think so. Knowing that problems for Jez, Dick, Willie, and Percy would only continue up until their departure from the city, Paul would take the opportunity to try and mend his relationship with Big Mitch Baker, through Tommy or at the very least, circumvent his inability to recruit the bikers for security himself. How you doing, mate? It's Paolo again. Look, Tommy, I forgot to mention, we're gonna need some extra muscle for the concert. A bit of security. There's a biker gang led by Mitch Baker. It would be great publicity. Very rock and roll, baby. Sort this out for me, and I'll get you some backstage passes for the gig, alright? Tommy would earn the trust of Mitch Baker, and as a result, ensure proper security from the bikers for Love Fist during their upcoming tour. Before the tour could take place, however, Paul and the boys would learn that their old friend, the Psycho Killer, was still very much alive. It remains unclear to this day exactly how this person survived Tommy's initial attack, though some have speculated the existence of twins, among other unlikely phenomenon to explain their survival. Whatever the case, Paul would once again call on Tommy's services to keep the band safe on their way to the concert. Tommy! Tommy! Tommy, man, that Psycho's back! What's going on? That psycho won't leave Love Fist alone. You didn't kill him, man, and now he's back. Yeah, 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 the thing is. The thing is, we need someone to drive the limo we can trust, because that nutter keeps making threats. Shell me, I need my mom. We're all breaking ourselves, man. Okay, guys, calm down. I'll handle this. Normally, I wouldn't busy myself with driving around a bunch of drunken Scottish bisexuals. But in your case, I'll make an exception. Thanks to his new friend, Tommy Versetti, Paul would manage to keep the band alive long enough to complete their tour in Vice City, but as we speculated earlier, he would not apparently be credited in any capacity for his work with the band, and instead would be a silent executive producer. Paul would later boast about having worked with several bands from the 80s who were instrumental, pun intended, to the music scene of the decade. He claimed to be responsible for the successful singles I Ran by Flock of Seagulls, You Got Another Thing Coming by Judas Priest, and I Just Died in Your Arms Tonight by Cutting Crew, among others though he was conveniently never credited for any of this work, leaving the truth of his involvement ambiguous at best. If his association to Love Fist wasn't known for certain, it might be tempting to conclude that these claims were entirely fabricated. However, given his work for them and his later work with known bands, it seems entirely possible that both before and after 1986, he was working with various bands around Vice City as an uncredited producer. Still frequenting the Malibu Club nearly every night, Paul would continue to try his luck with the ladies to no avail. At some point in 1986, he would find some success when approached by Fernando Martinez of Fernando's New Beginnings, and if the smooth-talking Latin radio personality is to be believed, this would actually inspire him to start the aforementioned dating service. So anyway, as I was saying, this early girl in the nightclub, you know, now of course, I, Fernando Martinez, did not come home with this chick. Me, I have a reputation to think of, a code, but... I could see she was a all lonely and stuff, and I feel really bad, so I scour the nightclub from top to bottom, and then I find this snooty little English kid, Paul or something, standing all alone, and I take him over to this ugly girl. I make them think, I make them talk, I tell them some jokes, and soon they are singing, they are dancing, and I think, Fernando, you have a gift, my friend. A gift for romance. I like to see men's and women's get together. People say, Fernando, use your gift to make money and buy a yacht or maybe a fast car. And I say, Fernando is on the radio. That is my gift to Vice City. Paul would once again run afoul of his friend Tommy Versetti that year, when Versetti came looking for information regarding a money counterfeiting operation in the state. 
Knowing Paul was good with rumors, he would be Tommy's first stop, and despite having worked together in some capacity several times, Tommy would be none the kinder to his limey acquaintance when seeking answers. On that. <laughs> oh, all right, girls, you're lost, mate, innit? All right, me old China, that's hanging. What do you know about counterfeiting? Oh, I'm fine, Paul. How about you? Come here. Oh, all right, all right, all right. You're obviously a busy man. All I know about dodgy reddies is to try and supply the plates. Ah, oh, fuck. You know, they've got a shipping company down the docks. Ah, uh, uh, the boss man would know when the plates are coming in next. Thanks. Oh. What's the matter with you, you maniac? Give me another drink, lively. Still desperately wishing to sit at the big boy's table, Paul would continue to harass and harangue Tommy whilst he took control of the city, buying up assets left and right in a bid to secure his position as the city's new drug baron. One such asset that Tommy would acquire would be an adult film studio, Interglobal Films, and Paul, thinking of himself as a smooth-talking ladies' man, would even attempt to land himself a role in one of their films, seeing as he was so familiar with the new owner. Tommy, Paolo here, two packs of Amigo. What do you want, Paul? I don't want any fake label clothes. Very funny, mate, but you know I don't touch bank gear. No, I was just calling to see if I could get a part in one of your movies. Back in England, I did a lot of blue stuff, mate. I'm packing more weight than you, my son. Paul, thanks for the offer. I'll bear that in mind. Seriously, don't forget about me, I'll fall up down for ya. That's what I'm trying to forget about. Despite never being taken up on his offer to Tommy, Paul would also meet, through either Love Fist or his frequent clubbing, Mercedes Cortez, a friend and possible lover of Versetti, and according to Paul, even managed to sleep with her, though it remains unclear if this was simply more of his boasting. It's possible Paul met her at a celebration which followed Tommy's successful robbery of El Banco Corrupto Grande. While both are thought to have been present, it isn't entirely clear why Paul was there, given his often rocky relationship with Tommy. What'd I tell you, Tommy? What'd I tell you? Ben Swap better watch out when Ken Paul is in town. Come on, give me a bit of a slice, mate. Come on, I gotta get some new friends. Not long after, Tommy Versetti would kill his old boss and head of the Liberty City-based Ferrelli crime family, Sonny Ferrelli. And with Sonny's death, Tommy would become the undisputed kingpin of Vice City. Being a man who prided himself on staying in the know, Paul would quickly learn of Versetti's ultimate takeover and continue to try and find a way into the game, often too drunk to decide between childish antagonism or desperate bargaining. He would phone Versetti twice sometime after his takeover to, we speculate, antagonize him, feeling continuously ignored for his perceived role in setting Tommy up when he first arrived in Vice. Tommy, it's Palos. How are you? Right, mate, anyway, four hours to drop you a line. Oh my good lord, my son, you will not believe the quality of the brass I just encountered. Streetwalker or something, just that in little of anime. Said her name was Mercedes or something. Oh my god, mate, you've got to check this bird out. Could strip the lead out of a pencil. Said I was the best you ever had, and all. Get your potato skin fluffy, seeing ya. Tommy Facetti. How's it going, Mr. Big Shot? I hear all these things about you. Some kind of plow in town now, eh? Paul, you're drunk. No, you be proud, ain't drunk. I had a couple and some treats. I've been a bit of a couple of days, you know. Anyway, don't give me that. I ain't a mug. Who set you up in this town? Oh, me, that's who. Really? Don't give me that, don't. I introduced you to people, I showed you the ropes. Did a lot of stuff for you, and this is how you repay me. You ignore me. You won't give me a way in, or after all what I did for you. What do you think I am, a devil or something? Paul, take it easy. I've been busy, don't be an idiot. I ain't no idiot, miss. That's what I said in Bolstal. You ask skip the trouble, son, because you're going to get it. <laughs> Tommy, mate, please. Use me big oh, please. Don't laugh at me. Uh, Paul, get some sleep, seriously. But nothing would successfully convince Tommy of Paul's true utility to a man such as himself. Finally giving up on his increasingly desperate attempts to earn Tommy's respect or friendship, Paul would begin to work on himself for once, and at some point between 1986 and 1992, decide that it was finally time to go home again. Possibly following a three-month bender in 1987, which ended in a massive crash on, of all days, Black Thursday. Returning to jolly old England for a break from the dazzling lights of Vice City in the 1980s, Paul would even manage to kick his drug habit, at least most of it. He did seem to still rely quite heavily on the aid of alcohol to get him through his days, but by early 92 he had cleaned up his act for the most part, and begun to find work in the music industry as the Madchester scene began to explode. A 
Upon returning to England, however, Paul would not simply rest on his laurels in his namesake city, but instead begin making moves in and around Manchester. Having learned a great deal about networking whilst living in Vice City, Paul would have the talent and charisma necessary to land himself new and lucrative opportunities, and even find himself rich enough to begin making large acquisitions, such as his first major contract signing in early 92. Paul would pay a massive £50,000 to buy out the contract of Gurning Chimp's singer Macker, and his band, who was poised to take the world, or at the very least Manchester, by storm. With Macker and the rest of the band now his to manage, Paul would get to work on an advertisement strategy that would propel the chimps to worldwide success, and to a man such as Kent Paul, there was no better place to advertise than the land of the free. Paul, Macker, and the chimps would fly out to Las Venturas San Andreas and begin to immerse themselves in American culture, but Paul would drastically underestimate just how unpredictable, and difficult, Macker could truly be. At some point during his time in America, either in the 90s or possibly during his original stay beginning at age 21, Paul would meet hippie drug dealer and pseudo-philosopher The Truth, whose real name remains a mystery to even our most intrepid GTAB investigators. Likely at Macker's suggestion, Paul and the rest of the band would accompany The Truth on a peyote journey deep into the desert of Bone County, and quite predictably, things would go horribly wrong. When the peyote turns out to be, in Macker's opinion, shite, he would opt to spike presumably everybody's drinks with LSD, and cause their otherwise enlightening journey to become a living nightmare. Over the course of the night, everyone in the band besides Macker and Paul would go missing, someone would apparently give STIs to a group of country bumpkins, and the truth would wake up in a Japanese bathhouse, in Los Santos. Luckily for Paul and Macker though, the truth would be friends with one of the most reliable criminal contractors in the state, Carl Johnson, and phone his friend to collect the stranded and likely very confused Fritz. Hello? Hey, anybody out here? The truth sent me. Hey, over there. Hey, man, you all right? Fucking hell. I'm fucking hanging. Stone me, bloody crows. Oh, where am I? I don't know, mate. I was having a dream. I was wanking over some fat bird's tits when this twat turned up. Macca, you fucking psycho. You did it again, didn't ya? That peyote was shite. You're lucky I brought some tabs along. I told you a million times not to put stuff in my fucking drink. Oh, piss off, kidder. Who are you again? Oh, I'm a friend of the truth. He said you guys might need a ride in the town or something. But I'm a fucking raspberry. You're not a fucking raspberry. I can't feel my legs, RP. I've wanked the use out of them. Just stand up, you soppy cunt. We go through this every weekend. Ow, ooh. Man, what the hell was y'all doing last night? Anybody got a rag? Uh, so where I'm taking y'all? I got a pal, Rosie. He's got some casino gig going down in Venturas. Sweet? Alright. Fuck off, String. Oh, charming. Alright, ladies, let's go. Come on, fucking Northerners. Well, it felt like I couldn't feel him honest. So where's the rest of the band, guys? Macca, where are the boys? I don't fucking know, do I? I remember snakes. Lots of snakes. It's a snake farm not too far from here. We can go check it out. Retracing their steps to try and find the rest of the band, at least at first, Carl would take Paul and Macca to a snake farm not far from where they awoke, and try to find the missing members. Unfortunately, not only would they not find any of the missing gurning chimps, but they would find a group of very angry rednecks who were less than enthused to see Paul or Macker again so soon. Here we are. Look familiar? Looks just like Salford to me. What are you talking about? Take a gander at him, fellas. Is that him? That there city boy has gone and been with my prize hog. Now I don't even get no sugar from her. And that one done screwed my sis. I had a terrible aching in my grinds ever since. I'm gonna slap you silly for giving me and my fella the red bumpies. What in tarnation? I'm a-fixin' to give you a whooping for what you gone and done to my young uns. Thankfully, with Carl present, the trio would manage to safely escape the attack, and Paul would ultimately decide that finding new replacement members would be far easier than actually tracking down the missing ones. Seems you boys had a good time. Hey, what about the band? We'll just have to pray they've made it to civilization. Keep all this and drummers at ten a penny anyway. Which casino is it? It's called Caligula's. It's on the strip somewhere, I think. Instead, Paul would decide that the best place to hunker down and make more connections would be at Caligula's Casino on the Ventura Strip, as he'd learned through the grapevine he so frequently picked from that an old friend of his had been managing it for the Mafia. 
That friend was none other than the disgraced mob lawyer, Ken Rosenberg. What kind of tits does this Rosie have? Big floppy sausage tits? Empty saddlebags or bee stings? Rosie's a man! And stop touching yourself! It's just for comfort, Pablo. This is a stressful situation, man. You're fucking telling me it is. Ah, oh, can it, you two? Hey, he started it. Come on, then. Let's go in and see Rosie. Kent Paul, here to see Rosie. Hey, boss, there's somebody here to see you. Oh, go away. I have a migraine. Oh, hey, Rosie, son, it's me, Paolo. Oh, God. My despair is complete. Okay, let him in. Rosie, how are you, me old son? I pray that one day I can escape my perpetual torment and retire in peace and comfort a million miles away from anyone I've ever fucking known, and instead, I get this? Come on, it's me, Kent Paul. Well, hello, Paul. What a pleasant surprise. Who the hell are these guys? These are my boys, Mecca and Cole. Sir. You want any speckled doves, boss? I'm peeking on one right now. Top of the range, <laughs> man. Well, it's fitting as I sit here up to my neck in a river of shit with every mafia gorilla from Liberty City to Los Santos pissing in my face that you, Kent Paul, should witness it. What's the matter, Sam? Too numerous, oppressively insurmountable, and depressingly fucking typical even to mention. It's all right, bruv. Paolo can help. Give us some space, would you, son? I'll give you a tinkle later. All right, for sure. Not you, Mecca. Oh, you twat. Unbelievable. Rosenberg would reluctantly reacquaint himself with his old Vice City contact, and having no one else to speak to besides a parrot named Tony, he would presumably spill his guts to Paul, despite never sharing a particularly close relationship. When Paul learned of just how deep a mess Rosenberg had gotten himself into, he would uncharacteristically decide to stay and help by recruiting his new friend Carl Johnson to assist Rosie with the Mafia Mexican standoff he found himself in the middle of. Oi, Rosie, liven yourself up. Carl's here. <sighs> Hello. What's happening? Hey, there's some top fanny down at that pool, Pabsy. Eh? Oh, leave it out, Dimlo. What's wrong with you? Well, are you going to tell him or shall I? I'm really screwed. Crack on, Rosie. Spit it out. I threw it all away. Okay. I had the power, the money, the ladies, but I couldn't lay off the blow. So I went into rehab, and everything went to shit, but so what? So when I came out, I started representing the Liberty City mob. Again, and that's how I ended up here. But no one family would trust another family to run the casino, so I was put forth as a neutral party. So now I spend my days waiting for one family to cap me and blame the other one. My only friend is a bird named Tony. I never fucked anyone over in my life who didn't have it coming to him. Shit, let me think about this. You got to break it down for me real quick. Okay, okay. The Sindacos are on the warpath. Okay, I mean, something terrible like has happened to Johnny. I mean, he's in a shock-induced coma at the hospital across town. Now, the Ferrellis, they will take this opportunity to rub him out. Now, if any hit between the families succeeds on my turf, I will get the axe, bullet, machete, Okay, whatever. okay, relax. I'm gonna shoot over to the hospital and move the body or something. There you go, my love. Things ain't so bad, are they? <sighs> Bada bang! While Carl dealt with Rosenberg's Sindaco problem, Paul would come up with a plan he was quite proud of to revitalize the cripplingly anxious Florida lawyer. Knowing Rosenberg not just as his one-time lawyer, but as a fellow Malibu Club regular back in the 80s, Paul would know the one thing that Rosie needed to get him back on his feet and ready to tackle his daunting responsibilities. Cocaine. Oh, baby, I'm back! I am back! Let's get this show on the road! The good doctor has revived the patient. Thank you, Sweet thank as my you, son, thank sweet. You. So everything straight now? No! Absolutely not! I'm still screwed! Absolutely screwed, but at least now I'm in the right frame of mind! <laughs> what the fuck are we gonna do? Any minute now, some mafia bullet is going to splatter my brains all over the wall! My wall! My beautiful wall. Ooh, you missed a bit. I love that. Forget about it. Oh, that's a great idea, Tony, but you know what? It ain't gonna work, okay? Not this time. No way, no way. Look, man, relax. Get a grip. Yeah. 
You're right. I need to get a grip. Take control. Yes. Grab the bull by the horn. And show everybody who's boss. I'm the boss. I am the boss. All right, then. All right. Let's tear this That's what up. I'm saying. <laughs> so where we going? Details. Details. Let's just get there. Rack them up, Mako. What's the matter with you? However, Paul would eventually overstay his welcome when Ken's real boss, Salvatore Leone, finally decided to pay the casino a visit personally, to ensure that the business was running exactly as he wanted it to. Having exactly zero patience for the antics of either Paul or the far more unruly Macker, Salvatore would almost immediately make a show of force by having them both dangled out of Ken's office window, tying them to the back of Ken's couch to ensure he stayed exactly where Salvatore wanted him. Top fucking buzz this! I'm peeking on the blood pressure alone! Yeah, terrific. Well, well, well. What do we got here? Here's your sandwich. Who's this pretty thing? I don't usually do this kind of shit, you know. <laughs> I like this girl. What's your name, kid? Maria. And the service is not included. Hey, the woman, you fat fuck. You heard the bird. Come on. <laughs> Are you kidding me? See you later, guys. And who's this asshole? The name's Carl Johnson, sir. Before working with Mr. Rosenberg here, I had the pleasure of doing business with your son, Joey, back in Liberty City. You know my Joey? I like that. So, kid, what can I do for you? Well, Ken, a vouch for me, I'm a straight killer. Oh, but one man fucking army. A, a real dependable. Total fucking maniac, too. You know the Ferrellis are sending over a crew to hit me. Their flight gets in soon. Traveling as a string quartet. <laughs> I was gonna send some of the boys over as a little welcoming committee. But uh, maybe you can take care of it. Thank you, sir. I guarantee you, you won't regret this. Uh, maybe I should go yeah! around. That, 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 you stay where you are, Rosenberg. I don't want you getting yourself lost. In far deeper than they expected to be, Paul, Macker, and Rosenberg would all become increasingly desperate to escape their position, but thanks to the skills of the one-of-a-kind Carl Johnson, Paul would at least be allowed to get back on his feet, but only literally, which was more than could be said for the anti-social Macker. Can I fucking go now, or fucking what? Ooh, you fucking twat! Right in the fucking happy sack! Perhaps you'll be cured of your little anti-social condition, mate. Carl! My man. Mr. Leon. Looks like this piece of shit was right. You did a real number on those Ferrelli losers. Now it's time the Ferrellis found out what it means to screw with Salvatore Leon. How would you like to hit the St. Mark's Bistro? A hit in Liberty City? Cool. But I'm gonna need some backup. Take who you want. Well, I usually use these two. Hey, hey, remember all those jobs we did together, huh? Huh? You and me, Carl, remember? Huh? You know, you used to call me Killer Ken. Ken the Killer? Killer? Ice Cold Ken. That's me. And him too, I guess. Thinking that Carl was loyal to him, Salvatore would allow CJ to take Paul, Macker, and Rosenberg with him as backup for the Liberty City hit, believing Carl intended to take them out discreetly along the way. Luckily for them, though, CJ would have no intention of murdering anyone of them, anyway, and give them an opportunity to drive as far away from Las Venturas as they could get, with a cover story explaining their disappearances to Don Salvatore. Alright, you guys better get out of Las Venturas fast. I'll be in touch. What about your backup, man? Will you be alright without us? Of course he will, you fucking moron! Come on! Paul, Macker, and Ken would presumably begin hiding out somewhere in Los Santos following their exile from Venturas, but exactly what they did during this time remains unclear. At some point, however, they would be contacted by Carl Johnson once again, who was finally planning himself to return to Los Santos, now being the manager of LS rap star Mad Dog. Knowing he needed a producer and an accountant if he was to properly manage Mad Dog's career, he would suggest to Ken that he and Paul come and work with him at Mad Dog's mansion in the Vinewood Hills, and possibly even live there, given the mansion had an excess of 19 bedrooms, if the boastful superstar was to be believed. Hey Ken, how you doing? Who is this? It's Carl. Carl Johnson. Hey Carl! Great! Guys, it's Carl! Great! I'm fucking great! Fucking amazing! I got a need for an accountant and a sound engineer, and I thought of you and Paul. Fucking amazing! Paul's great with figures, and I'd make a fucking amazing producer. This is... This is fucking great!
play. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Whatever you say, man. But look, see you soon. Fucking amazing. Back on top, Paul would become producer to Los Santos' favorite rapper, and Macker would be given opportunities to record solo in Dog's studio, though Paul would desperately fight with him to cease his constant anti-social behavior. Later, while recording Dog's new album at his home studio, Paul and the crew would be interrupted when CJ's presence triggers government G-man Mike Torino's intrusion on the studio signals, leaving Paul, Mad Dog, and Macker excessively confused. Oh, go on! Go on! Come on! Come on, please leave yourself alone. Come on, here. Come on, oh, 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 you man, mongrel. Oh, sonny, you shouldn't be choking the gecko in the first place. Remember what happened to that gig in Amber? That groupie loved it. That wasn't a groupie, that was a roadie. But she had great tits. Man tits. They were man tits. Goddamn. Hey, what happened? Hey, what the sound's that? I don't know, bruv. It all just went. You fucking shite, you RP. I can't be held responsible for dodgy gear, all right? Come on, keep it together, man. You can't fuck with us, Flo. Finally, I thought I'd never get through to you. What the f... What's Torino, this? is that you? What's happening here? Torino? Listen, you gotta pull one last trick. Hold up, mate. Look, okay? hold up one second. Communists at the gate, Carl. I'm tired of this, Torino. I'm outside. Let's take a ride. Now I'm eating things. Fuck me! Um, hey, I gotta on? get out of here. You got this? Hey, dog. I gotta go hit a marketing meeting. I'm gonna catch you later. All right, morning, go, sunshine. My heart. Yeah, sweet ass. Come on, you having that, Mac? You having that? I'm gonna die in the eye of the storm. That's my destiny. But one incredibly strange interruption would not be enough to throw the talented men off their game. And soon after CJ's departure, Paul would return to producing Mad Dog's next record, and recording would finally go smoothly, at least for a time. Being solely responsible for the musical production and no longer a manager, Paul would be forced to watch Mad Dog's hasty departure to chase after fellow LS rapper, OG Loke, with little to nothing he could do to stop the disruption. Hey, what's up, dawg? CJ, what's up, baby? What? Resist, sunshine. You can do it. For me, eh? Fucking Noveners. No, Macca. Fight the urge. Think of Thatcher. You know it's my time again. I know, dude. So what's holding you back? Whoa, whoa, hold up. This is video. I gotta see this fool. Hey, man, you clean now. You got nothing to worry about. Man, that fake-ass Loke. Loke? But he's terrible. Motherfucker. I knew there was something familiar about those rhymes he was kicking. They're from my rhyme book. That's my money. And those are my hoes. And that's my video he's shooting today. Okay. I say we make a cameo appearance. Just drop in on the night. Yeah, that's gangster. Come on. Gotcha. I love you, Mac. Oh, Macca. I love you, Macca. Oh, you ain't right in the head, mate. After chasing Loke down to retrieve Mad Dog's stolen rhyme book, CJ and Dog would meet Blast and Fools records producer Jimmy Silverman, and presumably put him in contact with Paul in order to facilitate a distribution deal for the newly finished album. With Paul's apparent musical expertise, Dog's natural talent, CJ's resourcefulness, and Silverman's connections, Mad Dog would release his first gold record, 40 Dog, in late 1992, or possibly early 1993. Whoa, 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 whoa. I come in peace with Mr. Dog here, who has an announcement. My, I mean, our first gold record! Yes, you know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, they heard about I it. I decided to get breast implants. Oh, oh, that's not the fucking local, up. is it? Joke on. Anyway, what's next? We should hit the casinos, roll some dice with Woozy. Nah, we gotta take care of shit here first. We're going on tour, fam. Has anyone got a tissue? My nose is just, <laughs> yeah. it won't stop running. Is that, anybody? Yeah, I have. Over there. Uh, I'll pass. Carl, where are you off to now? Finna hit the block. See what's happening.
But for Kent Paul, the death of the 1980s would be unacceptable, and as the realization that times were moving on rapidly without him began to become more apparent, he would slowly slip back into his old ways. He would apparently stop producing for Mad Dog shortly after the release of 40 Dog, and end up falling off the wagon of substance abuse once again, even though he'd never truly given up his drinking habit. Now back on drugs and spiraling downwards, Paul would once again return to England, and spend the next several years aimlessly wandering through Manchester's music scene, presumably still clinging on to decades past, as he grew further and further out of touch. By 2002, Paul would be forced to attend rehab, though it's unclear who it was that sent him away, with our own investigative team dismissing the possibility of a self-check-in, given Paul's extensively irresponsible record. He would apparently complete the program, and soon after begin staying at an aftercare program under the watchful supervision of one Dr. Perkins. Paul would spend many grueling hours undergoing psychotherapy, and in his constant isolation eventually become desperate enough in his free time to learn that dreaded technology which we've come to know as the internet. He would begin teaching himself how to code his own website entirely from scratch, using the computer time he was allotted during treatment, and even begin teaching himself HTML while he recovered, in hopes of improving his web design. Paul's site would even begin to receive visitors from all across the world, though not many, and fans would begin writing him, often to complain about things he'd gotten wrong on his blog. One such email exchange recovered by our investigators read, No you can't. I'm a big 80s fan. Loved your website. I live in Missouri. Where is Kent? We have a lot of corn here and we all drive cars. Do they have cars in Kent? Will you be my friend? I'm very lonely. I got a big knife and I want to cut myself. I love goth music and old television shows. Anyways, I was watching cable all last week and I noticed you made a couple of errors. First, the family was called the Chesterfields, not the Dawkins. And then, you say the little kid was 35, but in fact, he was 42. That's why I kept saying, but I'm 42. Because he was. He didn't say, I'm 35. I mean, I think he might have, but only when he was. Uh, also, he was an investment banker, not a bond trader, as you have it on your website, which is wrong. I don't think you could really call yourself a fan of five of us. I've been to lots of conventions, and I still have a lunchbox. Please ride back. Keep on trucking. To which Paul responded, Jeff. Well, thanks, Jeff, you prat. First up, I'm called Paul. I'm from Kent, near London. Seconds, I don't care. That show is crap. Thirds, no, you can't be my friend. And fourths, I hope you're in prison or something. Am I making myself clear? He would spend so much time dedicated to his new website, Kent Paul's 80s Nostalgia Zone, that he would become actively competitive with other patients in his own facility, making rudimentary sites of their own. He would post lengthy diatribes about his unhealthy 80s obsession throughout 2002, posting about everything from music to movies, fads and fashions, famous quotes, faces and video games, clothes, social problems, food, and just about everything in between, so long as he could tie it back to his favorite, long dead decade. What became of Kent Paul following his time at the Halfway House remains anyone's guess. He was never again credited for any musical production, and by all accounts effectively dropped off the face of the earth, which some particularly conspiratorial folks have used as further proof of a parallel dimensional shift. We here at GTA Biographies, however, are thoroughly convinced he was simply, finally, out of juice. Poor bloody bastard. Kent Paul was an insecure yet perplexingly boastful man, who from a young age was displeased with his own abilities, whether they be social or romantic. Despite this insecurity, he would have plenty of success if his own word is to be believed, but remain uncredited for much of his contributions in the music industry and beyond, which likely only further contributed to his below-average sense of self-worth. He was also an arguably perverted womanizer, or at least he attempted to be so, despite rarely managing to attract the specific type of woman he was into. He would, however, on numerous occasions find love in other places, but his own twisted sense of what a real woman was would contribute to his private loss of confidence, whilst always maintaining the air of superiority he was almost obligated to display as a Brit in America. 
Though he would rarely receive the credit or acknowledgement for his contributions, Paul was by all accounts a quite talented record producer, as demonstrated by his work for the Gurning Chimps and later Mad Dog, whose album would even go on to reach gold status due in no small part to his production. This talent may be proof that he was in fact responsible for making bands such as Cutting Crew, Judas Priest, and Flock of Seagulls successful, though it remains entirely unclear if he was simply exaggerating his role in the 80s music scene to boost his own ego. Paul was, for most of his life, quite a loner, never hanging onto a girlfriend for long and rarely getting to know people beyond club acquaintances and working girls. His only known close friends were perhaps Ken Rosenberg, though Ken seemed mostly annoyed at Paul's presence if anything, and Macker whose thick northern accent made it difficult to discern just what the hell he was ever saying, let alone what he thought of Paul. As revealed in Macker's blog, he and Paul would be close enough for him to refer to Paul endearingly as Pabsy as late as 2004. However, as we mentioned earlier, he had still not been heard from since at least two years prior. If there was anyone in Vice City who embodied the excess, flamboyance, and recklessness of the 1980s in America, it ironically might not have been an American at all, but a scruffy lad from East Kent with a gleam in his eye and a point to prove whatever the hell it was. Though Paul himself would likely boast of a far more extensive criminal record, in reality he has one of the shortest criminal records of almost anyone explored here on GTA Biographies. In fact, the only reason Paul's rap sheet is longer than just a few entries is due to his association with Tommy Rossetti and later Carl Johnson. Beyond his arguably tenuous connections to murders, among other crimes, committed by these two well-known American criminals, it's possible Paul's ties to the underworld would hardly be worth mentioning when it comes to actual charges he could have received. All that being said, there are a number of potential links that Paul did have to incidents both major and minor whilst living in England and more predominantly America, starting with Destruction of private property at age 15 when vandalizing Mark Cosgrove's car, not charged as an adult. Accessory murder in 1986 when tipping Tommy Rossetti off to Leo Teal on Ocean Drive, who was subsequently killed along with several other chefs. Accessory murder when tipping Tommy off to Lance Vance's abduction, resulting in Tommy murdering dozens of Diaz soldiers to save Lance. Conspiracy drug possession when recruiting Tommy to find love juice for Love Fist at the recording studio. Conspiracy accessory attempted murder when hiring Tommy to kill Love Fist's psycho killer. Accessory murder when tipping Tommy off to a counterfeiting operation in Viceport, resulting in Tommy killing many counterfeiters. Accessory murder when witnessing Carl Johnson's murder for at least four Bone County snake farmers. And purchasing illegal drugs and drug possession when supplying Ken Rosenberg with cocaine to revitalize him. As you can see, Paul himself was hardly a criminal mastermind, though it seems quite apparent that some part of him wished he could be. Had he managed to keep his nose just a bit cleaner and avoid the likes of Tommy Versetti or Carl Johnson, it's possible he could have remained off the criminal radar indefinitely, with the VCPD and LVPD respectively having far bigger fish to fry. However, GTA Biographies never forgets and never forgives, unless we are paid off substantially. As a result, we have absolutely no shame whatsoever in exposing Mr. Kent Paul for what few crimes he is guilty of. We can only hope, America, that if Paul is still out there, he will one day see justice, but more than likely, he will simply fade away into obscurity. Cheers, Pabsy. Why did the British give up on retaking America so easily? Was it because the likes of Kent Paul represented the best Her Majesty had to offer? Or was it perhaps because America was no longer worth it after the 80s culture finally died? The first time. We may never be able to understand those foreigners in the far-off land of tea and crumpets, but rest assured we can at least make fun of their accents while they watch the great ship of American prosperity sink beneath the waves. Until that day, though, America will always be a dangerous place, folks. Be you a red-blooded Mississippian or a cocky lad from East Kent. Stay indoors, people, but don't change the channel. You never know if Piers Morgan will resurface when you least expect him to. Instead, keep yourself tuned to this channel, now available as a stream of data directly to your central nervous system. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of Grand Theft Auto Biographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching. America, the land of the free, home of the brave, and the stupid, and the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. 
tonight on Grand Theft Auto Biography. Construction, bribery, and good old-fashioned gang wars. Tonight we will take a look at the life of one of America's most notorious land developers, who left his low-cost, high-profit mark all across this great nation. We will examine a real estate magnate who not only used every dirty tactic in the book, but more than likely wrote the book himself. A proud man who never hesitated to bribe, threaten, or kill just about anyone that stood in his way, whose legacy of intimidation still lingers in the modern-day criminal underworld. We will see riots, false flag operations, and bitter revenge as we document the known criminal history of the one and only Avery Carrington. The early life of Avery Carrington is shrouded in mystery, as is often the case here on GTA Biographies. However, it is also often the case that we should speculate on what led him to his most infamous associations based on what little information we do have. According to our research, Avery was born in Texas, likely in the year 1935, although the source for this figure has been occasionally misinformed in the past, so this date should be taken with a grain of salt. Who his parents were specifically remains a mystery, despite the fact that Avery himself would frequently reminisce about his father, who seemed to have imparted a large part of his own personality onto his son. Being a native Texan, presumably just like his father, we speculate Avery would grow up with a fascination and idolization of the American cowboy, as by the time he was an adult, he would dress almost exclusively in vests, jeans, and was almost never seen without his signature cowboy boots and hat. While it isn't known for a certainty, it is believed that Avery would begin his business back in Texas, perhaps using a substantial inheritance or loan from his father to begin buying up property left and right. It must be emphasized that while we do not know if Avery came from wealth himself or built himself up from scratch, the former seems far more likely to our investigative team, based solely on his clear disregard for practically everyone around him, and especially the poor. Given that he so often invoked his father for teaching him how to be a businessman, it can also be assumed that Avery learned his signature aggression from Carrington Sr. as well. He would become known for using the most underhanded tactics imaginable in order to ensure whatever deal he was making benefited him as much as possible. He would see no issue morally or otherwise with inciting violence, bribery, physical intimidation, or even outright murder, as long as it made him just a bit wealthier and more importantly, the winner. In fact, Carrington seemed to be a sore loser in general, possibly another trait inherited from his father's disposition. This is evidenced by his reluctance to concede even the tiniest bit of ground to his enemies, or even just those who happened to stand in his way. Eventually, Avery would decide that even Texas wasn't big enough for his ego, and decide to move his primary business interests to the sunny state of Florida. More specifically, the den of sin, misery, and cocaine that was Vice City in the 1980s. It isn't known exactly when Avery moved his business to Vice, however, it was likely by at least 1982 or earlier, as by 1986, he would already be finished construction of a massive development near, presumably, the Gator Keys. This construction development would be an upper-class condominium complex outside of Vice City, Shady Acres. Although its likely owners have since changed hands, we still attempted to find details on when, how, or even where the development was constructed, but our inquiry attempts were continuously rejected, with the reason cited being that we were far too poor to even visit, let alone be approved for on-site filming. I'm a VIP, and I want to live around people just like myself, rich and divorced. Shady Acres. I'm Avery Karen. Shady Acres is an incredible, upscale, state-of-the-art, top-notch condominium development. Condo. A short drive out of town on some pristine wetlands. 
away from the noise and uninvited diversity of the city. Shady Acres. And when you buy into that dream that is Shady Acres, not only do you get a luxurious 5,000 square foot condo with underground parking for your newly acquired sports car, but there's also a jacuzzi for entertaining. Jacuzzi. Each condo is tastefully furnished with a stock bar and an exotic waterbed shaped like a dollar sign. Shady Acres also has a golf range, firing range, helipad, and exotic petting zoo. When your kids come to visit, you're successful. Start defining your lifestyle. Start defining yourself. Shady Acres. Shady Acres. Happiness is worth the price. Shady It is assumed that Shady Acres, like all of Carrington's projects, was built by his private construction company, Avery Construction. However, representatives from the company refused to speak with us, and any direct proof linking Avery to the company itself has yet to be found, leading some to assume the two are entirely unconnected. Regardless of how he got it done, Avery would indeed get Shady Acres built, and begin to reap the profits from advertising exclusively to rich, middle-aged white men with plenty of money to burn. But one enormous and exceedingly profitable development in Vice City would of course not be enough for the greedy and ruthless cowboy, and soon enough, he would begin seeking new opportunities to expand his interests across the city and the state. Avery was never known to have married in his life, for reasons even we will not speculate on, and as a result, he would have no known children, but still have a desire to impart his particular brand of wisdom onto a new generation. To accomplish this, Avery would, by 1986, take backstabber and training Donald Love under his wing, and drag him all around Vice City to various meetings and deals in order to show Donald the ropes of extreme capitalism as he saw it. Despite his willingness to train Donald, he would be incredibly dismissive of his protege, seeming to keep him around more to boost his own ego than to actually teach the man anything. But nonetheless, many of Avery's lessons would become embedded in Donald's mind, and eventually, Avery's ego would come back to haunt him. In the meantime, though, he would seek legal counsel for his many highly illegal activities from well-known criminal lawyer Ken Rosenberg, and the two would quickly form an effective mutual business relationship. He would also become well-known enough among relevant circles to be invited to yacht parties hosted by the retired Colonel Juan Garcia Cortez, with one such party, believed to be the last of its kind, taking place in early 1986. Sometime after the completion of Shady Acres, Avery would purchase the rights to land formerly used for the Washington Beach Fairground, and presumably demolish it himself. Although he would acquire rights to nearly all of the land for his next construction project, a small delivery company, Spand Express, would continue to hang on, refusing to sell their lot. Seeking any and all avenues to push them out of the area, Avery would approach one of Vice City's most resourceful lawyers for legal advice on how best to proceed. Rosenberg would spill a sob story to Avery about a botched drug deal he'd helped set up between the Ferrelli crime family and the Vance crime empire, as well as the lone Ferrelli survivor, who was now tasked with helping him clean up the mess, Tommy Rossetti. Seeing a perfect opportunity for mutual criminal aid, Avery would volunteer to help the stressed out mobsters, provided they first help him with his spandex problem. Avery goes without saying, Tommy, Tommy, any progress? No, 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 tell me later, tell me later. Tommy, this is Avery Carrington. I believe you met at the party. Not in person. Howdy. Avery here has a proposition. <clears throat> Haven't we got other things on our mind? I'm trying to keep the wolves from the door. So could you please cut me some slack? I'm stretched like a wire, and even if I'm dead by the end of the week, I'd like to think that I didn't die poor. Now just okay? calm down, both of you. Son, you help me, and any greaseballs giving you a hard time, I'll see to it they take a long dirt nap. Okay, what could I do for you? This delivery company's got its depot on some prime land. They won't sell. They're hanging on like a big old prairie rat. So we gotta go in there and smoke that vermin out. Head on down there and stir up a hornet's nest. The security will have their hands full, and then you can sneak in and put them out of business. And you could drop by Raphael's for a change of clothes. You might be there a while, but yeah, go for it. Should be a riot. If the balls drop like they should. Stop by my office sometime. Tommy would don a Spand Express uniform and proceed to incite a violent riot during a quite conveniently timed strike, slipping past the fighting to destroy several of the company's trucks in hopes of putting the whole operation out of business. With Spand dealt with, Avery would, we assume, finally purchase the remaining lot that once made up the Washington Beach Fairground 
though the Spandex Express headquarters would remain undisturbed for at least the duration of 1986. Avery wouldn't stop there, however, always needing more land and more projects to keep himself busy doing what he did best. Knowing he now had a particularly useful resource available to him in Tommy Versetti, Avery would make the most of his situation and continue to employ Tommy's services in dealing with property disputes. He would attempt to buy some unidentified land shortly after the Spandex Riot, and when his initial offer was refused, he would immediately turn to Tommy for a more direct approach in getting what he wanted. Come in and park yourself on the hide, son. Hell, my daddy used to say, never look a gift horse in the mouth. And by golly, he never did. Would you like a drop of the old Kentucky? No thanks. A clean thinker. I like that. Now, the property business isn't all about highfalutin paper pushing. It's about dirt, and the will to claim that dirt. You with me, son? Oh, yeah. Well, I need some tenacious bastard to let go of some dirt, and you look to me like the kind of guy to persuade him. Persuasion's my forte. Yeah, he'll be down at the country club, down on the golf course. They don't allow guns, so his bodyguards won't be packing lawgivers. Go beat eight tons of crap out of him. Here, now, I got you a membership. And boy, you're gonna need more appropriate clothing. Once again, Tommy would make a suitable change of clothes in order to sneak into the Leaflinks Golf Club and make the hardballing developer change his mind. Unfortunately for him, however, Tommy's method of ensuring Avery got the deal he was after involved outright murder, and after disposing of the developer and his guards, he would flee the country club and return to Avery for his payment and yet another criminal scheme. Catching on quickly, Tommy would by then have a firm grasp on the kind of man Avery was and as a result, would barely need an explanation when the cowboy revealed his next rodeo. The final piece of the puzzle in this Washington Beach redevelopment project would require the destruction of an adjacent building site across the street from his. Seeing as construction had already begun on the other site, Avery would employ Tommy to use remote control explosives to anonymously decommission the building by force. He would even leave town during the attack to add plausible deniability to his innocence. Now look here, son. I got a problem, and I reckon you could help me with it. I'm no builder. No, I was thinking more of your demolition skills. Now this here, this is the development as planned, and this, this is the property that we're looking at. You're trying to say this new office block is kind of in the way. You catch on quick. Now I'm gonna head out of town for a while, and if that office development would have faced sudden and insurmountable structural problems, then I... As a civil-minded individual, you feel obliged to step in and save the rejuvenation of an important area of the city. Where can I get more guys like you? With his Washington Beach project finally clear of all roadblocks, Avery would next turn his eye to the low-income sections of the Vice City mainland, primarily Little Havana and Little Haiti. Having no shame whatsoever, he envisioned a new scheme to drive down prices in the neighborhoods so that his company could buy up the land at a profit, and then more than likely, redevelop it into more pristine condominiums. Avery would hire Tommy Rossetti one last time in 1986 to disguise himself as a Cuban gangster and provoke a full-scale gang war capitalizing on the recent death of a high-ranking Haitian soldier who is rumored to have been killed by the Cubans. Tommy, this is Donald Love. Donald, this is Tommy Vercetti, the latest gunslinger to come to these parts. Oh. Now, Donald, you just shut up and listen, and you might learn something. Now, nothing brings down real estate prices quicker than a good old-fashioned gang war. Except maybe a disaster like a biblical plague or something, but that may be going too far in this case. You getting this down, you four-eyed prick? Now recently a Haitian gang lord died. Apparently the Cubans did it. Nobody's certain, but let's make them certain. You disguise yourself as a Cuban hombre and head on down and crash that funeral. Mix it up and then hightail it. You getting this down, Donald? Well, that ought to put the coyote in the chicken coop, huh? And then we'll just sit back and watch the prices tumble. His plan would indeed work, and it is believed that sometime after 1986, prices in these areas had fallen significantly, likely further lowered when the war concluded with an enormous explosion at a Haitian drug factory. Though details on what Avery got up to in Vice City following the Cuban-Haitian gang war are ambiguous, one thing for certain is that he would remain connected to Tommy Versetti for presumably quite some time, 
even occasionally offering the rising kingpin advice in regards to building a legitimate criminal empire using business assets. Oh, we gotta redecorate this place! We gotta make it look older! I can't stand this look! Tommy, what do you say? What do you say we put a bar in the- You're my lawyer, Rosenberg, not my interior decorator. Got it? Listen to me. The time to take over this town is now. It's all out there waiting for us. We need to start seizing territory and let Vice City know we're the new players in town. You know what I'm saying? What you need is a legitimate front, Tommy. Real estate. It's never done me no harm. We need to start using some muscle, or we can kiss all that hard work goodbye. Local business know Diaz is dead, and they're refusing to pay protection. Oh, we could try bribery. Bribery? Screw bribery. I'll show you how to make them scared. I'll be back here in five minutes. In fact, it seems entirely possible, if not likely, that Avery and Tommy continued to work together right up until Avery's departure from Vice City, or even his death. After the Versetti gang became the dominant crime family in the city, it is believed that Avery's many construction projects from the 80s would be completed, but we have no reason to believe a man such as him would be keen on slowing down. Howdy, son. Just thought I'd ring you up and give you some advice. Hey, Avery, what's eating you? There's a lot of opportunity in this town if you own the right real estate. You catch my drift? I reckon so. All I'm saying is keep your eyes open, and you might find the perfect business opportunity. I'll catch you later. Later, Avery. Whatever Avery did between 1986 and 1992, it would propel him to the status of cultural icon, with many suggesting that he got involved with developing for casinos in Las Venturas, given his appearance on the old Venturas strip. Eventually, Avery would once again decide to move his business interests to another corner of the nation, this time the Northeast, in the miserable state of Liberty, specifically Liberty City. He would, we speculate, attempt to get on the good side of the then-mayor, Roger C. Hole, by presumably bribing him, or using other underhanded means to get a foothold in the Liberty City construction market. But, surprisingly, the mayor would resist. Already bought by the Ferelli crime family who held a considerable amount of power in the city at the time, Avery would instead be forced to try another tactic, given the high-class nature of his new opponent, defamation. He would email Liberty Tree reporter Ned Burner in 1998 in an attempt to bribe Burner into printing stories regarding the mayor's corruption. Ned, good to finally talk to you the other day. You know what I always say? Well, no, of course you don't. We've never met. And also, I don't always say the same thing. I'm not a goddamn parrot. I am a success story, and I didn't get to where I am today by acting like a sissy or giving in to bullies, no sir. I got where I am today by stabbing people in the back, bribing, and threatening people, and generally making a nuisance of myself. That, and artificially manipulating property prices. So Ned, how about it? What do you make, a newspaperman? 60, 70 grand? Well, write what I want and I'll pay you 200 grand, in cash. Have we got a deal? I recommend you say yes, because if you try and play hardball with me, I'll have you killed and be proud of myself for doing so. Business is like war, only without the Geneva Convention to hold us back. May the best man win. So listen, Ned, dear boy, take the money and start telling the truth about the mayor. We all know that Hull has been taking bribes from the mob for years and is in bed with some of the biggest names in American construction. Some, but not me. Either we correct that, or we disgrace him, or we kill him. Come on, Ned, tell the world. The man is a fraud and a liar and a crabby politician. We gotta save this town, you and me, Carrington. But anyone who knows Liberty City history can tell you that Mayor Hull wouldn't have long to even be defamed, given that his assassination would take place that same year. In a case of irony so palpable that even Avery would find it bitter, he would soon discover that one of the candidates running to replace Mayor Hull would be his own protege, Donald Love, but no correspondence was known to have taken place between the two since at least the 1980s. Love would lose his bid for election and find himself a broken, poor man, but Avery would be none the wiser, no longer interested in his one-time student and instead interested in securing yet another lucrative deal. Deciding to go around the new mayor, Miles O'Donovan, Avery would make a deal with the Panlantic Construction Company, a front for the Colombian cartel operating out of Liberty, and arrive in person at Francis International Airport with intentions to inspect the site guarded by his new cartel allies. However, Avery would make the fatal mistake of underestimating how much he'd taught Donald Love, and en route to Fort Staunton, he would be assassinated by Tony Sobriani of the Leone crime family, working under orders from both Salvatore Leone and Donald Love himself. Tony, my ex-mentor, Avery Carrington, is flying into town today. It's come to my attention that he's working for the Panlantic Corporation. They'll do anything to get primary in the state. 
If being killed under orders from his own former criminal student wasn't insulting enough, Avery's death would be further trivialized when his corpse was stolen alongside that of Ned Burner and delivered to Donald Love at his private hangar in Francis International Airport. As Love fled the city temporarily to allow the heat he'd come under to die down, he would bring the corpses with him for nefarious purposes and return by at least early 2001, having fully, finally embraced the lessons that Avery taught him after eating his dead body. since we've last met. You used to feed me such pearls of wisdom, and soon I shall dine again. My God, he's wearing a wig! Avery Carrington was above all else ruthless. He was never known to take no for an answer, and would happily undermine, bribe, or kill just about anybody who sought to deprive him of whatever it is he set his sights on that day. He was arrogant, violent, and condescending, always maintaining an air of criminal wisdom to those he sought to indoctrinate, and seemed to always find a way of bringing up his father in casual conversation. His callous and seemingly cavalier approach to even the most serious of matters may have contributed to his never having been married, though it's also entirely possible he was simply married to his job. Very little is known about his personal life, but as we mentioned earlier, he was not known to have had children, and this may have been the reason he initially took on Donald Love as a protege and pseudo-son, despite effectively abandoning him later on and constantly dismissing Donald when he was around. Avery was described even by the VCPD as an extreme capitalist, and this could be seen in his constant and forceful expansion across the country, making his mark in Vice City, San Andreas, and even attempting to get a foothold in Liberty City before his assassination. The extreme here also refers to his knack for using highly illegal hostile takeover tactics to push whoever opposed him out of the game, as well as his ability to weasel out of any responsibility for such actions using his favorite excuse, plausible deniability. Much like his protege, whom we covered in the premiere of this season, Avery Carrington represented the very worst that the American business mentality had to offer. Hyper-violent, emotionally detached, and entirely self-serving with the only people he himself respected being similarly ruthless businessmen, such as Tommy Versetti. As with many of the criminals we have examined this season, information on the full extent of Avery's potential criminal history is difficult to come by, and as such, we must emphasize the title of this section, Known Crimes. We have absolutely no doubt that had an official investigation been launched by the authorities, far more dirt would have been found from his many years as a real estate mogul across the country, but given that his most notorious and well-documented years were during his association to Tommy Versetti, the bulk of his crimes we can attribute to him come from this era, starting with Conspiracy accessory murder, inciting a riot, assault, and destruction of private property, when hiring Tommy Rossetti to destroy several Spant Express delivery vans. Conspiracy accessory murder when hiring Tommy to eliminate a rival land developer who was refusing to sell. Conspiracy accessory murder, destruction of private property, and terrorism when hiring Tommy Rossetti to destroy a construction site opposite his own in order to claim the land, resulting in the deaths of several workers. And Conspiracy accessory murder when hiring Tommy to incite a gang war between the Haitians and Cubans. Given that Avery was later known to have worked with the Colombian cartel and spent many years using the same tactics around the country, it is almost a given certainty that had we the proper resources, we could have dug up a mountain of similar charges from Avery's many years buying and selling land around America. As things stand, however, this represents just a tiny fraction of what one powerful, no-nonsense American capitalist can do in just one city in just one year when given the proper tools. What turns a man to extreme capitalism? Is it the easily exploitable masses just begging to have their wallets emptied, or pure necessity in this hyper-competitive dystopia we find ourselves trapped in day in and day out? It's not for us to say, but what we will say is America is a dangerous place, folks. 
Stay indoors, people. You never know if that friendly gent with a 10-gallon hat that you wave to is actually planning to buy your house and demolish it in order to make room for a condo you most certainly can't afford. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching. America, the land of the free, home of the brave, and the stupid, and the criminally insane. Who's this? The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets, causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight, on Grand Theft Autobiographies. Military coups, adult film stars, and treacherous swine. Tonight we will examine the life of a Central American war criminal and self-purported revolutionary who helped shape the drug scene of Vice City during that magical decade that was the 1980s. We will follow not just his story, but also the lives of his daughter and right-hand man, whose own stories in the Sunshine State are inextricably linked to this very influential man. We will see revolutions, yacht parties, and an intense hatred for the French that even this reporter cannot hope to match, as we take a look at the life of Colonel Juan Garcia Cortez, his daughter Mercedes, and his right-hand man, Gonzalez. Our story tonight begins somewhere in Central America, possibly the Dominican Republic, though this remains unconfirmed. It is here, likely sometime in the 1930s, that the future Colonel Juan Garcia Cortez would be born, and grow up surrounded by chaotic fighting which seemed to plague his nation throughout his lifetime. Further south in the beautiful nation of Colombia, Cortez's future right-hand man, Gonzalez, would be born likely half a decade or more after Cortez, though exact birth dates for either man could not be obtained by our investigators. In fact, details on the early lives of both Juan Cortez and Gonzalez are quite sparse, and their childhoods remain a complete mystery to all but their closest friends and family. The real dirt on both men would begin to surface when Juan took it upon himself to become a liberator, or at least, begin paying lip service to this ideal. Juan Cortez would join the military in his home country and slowly begin to work his way up the ranks using the most ruthless methods imaginable, even for a nation so frequently chaotic as his own. Far less is known about Gonzalez's early years, with little to no information existing on his whereabouts prior to meeting and working with Juan Cortez. He was known to have been married at some point, but any details on the identity of his wife, or if the two ever had children, remains unknown. Given that we also do not know exactly when Cortez would become involved in the drug trade, which provided the basis for tonight's biography, it is difficult or impossible to know when he would begin working with Gonzalez, or under what circumstances. All that is known for a certainty is that by 1984, the two men were strong allies, and even friends. Also likely sometime prior to his move stateside, Juan Cortez would marry and father his only child, a daughter, Mercedes Cortez though tragically, his wife would pass away sometime prior to 1986, leaving Mercedes to be raised by Juan on his own. Over the course of his military career, Juan Cortez would participate in, possibly even initiating, dozens of coups against the standing government. According to records at the VCPD in the 1980s, by 1986, he had survived and participated in as many as 30 coups and received at least 9 death sentences, which were obviously never executed. With each successful coup and subsequent change of government, Cortez would always manage to maintain his own power, and by middle age, he would attain the rank of colonel, continuing to cultivate a public image of trustworthiness, ruthlessness, and sophistication. To this aim, the colonel would develop several expensive tastes, and use his vast sums of wealth to indulge himself in such exotic activities as eating nearly extinct species and sailing around on his massive yacht. He would also at some point develop a seething and as of yet unexplained hatred for the French government, 
and xenophobia towards the French in general, which likely stems from his home country having originally been colonized in some capacity by them. But if there was one thing stronger than his hatred for the French, it was his lust for more power, and wealth, despite his already overwhelmingly powerful position as a military colonel and supposed man of the people. We speculate that at some point in the early 1980s, trouble in Cortez's home country, possibly due to a recent or even ongoing coup, would force him to reconsider relocation. This eventual relocation would in reality be an excuse to begin or expand his secret source of revenue, the drug trade, and may or may not have been directly related to his change in career paths. Whatever the reasons, Colonel Cortez would send Gonzalez to the shores of the United States by 1984 to begin setting up connections for his side business away from their home countries. Though we say send, in reality it isn't clear when or even how the two men met, nor is it clear when Gonzalez moved to Vice City. Therefore, it remains entirely possible that their business relationship began due to Gonzalez's existing connections in Vice rather than working together throughout their lives. Whatever the case, Gonzalez would be granted a visa to the U.S. as a public health and fitness commission, with Cortez as a cultural attaché. In fact, Gonzalez's presence in the U.S. was accompanied and facilitated by his diplomatic immunity, apparently being a part of a cultural affairs division of the San Dominican Consulate. This all further hints at, but again does not confirm, a long-standing relationship between Gonzalez and the Colonel. Gonzalez would settle into life in Vice City, Florida, and quickly begin making contacts with cokeheads all over the city. Most prominently, filmmaker Rennie Wasselmeyer, who at the time was inadvertently supplying half the city with snow through their many show business connections. Eventually, Rennie would put Gonzalez in contact with rising criminal kingpin Victor Vance of the Vance Crime Empire, and Victor would lend his services to the Colonel's right-hand man as he attempted to move products safely to a lockup in Viceport. Are you Gonzalez? Ah, you must be Victor. Hey, senor, I need to get my Colonel's merchandise safely to Viceport. Your Colonel? You're in the army? Not your army. Colonel Juan Garcia Cortez is my boss. I'll bear that in mind. Take my copter. My men will join you. With Victor's help, Gonzalez would manage to safely deliver the shipment to Cortez's lockup, and an alliance of convenience would form between the two. I have lost many good men today, men I cannot afford to lose if I am to protect my colonel's interests in the deal ahead. If you need a bodyguard, you can do a lot worse than me, for the right price, of course. Maybe so, but I can't trust anyone until I've discovered who leaked our arrival to those puta bandits. Sensing Victor was a man who could be trusted to keep a secret, and already having seen his considerable skills as a gunman and a crime lord, Gonzalez would continue to hire Victor several times throughout 1984, as his ambitions grew beyond just working for the Colonel Cortez, which was apparently not paying enough. Sometime in or prior to 1984, Gonzalez would begin cutting the Colonel's coke to make a tidy profit of his own, but he would quickly discover that keeping all holes plugged on a sinking ship would only delay the inevitable. He would discover that one of his own men, Jesus, had betrayed him, possibly attempting to do exactly as he had been doing by cutting product off the top, though the exact nature of the betrayal remains unclear. What is clear is that Gonzalez and Victor would again meet at the Leaflings Country Club, where Vic would help Gonzalez plug one more leak. Ah, Vic! I hope you play golf. Sure. Uh, I've played a round or two. <laughs> I play around all the time. But don't tell my wife. <laughs> Vic, I find the way a man plays golf says much about him. Really? See, si. for instance, I trusted Jesus over there, yet he betrayed me. <laughs> I should have known better. He's a terrible golfer. Let's see if I like the way you play, huh? Then maybe we do business. I have a deal coming up very soon, Vic. Your authorities are keen to support my colonel's attempt to bring greater democracy to the Latin world. Bueno, you bastard! No one sells me out! Well played, Vic. Thanks. Regard this as a down payment on your services. I'll be in touch. Having built up enough trust with Victor, Gonzalez would next hire the elder Vance brother to outright help him sell Cortez's merchandise for an extra profit. Thankfully, Victor would have no interest in ratting Gonzalez out to his boss, and would gladly retrieve the products stashed in a van in Ocean Beach. Ah, Vic, my friend. 
of a small side deal requiring a sensitive touch. Sensitive? Let's just say I'd rather my boss didn't find out about this. <laughs> or my men, for that matter. Let me guess. You've cut your colonel's coke to make a side profit. Shh, Vic, please. This is, after all, the land of opportunity. I don't care who you rip off, Gonzalez, as long as it's not me. Bueno. The drugs are at Ocean Beach. Take them to the deal in Washington. Upon arriving at the deal, however, the vehicle containing the drugs and Victor would be T-boned by a line runner, and the attackers would escape with Gonzalez's, in reality the Colonel's, merchandise. During the hit, Victor would be knocked unconscious and would subsequently inhale a dangerous amount of the product, though that wouldn't stop him from getting revenge. What the fuck? You hit the van too hard! The drugs have gone everywhere! There's more in this dude than in the back! Quit whining! Let's just get this shit up to the party on Starfish. We've got bitches waiting! Gonzalez! We got hit. The drugs, they're gone. What? Are you fucking with me? No, I'm not. What's wrong with you? Are you high on my shit? No. Yeah. I must have been breathing it in while I was out cold. I want my drugs back, Vic. I still have a buyer who might be interested, but he's leaving town real soon. Kill the bastards who did this and get my drugs back to the lockup. Oh, he'll pay all right. Victor would locate the thieves on Starfish Island and shoot his way to the stolen drugs, retrieving them before they could be sold and potentially expose Gonzalez for his treachery to the unsuspecting Colonel Cortez. Well, at least you managed to retrieve my merchandise. But I think... For our friendship, this is the end. Adios. Eventually, though it isn't exactly clear how, up-and-coming drug baron Ricardo Diaz would discover Gonzalez's side business and begin blackmailing him for information on Cortez's operation, or risk having his cover blown. Having seemingly no other choice, Gonzalez would cooperate with Diaz and once again receive help from Victor Vance, as well as Diaz's men, when leaving the city with a large shipment of guns, for possibly one of the colonel's many military coups, or simply future resale. Take the guns back to your colonel, but remember, you belong to me now. Any shipments you bring to Vice City comes through me. See, si, see, si, no problem. Vic, I was just talking to my new friend Gonzalez about loyalty, how I will look after him so long as he does what he's told. And you will do as you're told, won't you? See, si, see. Si. Bueno, escort him to the airport, Vic. Show him what it means to be a friend of Ricardo Diaz and what it is to be an enemy. Pursued by members of the Sharks gang, Victor would protect Gonzalez's convoy en route to Escobar International Airport, and provide the men on the ground with sufficient cover for them to pack up and return promptly to Colonel Cortez, somewhere in Central America. By 1986, circumstance, or simple desire, would finally bring the colonel himself stateside, and he would begin living in Vice City, purchasing a luxury villa, and filling it with servants to attend his every need. Gonzalez by this time would also return to America, but be far less active in the Vice City criminal underworld now that his boss was directly watching his every move. Cortez himself would take to life in Vice City like a fish to water, and quite quickly become a well-known and highly sought-after public figure due in large part to the extravagant parties he would host aboard his yacht in Ocean Beach, attended by celebrities, politicians, and crime lords from across the state and beyond. To you, I am Colonel Juan Garcia Cortez. To my people, I am a hero, a patriot. My love for my country knows no bounds. I will give everything if that is what is asked of me. And if my people need me most in Vice City, promoting our needs, encouraging trade, and improving our standing, then that is where I will go, for my people. Sometimes as I stand in the luxury villa my people pay for, or relax at uh, another party, I know I would rather be at home in the mountains, waiting for the harvest to ripen, sharing a joke with my people. But that has not been my fortune. It is my curse to live in luxury in the United States in order to... His presence in Vice City, given his well-known military background in Central America, as well as his right-hand man's role in the city's underworld, would be immediately known to the VCPD. They would bug his villa, and as a result, the colonel would begin living almost exclusively on his yacht to keep his affairs private. 
With connections already established by 86 thanks to Gonzalez, Cortez would also quite rapidly become a go-to middleman for major drug deals between parties from all across the country's underworld. He would set up one such deal with Ferelli family lawyer Ken Rosenberg to purchase several kilos of cocaine from the effectively retired Vance crime empire, who had been operating quietly out of Colombia for the last two years. Unfortunately for practically everyone involved, however, this deal, as with all of the Colonel's deals, would be known about by Gonzalez, who was still under obligation of blackmail, reporting to the opportunistic Ricardo Diaz. Upon hearing of the deal meant to take place in Vice Port from Gonzalez, Diaz would send a group of his men to ambush the meat, and in the ensuing chaos, Victor Vance, along with Ferelli associates Harry and Lee, would be killed, while all other parties fled, allowing Diaz to take both the money and the product. Boy, get out of your car! Following the botched deal, Cortez would remain calm and composed while he began inquiries into who might have been responsible for the leak. He would host one of his yacht parties shortly after, and among the guest list would be Ferelli lawyer Ken Rosenberg. But his recent brush with death would leave him too paranoid to attend, and in his stead, he would send the other survivor from the ambush and the infamous Ferelli soldier, Tommy Versetti. Reassuring Versetti that the thieves would eventually be found, he would introduce Tommy to his daughter, Mercedes, and almost immediately the two would become interested in one another. Will you be working for my father? Maybe. Do you mind me resting my hand in your lap? Maybe. So difficult having a rich and powerful father. Vamos. Having a personal distaste for Ricardo Diaz, Mercedes would use Tommy as an excuse to leave the party early and ask him to take her where she really wanted to go, the pole position strip club. See you around, handsome. Though I bought you thunder. I'm sure you will. Mercedes would remain connected to Tommy through his relationship to her father, and eventually, the two would meet again when Versetti began working with Kent Paul to help the band Love Fist, who were always looking for a good time. Hey, Mercedes. Hiya, Tommy. And how are you? Just fine. Listen, you fancy having love fist? Okay. But just as a favor, I expect return. I see you later, big boy. The Greek principle of enlightened debate and the American principle of free speech. Or is that the ancient Greek principle of creating white... Believing he knew the kind of girl Mercedes was, he would introduce her to the group and inadvertently Paul, who would go on to claim he'd also slept with the colonel's daughter, despite all evidence to the contrary. Mercedes would also be present at the celebration which followed Tommy and Cruz's successful robbery of El Banco Corrupto Grande in Little Havana, though it remains unclear if at this time, or any time, she became intimate with Versetti himself. Having already gone through all of Love Fist and always looking for more fun, Mercedes would gladly accept Tommy's offer when later that year, he offered her a job at Interglobal Films, as an adult film star, along with Candy Sucks. Hey Mercedes! Hey Tommy, you want a party? Not now, sweets. You interested in doing some movies? Of course, as long as it's cheap and sleazy. <laughs> You're hired. Get in. Hey, Tommy, you coming in for a warm-up? Maybe later, babe. She would be such a natural as an actor that even director Steve Scott would be impressed with her talents. And by all accounts, she would be a highly successful star in the Vice City smut scene of the 1980s. It isn't clear for how long Mercedes continued to star in films for Steve Scott or others, but she would remain in America for possibly her entire adult life even following her father's departure in 1986 for personal and business reasons. How's filming going, Steve? Well, Candy is a natural. And that new girl, she's insatiable. She went through half the cast and crew before I even took a light reading. Back with Juan Cortez, he would personally reach out to Tommy Versetti following his attendance at his yacht party, and encourage him to come and meet privately to further discuss their options. Hola, is this Mr. Versetti? Yeah. Uh, this is Cortez. You were at my party? Yeah, I remember. Uh, Mr. Versetti, it was a most unfortunate incident that happened with this business deal. I know. I want you to know me and my people are doing their utmost to get to the bottom of it. If you'd like to talk to me more privately, you can find me at the boat. Yeah? Okay. Good day, senor. Somewhere along the way, Cortez would discover Gonzalez's previous side business skimming profits off of his product, and learn of his big mouth regarding the botched deal. No longer trusting his own right-hand man, Cortez would suggest that Tommy personally kill Gonzalez, though at the time, neither man would be completely aware of his role in the ambush to begin with due to his alliance to Ricardo Diaz. 
Keeper City would find Gonzalez lounging at his penthouse in Vice Point near the Malibu Club, and after eliminating his guards, chase him down in the street with a chainsaw in hand, which according to our investigations, ended exactly as one might expect. I'm starting my own thing now. I'm gonna shut that big mouth of yours. Yeah. He's got a blade. Stop running, you fat slime ball. Go away from me, you Oh, sweet Jesus! I've wasted my life and my looks! Stand still and I'll make it quick. Following Gonzalez's death, neither Tommy or Cortez would in reality be any closer to locating the thieves. And so Cortez would continue inquiries while hiring Tommy to help him in his ongoing conflict with the French police. Exactly what Colonel Cortez intended to do with the French missile technology remains unclear, but given his track record, we cannot imagine it was anything good. Damn, my shopping bag. The rain, she's très wet this time of the year. What? Ah, uh, comment? Look, Cortez sent me. Just give me the damn chips. Oh, d'accord. Hey, Quiz imperialist hey, American hey. pig. That is propriété of a gouvernement français. Hand it over. You American idiot. Get they more. followed you here. Tommy would manage to chase down the French agent carrying the missile technology blueprints and retrieve them for Cortez, who we can only assume either intended to sell the information to enemies of the French or to use it himself to build missiles for another possible coup attempt in his home country. In the meantime, however, Cortez's inquiries would point him in one particular direction that was all in all not entirely surprising to the cunning colonel. He would become suspicious of Ricardo Diaz, and as a result, try to get Tommy a job defending Diaz at an upcoming deal, with the hope that Tommy could learn the truth from inside the Diaz organization. Tomas, I appreciate your coming. Forgive me for getting straight to business. Diaz has asked me to oversee a minor business transaction. Let's hope it goes better than last time. Which is why I thought of you, my friend. I've dropped some protection at the multi-story car park. Pick it up. Then go and watch over Diaz's men at the drop-off. Gracias, amigo. Tommy would go on to successfully defend Diaz along with the brother of Victor Vance killed during the ambush, Lance. Having earned Diaz's trust, at least initially, the two men would continue to work for him while they tried to find concrete proof of his role in the botched deal. Meanwhile, Cortez would continue his usual mingling among his criminal and political contacts, and at some point, find a buyer interested in a piece of military hardware being moved through Vice City. Knowing that Tommy was one of the most reliable criminal contractors in the state, possibly even the country, he would once again offer him a job, just as his suspicions of Diaz boiled over into outright accusations, even if just in private. Tommy, it's me, Colonel Corte. Look, senor, I believe you are a man who can get things done. So please help me. You can find me at the boat, huh? Diaz was pleased and would like to meet you again. Is that a good thing? Of course, although I'm starting to think that Diaz was responsible for our unfortunate loss. What makes you say that? One does not wave accusations at a man like Diaz. I'm merely thinking out loud. No matter. I have a proposal that you could profit. I don't have time to run more errands, Cortez. I would have thought a man with such dangerous dates would be hungry for opportunities. Please, Tommy, at least hear me out. Go on. I have a buyer for a piece of military hardware that is being taken through town. Pick it up for me. And once you get it, I want you to call me immediately. Tommy would successfully retrieve and store the military hardware at one of Cortez's lockups for later sale, and not long after, learn of his partner Lance jumping the gun and attacking Diaz personally, no longer able to work for the man who killed his brother. Tommy and Lance would assault the Diaz mansion and take out not only all of his guards, but the frumpy coke lord himself, with Tommy establishing himself as the new coke kingpin of the city. With Diaz dethroned, Gonzalez disposed of, and Mercedes living her own life in the city, Cortez would return his attention to his mortal enemies, the French. Facing increased pressure from the French government following his theft of the missile chip technology, Cortez would recruit the help of Tommy Rossetti one last time in 1986, as he prepared to flee the city for an unknown amount of time. Tommy, Tomas, it's Cortez. Look, the French are giving me all kinds of trouble, amigo. They're hypocrites. They spend a hundred years stealing from poor countries. And they call me a thief, huh? <laughs> I'm going to need your help as soon as possible, amigo. So please hurry, huh? Tommy, I need you, all right? I hate the damn French. Circumstances force a hasty departure, amigo. What's the problem? Ah, the French want their missile technology back, and after that last incident, I feel it is time to find safer homes. Wouldn't it be safer to fly? I'd be dead before I reach check-in. 
Besides, I need to get my merchandise out of the country. Need another gun? You, my friend, are worth ten guns. <laughs> Tommy would help Cortez's yacht escape from the docks as legions of French soldiers poured onto the deck. But thankfully for Cortez, he'd chosen the perfect man for the job. And within a matter of minutes, all French forces, including an attack helicopter, would be dealt with, with Tommy even personally clearing a blockade of ships that were blocking the yacht's escape route. Cortez would present Tommy with his personal escape launch and bid farewell to his friend and business partner. He would apparently return to his home country for a time and be forced to once again enter the realm of politics as tensions remained high, following many years of conflicts. Tomas, you have protected and served me well. And now you must leave us before we reach the open seas. I will lower my personal launch. Keep it, my friend. A token of my gratitude. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, one more request. While I'm away, could you keep an eye on Mercedes for me? I think she could look after herself, but sure, I'll keep an eye out. Gracias, amigo. Hasta luego. Adios, amigo. He would speak with Versetti one last time in 1986 over the phone, apparently concerned for his daughter, after hearing rumors that she'd chosen the most disgraceful career path he could imagine. A lawyer. Tommy, Tomas. Cortez, que pasa? Things are interesting. How are you, my friend? I wanted to ask you about Mercedes. Okay. What about her? Oh, Tommy. Tommy, I, I, I hear these stories, all these stories. I don't know what to think. Maybe she thinks she can do what she likes. But Tommy, tell me, is it true? Is what true? These stories I hear. She, she, she really going to be a lawyer. Tommy, the shame. The shame. You know, we Cortez are a proud family. We would never allow a daughter of ours to become a lawyer. Please, tell me if you so. I, I don't think I could take it. Oh, Colonel, I can assure you, Mercedes is never going to become a lawyer. Don't worry about it. Oh, thank you, Tommy. Tommy, thank you. The shame would be unbearable. She's a lady, not a parasite, you know? Anyway, Tommy, you must excuse me, all right? The new Minister of Interior has arrived. Many years ago, I killed his father in a failed coup, so I must be polite. Hey, good day, amigo. What became of Juan Cortez, or his daughter for that matter, remains a mystery to this day, as he was never again known to do business in Vice City openly, and Mercedes would apparently keep her nose clean enough to remain off our investigative team's radar, at least so far. Gonzalez was an opportunistic, selfish, and seemingly quite vain individual. He carried himself with an air of superiority which in our estimation was not earned, and was not known to inspire confidence by personality alone, unlike his boss Juan Cortez. Despite apparently being good friends with Cortez, Gonzalez had no problem betraying the colonel for profit and convenience, and seemed to have few, if any, close friends due to this lack of loyalty. He was also a comparatively cowardly man when contrasted with Cortez, backing down immediately when cornered by Diaz, and fleeing rather than standing his ground when facing the admittedly intimidating presence of a Ferrelli assassin wielding a chainsaw. Mercedes Cortez was a free-spirited and free-loving woman who adapted to whatever circumstances she found herself in quite adeptly. She was confident and highly seductive, enjoying the company of men more than most, and taking any opportunity available to her to have fun and enjoy her youth. It would help that her father would, perhaps uncharacteristically, allow her all the freedom she wanted, never seeming to overstep her boundaries and fearing above all that she should fall into a life of legitimate work as a lawyer or politician, rather than her promiscuous tendencies. Mercedes seemed to define herself, at least during what we assumed to be her mid-twenties and the eighties, by her sexual appetite, and always stood ready to try new things, while maintaining her own personal standards. She openly acted in pornographic films for Steve Scott, slept with rock stars such as Love Fist and possibly many others, and even occasionally worked as a dancer at the Pole Position Club, for either extra cash or simply extra fun. It isn't clear if she continued this lifestyle indefinitely, or came to regret it to any extent like her co-worker Candy Sucks, 
but during the brief period in which she was associated with Tommy Rossetti in the 80s, she did not appear to give any fucks whatsoever. Juan Garcia Cortez was, at a glance, an honest, hardworking, and trustworthy man of the people. Upon further inspection, however, it is quite clear to our investigative team that beneath his charismatic exterior lay a violent, dishonest, and greedy dictator, who might as well have laid claim to his home country had any of his coup attempts gone the way he'd intended. To his criminal allies, Juan Cortez was exceedingly loyal and honest, treating those whom he respected with an equal measure of dignity while politely smiling at his enemies as he positioned himself to strike. To the public of his home country and even Vice City, he was a political envoy, seeking to build a bridge between his country and the glorious U.S. of A. But to the underworld, he was a feared, respected, and decorated war hero, who proved time and time again that he was not a man to be trifled with. While claiming to be humble and cursed to live in luxury, he would enjoy consuming rare and nearly extinct animals aboard his expensive yacht. While claiming to be a man of the peace and only seeking justice, he would meddle in foreign affairs by stealing top-secret missile chip technology. And while claiming to be in the U.S. to facilitate relations with his home country, he would set up drug deals to line his already considerably hefty pockets. Due to the ambiguity surrounding Cortez's life both before and after his time in America during the 80s, few conclusions can be reached concretely regarding his character or motivations. But based solely on what little information we do have on him, we feel confident in stating he was among the most ruthless, charming, and memorable characters to grace the Florida drug scene during that most infamous of decades. Both Juan Cortez and his right-hand man Gonzalez would have a number of crimes attributed to them during their brief time in America during the 80s. One must keep in mind, however, as we have already stated tonight, we do not, and moreover we cannot, know what these men got up to back in their home countries, due to our request for information being repeatedly denied. Both men technically managed to fly under the radar of the American authorities during their stay, but if there is one thing we here at GTA Biographies are proud to do, it's sling accusations of criminality at people who are more than likely long dead. Beginning with Gonzalez, the crimes we were able to attribute to him are as follows. Drug dealing, drug distribution, and accessory murder when importing a shipment of the Colonel's Coke and stashing it at a lockup in Viceport, with help from Victor Vance. Conspiracy accessory murder and torture when tying his former employee Jesus to a buoy and shooting golf balls at him. Drug dealing, drug distribution, and accessory murder when recruiting Vic Vance to sell some of the Colonel's Coke for a side profit which ends in Victor tracking down and killing several thieves. And, sale of illegal firearms and accessory murder when fleeing Vice City in 1984 while pursued by members of the Sharks gang. And as for Juan Cortez, his known crimes are as follows. At least 30 attempted military coups which seemingly all ended in failure. Fleeing at least 9 death sentences in his home country. Drug dealing and drug distribution in his home country, as well as accessory drug dealing when facilitating deals in America. Conspiracy accessory murder when hiring Tommy Versetti to kill Gonzalez and his men. Theft of military technology and accessory murder when hiring Tommy Versetti to meet a French agent selling missile chip technology. Accessory murder when getting Tommy a job defending a drug deal for Ricardo Diaz. Theft of military technology and accessory murder when hiring Tommy Versetti to intercept a tank being driven through the city. And evading authorities and conspiracy accessory murder when fleeing Vice City and the French government in 1986 with help from Tommy Rossetti. Given that both men were either directly or indirectly responsible for nearly a hundred murders each in just the two years they spent in Vice City, it seems safe to assume that whatever their full rap sheets contained, they would be far longer than what we've compiled here today. Unlike her father, Mercedes Cortez does not appear to have been directly tied to any outright crime during her stay in Vice City, with the possible exception of her presence at a celebration following Tommy's bank robbery. Given that no physical evidence or even reliable hearsay links her to any other known crimes, it also seems safe to assume that Mercedes, while making her father proud, would live a far less controversial lifestyle, and adapt quite well to life in America. As for Juan Cortez, nobody knows what happened to him following his return to his home country, but if we had to place our bets, we'd say he was finally outwitted during an attempted coup, or he'd finally staged a successful one. What made the allure of the 1980s so intoxicating to so many different people? 
Was it the glitz and glamour of the nightclubs and the hair metal bands plastered on every billboard? Or was it the all-powerful substance we've all come to raise our noses at? Cocaine. We'll let you decide, America. But one thing is for certain in this crazy world, whether it's the 1980s or the 2020s, America is a dangerous place, folks. Stay indoors, people. You never know if that yacht party you attended was hosted by a Central American dictator who also sells you drugs. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching. America. The land of the free. Home of the brave. And the stupid. And the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on Grand Theft Auto Biographies. Regime building, drug dealing, and corruption at the highest levels. Tonight we will take a look at a brief window of time in the life of one of our most mysterious subjects on GTA Biographies to date. We will follow the actions of a government man embroiled in Latin American affairs, who used any means necessary to fund his operations, and the unlikely relationship he formed with one of the state's most notorious criminals, which gave us this glimpse into his otherwise undocumented career. We will see government-sponsored narcotics trafficking, interagency rivalries, and domestic terrorism, allegedly, as we examine the known life and crimes of the G-Man spook, Mike Torino. regular viewer of GTA biographies will know that more often than not, we are forced to fill in the gaps with speculation when discussing the early lives of our subjects. Tonight, that is doubly true, as nearly all information obtainable on Mike Torino comes from his time in association with the well-documented criminal Carl C.J. Johnson. Taking what little info we do have, we can make some assumptions on how Torino wound up where he was by the time he became acquainted with the Grove Street Gangster. We assume Mike Torino was born shortly after World War II, likely 5 to 10 years after, given his apparent age of late 30s to early 40s by 1992. Absolutely nothing is known about his early life, where he was born, or who his parents were, but based on accent, we speculate he was raised somewhere in the southwestern United States, such as Utah, or even San Andreas itself. Eventually, though it's entirely unclear at what age, Mike would start a career in the government, almost certainly at the CIA based on his later modus operandi, his own words, and the fact that he neglected to mention the CIA when listing the agencies watching him to Carl Johnson. Mike would quickly work his way up through the ranks of the agency and attain a clearance level high enough to begin planning and executing his own large-scale operations. It's possible Mike's clearance levels were so high that he had direct contact with the President of the United States himself, though this remains unconfirmed and is based solely on his later conversations with Carl, which may have been entirely exaggerated to convince the reluctant gangster, or we may simply be misinterpreting. Like many of the CIA's operations around this time, Mike would become involved in funding and supporting Latin American regimes that supported U.S. interests, and on the inverse, tearing down regimes which stood in opposition to the U.S. He would establish contacts through his wet work and espionage all across the Latin world, and by early 1992 be given clearance, or simply take his own initiative, to begin his most ambitious operation yet, this time domestically. In furtherance of his and his boss's agendas, Mike would come up with a scheme to fund CIA operations in Latin America by using his already established contacts to begin selling drugs back in the US. He would, through unknown means, begin to form an underground organization with the intent to distribute cocaine all across San Andreas. 
Establishing himself in the Bayside city of San Fierro, Mike would recruit muscle for the organization through San Fierro Rifa leader T-Bone Mendez, as well as the pimp Jizzy B to help facilitate connections in the state's underworld. And with that, the Loco Syndicate would be born. It isn't known exactly when the Syndicate formed or under what circumstances, and it's possible it had already been in operation on a smaller scale prior to the 1990s. But whatever the case, by 92, Torino would be prepared to step up production to make even more funds available for his Latin American affairs. And to that aim, he would find a new buyer prepared to take as much as 100 keys a month off of their hands, should things go as planned. As it turns out, that buyer was the Balos gang of Los Santos just a few hours away, and may have even been Melvin Big Smoke Harris himself of the Grove Street families, who would go on to be the city's cocaine kingpin. It isn't clear if Harris and Torino were in direct contact or not though, and given that this deal was apparently established before Smoke's public betrayal of the GSF, we can't be entirely certain it was him at all. Torino's involvement with the Los Santos-based suppliers would eventually put him in the scope of Carl Johnson, who, now living out of San Fierro himself, was conducting espionage of his own to find a way into the syndicate in order to dismantle it. Carl and his sister's boyfriend Cesar Villalpando would follow a bala's car to Angel Pine in Whetstone to observe a deal between Loco Syndicate members, including Mike Torino. Although unaware of who he was or his importance to the organization at the time, this would technically be the pair's first encounter, and would be one of the only times Carl managed to get the drop on the G-Man. CJ would eventually learn more about the Syndicate, including its actual name, through his contacts in the Mountain Cloud Boys, namely their boss, Wootsy Moo, otherwise known as Woozy. Woozy and his lieutenant Guppy would put CJ on the trail of Jizzy B, and with minimal convincing, Carl would manage to get himself hired by the pimp as Dumb Muscle to assist T-Bone and Mike with whatever they needed doing. Carl's true introduction to Mike would come under rather unfortunate circumstances for Torino, when a routine drug shipment is stolen by the Vietnamese gangsters, the Da Nang Boys, with Mike still inside the van. Mike! Mike! I've been trying to contact you! What? Oh man, who are you? Okay. Just keep talking. Hey, Holmes, Mike's in trouble. Let's bounce. What trouble? Who was Mike? Man, they taking the yay shipment and the van, and Mike's still in the back. Well, what we gonna do? How the fuck we gonna know where he's he is? He's got his phone. He's gonna talk to us till his battery runs out. Come on, we gotta bounce. All right, let's jet. With his phone battery dying, Mike would relay instructions to T-Bone, who would in turn direct CJ until the pair located Mike at Easter Bay Airport and dealt with the troublesome thieves. Hey, man, come on, hurry up. About time, T-Bone. Who the fuck is this? Hey, that's one of Jizzy's clowns. Relax, Weddle. You hear that? We gotta torch this van with the coke in it. Hey, Charlie, Weddle, we ain't torching nada. This is a setback, but doing 20 to life is a little more than that. Comprende, amigo? Hey, he right, man. Let's do it and get the hell out of hey, here. Hey, who the fuck asked you, payaso? This ain't a committee. Exactly. I call the shots here. Now shut up and let's go. Though Mike had been rescued, he would immediately be hyper-cautious about CJ's presence, already suspecting that the organization was being watched, and using his authority as head of the syndicate to try and confirm Carl's identity and cover story. How long you been working for Jizzy? I haven't seen you before. Just got into town last week. I done a couple jobs here and there. Just got into town, huh? Where were you before that? Hey, what is this? Man, just answer the fucking question. Look, man, chill. I've been in Los Santos with my family, all right? Give me his wallet. What? Hey, get off! Quit struggling and concentrate on the road. Here you go, Mike. Carl Johnson, huh? All right, I've seen enough here. Hey, it was a dub in there. Better still be there when I check it. Shut the fuck up. Okay, Carl Johnson. You did good today. Man, now shake the spot. We got shit to talk about. Both Torino and T-Bone would continue to test CJ and ensure he was not working for a rival organization or government agency, but without actually needing to lie, Carl would insist he wasn't working for anyone except himself. Facing increased pressure from the Da Nang boys, attempting to steal or block their shipments, Torino would hire Carl to protect a supply run to the factory in Doherty, and CJ would once again prove his usefulness to the group. Man, where the hell are everybody anyway? Ah, uh, hey! You a uh, pinchy hoot or what? Uh, what the? 
the hell? You think you can mess with me? I, I will blow your head off and rape and kill your family, you snake! You think you can fucking bullshit me and fuck me over? I know your fucking game, Messi. I don't know what you're talking about, man. Ah, my throat! Who you working for? Nobody! Turn around and look at me. <coughs> man, I'm just trying to make some money. Keep my mouth shut, I swear, man. <laughs> I almost had you, man. I almost fucking had you. <coughs> Watch out. You gotta be careful in this business, man. You know that. Are you boys done playing around? Yeah, we're straight, Bob. Oh, good. That's great. Now, we gotta go meet this shipment. We're late as it is. Let's go. You heard what Heffer said. Get out and grab a bike. The shipment has to get to the factory. You make sure it does, we make it worth your while. We're watching you, kid. See more, Nessie. We're watching. But even with all of Mike's inside knowledge, he would apparently not be suspicious enough of Carl to find his connections to Big Smoke back in Los Santos, and thus his motivation. Carl would go on to confront and murder Jizzy B without notifying the rest of the syndicate and steal his phone to learn of an upcoming meeting, this time taking place at Pier 69. Presumably still unaware of Jizzy's death and therefore CJ's betrayal, Mike would head to the meeting via helicopter, but almost immediately notice the rooftops littered with bodies as Carl and Caesar had already made their move and crashed the party. Chopper inbound! That's gotta be Torino! Oh shit, he'll see the bodies on the rooftops. It's too late, man, he's tripping out, Holmes. Smoke grenades? So much for a surprise. Come on, we gotta take these fools right now. Finally aware of CJ's true allegiances, and more importantly his skills as a gunman and a spy, Torino would retire to presumably his ranch in Tierra Robata, serving as either a local CIA safe house or possibly Mike's personal home. Knowing that Carl had already killed all the remaining members of the Syndicate's leadership besides himself, Torino's next move would be to protect Carl's. He would orchestrate a staged scenario using what we assumed to be a body double, and convince CJ's source of info, Woozy, that Mike and his men were cutting up a helicopter at a helipad downtown, giving CJ a perfect opportunity to strike. Carl, it's Woozy. I've got some information for you. Hey, Woozy, what's the business? My man found that van you were looking for by the helipad downtown. And Torino? Yep, he's there. Apparently he's about to take some merchandise and cut up a helicopter. They've already started loading boxes. Something about Torino don't add up. Holler back if you hear something. Just as Mike predicted, Carl would ambush the helicopter as it was preparing to leave and chase it all the way across the San Fierro freeway, eventually destroying it and in his mind, killing Torino once and for all. Not quite finished yet, Carl would go on to destroy the Syndicate's former crack factory in Doherty to officially put them out of business. Meanwhile, Mike Torino would perform a more than thorough background check on Carl, we assume, as by their next meeting he would know practically everything there was to know about the LS gangster, including a few things that even he didn't know. It is possible, however, that Mike had done his homework on CJ much earlier and had been watching to see what he would do from the moment he met him. However, given Mike's reliance on the income from the Loco Syndicate to fund his operations, we believe it is more likely that CJ had genuinely fooled Torino, at least for a brief time before his assassination of Jizzy B. Shortly after Carl's destruction of the crack factory, Mike would phone CJ from his Tierra Robota ranch using a voice scrambler to mask his identity. He would order Carl to visit him at his ranch if he wanted answers, and CJ would eventually relent. Speak on it. This is a friend of yours. I've got some information relating to your brother. Come to my ranch and I'll explain. It's in Chiara Robotic, cross the Garber Bridge, head south. Who the fuck is this? I can't talk right now. Get your ass over here. Mom's always told me not to talk to strangers. And look what happened to the bitch. Now if you want your brother to go to sleep tonight with his tongue intact, get your ass over here. Goodbye. When Carl finally arrived at the ranch, Mike would continue to hide his identity behind the voice scrambler, and instruct him to perform an off-road driving test to ensure he was up to one of the real jobs he had in mind for the gangster. Carl, darling, welcome. So fucking welcome, man. What you know about my family? Now first we need to see what you're made of. 
What it look like I'm made of? Putin? No, anger and hate. That's what I like about you. Hey, there's a truck in the garage. I'm gonna send my ticket for a spin. After proving himself fully capable of handling even a monster truck in the uneven hills of Bone County and Tierra Robata, Mike would be prepared to reveal himself to Carl, and attempt to explain his role in the way he saw it, protecting American democracy. Who the fuck is this? Son, get back to the ranch, and I'll explain everything. And I mean everything. Can't you just tell me now? I guess not. Hey, Carl. Hey, what the fuck, man? Hey, Torino, I, I told you my bad, man. What the hell can I say? I screwed you Calm over. Calm down, kid. Just go ahead and kill me then. Calm down. Man, you ain't nothing but a fucking Yale dealer anyway, Torino. Shut up and sit down. What, you think I'm a drug dealer? And what, you think you're a crusader for good? Do you have any idea what's going on? Any idea whatsoever? Do you? Do you? Nah, I pay as little attention to things as possible. Do not be a fucking smartass with me. I work for a government agency. It is not important which one. I will try not to confuse you. Yes, when we last met, I was involved in battling threats in Latin America by any means necessary. That does not make me a drug dealer. Now, the money that we raised, the friends that we won over, have helped us immeasurably in our overseas interests. Government agency? Kids like you, you expect heroes. We're fighting a war out there. I'll be a hero and I'll lose. And what do we have? Communism in Ohio. People sharing. Nobody buying stuff. That kind of bullshit. So relax and listen. All right, all right. I'm listening. I know what kind of guy you are. I need a guy like you. To do things I can't get caught doing. Like what? I need you to commandeer a truck. A rival agency with a confused social agenda. They got things that we need. Now this is a two-man job. You'll need a friend. Use your sister's boyfriend, but don't tell him a thing. Remember, I'll be watching you. Carl and Caesar would manage to stop and procure the speeding tanker truck along the San Fierro Highway and deliver it to CJ's Doherty Garage for temporary storage. Exactly which agency Mike and his bosses were targeting with the hijacking, what was inside the tanker, or what it was needed for by either party are still all mysteries. Perhaps more importantly to Mike than the tanker, however, was Carl proving he could be relied upon for more intense and demanding grunt work. He would dangle his brother's freedom just out of reach in order to continue convincing CJ that cooperation was in his and his brother's best interest. Roger that, big monkey. I got a 13-6 fat vulture. Need to acquire a drowning baby. Over. What? In 15 by the fat moon. Break your heart. Over and out. Carl, I need you to do me a favor. Yeah, I'll do you a proper injury, man. What you knowing about my brother? <laughs> Relax. He's in prison upstate. D-Wing, cell 13. To the left, I got a child killer who wants to rip his throat out. To the right of him, I got a white supremacist who wants to eat his heart, to be precise. Now, don't worry. Tenpenny and Pulaski are really relatively benign, unless, of course, you're a family member of Officer Pendleberry, whom they shot when he threatened to expose them, but you do know all about that, right? <laughs> Damn! Hey, man, how you know all this stuff, man? And won't you stop it? You just don't understand, do you, kid? Look, it's all white knights and heroes. We have to make decisions, kid. You know, I try to set bad people on other bad people, and sometimes I let good guys die. He's your brother, but to me, he's just collateral. It's a very delicate decision. Look, over here, you got all the scumbags inside the country. And over here, you got all the scumbags outside the country. And me and my colleagues, we're the fucking pivot. Keep the government in work. Which reminds me, come here, okay? I need you to head over here in the buggy outside, okay? Okay, let off a flare. We got some precious cargo needs collected. Hey, hold up. What about my brother and all that shit you was talking hey, about? Hey, don't worry. Sweet's just fine. He gets touched. A prison guard goes home and finds that his wife and kid have been murdered. Everything's under control. We'll talk later. Now, come on, get out of here.
Mike would send Carl to Las Brujas, near El Castillo del Diablo, and proceed to guide CJ to his intended destination, in order to signal a helicopter for a drop. Jesus, what took you? To Reno! Where you at? Miles away. No time for niceties, kid. Chew the vehicle, grab the equipment I provided, get to that drop zone, and wait for that package. Unfortunately for CJ, but likely unsurprisingly to Torino, the helicopter would be ambushed by presumably the same rival government agency whom Carl had robbed with Caesar, and CJ would be forced to defend the cargo from incoming fire. That's our cargo, arriving now! Jesus! Will you stop doing that? Carl would skillfully down all the attack helicopters and give the cargo chopper a chance to release the package for collection. Upon retrieving the package, Torino would one more time surprise Carl with his seemingly all-encompassing knowledge and remind CJ that his eyes and ears were everywhere. Okay, get the package back to Las Brujas. Where are you? You giving me the heebie-jeebies, man. Carl, I will always be watching or listening or both. With Carl's success at safeguarding the cargo for CIA retrieval, CJ would come under international scrutiny by various intelligence agencies the world over. He would have a hit placed on his head and very nearly be tracked down and tortured by Russian spies, and Mike would use this frightening knowledge as a slightly bigger stick while continuing to promise the carrot of his brother's early release in exchange for even more involved wet work. Here. Now. Don't screw around. What a asshole. It's amazing. What's up now, Torino? This history, it's all lies. It says Hitler killed himself, and then we nuked Japan. And people believe this shit. <laughs> Jesus. Well, if it makes them sleep better at night, I guess. Hey, man, what did you want? Is you gonna free my brother? No. Not now. And here's a little newsflash. I said that to get you to do something for me. Man, you real fucked up. But the shocker is, we are gonna look after him. Because I need him alive as much as you do. Oh, thanks. You know, after what you've done for me, it's like you're a pro now. I got double agents in Panama. I want to put a price on your head. A Russian spy. Little fat Boris-looking guy. He's asking for clearance to interrogate you. Russian style. Calipers on the genitals. Feels good. You'd like it. That ain't nothing cool, man. Just leave me alone. You bad news. Don't worry about it. The Russians got bigger things to worry about than your genitals, believe me. The whole country went to shit. You know, we tried hard to put a lid on it, but that idiot Gorbachev with his little strawberry in his forehead, he gave away the crown jewels. Still, they got their, you know, their boy in the White House. That was nice. So? What you want me to do? Now listen, I need you to buy me some property, okay? Shouldn't cost that much. You offer them a dollar. If they give you a hard time, kill them. I'm gonna need you to start doing some real wet work here for me soon, okay? Enough of this little girl bullshit. Now get out of here. Come on, beat it. Ready to really put Carl to work for the agency, Mike would have him purchase, with his own money of course, an airstrip in Bone County for Torino's planned domestic operations. Needing a flight-ready soldier who could operate under the radar, quite literally, Mike would instruct Carl to use the training tapes of the airstrip to learn how to fly, and with little other choice, Carl would do just that. Well, Carl, so what do you think of our new base of operations? It's missing something. Maybe a tennis court and a pool would help motivate me better. Very nice call, very cute. Uh, so listen, now, <clears throat> you're gonna have to learn how to fly. No, I ain't. Yes, actually you are. I set out a series of tests for you. You can access them on that TV. You're gonna have to prove to me that you can fly if you're gonna continue working towards your brother's freedom. Shit, whatever, man. Very nice. CJ's first task from Mike after learning the art of aviation would involve delivering urgently needed supplies across the state to agents in Angel Pine without being detected by radar systems. Mike would ambush CJ at the hangar to make a point about CJ's attentiveness, and once more explain his government mindset before sending Carl on yet another dangerous mission. Get you again, Carl! You're half asleep. I could have killed you in nine different ways. Wake up and smell the coffee. You need to lay off the coffee. We got a problem. I got some guys out in the field need some equipment. If they don't get it, they'll be dead by nightfall. Then take it to them! Me take it to them? 
Yeah, why not? I got five guys watching me all the time. I got two in that hill, one over there, and two by satellite. If I go, my guys and I will be dead. I don't have a death wish. I'm a man of peace, son. Yeah, clear. Take the plane. Now, you're not ready yet, so stay low under the radar. Questions? Yeah, just one thing. Get to I... it. Wait, hey, listen. Listen to me for once. Why won't these guys come after me? Oh, they can't, because they're all posted on me. One DEA, one FBI, a Russian, a Cuban double agent, and my paymasters. Checks and balances. Nobody is watching anybody watching nobody. Know what I mean? Go. Whatever, man. Using a Rustler one-seater airplane, small enough to go mostly unnoticed, CJ would fly all the way from Bone County to Whetstone to deliver the supplies to the agents, dodging telephone poles, weather, and even trees which seemed to come into view just moments before it was necessary to counter-maneuver. Hey Carl, you gotta stay nice and low on your approach, pop up on the radar, use the canyon to cover. You sure this thing is safe? I can see daylight through the floor. Yeah, that thing looks like an Australian. The US Air Force is less likely to get you down. Cool. What's the problem then? I said left flight. If you did as many as better meet with these guys, dude, you'd be lucky enough to shoot anything to move. Oh, shit. Hey, just stay low and you'll be fine. As usual, though, CJ would pull it off, continuing to impress Torino and presumably his bosses, depending on how aware they were of his uses thus far. Nice going, Carl. Really, you did good, kid. But Carl's skills would truly be put to the test when another rival agency, possibly the same one Carl had already been fighting on the CIA's behalf, would use CJ's airstrip for a stop-off in order to load a shipment of landmines they planned to offload in the Middle East. It seems very likely that this was the real reason Mike had CJ purchased the airstrip to begin with, having Carl purchase the deed to avoid suspicion, as we cannot imagine any other logical reason for this otherwise risky landing at an unguarded civilian airstrip. Ah, oh, what's Torino up to now? I'm feeling a little exposed here. Being the nearly unstoppable and cunning gangster that he was, Carl would manage to get aboard the fleeing cargo plane before it could take off, and proceeded to eliminate all personnel in the cargo bay before planting explosives inside and bailing out the back. Carl had proven he was not only a useful asset, but possibly one of the most reliable and deadly contractors the CAA had on tap, all without a pension. What's your take on this? Damn! I thought them was your people. Listen, Carl, we've got a problem. Some traitors from another department think they can help the overseas situation by financing militaristic dictators in exchange for arms contracts. Hey, ain't that exactly what you do? Well, kind of, but we get to pick our dictators. Degenerates that we can control. We try to stay the hell away from these guys with principles, because that just muddies the waters. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, of course, these idiots have stolen a consignment of landmines and they plan to offload them in the Middle East and cause a little rocket and everybody crazy and have a lot of problems. I mean, Carl, do you like maiming people? I'm curious. Maiming? Some people? Shit. Anyway, the point is, you and me, Carl, hey, we're the same. Now, yeah, it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. But if you screw this up, it causes a tinderbox situation all over Latin America and the Middle East. Now, look, I spoke to the big man. You got clearance to eliminate these fuckers. How's that? Huh? Man, kill government agents? <laughs> kill Schmidt. Come on, don't, don't look at it that way. <laughs> well, yeah, think of it as pest control. It works for me. All right, come on. I can't stay here now. I'm too hip. I gotta go. Okay? I'm out of here. Following Carl's unlikely but nonetheless successful mission in taking down the rival agency, Mike would vanish from CJ's life for a time, and return to doing whatever it is secret government agents do. Based on his previous actions, it seems more than likely that Torino would go about re-establishing a means of funding his operations, with the Loco Syndicate dismantled thanks to his new Grove Army Knife and CJ. Whatever he did get up to, he would continue to operate domestically in his crusade against the forces of evil or something. In this battle of Morally Ambiguous Agency 1 versus Morally Ambiguous Agency 2, Mike would have one more use for CJ, 
which also may have been the real reason for his wanting him to obtain a pilot's license. We cannot know for certain how many of the large-scale operations that Mike sent Carl on were planned and known about in advance, but given his actions later on, it seems likely to our investigative team that Carl's work in Bone County, his takedown of the cargo plane at the airstrip, and Mike's final task had all been planned operations, which were just waiting for the perfect neutral party to execute. While enjoying his newfound fame and success back in Los Santos, operating out of his new client Mad Dog's mansion in the Vinewood Hills, Torino would finally manage to contact CJ again presenting him with his most elaborate and deadly mission yet, one that would thankfully, if done correctly, earn his brother his freedom. Damn. Hey, what happened? Hey, what the sound's that? I don't know, bruv. It all just went. You fucking shite, you RP. I can't be held responsible for dodgy gear, all right? Come on, keep it together, man. You can't fuck with us, Flo. Finally, I thought I'd never get through to you. What the f... What's Torino, this? is that you? What's happening here? Torino? Listen, you gotta pull one last trick. Hold up, mate, look, okay? hold up, one second. Communists at the gate, Carl. I'm tired of this, Torino. I'm outside. Let's take a ride. Now I'm eating things. Fuck me! Um, hey, I gotta on? get out of here. You got this? Hey, dog, I gotta go hit a marketing meeting. I'm gonna catch you later. Right, my name goes, sunshine. Yeah, sweet ass. Come on, you having that, Mac? You having that? I'm gonna die in the eye of the storm. That's my destiny. Well, no invite to the housewarming, huh, kid? I knew you'd come anyway. Yeah, well, that's not important right now. I'll bring you up to speed on the way. Get in. What's this gonna take? I got my own shit to worry about. Would you like to see your brother this week? Yeah, what can I do? He's just gotta steal a military jet off an amphibious assault ship and use it to destroy a flotilla of spy ships. Nothing big. Oh man, you shit. When I shit you, Carl, there's a boat. All the gear you'll need is on board. I'll keep you briefed as you go. I ain't coming back from this one, am I? Yes, you are. Don't be ridiculous. Here, take this earpiece. Trust me, do as I say. You'll be home for a blowjob and a bologna sandwich. Carl would follow Torino's instructions to the letter, sneaking aboard the ship stealthily and proceeding to push his way to the hangar to acquire one of the military hydro jets, needed to finish the operation. You see, you see, what did I tell you? It was a snap. Seven aircraft, prepare to be vaporized. Did you hear that? Prepare to be vaporized. They're a bunch of bullshit. Ignore them. They should have you with an international incident. You're not a British tank. You should be fine. For real? Yeah, well, probably. Now make your way to the flotilla and sink the fuckers. After destroying several pursuing jets, Carl would take the Hydra to various reservoirs and lakes in Bone County to annihilate supposed spy vessels, which we suspect may have in actuality been more rival government agents. Carl, having performed a physically and mentally grueling, not to mention highly improbable feat with his success, would curse Torino's name, who would in turn play dumb when asked about where to store the stolen military hardware. You see? Child's play! Fuck you, Torino! I never want to go through this again! I think I'm a Earl! Oh, what a big whiny. Want some cheese with that wine? Hey, you are spectacular. You know what? I'm beginning to think my little Carl's a double agent. Ooh. Shut up, Torino! Where you want this thing? What thing? I don't know what you're talking about. You stole it. Got nothing to do with me. I don't know what you're talking about. See you around. Torino! Torino! Shit! Having passed all of Mike's tests and completed every mission given to him, Mike would be more than impressed with CJ by this time. It remains unclear if Torino had been using Carl for each of his progressively more dangerous jobs, expecting the gangster to die in the line of duty, or if his confidence in CJ's abilities were truly so high that he believed he would return each time. Either way, following Carl's theft of the Hydra and destruction of several spy ships, he would finally be ready to make good on his earlier promises of releasing Sweet from prison. He would show up one last time at Mad Dog's mansion to give CJ the good news, but not without his characteristic wit and sarcasm. I don't care how, I care when. As in now, you hear me? Hey man, what the f Hello boss man. Taking care of business, I see. Torino, fuck you. Almost lost my life out there for you. I got just one tiny little thing for you to do, and then I'm out of your life forever. You know what? I'm tired of your fucking little jobs. Ah, will you stop? This is pathetic. Come on, you're embarrassing yourself. Come on, put it down. Don't be ridiculous, okay? Hey, I got a little surprise for you here. You ready for this? Huh? Answer it. A 
Hello? Carl, Smee, Sweet. Oh, Sweet. I don't know what happened. They just released me. No idea what's going on. But I'm in the square outside the precinct in Commerce. All right, you hold tight. I'll be right there. All right. So what was that little job you was talking about, Torino? I just want you to go pick up your brother. Get out of here. What became of Mike Torino following this is anybody's guess. Given his cautious nature and otherwise indecipherable record, it seems entirely possible, if not likely, that Mike simply continued his foreign intervention and general government espionage for many years after 1992. But we cannot know for certain, as his name never again appears in any official statements or records from the CIA. While it isn't entirely out of the realm of possibility that he continues to operate to this day, given his clearly cushy CIA salary, it seems far more likely that he has retired by now, and perhaps lives out his final days in the comfort and luxury of his Tierra Robata ranch. However, it also seems equally likely that as a man so clearly convinced of his own necessity to the status quo, he would still be operating to this day. So the next time you visit San Andreas, be sure to keep your data off and your mirrors checked. You never know who's watching, or listening, or both. Mike Torino was a dyed-in-the-wool American imperialist, and when speaking honestly with Carl Johnson, we presume, wouldn't make allusions to being anything else. He was motivated, it seems, almost exclusively by his belief in American cultural and military superiority, which likely influenced his decision to join the CIA to begin with. As a government agent, his role as he saw it was making hard decisions, putting bad guys on other bad guys, and sometimes allowing for collateral damage where necessary. He was actively involved in political subterfuge in Latin America, having connections in Panama and all across parts of Central and Southern America, and may have played a substantial role in reshaping that part of the world for American interests as a result. Though he was always cautiously vague about the nature of his work in foreign nations, it seems undoubtedly true that he was who he claimed to be, given his ability to act in such bold defiance of local laws without penalty or pursuance. Being far from morally pure, Mike Torino would see little to no problem with using the illicit drug trade to fuel his operations elsewhere, and single-handedly contributed more to Los Santos's crack epidemic through sheer volume thanks to his Panamanian connections. In fact, while he was certainly not the only major supplier of cocaine to San Andreas in the 90s, he was at the height of the syndicate's power the most successful, being the main supply to the largest distribution network in the state through Melvin Big Smoke Harris. Mike was also well aware of corruption at every branch of the government, including being aware of Frank Tenpenny and Eddie Pulaski's role in Ralph Pendleberry's death, and possibly even their role in the death of Carl's mother. This may be further proof that Mike had been watching Carl for some time prior to their meeting in San Fierro. However, it still remains unclear how long Mike had been planning to try and recruit CJ, and if he was ever truly caught off guard, or merely pretending to be. Unlike Tenpenny and Pulaski, however, Mike was not corrupted by his power at least not in the literal sense of the word, and seemed to genuinely believe in the causes he was fighting for, even if they were incredibly destructive. He was not above blackmail, murder of rival government agents, or propagating a drug epidemic, but at the end of the day he was also a man of his word, who no matter how twisted his beliefs and methods were, followed through on his promises, such as the early release of Sweet Johnson from prison. Ultimately, very little is known about Mike Torino the man, with far more but still very little known about Mike Torino the government agent. He was a controlling, intelligent, and mysterious man whose true motivations can only ever be speculated upon. But at the very least, he kept his promises, which is far more than we can say for most violently disruptive G-men. As we almost always say before this part of the show, the numbers we have obtained through rigorous research on Mike Torino must be taken with a grain of salt, as most of our knowledge comes from that brief period in 92 when he was associated with Carl Johnson. If we assumed that 92 was a fairly typical year for an agent like Torino, and extrapolated that into our data, it would quickly become clear just how dangerous a man he truly was. That being said, we have compiled only the known crimes we believe him responsible for in and around San Andreas in the early 1990s, starting with drug dealing, drug distribution, conspiracy accessory drug dealing, and conspiracy accessory murder, 
when starting up the Loco Syndicate and allowing for collateral damage such as the gang member that T-Bone Mendez murders. Conspiracy accessory drug dealing when meeting with other high-ranking members of the Syndicate in Angel Pine. Drug dealing, conspiracy accessory drug dealing, and conspiracy accessory murder when being kidnapped during a deal and leading his men to the kidnappers slash thieves, who are promptly killed. Conspiracy accessory drug distribution and conspiracy accessory murder when hiring Carl Johnson to protect drug shipments en route to the crack factory from the attacking Da Nang boys. Conspiracy accessory drug dealing when planning to attend another loco syndicate meeting at Pier 69, which is crashed by Carl Johnson and Cesar Vialpando. Conspiracy public endangerment, conspiracy grand theft auto, and conspiracy murder when hiring Carl Johnson and Cesar Vialpando to hijack a rival agency's truck on the San Fierro freeway. Conspiracy accessory murder when hiring Carl to protect a cargo helicopter from numerous attacking agencies or enemy actors. Conspiracy accessory murder and conspiracy accessory destruction of government property when giving Carl the clearance to murder several rival agents and destroy their Andromeda cargo plane. And conspiracy accessory murder, conspiracy accessory theft of government property, and conspiracy accessory terrorism when hiring Carl to steal a hydrojet and take down several flotillas of enemy spy ships in Bone County. Once again, we must emphasize that this likely only represents a small fraction of the havoc and destruction that could be tied back to Mike Torino, and does not even account for his instrumental role in the death of thousands of addicts across the state, or the ramifications of his potentially destructive regime building in Latin America. Mike Torino may have been true to his word often enough, but it must not be forgotten that he was also beyond destructive, and debates surrounding the ethics and efficacy of his particularly cold approach continue to rage on to this day. Whether you love him or you hate him, it could not be said that Mike Torino was not terrifyingly good at his job. Why did the government resort to using the crack epidemic as a means of funding their foreign operations? Was it simply a lesser of two evils case where if somebody was going to do it, it might as well be them? Or have they simply been deceiving us all for their own profit our entire lives? Some say it's a loaded question, but I say America is a dangerous place, folks, and you never know if your dietary habits and odd proclivities are being monitored by state actors right at this very moment. Stay indoors, people, and tape over all of your webcams. You never know who might be watching you whittle away in abject isolation, just waiting for the right moment to wash your brain. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of Grand Theft Auto Biographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching. America. The land of the free. Home of the brave. And the stupid. And the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on A Criminal History, A Grand Theft Auto Biography. Welcome back, everybody. I'm sure many of you missed our examinations of the golden age of gangster culture in San Andreas during the 90s, but I hope you can forgive our extended absence. Tonight, we'll be returning to the epicenter of the crack cocaine epidemic on America's West Coast during the 1990s, with a look at one of the more contentious figures among West Coast gangbangers from this era, who inadvertently played a large role in his city's downfall and its subsequent rise from the ashes, Sean Sweet Johnson. Sean Johnson was born sometime in the mid-1960s to Beverly Johnson and an unidentified man who reportedly left the family when Sean and his siblings were still very young. And as a result, from a very young age, Sean was expected to take on the role of the man of the house and would eventually take to less than legitimate means to provide for his growing family of two brothers, a sister, and his mother. Likely sometime in his early to mid-teens, Sean would become involved in the rapidly growing gang culture around Los Santos and his own neighborhood of Ganton specifically, and would eventually found his own gang set along with a local friend, Melvin Harris, otherwise known as Big Smoke. Naming their gang after the streets where all of the founding members were raised, Grove Street would over the course of the 1980s become the dominant and most powerful African-American gang in East Los Santos, and extend their territorial ambitions as far as Seville Boulevard and Temple Drive, with Sweet leading the charge. 
By 1987, Sean, now known primarily by his street name Sweet, would also recruit his younger brother Carl Johnson into the gang, and possibly his youngest brother Brian as well. But despite the gang's relative success in these early days, the specter of tragedy would follow the Johnson siblings due to their involvement in a violent and dangerous lifestyle. That year, in 87, an incident would occur with Brian and Carl C.J. Johnson, which resulted in Brian's untimely death at a young age. And though details on this event are sparse and hard to confirm, whatever did happen, Carl Johnson seems to have been responsible for, or at the very least, this is how it was perceived. With the loss of Brian, Carl and Sweet's relationship would gradually begin to decline, and overwhelmed by guilt, CJ would eventually leave Los Santos that year to start a new life on the East Coast in Liberty City, leaving Sweet and his most prominent lieutenants Big Smoke and Lance Ryder Wilson to pick up the pieces and try to carry on. Reportedly, following Carl's departure, Sweet would become an increasingly hard man to be around, and would become disillusioned with any ambitions he may have originally had for himself and the Grove, as he began to focus on what he perceived as most important, holding on to the family he still had left, including his fellow gangsters. Over the course of the next five years, Sweet Johnson would continue to lead the Grove Street set, but with the growing epidemic of dangerous narcotics flowing into the streets and the hands of his fellow gangsters, things would only deteriorate for this once powerful gang. During that time, two subsets of the larger Grove Street family's collective would split off to form their own separate gangs with separate leadership, those being the gangsters of Temple Drive and Seville Boulevard. Sweet would reportedly do little to prevent the two sets from breaking away, and as a result, the Grove would lose some of its most loyal and valuable assets, such as Barry Thorne, aka Big Bear, among others, but ostensibly managed to hold on to his lieutenant's Big Smoke and Rider, or so he thought. Unbeknownst to Sweet at the time, Big Smoke and Rider would also grow disillusioned with the Grove, and begin plotting amongst themselves in secret to undermine Sweet and his staunch anti-drug mentality, which Smoke and Rider believed was only further weakening the gang. Working alongside the Corrupted Community Resources Against Street Hoodlums Division of the LSPD, or CRASH, Smoke and Ryder would plot to have Sweet assassinated, allowing them to take control of the gang and lift his implied ban on the sale of heavy narcotics like crack cocaine, and thus make themselves a whole lot of cash. In addition to working with Crash, Smoke and Ryder would also align themselves with the Grove's longtime sworn enemies, the Ballas Gang out of neighborhoods like Glen Park and Idlewood, and together, they would orchestrate a drive-by where several Ballas gangsters would gun sweep down and eliminate Grove Street once and for all. Unfortunately for them, by this time, Sweet would own his own home just two houses down from his childhood home, and though he would spend a great deal of time running the gang out of the Johnson family home, when the drive-by assassins arrived, he would presumably be in his own house instead. As a result of this mix-up, however it occurred, the Johnson family matriarch, Carl Sweet and Kendall's mother, Beverly Johnson, would be killed instead of Sweet, and though he would rush to his mother's aid alongside Kendall, they would be too late to do anything for her. Immediately following Beverly's death, Sweet would phone his remaining sibling, CJ, and inform him of the grim news, asking him to come home for the funeral as soon as possible. Welcome to Los Santos Airport. Sup, Carl is Sweet. Sup, Sweet, what you want? This mama. She's dead, bro. Just days after Beverly's murder, the funeral would be held on the west side of Los Santos, and Sweet would see his younger brother for the first time in five years, but given the circumstances which forced his return, their reunion would be particularly harsh. Hey, what's up, y'all? Look who I found hanging around. Carl, hey! Good to see you. I can't believe she gone, man. That's another funeral you ran away from, fool. Just like Brian's. Hey, she was my mama too. Not for the past five years she wasn't, nigga. And where the fuck you think you going? What? Get out of my face. I'm going to see Caesar. The hell you are, girl. You ain't messing with them essays. You know we beat them. They ain't nothing but a Look, bunch I of low lives. Look, What the fuck are you? At least I got Prince. Oh, and I guess that makes you an upstanding American. Carl, tell him. Carl, don't tell me shit, As long bitch. as he treat her right, disrespect you, and he did. How the hell you gonna say that? Like it's any business of yours. Fuck you, sweet. Oh, shit. Asshole. Here we go again. This shit's real fucked up. Everything. What you mean? What, apart from your mother being dead? Things are going real bad. Hey, let me show you running, man. Tony's buried over there. Little devil over there. It big devil over there. Man, it's just crazy. Everybody blasts on fools first, then ask questions second. After the ceremony, the reunited Johnson siblings, along with Big Smoke and Ryder, would all be attacked once again by a group of Balas in a drive-by, with their intention likely being to finish what they'd started when they tried to kill Sweet the first time. 
It's assumed that Kendall fled on her own, but the Johnson brothers, as well as Smoke and Ryder, would all be forced to escape the cemetery and return to Grove Street on bicycles, when Big Smoke's car is destroyed during the drive-by. By the skin of their teeth, they would all make it back in one piece, and Sweet would ask Carl when he intended on returning to Liberty City. I ain't sure. Thought I might stay. Things is fucked up. The <laughs> last thing we need is your help. Ah, man, I won't let you down. I swear. Hey, we gonna call some hood rats and chill the hell out. You want some? I got a whole lot going on. I'm tired. I'll catch y'all later. Hey, yo, just drop in. We all hanging out. Still reluctant to believe Carl when he said he was staying in Los Santos for good now, Sweet would begin to put his baby brother to work, by re-familiarizing him with the duties of a Grove Street gangbanger, starting with the small things. He would help CJ to spray Grove Street graffiti tags in Bala's controlled neighborhoods, and remind Carl to keep himself in shape and build back some muscle to defend himself. As the days ticked by, and Carl indeed seemed to be staying for good, Sweet would start to rely on him more and more, entrusting him with further responsibilities towards the goal of rehabilitating the Grove, all the while arguing with Big Smoke over the direction they were headed. No crack ever made a gang type. Oh no, man. What's up, y'all? What's up, CJ? What's crack? Man, all they care about is smoking and money. You can't knock the homies hustle, Sweet. And Mark say soldiers. They idiots trying to beat businessmen. Yeah, but they down with us, man. All they down with is money. CJ, go down there and show these fools you mean business. These chumps from the balls are sweating the homies. Go put pressure on them. Let's do it. We've been putting time in the hood, but we got to get the homies back together. Like the old days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you right. So you and Ryder go handle your business. Man, they're slang to their own mama. They don't care about nothing. You're naive, my friend. We got to keep our focus. Though reluctant to speak on the details, Sweet would also eventually be confronted by Carl regarding their mother's murder. But yet another surprise Bala attack would cut their discussion short, as the group was picking up food one evening at a nearby Cluck and Bell. Hey, hey, look! Kilo Trey scoping us out! Damn, Ryder, you a jinx! Shit, the motherfuckers headed to the hood! Realizing that what the Grove needed to get back on its feet was a better arsenal to start, CJ would begin prying Sweet for a new hookup on deadly weapons given the increasingly dangerous tools their foes were often carrying these days. To Carl's dismay, Sweet was still almost exclusively relying on an old Johnson family friend, Emmett, now technically a part of the separate Seville Boulevard families, to arm the gang. Say, what happened to Emmett? Emmett? <laughs> shit, gangs these days got Max, AKs, and all kind of stuff. Emmett, on the other hand, ain't got shit. Well, until we get that plug, we gotta deal with a cat that always been there for us. Emmett, Seville Boulevard families. We ain't too close these days, but nonetheless, I'll take you to see him. Get ourselves strapped up. Come on, man. Nigga, shake him up again. But Emmett was evidently occasionally capable of providing the gang with slightly more than just 9mm pistols. And at some point, Sweet, Carl, Big Smoke, and Ryder would all pile into Sweet's car and set out for Bala's territory for a little bit of payback. With Carl at the wheel, the four Grove Street OGs would mercilessly cut down numerous groups of Bala's gangsters in and around Jefferson and later Glen Park. Yeah, Bala's turf. You dog ready? Yeah, for sure. I'm ready. Carl, just concentrate on the driving and we'll take care of the shooting. Listen to the man, fool, and try not to park us up a tree or something. Yeah, if the car stops, we dead meat. Hitting back at the Bala's wasn't solving their ongoing set disputes with former Grove Street allies, however. The tension between the Grove and Seville Boulevard would especially heat up, to the point where Sweet ended up trapped in a shootout on their territory when a dispute broke out, possibly regarding his new girlfriend at the time. I'm pinned down in Seville Hood, and we need a ride out of here. Pronto! Oh, for sure, man. Hang in there. Drive by Emmett to get heated. Sweet's gang wasn't the only family he had felt obligated to control, though, as another ongoing dispute between himself and his sister Kendall would be one regarding her choice of boyfriend. Having looked after Carl, Kendall, and Brian before he died, Sweet would continuously feel obliged to nag his siblings with his own personal brand of wisdom, even if that often took the form of narrow-minded prejudices. I mean, what if y'all have kids? Leroy Hernandez? That don't sound his good, girl. His name ain't Hernandez. Well, Leroy Lopez is. Leroy Lopez either, you racist fuck. That ain't how moms raised us. I ain't racist. I just know how they feel about you. And look at you. You dress like a hooker. Oh, and I guess you two would know what a hooker look like, huh? You say it like it's a bad thing. Shut, Shut up, up, Carl. Carl. I'm just trying to protect you. For what? So I can date one of your mindless friends? I don't think so. Don't say a word, Carl. Just follow your sister before you see another dead sibling. Then you know exactly what my problem is. She's meeting him at some cholo car club. 
He would have more success with the Grove, though, as thanks to CJ's continued presence, they would slowly begin to retake territory, and Sweet put Carl in charge of personally taking the fight back to the Palas by capturing key neighborhoods, like Glen Park, for the families. This pushback would eventually culminate in a true revenge plot to get back at the Palas for both his mother's death and the subsequent drive-by attack at her funeral, the murder of Bala's OG, Kane. At a funeral? Yeah, we just catch all those ball sack ass niggas at one time. Hey, what up? What's going on, dog? At a funeral. Just like mamas. What up, family? Let's go pop these motherfuckers What's up, out. Man? What's cracking? Hey, look, we gotta go do something What's real big. Nigga? What up, kid folk? Put Grove what Street up, on the map for good. For life. Alright, nigga. Grove Street for Let's life. Roll. But as was par for the course with the never-ending gang wars of Los Santos in those days, the Balas would soon after retaliate once again, when crashing a release party by the recently out-of-prison friend of the Grove, Jeffrey O.G. Loke Martin. Sweet and Carl would once again engage dozens of attacking Balas alongside their fellow Grove soldiers, but mysteriously to the Johnson brothers, Ryder would not arrive in time with reinforcements from Big Smoke despite leaving at the attack's onset. Believing that the best way for Grove Street to fully re-establish itself as back in the game was to reunite the fractured Grove Street sets, Sweet would eventually manage to set up a meeting between himself and the heads of the Temple Drive and Seville Boulevard sets at the Jefferson Motel, with high hopes of bringing them back into the fold. Unfortunately for Sweet's ambitions, this meeting would be ambushed by the LSPD, and dozens of gangsters from all sets would be killed or arrested. Okay, it's strictly one rep per set. You guys gonna have to wait here. We'll be there just in case, bruh. Thanks, homie, but I'm down with these boys. I don't like this, man. Look at all them other family hoods. They used to be Grove Streets. Relax. We straight, they straight. How about you, Smoke? Hey, I'm feeling a little exposed, but I'm good. This is the Los Santos Police Department. Everybody stay where you are. Oh, shit! All you need to the Man, what you doing? Go! Get back in, man! We out of here, baby! I ain't leaving my brother! I ain't no buster! Man, it's every motherfucker for himself! What was fortunate for Sweet was that his baby brother Carl still had his back, and despite Big Smoke and Ryder initially fleeing the scene, CJ would rush into the motel to take down every cop between him and his big brother. Carl and Sweet would escape the Jefferson Motel just barely while fending off the police, but thanks to a returning ride from Smoke and Ryder, the Grove OGs would all manage to escape after a protracted chase across East Los Santos, ending in a massive explosion along the highway and the gangsters splitting up to lie low. That's gonna be a hell of a story to tell when we pass in the blunt. Damn, that was some serious shit. Woo! Fuck this. We gotta get out of here. Ryder's right. Everybody split up, we'll meet up later. But Sweet was determined to bring the Grove back to full strength, and despite the heavy losses all sides had suffered during the motel raid, soon after he would manage to once again organize a new meeting between the Grove, Temple Drive, and Seville Boulevard families under the Mulholland intersection. Grove Street King! What's up, CJ? Where you been? Hey, sorry, bro. I got caught up. Yeah, you probably was hitting one of them baller rats. Yeah, I know what you's up to, nigga. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, you know it. Listen up. Y'all down with CJ, right? Yeah, yeah sure. Show. He's been through a lot. I mean, we all been through a lot. But CJ's helping us clean up the hood. He's taking the fight to the enemy. Yeah. Showing all of us how he used to bang. Yeah. yeah. What it used to mean to be a Grove Street family. Yeah. yeah. CJ, you my brother. My running dog. I should have never doubted you. It's nothing. But you're home now, partner. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Home. Show. Listen up! I want all y'all to go get heated and meet me downtown under the Mulholland intersection. We gonna roll on these baller motherfuckers. Yeah, all right, all right. I see y'all on track. Yeah, let's roll. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Shit. You in? Hell yeah, I'm in. I'm your running dog, sweet. Yeah, my nigga. All right, you go get heated up, and I'll meet you at the crossroads. What Sweet didn't know and had failed to realize from the Jefferson Motel meeting, also being raided by the LSPD, was that the Grove had a snitch problem. Really, it had two, Big Smoke and Ryder. While trying to build the Grove back up, two of his most trusted lieutenants had been working against him behind his back, with both the crash division of the LSPD and the Ballas themselves, and during his second attempt at reuniting the former Grove Street sets, his ignorance would finally catch up to him. Hey, Sweet, man, you all right? You've been hit! 
DJ, where you been? Caesar called to show me some shit. It's smoke. He and Deep for 10 penny and some ballers. He sold us out. Doesn't matter, man. You gotta get out of here. The cops gonna arrive any second. Nah, man. I ain't running out on my brother. Yo, ballers! I'm taking you, motherfuckers! You hear me? I'm taking you all down, bitches! Unlike his brother CJ though, Sweet would not be deemed a useful enough asset to be back out on the street by Crash, and would subsequently be sent to an unknown prison facility in upstate San Andreas, awaiting trial in D-Wing Cell 13. Game over. Or so it seemed. Sweet would spend presumably weeks or months in prison believing that he would soon be tried and found guilty, and use his one phone call to phone his brother and say goodbye, having already given up hope and likely been expecting his life to reach that point for some time. Carl, what's up? It's your brother. Hey, what's up, man? You okay? Not really. I'm stuck in a cell between two lunatics. And people keep trying to jump me? This shit ain't cool, partner. You looking after Kendall? Nah, she looking after me. Right, right. That's cool. I'm gonna get you out of there, though, man. Oh, you ain't nigga. Who do you think you are? I'm in for life. I guess I've grown used to it now. No, you're not, man. I'm working shit out. Whatever it takes. That's a negative. I'm through hoping. Have a nice life, brother. Hold on, man. I'm getting shit worked out for you. Just hang in there. Sweet. Sweet. Shit. But during those weeks or months, it isn't exactly clear how long, Carl Johnson would not rest on his laurels back in Grove Street, but instead expand his interests across the entire state, eventually opening up a chop shop in San Fierro, acquiring a stake in a triad casino in Las Venturas, and even becoming the manager of a hip-hop superstar, Mad Dog. In addition to all these connections, Carl would also work briefly for a government agent named Mike Torino, who was keeping tabs on Sweet during his imprisonment, as leverage to have CJ perform deadly and off-the-books operations for the CIA. CJ would eventually do enough for Torino that the G-Man would finally fulfill his promise to Carl, and pull the strings necessary to see Sweet released early, which meant that the eldest Johnson brother went with no questions asked, and despite his expectation of being locked up forever. Sweet would immediately be transferred back to Los Santos and released onto the streets, where his baby brother was waiting for him with stories of the wild success he'd had in the short time he'd spent in prison, but Sweet was still only thinking of one thing, the Grove. What's up, bro? Hey, what's up, man? How you doing, bro? I'm all right, man. Hey, man, we off to our new spot. We got a mansion, sweet. We've been putting in work, and shit is going well. We got a stake in the casino. We got some insane shit in Fierro. We getting to the rap game. Hey, man, let me get you some new clothes. Come on. New clothes? Nigga, what the fuck is this bullshit? What you mean, man? What's mine is yours, and you know that. You never did get it, did you, Carl? I need to go check on things in the hood. Man, that's the problem. You always a perpetrator, running from what's real. Hey, man, shit's fucked up there. You don't want to be in the hood. No, that's exactly where I want to be. What you done for our hood? Man, what the hood done for me? Always dragging me down. Ever since I got out the hood, shit been cracking. That's everybody's dream to get out the hood. Man, you sound just like Smoke right now. All right, man. You hard. I'm going to show you what's going on in the hood. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, yeah, what about this blender? It's, it's really good. It's, it's, it sort of works. Man, what the fuck? That's Miles Blender. Look like base heads and took over the spot. Let's go home. This is home, man. Get these fuckers out of mom's house. You was born in there. Damn! Despite CJ's protests, the Johnson brothers would return to Grove Street, and Sweet would see firsthand the sad state that it had reached since his departure. And though Carl would want to leave as soon as possible, Sweet would refuse to do so, and instead insist that CJ help him clean the place out and get things back to how they used to be. Back in his own backyard, but now surrounded by even more crackheads and drug dealers than before, Sweet would finally, around this time, start to lose some of his willpower when tempted to try crack by a pusher associated with former Grove ally Mark Wayne, better known as B-Dub. Oh, what the hell are you doing? Oh, shit. Man, everything is KKK. Man, I just want to see what's so good. What's wrong with you, man? Man, this shit already destroyed the whole hood. I, I might as well let it destroy me too. 
Man, you don't need that shit, sweet. What do you know about this? This is what it boils down to now. Come on, sweet, soak the smoke. Hey, man, that shit steal your heart. You can't see that? This bitch talk nice to you and this what you do? Oh, fuck. You're gonna have to deal with beat up. What? Beat up? We can handle Ow. that shit right Get now, your hands off me. Show ass out of here. Bitch. Ironically brought back to his senses by the brother he so frequently gave a hard time, Carl would reinvigorate Sweet's nerve to fight back by tracking down Beat Up himself in Glen Park and trying to intimidate the dealer into giving up his boss, their former friend, Big Smoke, who had by now assumed the role of Los Santos's crack cocaine kingpin. Though they wouldn't get Smoke's location out of him, they would manage to bring an old friend back into the fold in the form of Big Bear, and Sweet, with his victory, would finally be back in the fighting spirit and ready to take on the Balas all over again. Oh shit! I'm free! Man, what the fuck you do that for, man? CJ, man, come on, put me back on the team. Give me 20 bucks and I'm all yours, man. Blast from the past! Hey, let's take a ride, homie. I'm gonna shoot you somewhere you're gonna enjoy. I got Bear's back, man. All right, I'll see you in a minute, Bear. Where we going, sweet? Someplace we can get old Bear back. All right, I'm down for that. He and Carl would continue to occasionally bicker regarding their different perspectives on prioritizing themselves or their perceived sense of duty to the gang, but in between their arguments, they would successfully manage to take back swaths of territory from the Balas, lost since Sweet's imprisonment. Eventually, though, another pot would finally begin to boil over, when the two corrupted officers of the Crash Division who'd been manipulating Big Smoke, not to mention every gang in the city, were finally taken to trial after months of investigations regarding corruption allegations. However, despite plenty of evidence once existing, which could have put the officers behind bars, during trial not enough would remain to concretely pin the numerous crimes levied against them, and as a result, Frank Tenpenny and Eddie Pulaski would go free, and unbeknownst to Sweet and everyone else, it was Carl who had been largely responsible for enabling their exoneration. Also unbeknownst to everyone else, including Sweet, Eddie Pulaski was already dead, also killed by Carl, and CJ had been working for Crash for some time against his will, originally with the same leverage that Mike Torino had used, Sweet's prison sentence. Now, with Torino having helped Carl to free Sweet without Crash, and Pulaski already dead, Carl likely may have naively assumed he wouldn't be hearing from Tenpenny again anytime soon, but that would have been underestimating just how many people the officers had pissed off during their years of intimidation and manipulation. Oh wait. They're exiting the courtroom now. That bastard Pulaski will probably just turn up listen, dead listen. just like the rest of them. In light of the lack of evidence against my client, the district attorney's office has seen fit to drop all charges what? against this innocent man. That's bullshit. You see? You can't trust the system, man. This surprise decision is wholly unprecedented. Oh, man, ain't no Absolutely justice. Amazing. It's just us. Uh, no, I've been arrested numerous times for totally natural behavior. Los Santos will burn tonight. Ain't nobody gonna be riding in my hood. I don't know about that, Holmes. Look, the whole city is going up. Oh, People are fucking pissed off about Damn. this. People don't know what they want. We all being used. You see, man, it's always the same, friend. Power systems corrupt everyone. Look, I said we gonna secure the hood. We ain't getting shit together so some idiot can burn it down. When news broke of Ted Penny walking free, the entire city of Los Santos, or at the very least, every single neighborhood which had ever been harassed by his crash division, would erupt into furious rioting, and for seemingly days, the city's affected populace would cry out in frustration and violent anger. The chaos, however, would actually prove particularly beneficial to Sweet and his goals for the Grove, as it provided the perfect opportunity to claim neighborhoods back from the Balas, with everyone overwhelmed by the rioting. During the riots, Grove Street would re-establish control of a third or more of the city's gang territory, and somewhere along the lines, Carl and Sweet would also finally discover where their old friend Big Smoke was holding out, and even help out Kendall's boyfriend Cesar Villalpando and his gang, the Varios Los Aztecas, despite Sweet's original prejudice against him. With new allies, new territory, and a location for one of the two men they viewed as most responsible for this chaos, Carl and Sean Johnson would head over to East Los Santos and prepare to confront their childhood friend Melvin Harris. But Carl, having already lost one brother and nearly lost Sweet to prison, would ask Sweet to let him handle this himself, and eventually, reluctantly, Sweet would relent. Look, I know you down for this, but I gotta go in there alone. What? Smoke played me. Ten Penny played me. They played us all. Yeah, but you're right. I was a buster when my family needed me the most. Hey, I let Brian die, man. This one for him. For moms. And for you, bro. For Grove Street, baby. Yeah, for the Grove, baby. 
Hey, if you need me, you know I'll be. For sure. You always been there for me, man. Waiting for his brother on the street below, Sweet would not be present for Carl's takedown of Big Smoke, but he would see the other man most responsible in their eyes for their circumstances arrive in a fire truck and attempt to smoke Carl out of the building, Frank Tenpenny. Neither Johnson brother would manage to take Tenpenny out on his way up or out of the tower, but Sweet would manage to jump onto Tenpenny's fire truck by grabbing onto the back ladder, just as Carl emerged from the destroyed crack palace with just enough time to hop into a car and pursue the fleeing truck. After an intense chase across the city, Carl would manage to get Sweet back in the car and off the fire truck, and the two would swap places with Sweet taking the wheel and Carl shooting, culminating in them driving Tenpenny off the road, ironically crashing to his death right into the Grove Street cul-de-sac. Following Tenpenny's death, the riots would subside and a sort of peace would seem to dawn on Grove Street for the Johnson brothers, and their new list of assets, courtesy of CJ. What became of either the Johnson brothers, their many allies, or anyone else directly associated with the Grove remains a mystery, as no other notable stories have emerged since those chaotic days in the early 90s. But it's quite possible that Sean Johnson is still alive to this day, living out in his old age as a true Grove Street OG. Sean Sweet Johnson was a protective, loyal, but occasionally naive and prejudiced man who prided himself on sticking to his principles, even if that arguably got himself and his loved ones into even more trouble. From a very young age, Sweet was forced to take on the role of the head of his household and find ways to keep himself and his siblings fed, and as a result, he developed a sense of duty to his brothers and sisters akin to a father figure, and would constantly attempt to guide them in ways he thought would best suit their interests, even if that usually meant dangerous and criminal lifestyles. On this note, Sweet was dogmatically protective and often controlling of not just his siblings, but the gang that he'd started and led his entire adult life. In his mind, he would always put his family and his gang first, and though in some respects this could be considered true, it also meant putting his brother, his friends, and himself in harm's way quite often when fighting his war against the Grove's main rivals, the Balas. He was often incredibly condescending, and at least around the time of Carl's return in 1992, carried himself with a certain air of unquestionable leadership. His narrow-minded attitude towards his gang and his approach to ridding the streets of the crack cocaine epidemic despite allowing plenty of other hard narcotics would open him up to his ultimate betrayal, and it must also be noted that he, like his brother, failed to discover this betrayal on his own, never questioning the motives of Smoke or Ryder due to their childhood history. Upon failing, twice, to reunite the Grove Street families and spending some time in prison, Sweet was not initially humbled of his goal in reclaiming glory for the Grove, but he would at least once very nearly succumb to temptations of doing hard drugs himself, and would often enough lose his temper quite explosively, at one point nearly killing an unarmed basehead and only narrowly being stopped by CJ. Sweet Johnson, though ironically not nearly as deadly as his baby brother, was nonetheless still responsible for numerous crimes over the years during all of his time as Grove Street's self-appointed leader. Though he would technically serve jail time for many of the crimes we have him listed for, his brother's connection to the G-man Mike Torino would mean he would receive a kind of unofficial pardon, at least for the crimes he committed before his arrest. But we have tried to account for all known criminal activity that Sweet partook in that could be verified by first or second-hand accounts, starting with theft and general gang activity in his youth. Illegal street gambling. Vandalism and accessory to vandalism when spraying graffiti in several neighborhoods alongside his brother CJ. Accessory murder when sending his brother CJ and Ryder to clean up the hood by killing several crack dealers. Murder when killing several balas who perform a drive-by on the group at a clock and bell. Accessory to purchasing illegal firearms and possession of illegal firearms when dealing with his family friend Emmett. Accessory murder when dropping off CJ and OG Loke with knowledge of Loke's plan to kill a Vagos member who supposedly stole his rhymes. Murder when gunning down numerous Bala's gangsters alongside Big Smoke and Ryder in several neighborhoods. Murder and accessory murder when engaging in a shootout against the Seville Boulevard families and his brother coming to rescue him. Accessory murder when tasking his brother with capturing Glen Park for Grove Street. Murder and accessory murder when attacking a Bala's funeral and assisting in CJ's murder of Kane. 
murder and accessory murder when engaging in a shootout in the Grove Street cul-de-sac against the Balas during a record release party by OG Loke. Murder and accessory murder when shooting his way out of the Jefferson Motel with his brother CJ and escaping the police with help from Smoke and Ryder. Accessory murder and possibly murder when engaging in a shootout against the Balas and the LSPD under the Mulholland intersection, resulting in his arrest and incarceration. Murder and accessory murder when working with his brother CJ to recapture Grove Street from the Balas. Murder and accessory murder when helping CJ to retake Glen Park and several other neighborhoods for the Grove. Accessory murder when encouraging CJ to help Cesar Villalpando retake territory for the Barrios Las Aztecas. Accessory murder and possibly murder when chasing Frank Tenpenny's fire truck across Los Santos while his brother took on all manner of attackers, as well as the murder of Frank Tenpenny himself by chasing him until he crashed. Again, when comparing his totals to his much more influential brother CJ, Sweet may seem downright tame in comparison, especially when considering the crime he would receive the most charges in, accessory murder, would be entirely down to his association to his aforementioned baby brother. However, when we look at this man's criminal history in comparison to your average, everyday American, it paints a much different picture of just how far these gangsters have gone in destroying our once glorious American way of life. All for the glory of their precious gangs. What creates such a fierce and arguably detrimental loyalty to one's own warped ideals? Is it all these darn violent video games kids play on their Degeneratrons, or the violent films of Vinewood lunatics like Jack Howitzer, or is it simply, more benignly, the ever-elusive specter of poverty in capitalist America? We may never know the answer, ladies and gentlemen, but one thing I do know is that America is a dangerous place. Stay indoors, people. You never know if it'll be your neighborhood next that gets turned into an active war zone for the amusement of some petty thugs who are vying for the land it sits on. I'll see you next time on another episode of A Criminal History with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching. <laughs>